Chapter 1 The regular early morning yell of horror was the sound of Arthur Dent waking up and suddenly remembering where he was. It wasn't just that the cave was cold, it wasn't just that it was damp and smelly. It was the fact that the cave was in the middle of Islington, and there wasn't a bus due for two million years. Time is the worst place, so to speak, to get lost in, as Arthur Dent could testify, having been lost in both time and space a good deal. At least being lost in space kept you busy. He was stranded in prehistoric Earth as the result of a complex sequence of events which had involved him being alternately blown up and insulted in more bizarre regions of the galaxy than he had ever dreamt existed. And though life had now turned very, very, very quiet, he was still feeling jumpy. He hadn't been blown up now for five years. Since he had hardly seen anyone since he and Ford Prefect had parted company four years previously, he hadn't been insulted in all that time either, except just once. It had happened on a spring evening about two years previously. He was returning to his cave just a little after dusk when he became aware of lights flashing eerily through the clouds. He turned and stared, with hope suddenly clambering through his heart. Rescue! Escape! The castaway's impossible dream! A ship! And, as he watched, as he stared in wonder and excitement, a long silver ship descended through the warm evening air, quietly, without fuss, its long legs unlocking in a smooth ballet of technology. It alighted gently on the ground, and what little hum it had generated died away as if lulled by the evening calm. A ramp extended itself. Light streamed out. A tall figure appeared silhouetted in the hatchway. It walked down the ramp and stood in front of Arthur. "'You're a jerk, Dent,' it said simply. It was alien, very alien. It had a peculiar alien tallness, a peculiar alien flattened head, peculiar slitty little alien eyes, extravagantly draped golden robes with a peculiarly alien collar design, and pale grey-green alien skin, which had about it that lustrous sheen which most grey-green races can only acquire with plenty of exercise and very expensive soap. Arthur boggled at it. It gazed levelly at him. Arthur's first sensations of hope and trepidation had instantly been overwhelmed by astonishment, and all sorts of thoughts were battling for the use of his vocal cords at this moment. Ooh, he said. B -b 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 uh, he added. B -b -b uh, who? He managed finally to say, and lapsed into a frantic kind of silence. He was feeling the effects of having not said anything to anybody for as long as he could remember. The alien creature frowned briefly and consulted what appeared to be some species of clipboard which he was holding in his thin and spindly alien hand. Arthur Dent, it said. Arthur nodded helplessly. Arthur Philip Dent, pursued the alien in a kind of efficient yap. Uh, uh, yes, uh, confirmed Arthur. You're a jerk, repeated the alien, a complete asshole. Uh, the creature nodded to itself, made a peculiar alien tick on its clipboard, and turned briskly back towards its ship. Ah, uh, said Arthur desperately. Ah, uh, don't give me that, snapped the alien. It marched up the ramp, through the hatchway, and disappeared into its ship. The ship sealed itself. It started to make a low, throbbing hum. Ah, uh, hey, shouted Arthur, and started to run helplessly towards it. Wait a minute, he called. What is this? What? Wait a minute! The ship rose as if shedding its weight like a cloak to the ground, and hovered briefly. It swept strangely up into the evening sky. It passed up through the clouds, illuminating them briefly, and then was gone, leaving Arthur alone in an immensity of land, dancing a helplessly tiny little dance. What? he screamed. What? What? Hey, what? Come back here and say that! He jumped and danced until his legs trembled and shouted till his lungs rasped. There was no answer from anyone. There was no one to hear him or speak to him. The alien ship was already thundering towards the upper reaches of the atmosphere, on its way out into the appalling void which separates the very few things there are in the universe from each other. Its occupant, the alien with the expensive complexion, leaned back in its single seat. His name was Walbagger the Infinitely Prolonged. He was a man with a purpose. 
Not a very good purpose, as he would have been the first to admit, but it was at least a purpose, and it did at least keep him on the move. While Bagger the Infinitely Prolonged was, indeed is, one of the universe's very small number of immortal beings. Those who are born immortal instinctively know how to cope with it. But Walbagger was not one of them. Indeed, he'd come to hate them, the load of serene bastards. He had had his immortality inadvertently thrust upon him by an unfortunate accident with an irrational particle accelerator, a liquid lunch, and a pair of rubber bands. The precise details of the accident are not important, because no one has ever managed to duplicate the exact circumstances under which it happened, and many people have ended up looking very silly, or dead, or both, trying. Wildbagger closed his eyes in a grim and weary expression, put some light jazz on the ship's stereo, and reflected that he could have made it if it hadn't been for the Sunday afternoons. He really could have done. To begin with, it was fun. He had a ball, living dangerously, taking risks, cleaning up on high-yield long-term investments, and just generally outliving the hell out of everybody. In the end, it was the Sunday afternoons he couldn't cope with, and that terrible listlessness which starts to set in at about 2.55, when you know you've had all the baths you can usefully have that day, that however hard you stare at any given paragraph in the papers, you will never actually read it, or use the revolutionary new pruning technique it describes, and that as you stare at the clock, the hands will move relentlessly on to four o'clock, and you will enter the long, dark tea-time of the soul. So things began to pall for him. The merry smiles he used to wear at other people's funerals began to fade. He began to despise the universe in general, and everybody in it in particular. This was the point at which he conceived his purpose, the thing that would drive him on, and which, as far as he could see, would drive him on forever. It was this. He would insult the universe. That is, he would insult everybody in it individually, personally, one by one, and, and this was the thing he really decided to grit his teeth over, in alphabetical order. When people protested to him, as they sometimes had done, that the plan was not merely misguided, but actually impossible, because of the number of people being born and dying all the time, he would merely fix them with a steely look and say, a man can dream, can't he? And so he had started out. He equipped a spaceship that was built to last, with a computer capable of handling all the data processing involved in keeping track of the entire population of the known universe, and working out the horrifically complicated routes involved. His ship flared through the inner orbits of the Sol star system, preparing to slingshot around the sun and fling itself out into interstellar space. Computer, he said. Here, yipped the computer. Where next? Computing that. Wildbagger gazed for a moment at the fantastic jewellery of the night, the billions of tiny diamond worlds that dusted the infinite darkness with light. Every one, every single one, was on his itinerary. Most of them he would be going to millions of times over. He imagined for a moment his itinerary connecting up all the dots in the sky like a child's numbered dots puzzle. He hoped that from some vantage point in the universe it might be seen to spell out a very, very rude word. The computer beeped tunelessly to indicate that it had finished its calculations. Falfanger, it said, it beeped. Fourth world of the Falfanger system, it continued, it beeped again. Estimated journey time three weeks, it continued further, it beeped again. There to meet with a small slug, it beeped, of the genus Our Earth Up Hill Iptenew. I believe, it added, after a slight pause, during which it beeped, that you had decided to call it a brainless prat. Wildbagger grunted. He watched the majesty of creation outside his window for a moment or two. I think I'll take a nap, he said, and then added, What network areas are we going to be passing through in the next few hours? The computer beeped. Cosmobid, think pics and home brain box, it said, and beeped. Any movies I haven't seen 30,000 times already? No. Huh. There's angst in space. You've only seen that 33,517 times. Wake me for the second reel. The computer beeped. Sleep well, it said. The ship fled on through the night. Meanwhile, on Earth, it began to pour with rain. 
and Arthur Dent sat in his cave and had one of the most truly rotten evenings of his entire life, thinking of the things he could have said to the alien and swatting flies, who also had a rotten evening. The next day he made himself a pouch out of rabbit skin because he thought it would be useful to keep things in. Chapter 2 This morning, two years later than that, was sweet and fragrant as he emerged from the cave he called home until he could think of a better name for it or find a better cave. Though his throat was sore again from his early morning yell of horror, he was suddenly in a terrific good mood. He wrapped his dilapidated dressing gown tightly around him and beamed at the bright morning. The air was clear and scented, the breeze flitted lightly through the tall grass around his cave, the birds were chirping at each other, the birds were flitting about prettily, and the whole of nature seemed to be conspiring to be as pleasant as it possibly could. It wasn't all the pastoral delights that were making Arthur feel so cheery, though. He had just had a wonderful idea about how to cope with the terrible lonely isolation, the nightmares, the failure of all his attempts at horticulture, and the sheer futurelessness and futility of his life here on prehistoric earth, which was that he would go mad. He beamed again and took a bite out of a rabbit leg left over from his supper. He chewed happily for a few moments, and then decided formally to announce his decision. He stood up straight and looked the world squarely in the fields and hills. To add weight to his words, he stuck the rabbit bone in his beard. He spread his arms out wide. "'I will go mad!' he announced. "'Good idea,' said Ford Prefect, clambering down from a rock on which he had been sitting. Arthur's brain somersaulted. His jaw did press-ups. "'I went mad for a while,' said Ford. "'Did me no end of good.' Arthur's eyes did cartwheels. "'You see,' said Ford, uh, "'Where have you been?' interrupted Arthur, now that his head had finished working out. Oh, "'Around,' said Ford, "'around and about.' He grinned in what he accurately judged to be an infuriating manner. "'I just took my mind off the hook for a bit. I reckon that if the world wanted me badly enough, it would call back. It did.' He took out of his now terribly battered and dilapidated satchel his sub-ether sensomatic. At least, he said, "'I think it did. This has been playing up a bit.' He shook it. If it was a false alarm, I shall go mad, he said, again. Arthur shook his head and sat down. He looked up. I thought you must be dead, he said simply. So did I for a while, said Ford, and then I decided that I was a lemon for a couple of weeks. I kept myself amused all that time, jumping in and out of a gin and tonic. Arthur cleared his throat, then did it again. Uh, where, he said, did you... Find a gin and tonic, said Arthur brightly. I found a small lake that thought it was a gin and tonic and jumped in and out of that. At least I think it thought it was a gin and tonic. I may, he added with a grin which would have sent sane men scampering into trees, have been imagining it. He waited for a reaction from Arthur, but Arthur knew better than that. Carry on, he said evenly. The point is, you see, said Ford, that there is no point in trying to drive yourself mad, trying to stop yourself going mad. You might just as well give in and save your sanity for later. "'And this is you sane again, is it?' said Arthur. "'I ask merely for information.' "'I went to Africa,' said Ford. "'Yes? Yes. "'What was that like? "'And this is your cave, is it?' said Ford. Uh, "'Yes,' said Arthur. "'He felt very strange. "'After nearly four years of total isolation, "'he was so pleased and relieved to see Ford "'that he could almost cry. "'Ford was, on the other hand, "'an almost immediately annoying person.' "'Very nice,' said Ford, in reference to Arthur's cave. "'You must hate it.' Arthur didn't bother to reply. "'Africa was very interesting,' said Ford. "'I behaved very oddly there.' He gazed thoughtfully into the distance. "'I took up being cruel to animals,' he said airily. "'But only,' he added, as a hobby. "'Oh, yes?' said Arthur warily. "'Oh, yes,' Ford assured him. "'I won't disturb you with the details, because they would... "'What?' disturb you. But you may be interested to know that I am single-handedly responsible for the evolved shape of the animal you came to know in later centuries as a giraffe. And I tried to learn to fly, do you believe me? Tell me, said Arthur. I'll tell you later. I'll just mention that the guide says... The, the guide, the hitchhiker's guide to the galaxy, you remember? Yes, I remember throwing it into the river. Yes, said Ford, but I fished it out again. You didn't tell me. I didn't want you to throw it in again. "'Fair enough,' admitted Arthur. "'It says—' "'What?' "'The guide says—' "'The guide says that there is an art to flying,' said Ford, "'or rather a knack. 
The knack lies in learning how to throw yourself at the ground and miss. He smiled weakly. He pointed at the knees of his trousers and held his arms up to show the elbows. They were all torn and worn through. I haven't done very well so far, he said. He stuck out his hand. I'm very glad to see you again, Arthur, he added. Arthur shook his head in a sudden access of emotion and bewilderment. I haven't seen anyone for years, he said. Not anyone. I can hardly even remember how to speak. I keep forgetting words. I practice, you see. I, I practice by talking to... talking to... Um, Oh, now, what are those things people think you're mad if you talk to? Like like George the Third, Kings, suggested Ford. No, 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 said Arthur. The things he used to talk to. We're surrounded by them, for heaven's sake. I've planted hundreds myself. They all died. Trees. I practice by talking to trees. What's that for? Ford still had his hand stuck out. Arthur looked at it with incomprehension. Shake, prompted Ford. Arthur did, nervously at first, as if it might turn out to be a fish. Then he grasped it vigorously with both hands in an overwhelming flood of relief. He shook it and shook it. After a while, Ford found it necessary to disengage. They climbed to the top of a nearby outcrop of rock and surveyed the scene around them. "'What happened to the Golga Frinchams?' said Ford. Arthur shrugged. "'A lot of them didn't make it through the winter three years ago,' he said, "'and the few who remained in the spring said they needed a holiday and set off on a raft.' History says they must have survived. Huh, said Ford. Well, well. He stuck his hands on his hips and looked around again at the empty world. Suddenly there was about Ford a sense of energy and purpose. We're going, he said excitedly and shivered with energy. Where? How? said Arthur. I don't know, said Ford, but I just feel that the time is right. Things are going to happen. We're on our way. He lowered his voice to a whisper. I have detected, he said, disturbances in the wash. He gazed keenly into the distance and looked as if he'd quite like the wind to blow his hair back dramatically at that point, but the wind was busy fooling around with some leaves a little way off. Arthur asked him to repeat what he'd just said because he hadn't quite taken his meaning. Ford repeated it. The wash? said Arthur. The space-time wash, said Ford and as the wind blew briefly past at that moment, he bared his teeth into it. Arthur nodded, and then cleared his throat. Uh, are we talking about, he asked cautiously, um, some sort of Vogon laundromat, or what are we talking about? It is, said Ford, in the space-time continuum. Ah, nodded Arthur. Is he? Is he? He pushed his hands into the pocket of his dressing gown and looked knowledgeably into the distance. What? said Ford. Uh, who, uh, said Arthur, is Eddie, then, uh, exactly, then? Ford looked angrily at him. Will you listen? he snapped. I have been listening, said Arthur, but I'm not sure it's helped. Ford grasped him by the lapels of his dressing gown and spoke to him as slowly and distinctly and patiently as if he was somebody from a telephone company accounts department. There seem, he said, to be some pools, he said, of instability he said, in the fabric, he said. Arthur looked foolishly at the cloth of his dressing gown where Ford was holding it. Ford swept on before Arthur could turn the foolish look into a foolish remark. In the fabric of space-time, he said. Ah, that, said Arthur. Yes, that, confirmed Ford. They stood there alone on a hill on prehistoric earth and stared each other resolutely in the face. And it's done what? said Arthur. It, said Ford, has developed pools of instability. Has it, said Arthur, his eyes not wavering for a moment. It has, said Ford, with a similar degree of ocular immobility. Good, said Arthur. See, said Ford. No, said Arthur. There was a quiet pause. The difficulty with this conversation, said Arthur, after a sort of pondering look had crawled slowly across his face like a mountaineer negotiating a tricky outcrop, is that it's very different from most of the ones I've had of late, uh, which, as I explained, have mostly been with trees. They weren't like this, except perhaps some of the ones I've had with elms, which sometimes got a bit bogged down. Arthur, said Ford. Hello, yes, said Arthur. Just believe everything I tell you, and it will all be very, very simple. Uh, well, I'm not sure I believe that. They sat down and composed their thoughts. Ford got out his sub-ether sensomatic. 
It was making vague humming noises, and a tiny light on it was flickering faintly. Flat battery? said Arthur. No, said Ford. There is a moving disturbance in the fabric of space-time, an eddy, a pool of instability, and it's somewhere in our vicinity. Where? Ford moved the device in a slow, lightly bobbing semicircle. Suddenly, the light flashed. There! said Ford, shooting out his arm. There, behind that sofa! Arthur looked. Much to his surprise, there was a velvet, paisley-covered Chesterfield sofa in the field in front of them. He boggled intelligently at it. Shrewd questions sprang into his mind. Why, he said, is there a sofa in that field? I told you, shouted Ford, leaping to his feet. Eddie's in the space-time continuum. And this is his sofa, is it? asked Arthur, struggling to his feet, and he hoped, though not very optimistically, to his senses. Arthur, shouted Ford at him, that sofa is there because of the space-time instability I've been trying to get your terminally softened brain to get to grips with. It's been washed up out of the continuum. It's space-time jetsam. It doesn't matter what it is. We've got to catch it. It's our only way out of here. He scrambled rapidly down the rocky outcrop and made off across the field. Catch it, muttered Arthur, then frowned in bemusement as he saw that the Chesterfield was lazily bobbing and wafting away across the grass. With a whoop of utterly unexpected delight, he leapt down the rock and plunged off in hectic pursuit of Ford Prefect and the irrational piece of furniture. They careered wildly through the grass, leaping, laughing, shouting instructions to each other to head the thing off this way or that way. The sun shone dreamily on the swaying grass, tiny field animals scattered crazily in their wake. Arthur felt happy. He was terribly pleased that the day was for once working out so much according to plan. Only twenty minutes ago he had decided that he would go mad, and now here he was already chasing a Chesterfield sofa across the fields of prehistoric earth. The sofa bobbed this way and that, and seemed simultaneously to be as solid as the trees as it drifted past some of them, and hazy as a billowing dream as it floated like a ghost through others. Ford and Arthur pounded chaotically after it, but it dodged and weaved, as if following its own complex mathematical topography, which it was. Still they pursued it, still it danced and span, and suddenly turned and dipped as if crossing the lip of a catastrophe graph, and they were practically on top of it. With a heave and a shout, they leapt on it, the sun winked out, and they fell through a sickening nothingness and emerged unexpectedly in the middle of the pitch at Lord's Cricket Ground, St. John's Wood, London, towards the end of the last test match of the Australian series in the year 1980-something, with England needing only 28 runs to win. Chapter 3 Important Facts from Galactic History Number 1 Reproduced from the Sidereal Daily Mentioner's Book of Popular Galactic History the night sky over the planet Cricket is the least interesting sight in the entire universe. Chapter 4 It was a charming and delightful day at Lord's as Ford and Arthur tumbled haphazardly out of a space-time anomaly and hit the immaculate turf rather hard. The applause of the crowd was tremendous. It wasn't for them, but instinctively they bowed anyway, which was fortunate because the small red heavy ball which the crowd actually had been applauding whistled mere millimetres over Arthur's head. In the crowd, a man collapsed. They threw themselves back to the ground, which seemed to spin hideously around them. What was that? hissed Arthur. Something red, His Ford back at him. Where are we? Uh, somewhere green. Shapes, muttered Arthur. I need shapes. The applause of the crowd had been rapidly succeeded by gasps of astonishment and the awkward titters of hundreds of people who could not yet make up their minds about whether to believe what they'd just seen or not. "'This your sofa?' said a voice. "'What was that?' whispered Ford. Arthur looked up. "'Something blue,' he said. "'Shape?' said Ford. Arthur looked again. "'It is shaped,' he hissed at Ford, with his brow savagely furrowed, like a policeman.' They remained crouched there for a few moments, frowning deeply. The blue thing, shaped like a policeman, tapped them both on the shoulders. "'Come on, you two, the shape said. "'Let's be having it.' These words had an electrifying effect on Arthur. 
He leapt to his feet like an author hearing the phone ring, and shot a series of startled glances at the panorama around him, which had suddenly settled down into something of quite terrifying ordinariness. "'Where did he get this from?' he yelled at the policeman shape. "'What did you say?' said the startled shape. "'This is Lord's Cricket Ground, isn't it?' snapped Arthur. "'Where did he find it? How did he get it here? I think,' he added, clasping his hand to his brow, "'that I'd better calm down.' He squatted down abruptly in front of Ford. "'It is a policeman,' he said. "'What do we do?' Ford shrugged. "'What do you want to do?' he said. "'I want you,' said Ford, "'to tell me that I have been dreaming for the last five years.' Ford shrugged again and obliged. "'He'd been dreaming for the last five years,' he said. Arthur got to his feet. "'It's all right, officer,' he said. "'I've been dreaming for the last five years. "'Ask him,' he added, pointed to Ford. "'He was in it.' Having said this, he sauntered off towards the edge of the pitch, brushing down his dressing gown. He then noticed his dressing gown and stopped. He stared at it. He flung himself at the policeman. "'So where did I get these clothes from?' he howled. He collapsed and lay twitching on the grass. Ford shook his head. "'He's had a bad two million years,' he said to the policeman. And together they heaved Arthur onto the sofa and carried him off the pitch and were only briefly hampered by the sudden disappearance of the sofa on the way. Reactions to all this from the crowd were many and various. Most of them couldn't cope with watching it and listened to it on the radio instead. "'Well, this is an interesting incident, Brian,' said one radio commentator to another. "'I don't think there have been any mysterious materialisations on the pitch. "'Oh, since... well, I don't think there have been any at all, have there, uh, that I recall? "'Edgbaston, 1932? "'Ah, now what happened then?' Uh, well, Peter, I think it was Cantor facing Wilcox coming up to bowl from the pavilion end when a spectator suddenly ran straight across the pitch. There was a pause whilst the first commentator considered this. Yes, he said, um, uh, yes, there's, there's nothing actually very mysterious about that, is there? He didn't actually materialise, did he? Just, just ran on. No, that's true, but he did claim to have seen something materialise on the pitch. Ah, did he? Yes, an alligator, I think, of some description. Ah, and had anyone else noticed it? Apparently not, and no one was able to get a very detailed description from him, so only the most perfunctory search was made. And what happened to the man? Well, I think someone offered to take him off and give him some lunch, but he explained that he'd already had a rather good one, so the matter was dropped and Warwickshire went on to win by three wickets. So, uh, not very like this current instance. For those of you who just tuned in, you may be interested to know that there are two men, two rather scruffily attired men, and indeed a sofa, a Chesterfield, I think. Yes, a Chesterfield. have uh, just materialised here in the middle of Lord's Cricket Ground, but I don't think they meant any harm. They've been very good-natured about it, and, uh, sorry, can I interrupt you for a moment, Peter, and say that the sofa has just vanished? So it has. Well, that's one mystery less. Still, it's definitely one for the record books, I think, particularly occurring at this dramatic moment in play. England now needing only 24 runs to win the series. The men are leaving the pitch in the company of a police officer, and I think everyone's settling down now, and play is about to resume. Now, sir, said the policeman, after they made a passage through the curious crowd and laid Arthur's peacefully inert body on a blanket. Perhaps you'd care to tell me who you are, where you came from, and what that little scene was all about. Ford looked at the ground for a moment, as if steadying himself for something. Then he straightened up and aimed a look at the policeman, which hit him with the full force of every inch of the six light-years distance between Earth and Ford's home near Beetlejuice. "'All right,' said Ford very quietly. "'I'll tell you.' "'Yes, well, uh, that won't be necessary,' said the policeman hurriedly. "'Just don't let whatever it was happen again.' The policeman turned round and wandered off in search of anyone who wasn't from Beetlejuice. Fortunately, the ground was full of them. Arthur's consciousness approached his body as if from a great distance, and reluctantly. It had had some bad times in there. Slowly, nervously, it entered, and settled down into its accustomed position. Arthur sat up. "'Where am I?' he said. "'Lord Scricket Ground,' said Ford. "'Fine,' said Arthur, and his consciousness stepped out again for a quick breather. His body flopped back on the grass. Ten minutes later, hunched over a cup of tea in the refreshment tent, the colour started to come back to his haggard face. "'How are you feeling?' said Ford. "'I'm home,' said Arthur hoarsely. He closed his eyes and greedily inhaled the steam from his tea as if it was, well, as far as Arthur was concerned, as if it was tea, which it was. "'I'm home,' he repeated. "'Home. It's England. It's... Today, the nightmare is over. He opened his eyes again and smiled serenely. I'm where I belong, he said in an emotional whisper. 
There are two things I feel I should tell you, said Ford, tossing a copy of The Guardian over the table at him. I'm home, said Arthur. Y yes, said Ford. One is, he said, pointing at the date at the top of the paper, that the earth will be demolished in two days' time. I'm home, said Arthur. Tea, he said. Cricket, he added with pleasure. Mown grass, wooden benches, white linen jackets, beer cans. Slowly he began to focus on the newspaper. He cocked his head on one side with a slight frown. I've seen that one before, he said. His eyes wandered slowly up to the date, which Ford was idly tapping at. His face froze for a second or two, and then began to do that terribly slow crashing trick which Arctic ice flows do so spectacularly in the spring. And the other thing, said Ford, is that you appear to have a bone in your beard. He tossed back his tea. Outside the refreshment tent, the sun was shining on a happy crowd. It shone on white hats and red faces. It shone on ice lollies and melted them. It shone on the tears of small children whose ice lollies had just melted and fallen off the stick. It shone on the trees. It flashed off whirling cricket bats. It gleamed off the utterly extraordinary object which was parked behind the sight screens and which nobody appeared to have noticed. It beamed on Ford and Arthur as they emerged blinking from the refreshment tent and surveyed the scene around them. Arthur was shaking. Perhaps, he said, I should... No, said Ford sharply. What, said Arthur, don't try and phone yourself up at home. How did you know? Ford shrugged. But why not, said Arthur. People who talk to themselves on the phone, said Ford, never learn anything to their advantage. But look, said Ford. He picked up an imaginary phone and dialed an imaginary dial. Hello, he said into the imaginary mouthpiece. Is that Arthur Dent? Ah, oh, hello, yes. This is Arthur Dent speaking. Don't hang up. He looked at the imaginary phone in disappointment. He hung up, he said, shrugged and put the imaginary phone neatly back on its imaginary hook. This is not my first temporal anomaly, he added. A glummer look replaced the already glum look on Arthur Dent's face. So we're not home and dry, he said. We could not even be said, replied Ford, to be home and vigorously toweling ourselves off. The game continued. The bowler approached the wicket at a lope, a trot, and then a run. He suddenly exploded in a flurry of arms and legs, out of which flew a ball. The batsman swung and thwacked it behind him over the sight screens. Ford's eyes followed the trajectory of the ball and jogged momentarily. He stiffened. He looked along the flight path of the ball again, and his eyes twitched again. "'This isn't my towel,' said Arthur, who was rummaging in his rabbit-skin bag. "'Shh!' said Ford. He screwed his eyes up in concentration. "'I had a Golgofrinchen jogging towel,' continued Arthur. "'It was blue with yellow stars on it. This isn't it.' "'Shh!' said Ford again. He covered one eye and looked with the other. "'This one's pink,' said Arthur. "'It isn't yours, is it?' "'I would like you to shut up about your towel.' said Ford. It isn't my towel, insisted Arthur. That is the point I'm trying to... And the time at which I would like you to shut up about it, continued Ford, in a low growl, is now. All right, said Arthur, starting to stuff it back into the primitively stitched rabbit skin bag. I realize that it is probably not important in the cosmic scale of things. It's just odd. That's all. A pink towel suddenly, instead of a blue one with yellow stars. Ford was beginning to behave rather strangely or rather, not actually beginning to behave strangely, but beginning to behave in a way that was strangely different from the other strange ways in which he more regularly behaved. What he was doing was this. Regardless of the bemused stares it was provoking from his fellow members of the crowd gathered round the pitch, he was waving his hands in sharp movements across his face, ducking down behind some people, leaping up behind others, then standing still and blinking a lot. After a moment or two of this, he started to stalk forward slowly and stealthily, wearing a puzzled frown of concentration, like a leopard that is not sure whether it's just seen a half-empty tin of cat food half a mile away across a hot and dusty plain. "'This isn't my bag, either,' said Arthur suddenly. Ford's spell of concentration was broken. He turned angrily on Arthur. "'I wasn't talking about my towel,' said Arthur. "'We've established that that isn't mine. "'It's just that the bag into which I was putting the towel, "'which is not mine, is also not mine, "'though it is extraordinarily similar. "'Now, personally, I think that that is extremely odd, "'especially as the bag was one I'd made myself on prehistoric earth. 
These are also not my stones, he added, pulling a few flat grey stones out of the bag. I was making a collection of interesting stones, and these are clearly very dull ones. A roar of excitement thrilled through the crowd and obliterated whatever it was that Ford said in reply to this piece of information. The cricket ball, which had excited this reaction, fell out of the sky and dropped neatly into Arthur's mysterious rabbit-skin bag. Now, I would say that was also a very curious event, said Arthur, rapidly closing the bag and pretending to look for the ball on the ground. I don't think it's here, he said to the small boys who immediately clustered round him to join in the search. It probably rolled off somewhere. Over there, I expect. He pointed vaguely in the direction in which he wished they would push off. One of the boys looked at him quizzically. You all right, said the boy. No, said Arthur. Then why have you got bone in your beard? said the boy. I'm training it to like being wherever it's put. Arthur prided himself on saying this. It was, he thought, exactly the sort of thing that would entertain and stimulate young minds. Oh, said the small boy, putting his head on one side and thinking about it. What's your name? Dent, said Arthur. Arthur Dent. You're a jerk, Dent, said the boy. A complete asshole. The boy looked past him at something else to show that he wasn't in any particular hurry to run away, and then wandered off scratching his nose. Suddenly Arthur remembered that the earth was going to be demolished again in two days' time, and just as once didn't feel too bad about it. Play resumed with a new ball. The sun continued to shine, and Ford continued to jump up and down, shaking his head and blinking. "'Something's on your mind, isn't it?' said Arthur. "'I think,' said Ford, in a tone of voice which Arthur now recognised as one which presaged something utterly unintelligible, "'that there's an S.E.P. over there.' He pointed. Curiously enough, the direction he pointed in was not the one in which he was looking. Arthur looked in the one direction, which was towards the sight screens, and in the other, which was at the field of play. He nodded. He shrugged. He shrugged again. A what? he said. An S.E.P. An S-what? E.P. And what's that? Somebody else's problem, said Ford. Ah, oh, good, said Arthur, and relaxed. He had no idea what that was all about, but at least it seemed to be over. It wasn't. Over there, said Ford, again pointing at the sight screens and looking at the pitch. Where, said Arthur. There, said Ford. I see, said Arthur, who didn't. Y you do, said Ford. What, said Arthur. Can you see, said Ford patiently, the S.E.P.? I thought you said that was someone else's problem. That's right. Arthur nodded slowly, carefully, and with an air of immense stupidity. And I want to know, said Ford, if you can see it. You do? Yes. What, said Arthur, does it look like? Well, how should I know, you fool, shouted Ford. If you can see it, you tell me. Arthur experienced that dull, throbbing sensation just behind the temples, which was a hallmark of so many of his conversations with Ford. His brain lurked like a frightened puppy in its kennel. Ford took him by the arm. An S.E.P., he said, is something we can't see or don't see, or our brain doesn't let us see because we think that it's somebody else's problem. That's what S.E.P. means, somebody else's problem. The brain just edits it out. It's like a blind spot. If you look at it directly, you won't see it unless you know precisely what it is. Your only hope is to catch it by surprise out of the corner of your eye. Ah, said Arthur. Then that's why... Yes, said Ford, who knew what Arthur was going to say. You've been jumping up and... Yes, down and blinking. Yes, and I think you've got the message. I can see it, said Arthur. It's a spaceship. For a moment, Arthur was stunned by the reaction this revelation provoked. A roar erupted from the crowd, and from every direction, people running, shouting, yelling, tumbling over each other in a tumult of confusion. He stumbled back in astonishment and glanced fearfully around. Then he glanced around again in even greater astonishment. Exciting, isn't it? said an apparition. The apparition wobbled in front of Arthur's eyes, though the truth of the matter is probably that Arthur's eyes were wobbling in front of the apparition. His mouth wobbled as well. His mouth said, I think your team has just won, said the apparition. Repeated Arthur, and punctuated each wobble with a prod at four prefects back. Ford was staring at the tumult and trepidation. "'You are English, aren't you?' said the apparition. 
Yes, said Arthur. Well, your team must, I say, have just won the match. At, uh, it means they retain the ashes. You must be very pleased. I must say I'm rather fond of cricket, though I wouldn't like anyone else outside this planet to hear me saying that. Uh, oh, dear, no. The apparition gave what looked as if it might have been a mischievous grin but it was hard to tell because the sun was directly behind him, creating a blinding halo around his head and illuminating his silver hair and beard in a way which was awesome, dramatic, and hard to reconcile with mischievous grins. Still, he said, it'll all be over in a couple of days, won't it? Though, as I said to you when we last met, I was very sorry about it. Still, whatever will have been will have been. Arthur tried to speak, but gave up the unequal struggle. He prodded forward again. I thought something terrible had happened, said Ford, but it's just the end of the game. We ought to get out. Oh, hello, Slarty Bartfast. What are you doing here? Oh, pottering, pottering, said the old man gravely. Is that your ship? Can you give us a lift anywhere? Patience, patience, the old man admonished. OK, said Ford, it's just that this planet's going to be demolished pretty soon. I know that, said Slarty Bartfast, and, well, I just wanted to make that point, said Ford. The point is taken. And if you feel that you really want to hang around a cricket pitch at this point... I do. Then it's your ship. It is. I suppose. Ford turned away sharply at this point. Hello, slotty Bartfast, said Arthur at last. Hello, Earth Man, said slotty Bartfast. After all, said Ford, we can only die once. The old man ignored this and stared keenly onto the pitch, with eyes which seemed alive with expressions that had no apparent bearing on what was happening out there. What was happening was that the crowd was gathering itself into a wide circle around the centre of the pitch. What Slarty Bartfast saw in it, he alone knew. Ford was humming irritably. It's just, he burst out at last, that if we don't go soon, we might get caught up in the middle of it all again, and there's nothing that depresses me more than seeing a planet being destroyed, except possibly still being on it when it happens. Or, he added in an undertone, hanging around cricket matches. Patience, said Slarty Bartfast again. Great things are afoot. That's what you said last time we met, said Arthur. They were, said Slarty Bartfast. Well, yes, that's true, admitted Arthur. All, however, that seemed to be afoot was a ceremony of some kind. It was being specially staged for the benefit of TV rather than spectators, and all they could gather about it from where they were standing was what they heard from a nearby radio. Ford was aggressively uninterested. He fretted as he heard it explained that the ashes were about to be presented to the captain of the English team out there on the pitch, fumed when told that this was because they had now won them for the nth time, positively barked with annoyance at the information that the ashes were the remains of a cricket stump, and when, further to this, he was asked to contend with the fact that the cricket stump in question had been burnt in Melbourne, Australia, in 1882, to signify the death of English cricket, he rounded on Slarty Bartfast with a deep breath, but didn't have a chance to say anything because the old man wasn't there. He was marching out onto the pitch with terrible purpose in his gait. His hair, beard, and robes swept behind him, looking very much as Moses would have done if Sinai had been a well-cut lawn, instead of, as it was more usually represented, a fiery smoking mountain. He said to meet him at his ship, said Arthur. What in the name of Zarking Fardwark says the old fool doing exploded, Ford? "'Meeting us at his ship in two minutes,' said Arthur, with a shrug, which indicated total abdication of thought. They started off towards it. Strange sounds reached their ears. They tried not to listen, but could not help noticing that Slarty Bartfast was querulously demanding that he be given the silver urn containing the ashes, as they were, he said, vitally important for the past, present, and future safety of the galaxy, and that this is causing wild hilarity.' They resolved to ignore it. What happened next, they could not ignore. With a noise like a hundred thousand people suddenly saying, Whoop! A steely white spaceship suddenly seemed to create itself out of nothing in the air directly above the cricket pitch and hung there with infinite menace and a slight hum. Then for a while it did nothing, as if it expected everybody else to go about their normal business and not to mind it just hanging there. Then it did something quite extraordinary, or rather, it opened up and let something quite extraordinary come out of it. Eleven quite extraordinary things. They were robots. 
white robots. What was most extraordinary about them was that they appeared to have come dressed for the occasion. Not only were they white, but they carried what appeared to be cricket bats. And not only that, but they also carried what appeared to be cricket balls. And not only that, but they wore white ribbing pads round the lower parts of their legs. These last were extraordinary because they appeared to contain jets, which allowed these curiously civilized robots to fly down from their hovering spaceship and start to kill people, which is what they did. Hello, said Arthur. Something seems to be happening. Get to the ship, shouted Ford. I don't want to know. Just get to the ship. He started to run. I don't want to know. I don't want to see. I don't want to hear. He yelled as he ran. This is not my planet. I didn't choose to be here. I don't want to be involved. Just get me out of here and get me to a party with people I can relate to. Smoke and flame billowed from the pitch. Well, the supernatural brigade certainly seems to be out in force here today, burbled the radio happily to itself. What I need, shouted Ford by way of clarifying his previous remarks, is a strong drink and a peer group. He continued to run, pausing only for a moment to grab Arthur's arm and drag him along with him. Arthur had adopted his normal crisis role, which was to stand with his mouth hanging open and let it all wash over him. They're playing cricket, muttered Arthur, stumbling along after Ford. I, I swear they're playing cricket. I do not know why they're doing this, but that is what they're doing. They're not just killing people, they're sending them up. He shouted, Ford, they're sending us up. It would have been hard to disbelieve this without knowing a great deal more about galactic history than Arthur had so far managed to pick up in his travels. The ghostly but violent shapes that could be seen moving within the thick pall of smoke seemed to be performing a series of bizarre parodies of batting strokes, the difference being that every ball they struck with their bats exploded wherever it landed. The very first one of these had dispelled Arthur's initial reaction that the whole thing might just be a publicity stunt by Australian margarine manufacturers. And then, as suddenly as it had all started, it was over. The eleven white robots ascended through the seething cloud in a tight formation, and with a few last flashes of flame, entered the bowels of their hovering white ship, which, with the noise of a hundred thousand people saying, Foop! promptly vanished into the thin air out of which it had whooped. For a moment there was a terrible stunned silence, and then out of the drifting smoke emerged the pale figure of Slarty Bartfast, looking even more like Moses, because in spite of the continued absence of the mountain, he was at least now striding across a fiery and smoking well-mown lawn. He stared wildly about him until he saw the hurrying figures of Arthur Dent and Ford Prefect forcing their way through the frightened crowd, which was for the moment busy stampeding in the opposite direction. The crowd was clearly thinking to itself about what an unusual day this is turning out to be, and not really knowing which way, if any, to turn. Slarty Bartfast was gesticulating urgently at Ford and Arthur, and shouting at them as the three of them gradually converged on his ship still parked behind the sight screens, and still apparently unnoticed by the crowd stampeding past it, who presumably had enough of their own problems to cope with at that time. Maybe gobble, wobble, wobble, shouted Slarty Bartfast in his thin, tremulous voice. What did he say? panted Ford as he elbowed his way onwards. Arthur shook his head. They've something or other, he said. They've table, wobble, wobble, shouted Slarty Bartfast again. Ford and Arthur shook their heads at each other. It sounds urgent, said Arthur. He stopped and shouted. What? They've gobble wobble fashes! cried Slarty Bartfast, still waving at them. He says, said Arthur, they've taken the ashes. That is what I think he says. They ran on. The, said Ford. Ashes, said Arthur tersely. The burnt remains of a cricket stump. It's a, a trophy that, he was panting, is, is apparently what they... "'Have come and taken.' "'He shook his head very slightly, "'as if he was trying to get his brain "'to settle down lower in his skull. "'Strange thing to want to tell us,' snapped Ford. "'Strange thing to take. Strange ship. "'They had arrived at it. "'The second strangest thing about the ship "'was watching the somebody else's problem field at work. "'They could now clearly see the ship for what it was, "'simply because they knew it was there.' It was quite apparent, however, that nobody else could. 
It wasn't because it was actually invisible or anything hyper-impossible like that. The technology involved in making anything invisible is so infinitely complex that 999,999,999,999 times out of a billion, it is much simpler and more effective just to take the thing away and do without it. The ultra-famous scientomagician Efrafax of Wug once bet his life that, given a year, he could render the great mega-mountain Magramal entirely invisible. Having spent most of the year juggling around with immense luxo valves and refracto nullifiers and spectrum bypassomatics, he realised with nine hours to go that he wasn't going to make it. So he and his friends, and his friends' friends, and his friends' friends' friends, and his friends' 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 friends, and some rather less good friends of theirs who happened to own a major stellar trucking company, put in what is now widely recognised as being the hardest night's work in history, and sure enough, on the following day, Magramal was no longer visible. Ephrafax lost his bet, and therefore his life, simply because some pedantic adjudicating official noticed, A, that when walking around the area that Magramal ought to be, he didn't trip over or break his nose on anything, and B, a suspicious-looking extra moon. The somebody else's problem field is much simpler and more effective, and what is more can be run for over a hundred years on a single torch battery. This is because it relies on people's natural predisposition not to see anything they don't want to, weren't expecting or can't explain. If Ephrafax had painted the mountain pink and erected a cheap and simple somebody else's problem field on it, then people would have simply walked past the mountain, around it, even over it, and would simply never have noticed that the thing was there. And this is precisely what was happening with Slarty Bartfast's ship. It wasn't pink, but if it had been, that would have been the least of its visual problems, and people were simply ignoring it like anything. The most extraordinary thing about it was that it looked only partly like a spaceship with guidance fins, rocket engines, and escape hatches, and so on, and a great deal like a small, upended Italian bistro. Ford and Arthur gazed at it with wonderment and deeply offended sensibilities. Yes, I know said Slarty Bartfast, hurrying up to them at that point, breathless and agitated. Uh, but there is a reason. Come, we must go. The ancient nightmare is come again. Doom confronts us all. We must leave at once. I fancy somewhere sunny, said Ford. Ford and Arthur followed Slarty Bartfast into the ship, and were so perplexed by what they saw inside it that they were totally unaware of what happened next outside. A spaceship, yet another one, but this one sleek and silver, descended from the sky onto the pitch, quietly, without fuss, its long legs unlocking in a smooth ballet of technology. It landed gently. It extended a short ramp. A tall, grey-green figure marched briskly out and approached the small knot of people who were gathered at the centre of the pitch, tending to the casualties of the recent bizarre massacre. It moved people aside with quiet, understated authority, and came at last to a man lying in a desperate pool of blood, clearly now beyond the reach of any earthly medicine, breathing, coughing his last. The figure knelt down quietly beside him. "'Arthur Philip Deodat?' asked the figure. The man, with horrified confusion in his eyes, nodded feebly. "'You're a no-good Dumbo nothing,' whispered the creature. I thought you should know that before you went. Chapter 5 Important Facts from Galactic History Number 2 Reproduced from the Sidereal Daily Mentioner's Book of Popular Galactic History Since this galaxy began, vast civilization have risen and fallen, risen and fallen, risen and fallen so often that it's quite tempting to think that life in the galaxy must be a something akin to seasick, space-sick, time-sick, history-sick, or some such thing, and be stupid. Chapter 6 It seemed to Arthur as if the whole sky suddenly just stood aside and let them through. It seemed to him that the atoms of his brain and the atoms of the cosmos were streaming through each other. It seemed to him that he was blown on the wind of the universe and that the wind was him. It seemed to him that he was one of the thoughts of the universe, and that the universe was a thought of his. It seemed to the people at Lord's Cricket Ground that another North London restaurant had just come and gone, as they so often do, and that this was somebody else's problem. What happened? 
whispered Arthur in considerable awe. "'We took off,' said Slarty Bartfast. Arthur lay in startled stillness on the acceleration couch. He wasn't certain whether he had just got space sickness or religion. "'Nice mover,' said Forge, in an unsuccessful attempt to disguise the degree to which he had been impressed by what Slarty Bartfast's ship had just done. "'Show him about the decor.' For a moment or two the old man didn't reply. He was staring at the instruments with the air of one who was trying to convert Fahrenheit to centigrade in his head while his house is burning down. Then his brow cleared, and he stared for a moment at the wide panoramic screen in front of him, which displayed a bewildering complexity of stars streaming like silver threads around them. His lips moved as if he was trying to spell something. Suddenly his eyes darted an alarm back to his instruments, but then his expression merely subsided into a steady frown. He looked back up at the screen. He felt his own pulse. His frown deepened for a moment. Then he relaxed. "'It's a mistake to try and understand machines,' he said. "'They only worry me. What did you say?' Uh, "'Decor,' said Ford. "'Pity about it.' "'Deep in the fundamental heart of mind and universe,' said Slarty Bartfast, "'there is a reason.' Ford glanced sharply around. He clearly thought this was taking an optimistic view of things. The interior of the flight deck was dark green, dark red, dark brown, cramped and moodily lit. Inexplicably, the resemblance to a small Italian bistro had failed to end at the hatchway. Small pools of light picked out pot plants, glazed tiles, and all sorts of little unidentifiable brass things. Raffia-wrapped bottles lurked hideously in the shadows. The instruments which had occupied Slarty Bartfast's attention seemed to be mounted in the bottom of bottles which were set in concrete. Ford reached out and touched it. Fake concrete. Plastic. Fake bottles set in fake concrete. The fundamental heart of mind and universe can take a running jump, he thought to himself. This is rubbish. On the other hand, it could not be denied that the way the ship had moved had made the heart of gold seem like an electric pram. He swung himself off the couch. He brushed himself down. He looked at Arthur, who was singing quietly to himself. He looked at the screen and recognised nothing. He looked at Slarty Bartfast. How far do we just travel? he said. About, said Slarty Bartfast, about two-thirds of the way across the galactic disk, I would say. Roughly, uh, yes, roughly two-thirds, I think. It's a strange thing, said Arthur quietly that the further and faster one travels across the universe, the more one's position in it seems to be largely immaterial, and one is filled with the profound, or rather, emptied of a... a yes, very strange, said Ford. Where are we going? We are going, said Slarty Bartfast, to confront an ancient nightmare of the universe. And where are you going to drop us off? I will need your help. Tough. Look, there's some way you can take us where we can have fun. I'm trying to think of it. We can get drunk and maybe listen to some extremely evil music. Hold on, I'll look it up. He dug out his copy of The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy and zipped through those parts of the index, primarily concerned with sex and drugs and rock and roll. A curse has arisen from the mists of time, said Slarty Bartfast. Yes, I expect so, said Ford. Hey, he said, lighting accidentally on one particular reference entry. Eccentrica Glumbitz. Did you ever meet her? The triple-breasted whore of Eroticon 6. Some people say her erogenous zones start some four miles from her actual body. Me, I disagree. I say five. A curse, said Slotty Bartfast, which will engulf the galaxy in fire and destruction and possibly bring the universe to a premature doom. I mean it, he added. Hmm, sounds like a bad time, said Ford. With luck, I'll be drunk enough not to notice. Here, he said, stabbing his finger at the screen on the guide, would be a really wicked place to go, and I think we should. What do you say, Arthur? Stop mumbling mantras and pay attention. There's some important stuff you're missing here. Arthur pushed himself up from his couch and shook his head. Where are we going? he said. To confront an ancient... Oh, can it, said Ford. Arthur, we're going to go out into the galaxy and have some fun. Is that an idea you can cope with? "'What's Slarty Bartfast looking so anxious about?' said Arthur. "'Oh, nothing,' said Ford. "'Doom,' said Slarty Bartfast. "'Come,' he added with sudden authority. "'There is much I must show and tell you.' He walked towards a green wrought-iron spiral staircase set incomprehensibly in the middle of the flight deck and started to ascend. Arthur, with a frown, followed. Ford slung the guide sullenly back into its satchel. 
My doctor says that I have a malformed public duty gland and a natural deficiency in moral fibre, he muttered to himself, and that I am therefore excused from saving universes. Nevertheless, he stomped up the stairs behind them. What they found upstairs was just stupid, or so it seemed, and Ford shook his head, buried his face in his hands, and slumped against a pot plant, crushing it against the wall. The central computational area, said Slarty Bartfast, unperturbed. This is where every calculation affecting the ship in any way is performed. Yes, I know what it looks like, but it is, in fact, a complex four-dimensional topographical map of a series of highly complex mathematical functions. It looks like a joke, said Arthur. I know what it looks like, said Slarty Bartfast, and went into it. As he did so, Arthur had a sudden vague flash of what it might mean, but he refused to believe it. The universe could not possibly work like that, he thought to himself. Could not possibly. That, he thought to himself, would be as absurd as... absurd as... He terminated that line of thinking. Most of the really absurd things he could think of had already happened. And this was one of them. It was a large glass cage or box. In fact, a room. In it was a table, a long one. Around it were gathered about a dozen chairs of the Bentwood style. On it was a tablecloth a grubby red-and-white check tablecloth, scarred with the occasional cigarette burn, each presumably at a precisely calculated mathematical position. And on the tablecloth sat some dozen half-eaten Italian meals, hedged about with half-eaten breadsticks and half-drunk glasses of wine, and toyed with listlessly by robots. It was all completely artificial. The robot customers were attended by a robot waiter, a robot wine-waiter, and a robot maitre d'. The furniture was artificial, the tablecloth artificial, and each particular piece of food was clearly capable of exhibiting all the mechanical characteristics of, say, a polysopreso, without actually being one. And all participated in a little dance together, a complex routine involving the manipulation of menus, bill pads, wallets, checkbooks, credit cards, watches, pencils and paper napkins, which seemed to be hovering constantly on the edge of violence, but never actually getting anywhere. Slarty Bartfast hurried in, and then appeared to pass the time of day quite idly with the maitre d', whilst one of the customer robots, an auto Rory, slid slowly under the table, mentioning what he intended to do to some guy over some girl. Slarty Bartfast took over the seat which had been thus vacated and passed a shrewd eye over the menu. The tempo of the routine around the table seemed somehow imperceptibly to quicken. Arguments broke out. People attempted to prove things on napkins. They waved fiercely at each other and attempted to examine each other's pieces of chicken. The waiter's hand began to move on the bill pad more quickly than a human hand could manage, and then more quickly than a human eye could follow. The pace accelerated. Soon, an extraordinary and insistent politeness overwhelmed the group. And seconds later, it seemed that a moment of consensus was suddenly achieved. A new vibration thrilled through the ship. Slarty Bartfast emerged from the glass room. Bistromathics, he said, the most powerful computational force known to parascience. Come to the room of informational illusions. He swept past and carried them bewildered in his wake. Chapter 7 The bistromathic drive is a wonderful new method of crossing vast interstellar distances without all that dangerous mucking about with improbability factors. Bistromathics itself is simply a revolutionary new way of understanding the behaviour of numbers. Just as Einstein observed that time was not an absolute, but depended on the observer's movement in space, and that space was not an absolute, but depended on the observer's movement in time, so it is now realised that numbers are not absolute, but depend on the observer's movement in restaurants. The first non-absolute number is the number of people for whom the table is reserved. This will vary during the course of the first three telephone calls to the restaurant and then bear no apparent relation to the number of people who actually turn up or to the number of people who subsequently join them after the show, match, party or gig or to the number of people who leave when they see who else has turned up. The second non-absolute number is the given time of arrival 
which is now known to be one of those most bizarre of mathematical concepts, a reciprocal exclusion, a number whose existence can only be defined as being anything other than itself. In other words, the given time of arrival is the one moment of time at which it is impossible that any member of the party will arrive. Reciprocal exclusions now play a vital part in many branches of maths, including statistics and accountancy, and also form the basic equation used to engineer the somebody else's problem field. The third and most mysterious piece of non-absoluteness of all lies in the relationship between the number of items on the bill, the cost of each item, the number of people at the table, and what they are each prepared to pay for. The number of people who have actually brought any money is only a sub-phenomenon in this field. The baffling discrepancies which used to occur at this point remained uninvestigated for centuries, simply because no one took them seriously. They were at the time put down to such things as politeness, rudeness, meanness, flashness, tiredness, emotionality, or the lateness of the hour, and completely forgotten about on the following morning. They were never tested under laboratory conditions, of course, because they never occurred in laboratories, not in reputable laboratories, at least. And so it was only with the advent of pocket computers that the startling truth became finally apparent, and it was this. Numbers written on restaurant bills within the confines of restaurants do not follow the same mathematical laws as numbers written on any other pieces of paper in any other parts of the universe. This single fact took the scientific world by storm. It completely revolutionised it. So many mathematical conferences got held in such good restaurants that many of the finest minds of a generation died of obesity and heart failure, and the science of maths was put back by years. Slowly, however, the implications of the idea began to be understood. To begin with, it had been too stark, too crazy, too much what the man in the street would have said. Oh yes, I could have told you that about. Then some phrases like interactive subjectivity frameworks were invented, and everybody was able to relax and get on with it. The small groups of monks who'd taken up hanging around the major research institutes, singing strange chants to the effect that the universe was only a figment of its own imagination, were eventually given a street theatre grant and went away. Chapter Eight. In space travel, you see. Said Slarty Bartfast as he fiddled with some instruments in the room of informational illusions. In space travel, he stopped and looked about him. The room of informational illusions was a welcome relief after the visual monstrosities of the central computational area. There was nothing in it, no information, no illusions, just themselves, white walls, and a few small instruments which looked as if they were meant to plug into something which Slarty Bartfast couldn't find. Yes. Urged Arthur, he had picked up Slarty Bartfast's sense of urgency, but didn't know what to do with it. Yes, what? Said the old man.、Uh, you were saying. Slarty Bartfast looked at him sharply. The numbers, he said, are awful. He resumed his search. Arthur nodded wisely to himself. After a while, he realised that this wasn't getting him anywhere, and he decided that he would say, "What? After all." In space travel," repeated Slarty Bartfast. "All the numbers are awful." Arthur nodded again and looked round to Ford for help, but Ford was practising being sullen and getting quite good at it. "I was only," said Slarty Bartfast with a sigh, "trying to save you the trouble of asking me why all the ship's computations were being done on a waiter's bill pad." Arthur frowned. Why he said, "Were all the ship's computations being done on a wet?"、Hmm. He stopped. Slarty Bartfast said, "Because in space travel, all the numbers are awful." He could tell that he wasn't getting his point across. Listen, he said, "On a waiter's bill pad, numbers dance. You must have encountered the phenomenon." Well, on a waiter's bill pad," said Slarty Bartfast. "Reality and unreality collide on such a fundamental level that each becomes the other, and anything is possible within certain parameters." What parameters? It's impossible to say," said Slarty Bartfast. "That's one of them. Strange but true. At least I think it's strange," he added, "and I am assured that it's true." At that moment, he located the slot in the wall for which he had been searching. 
and clicked the instrument he was holding into it. Do not be alarmed, he said, and then suddenly darted an alarmed look at it himself and lunged back. It's... They didn't hear what he said, because at that moment the ship winked out of existence around them, and a star battleship the size of a small Midlands industrial city plunged out of the sundered night towards them, star lasers ablaze. A nightmare storm of blistering light seared through the blackness and smacked a fair bit off the planet directly behind them. They gaped, pop-eyed, and were unable to scream. Chapter 9 Another World, Another Day, Another Dawn The early morning's thinnest sliver of light appeared silently. Several billion trillion tons of super-hot exploding hydrogen nuclei rose slowly above the horizon and managed to look small, cold and slightly damp. There is a moment in every dawn when light floats. There is the possibility of magic. Creation holds its breath. The moment passed as it regularly did on Squanchula Sita, without incident. The mist clung to the surface of the marshes. The swamp trees were grey with it, the tall reeds indistinct. It hung motionless like held breath. Nothing moved. There was silence. The sun struggled feebly with the mist, tried to impart a little warmth here, shed a little light there, but clearly today was going to be just another long haul across the sky. Nothing moved. Again, silence. Nothing moved. Silence. Nothing moved. Very often on Squanchula Sita, whole days would go on like this, and this was indeed going to be one of them. Fourteen hours later, the sun sank hopelessly beneath the opposite horizon with a sense of totally wasted effort. And a few hours later, it reappeared, squared its shoulders, and started on up the sky again. This time, however, something was happening. A mattress had just met a robot. Hello, robot, said the mattress. Bleh, said the robot, and continued what it was doing, which was walking round very slowly in a very tiny circle. Happy, said the mattress. The robot stopped and looked at the mattress. It looked at it quizzically. It was clearly a very stupid mattress. It looked back at him with wide eyes. After what it had calculated to ten significant decimal places as being the precise length of pause most likely to convey a general contempt for all things mattressy, the robot continued to walk around in tight circles. We could have a conversation, said the mattress. Would you like that? It was a large mattress, and probably one of quite high quality. Very few things actually get manufactured these days, because in an infinitely large universe, such as, for instance, the one in which we live, most things one could possibly imagine, and a lot of things one would rather not, grow somewhere. A forest was discovered recently, in which most of the trees grew ratchet screwdrivers as fruit. The life cycle of a ratchet screwdriver is, is quite interesting. Once picked, it needs a dark, dusty drawer in which it can lie undisturbed for years. Then one night it suddenly hatches discards its outer skin, which crumbles into dust, and emerges as a totally unidentifiable little metal object, with flanges at both ends and a sort of ridge and a sort of hole for a screw. This, when found, will get thrown away. No one knows what it's supposed to gain from this. Nature, in her infinite wisdom, is presumably working on it. No one really knows what mattresses are meant to gain from their lives, either. They are large, friendly, pocket-sprung creatures, which live quiet, private lives in the marshes of Squanchula Zeta. Many of them get caught, slaughtered, dried out, shipped out, and slept on. None of them seem to mind this, and all of them are called Zem. No, said Marvin. My name, said the mattress, is Zem. We could discuss the weather a little. Marvin paused again in his weary circular plod. The dew, he observed, has clearly fallen with a particularly sickening thud this morning. He resumed his walk, as if inspired by this conversational outburst, to fresh heights of gloom and despondency. He plodded tenaciously. If he had had teeth, he would have gritted them at this point. He hadn't. He didn't. The mere plod said it all. The mattress flolloped around. This is a thing that only live mattresses and swamps are able to do, which is why the word is not in more common usage. 
It flolloped in a sympathetic sort of way, moving a fairish body of water as it did so. It blew a few bubbles up through the water engagingly. Its blue and white stripes glistened briefly in a sudden feeble ray of sun that had unexpectedly made it through the mist, causing the creature to bask momentarily. Marvin plodded. "'You have something on your mind, I think,' said the mattress, floopily. "'More than you can possibly imagine,' dreared Marvin. "'My capacity for mental activity of all kinds is as boundless as the infinite reaches of space itself, "'except, of course, for my capacity for happiness.' "'Stomp, stomp,' he went. "'My capacity for happiness,' he added, "'you could fit into a matchbox without taking out the matches first. The mattress globbered. This is the noise made by a live, swamp-dwelling mattress that is deeply moved by a story of personal tragedy. The word can also, according to the ultra-complete Maximegalon Dictionary of Every Language Ever, mean the noise made by the Lord High Sanvalvwag of Hollop on discovering that he has forgotten his wife's birthday for the second year running. Since there was only ever one Lord High San Valvag of Hollop, and he never married, the word is only ever used in a negative or speculative sense, and there is an ever-increasing body of opinion which holds that the ultra-complete Maximegalon dictionary is not worth the fleet of lorries it takes to cut its microstored edition around in. Strangely enough, the dictionary omits the word floopily, which simply means in the manner of something which is floopy. The mattress globbered again. "'I sense a deep dejectedness in your diodes,' it volued, for the meaning of the word volue, by a copy of Squanchula's Swamp Talk at any remaindered bookshop, or alternatively by the ultra-complete Max Megalon Dictionary, as the university would be very glad to get it off their hands and regain some valuable parking lots. "'And it saddens me. "'You should be more mattress-like. "'We live quiet, retired lives in the swamp, "'and we are content to flollop and volue "'and regard the wetness in a fairly floopy manner. "'Some of us are killed, but all of us are called Zem, "'so we never know which, "'and globbering is thus kept to a minimum. "'Why are you walking in circles?' "'Because my leg is stuck,' said Marvin simply. "'It seems to me,' said the mattress, eyeing it compassionately, that it is a pretty poor sort of leg. You are right, said Marvin. It is. Voon, said the mattress. I expect so, said Marvin, and I also expect that you find the idea of a robot with an artificial leg pretty amusing. You should tell your friends Zem and Zem when you see them later. They'll laugh if I know them, which of course I don't, except in so far as I know all organic life forms, which is much better than I would wish to. Ha, ah, but my life is but a box of worm gears. He stomped around again in his tiny circle, around his thin steel peg leg, which revolved in the mud but seemed otherwise stuck. But why do you just keep walking round and round? said the mattress. "'Just to make the point,' said Marvin, and continued round and round. "'Consider it made, my dear friend,' flurbled the mattress. "'Consider it made.' "'Just another million years,' said Marvin. "'Just another quick million. "'Then I might try it backwards, just for the variety, you understand.' The mattress could feel in his innermost spring pockets that the robot dearly wished to be asked how long he had been trudging around in this futile and fruitless manner, and with another quiet flurble he did so. "'Oh, just over the 1.5 million mark, just over,' said Marvin airily. "'Ask me if I ever get bored. Go on, ask me.' The mattress did. Marvin ignored the question and merely trudged with added emphasis. I gave a speech once, he said suddenly and apparently unconnectedly. You may not instantly see why I bring the subject up, but that is because my mind works so phenomenally fast, and I am at a rough estimate thirty billion times more intelligent than you. Let me give you an example. Think of a number, any number. Uh, five, said the mattress. Wrong, said Marvin. You see? The mattress was much impressed by this, and realized that it was in the presence of a not unremarkable mind. It willamed along its entire length, sending excited little ripples through its shallow, algae-covered pool. It gupped. "'Tell me,' it urged, "'of the speech you once made. I long to hear it.' "'It was received very badly,' said Marvin, "'for a variety of reasons. 
I delivered it, he added, pausing to make an awkward humping sort of gesture with his not exactly good arm, but his arm which was better than the other one, which was dishearteningly welded to his left side. Over there, about a mile distance. He was pointing as well as he could manage, and he obviously wanted to make it totally clear that this was as well as he could manage, through the mist, over the reeds, to a part of the marsh which looked exactly the same as every other part of the marsh. There, he repeated, I was somewhat of a celebrity at the time. Excitement gripped the mattress. It had never heard of speeches being delivered on Squanchula's Zeta, and certainly not by celebrities. Water splattered off it as a thrill glurried across its back. It did something which mattresses very rarely bothered to do. Summoning every bit of its strength, it reared its oblong body, heaved it up into the air, and held it quivering there for a few seconds, whilst it peered through the mist over the reeds at the part of the marsh which Marvin had indicated, observing, without disappointment, that it was exactly the same as every other part of the marsh. The effort was too much, and it flodged back into its pool, deluging Marvin with smelly mud, moss, and weeds. I was a celebrity, droned the robot sadly, for a short while on account of my miraculous and bitterly resented escape from a fate almost as good as death in the heart of a blazing sun. You can guess from my condition, he added, how narrow my escape was. I was rescued by a scrap metal merchant. Imagine that. Here I am, brain the size of... Oh, never mind. He trudged savagely for a few seconds. He it was who fixed me up with this leg. Hateful, isn't it? He sold me to a mind zoo. I was the star exhibit. I had to sit on a box and tell my story, whilst people told me to cheer up and think positive. Give us a grin, little robot, they would shout at me. Give us a little chuckle. I would explain to them that to get my face to grin would take a good couple of hours in a workshop with a wrench and that went down very well. The speech, urged the mattress, I long to hear of the speech you gave in the marshes. There was a bridge built across the marshes, a cyber-structured hyper-bridge, hundreds of miles in length, to carry iron buggies and freighters over the swamp. A bridge, quirled the mattress, here in the swamp? A bridge, confirmed Marvin, here in the swamp. It was going to revitalize the economy of the Squanchula system. They spent the entire economy of the Squanchula system building it. They asked me to open it. Poor fools. It began to rain a little. A fine spray slid through the mist. I stood on the platform, for hundreds of miles in front of me, and hundreds of miles behind me, the bridge stretched. Did it glitter? enthused the mattress. It glittered. Did it span the miles majestically? It spanned the miles majestically. Did it stretch like a silver thread far out into the invisible mist? Yes, said Marvin. Do you want to hear the story? I want to hear your speech, said the mattress. This is what I said. I said, I would like to say that it is a very great pleasure, honor, and privilege for me to open this bridge but I can't, because my lying circuits are all out of commission. I hate and despise you all. I now declare this hapless cyber-structure open to the unthinking abuse of all who wantonly cross her. And I plug myself into the opening circuits. Marvin paused, remembering the moment. The mattress flurred and glurried, it flolloped and gupped and willamid, doing this last in a particularly floopy way. Voon, it worfed at last. And was it a magnificent occasion? Reasonably magnificent. The entire thousand-mile-long bridge spontaneously folded up its glittering spans and sank weeping into the mire, taking everybody with it. There was a sad and terrible pause at this point in the conversation, during which a hundred thousand people seemed unexpectedly to say, Whoop! and a team of white robots descended from the sky like dandelion seeds drifting on the wind in tight military formation. For a sudden, a violent moment, they were all there, in the swamp, wrenching Marvin's false leg off, and then they were gone again in their ship, which said foop. You see the sort of thing I have to contend with, 
said Marvin to the gobbering mattress. Suddenly, a moment later, the robots were back again for another violent incident, and this time when they left, the mattress was alone in the swamp. He flolloped around in astonishment and alarm. He almost lurgled in fear. He reared himself up to see over the reeds, but there was nothing to see. No robot, no glittering bridge, no ship, just more reeds. He listened. But there was no sound on the wind beyond the now familiar sound of half-crazed etymologists calling distantly to each other across the sullen mire. Chapter 10 The Body of Arthur Dent Span The universe shattered into a million glittering fragments around it, and each particular shard span silently through the void, reflecting on its silver surface some single, searing holocaust of fire and destruction. And then the blackness behind the universe exploded, and each particular piece of blackness was the furious smoke of hell. And the nothingness behind the blackness behind the universe erupted, and behind the nothingness behind the blackness behind the shattered universe was at last the dark figure of an immense man speaking immense words. These, then, said the figure, speaking from an immensely comfortable chair, were the cricket wars, the greatest devastation ever visited upon our galaxy. What you have experienced... Slarty Bartfast floated past, waving. It's just a documentary, he called out. This is not a good bit. Terribly sorry, trying to find the rewind control. Is what billions upon billions of innocent... Do not called out Slarty Bartfast, floating past again and fiddling furiously with the thing that had stuck into the wall of the Room of Informational Illusions, and which was, in fact, still stuck there, agree to buy anything at this point. People, creatures, your fellow beings. Music swelled. Again, it was immense music, immense chords, and behind the man, slowly, three tall pillars began to emerge out of the immensely swirling mist. Experienced, lived through, or more often failed to live through. Think of that, my friends, and let us not forget, and in just a moment I shall be able to suggest a way which will help us always to remember that before the cricket wars, the galaxy was that rare and wonderful thing, a happy galaxy. The music was going bananas with immensity at this point. A happy galaxy, my friend, as represented by the symbol of the wicket gate. The three pillars stood out clearly now, three pillars topped with two cross pieces, in a way which looked stupefyingly familiar to Arthur's addled brain. The three pillars, thundered the man, the steel pillar which represented the strength and power of the galaxy. Searchlights seared out and danced crazy dances up and down the pillar on the left, which was clearly made of steel or something very like it. The music thumped and bellowed. The Perspex Pillar, announced the man, representing the forces of science and reason in the galaxy. Other searchlights played exotically up and down the right-hand, transparent pillar, creating dazzling patterns within it, and a sudden inexplicable craving for ice cream in the stomach of Arthur Dent. And, the thunderous voice continued, the wooden pillar, representing, and here his voice became just very slightly hoarse with wonderful sentiments, the forces of nature and spirituality. The lights picked out the central pillar, the music moved bravely up into the realms of complete unspeakability. Between them supporting, the voice rolled on, approaching its climax, the golden bale of prosperity and the silver bale of peace. The whole structure was now flooded with dazzling lights, and the music had now, fortunately, gone far beyond the limits of the discernible. At the top of the three pillars, the two brilliantly gleaming bales sat and dazzled. There seemed to be girls sitting on top of them, and maybe they were meant to be angels. Angels are usually represented as wearing more than that, though. Suddenly there was a dramatic hush in what was presumably meant to be the cosmos, and a darkening of the lights. "'There is not a world,' thrilled the man's expert voice, "'not a civilized world in the galaxy where this symbol is not revered even today. Even in primitive worlds it persists in racial memories. This is what the forces of cricket destroyed, and this it is that now locks their world away till the end of eternity. 
and with a flourish the man produced in his hands a model of the wicket gate. Scale was terribly hard to judge in this whole extraordinary spectacle, but the model looked as if it must have been about three feet high. Not the original key, of course. That, as everyone knows, was destroyed, blasted into the ever-whirling eddies of the space-time continuum, and lost forever. This is a remarkable replica, hand-tooled by skilled craftsmen, lovingly assembled using ancient craft secrets into a memento you will be proud to own, in memory of those who fell and in tribute to the galaxy, our galaxy, which they died to defend. Slotty Bartfast floated past again at this moment. Uh, found it, he said. Uh, we can lose all this rubbish. Just don't nod, that's all. Now let us all bow our heads in payment, intoned the voice, and then said it again, much faster and backwards. Lights came and went. The pillars disappeared. The man gabbled himself backwards into nothing. The universe snappily reassembled itself around them. Uh, you get the gist, said Slotty Bartfast. "'I'm astonished,' said Arthur, and bewildered. "'I was asleep,' said Ford, who floated into view at this point. "'Did I miss anything?' "'They found themselves once again teetering rather rapidly "'on the edges of an agonizingly high cliff. "'The wind whipped out from their faces, "'and across a bay on which the remains of one of the greatest "'and most powerful space battle fleets ever assembled in the galaxy "'was briskly burning itself back into existence.' The sky was a sullen pink, darkening via a rather curious colour to blue and upwards to black. Smoke billowed down out of it at an incredible lick. Events were now passing back by them almost too quickly to be distinguished, and when, a short while later, a huge star battleship rushed away from them as if they had said boo, they only just recognised it as the point at which they had come in. But now things were too rapid, a video-tactile blur which brushed and jiggled them through centuries of galactic history, turning, twisting, flickering. The sound was a mere thin trill. Periodically, throughout the thickening jumble of events, they sensed appalling catastrophes, deep horrors, cataclysmic shocks, and these were always associated with certain recurring images, the only images which ever stood out clearly from the avalanche of tumbling history. A wicket gate, a small, hard, red ball, hard, white robots, and also something less distinct, something dark and cloudy. There was also another sensation which rose clearly out of the trilling passage of time. Just as the slow series of clicks, when speeded up, will lose the definition of each individual click and gradually take on the quality of a sustained and rising tone, so a series of individual impressions here took on the quality of a sustained emotion, and yet not an emotion. If it was an emotion, it was a totally emotionless one. It was hatred, implacable hatred. It was cold, not like ice is cold, but like a wall is cold. It was impersonal, not like a randomly flung fist in a crowd is impersonal, but like a computer-issued parking summons is impersonal. And it was deadly. Again, not like a bullet or a knife is deadly, but like a brick wall across a motorway is deadly. And just as a rising tone will change in character and take on harmonics as it rises, so again this emotionless emotion seemed to rise to an unbearable if unheard scream, and suddenly seemed to be a scream of guilt and failure, and suddenly it stopped. They were left standing on a quiet hilltop on a tranquil evening. The sun was setting. All around them, Softly undulating green countryside rolled off gently into the distance. Birds sang about what they thought of it all, and general opinion seemed to be good. A little way away could be heard the sound of children playing, and a little further away than the apparent source of that sound could be seen in the dimming evening light the outlines of a small town. The town appeared to consist mostly of fairly low buildings made of white stone. The skyline was of gentle, pleasing curves. The sun had nearly set. As if out of nowhere, music began. A voice said, This 
Slarty Bartfast tugged at a switch, and it stopped. I will tell you about it, he said quietly. The place was peaceful. Arthur felt happy. Even Ford seemed cheerful. They walked a short way in the direction of the town, and the informational illusion of the grass was pleasant and springy under their feet, and the informational illusion of the flowers smelt sweet and fragrant. Only Slarty Bartfast seemed apprehensive and out of sorts. He stopped and looked up. It suddenly occurred to Arthur that, coming as this did at the end, so to speak, or rather the beginning, of all the horror they had just blurrily experienced, something nasty must be about to happen. He was distressed to think that something nasty could happen to somewhere as idyllic as this. He too glanced up. There was nothing in the sky. They're not about to attack here, are they? he said. He realised that this was merely a recording he was walking through, but he still felt alarmed. Nothing is about to attack here, said Slutty Bartfast in a voice which unexpectedly trembled with emotion. This is where it all starts. This is the place itself. This is cricket. He stared up into the sky. The sky from one horizon to another, from east to west, from north to south, was utterly and completely black. Chapter 11 Stomp, stomp. Were pleased to be of service. Shut up. Thank you. Stomp, 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 stomp. Were thank you for making a simple door very happy. Hope your diodes rot. Thank you. Have a nice day. Stomp, 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 stomp. Were it is my pleasure to open for you. Zarkov. And my satisfaction to close again with the knowledge of a job well done. I said Zarkov. Thank you for listening to this message. Stomp, 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 stomp. Whoop! Zayford stopped stomping. He had been stomping around the Heart of Gold for days, and so far no door had said whoop to him. He was fairly certain that no door had said whoop to him now. It was not the sort of thing that doors said, too concise. Furthermore, there were not enough doors. It sounded as if a hundred thousand people had said whoop, which puzzled him because he was the only person on the ship. It was dark. Most of the ship's non-essential systems were closed down. It was drifting idly in a remote area of the galaxy, deep in the inky blackness of space. So which particular hundred thousand people would turn up at this point and say a totally unexpected whoop? He looked about him, up the corridor and down the corridor. It was all in deep shadow. There were just the very dim, pinkish outlines to the doors, which glowed in the dark and pulsed whenever they spoke, though he tried every way he could think of, of stopping them. The lights were off so that his heads could avoid looking at each other, because neither of them was currently a particularly engaging sight, and nor had they been since he had made the error of looking into his soul. It had, indeed, been an error. It had been late one night, of course. It had been a difficult day, of course. There had been soulful music playing on the ship's sound system, of course. And he had, of course, been slightly drunk. In other words, all the usual conditions which bring on a bout of soul-searching had applied, but it had nevertheless clearly been an error. Standing now silent and alone in the dark corridor, he remembered the moment and shivered. His one head looked one way and his other the other, and each decided that the other was the way to go. He listened but could hear nothing. All there had been was the whoop. It seemed an awfully long way to bring an awfully large number of people just to say one word. He started nervously to edge his way in the direction of the bridge. There at least he would feel in control. He stopped again. The way he was feeling, he didn't think he was an awfully good person to be in control. The first shock of that moment, thinking back, had been discovering that he actually had a soul. In fact, he'd always more or less assumed that he had one, as he had a full complement of everything else, and indeed two of some things. 
but suddenly actually to encounter the thing lurking there deep within him had given him a severe jolt, and then to discover, this was the second shock, that it wasn't the totally wonderful object which he felt a man in his position had a natural right to expect had jolted him again. Then he had thought about what his position actually was, and the renewed shock had nearly made him spill his drink. He drained it quickly before anything serious happened to it. He then had another quick one to follow the first one down and check that it was all right. Freedom, he said aloud. Trillian came onto the bridge at that point and said several enthusiastic things on the subject of freedom. I can't cope with it, he said darkly and sent a third drink down to see why the second hadn't yet reported on the condition of the first. He looked uncertainly at both of her, and preferred the one on the right. He poured a drink down his other throat, with the plan that it would head the previous one off at the pass, join forces with it, and together they would get the second to pull itself together. Then all three would go off in search of the first, give it a good talking to, and maybe a bit of a sing as well. He felt uncertain as to whether the fourth drink had understood all that, so he sent down a fifth to explain the plan more fully, and a sixth for moral support. "'You're drinking too much,' said Trillian. His heads collided, trying to sort out the four of her he could now see into a whole person. He gave up and looked at the navigation screen, and was astonished to see a quite phenomenal number of stars. "'Excitement and adventure and really wild things,' he muttered. "'Look,' she said in a sympathetic tone of voice, and sat down near him. "'It's quite understandable that you're going to feel a little aimless for a bit.' He boggled at her. "'Never seen anyone sit down on their own lap before.' "'Wow,' he said. He had another drink. "'You've finished the mission you've been on for years.' "'I haven't been on it. I've been tried to avoid being on it.' "'You've still finished it,' he grunted. "'There seemed to be a terrific party going on in his stomach.' I think it finished me, he said. Here I am, Zaphod Beeblebrooks. I can go anywhere, do anything. I have the greatest ship in the known sky, a girl with whom things seem to be working out pretty well. Are they? As far as I can tell. I'm not an expert in personal relationships. Trillian raised her eyebrows. I am, he added, one hell of a guy. I can do anything I want, only I just haven't the faintest idea what. He paused. One thing he further added, had suddenly ceased to lead to another, in contradiction of which he had another drink and slid graciously off his chair. Whilst he slept it off, Trillian did a little research in the ship's copy of The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. It had some advice to offer on drunkenness. Go to it, it said, and good luck. It was cross-referenced to the entry concerning the size of the universe and ways of coping with that. Then she found the entry on Han Wavell, an exotic holiday planet, and one of the wonders of the galaxy. Han Wavell is a world which consists largely of fabulous ultra-luxury hotels and casinos, all of which have been formed by the natural erosion of wind and rain. The chances of this happening are more or less one to infinity against. Little is known of how this came about, because none of the geophysicists, probability statisticians, meteor analysts, or bizarrologists who are so keen to research it can afford to say them. Terrific, thought Trillian to herself, and within a few hours the great white running-shoe ship was slowly powering down out of the sky, beneath a hot, brilliant sun, towards a brightly coloured sandy spaceport. The ship was clearly causing a sensation on the ground, and Trillian was enjoying herself. She heard Zaphod moving around and whistling somewhere in the ship. How are you? she said over the general intercom. Fine, he said brightly, terribly well. Where are you? In the bathroom. What are you doing? Staying here. After an hour or two it became plain that he meant it, and the ship returned to the sky without having once opened its hatchway. "'Hey-ho!' said Eddie the computer. Trillian nodded patiently, tapped her fingers a couple of times, and pushed the intercom switch. "'I think that enforced fun is probably not what you need at this point.' "'Probably not,' replied Zaphod from wherever he was. "'I think a bit of a physical challenge would help draw you out of yourself.' "'Whatever you think, I think,' said Zaphod. "'Recreational impossibilities,' was a heading which caught Trillian's eye when a short while later she sat down to flip through the guide again, and, as the heart of gold rushed at improbable speeds in an indeterminate direction, she sipped a cup of something undrinkable from the Nutrimatic drinks dispenser and read about how to fly. "'The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy has this to say on the subject of flying.' 
There is an art, it says, or rather a knack to flying. The knack lies in learning how to throw yourself at the ground and miss. Pick a nice day, it suggests, and try it. The first part is easy. All it requires is simply the ability to throw yourself forward with all your weight and the willingness not to mind that it's going to hurt. That is, it's going to hurt if you fail to miss the ground. Most people fail to miss the ground, and if they're really trying properly, the likelihood is that they will fail to miss it fairly hard. Clearly, it is the second part, the missing, which presents the difficulties. One problem is that you have to miss the ground accidentally. It's no good deliberately intending to miss the ground because you won't. You have to have your attention suddenly distracted by something else when you're halfway there, so that you're no longer thinking about falling or about the ground or about how much it's going to hurt if you fail to miss it. It is notoriously difficult to prize your attention away from these three things during the split second you have at your disposal. Hence, most people's failure and their eventual disillusionment with this exhilarating and spectacular sport. If, however, you are lucky enough to have your attention momentarily distracted at the crucial moment by, say, a gorgeous pair of legs or tentacles, pseudopodia, according to phylum and or personal inclination, or a bomb going off in your vicinity, or by suddenly spotting an extremely rare species of beetle crawling along a nearby twig, then, in your astonishment, you will miss the ground completely and remain bobbing just a few inches above it, in what might seem to be a slightly foolish manner. This is a moment for superb and delicate concentration. Bob and float, float and bob. Ignore all considerations of your own weight and simply let yourself waft higher. Do not listen to what anybody says to you at this point because they are unlikely to say anything helpful. They are most likely to say something along the lines of, Good God, you can't possibly be flying. It is vitally important not to believe them or they will suddenly be right. Waft higher and higher. Try a few swoops, gentle ones at first, then Drift above the treetops, breathing regularly. Do not wave at anybody. When you have done this a few times, you'll find the moment of distraction rapidly becomes easier and easier to achieve. You will then learn all sorts of things about how to control your flight, your speed, your maneuverability, and the trick usually lies in not thinking too hard about whatever you want to do, but just allowing it to happen, as if it was going to anyway. You will also learn about how to land properly, which is something you will almost certainly cock up, and cock up badly, on your first attempt. There are private flying clubs you can join which help you achieve the all-important moment of distraction. They hire people with surprising bodies or opinions to leap out from behind bushes and exhibit and or explain them at the critical moments. Few genuine hitchhikers will be able to afford to join these clubs, but some may be able to get temporary employment at them. Trillian read this longingly, but reluctantly decided that Zayford wasn't really in the right frame of mind for attempting to fly, or for walking through mountains, or for trying to get the Brantis Vogan civil service to acknowledge a change of address card, which were the other things listed under the heading Recreational Impossibilities. Instead, she flew the ship to Elosimana Sinica, a world of ice, snow, mind-hurtling beauty and stunning cold. The trek from the snow plains of Lisca to the summit of the ice-crystal pyramids of Sastantua is long and gruelling, even with jet skis and a team of Sinica snowhounds. But the view from the top, a view which takes in the Stin glacier fields, the shimmering prism mountains, and the far ethereal dancing ice lights is one which first freezes the mind and then slowly releases it to hitherto unexperienced horizons of beauty. And Trillian, for one, felt that she could do with a bit of having her mind slowly released to hitherto unexperienced horizons of beauty. They went into a low orbit. There lay the silver-white beauty of Alosimania Sinica beneath them. Zaphod stayed in bed with one head stuck under a pillow and the other doing crosswords till late into the night. Trillian nodded patiently again, counted to a sufficiently high number, and told herself that the important thing now was just to get Zaphod talking. She prepared, by dint of deactivating all the robot kitchen synthematics, the most fabulously delicious meal she could contrive, delicately oiled meats, scented fruits, fragrant cheeses, fine Aldebaran wines... She carried it through to him, and asked if he felt like talking things through. 
Zarkov, said Zayford. Trillian nodded patiently to herself, counted to an even higher number, tossed the tray lightly aside, walked to the transport room, and just teleported herself the hell out of his life. She didn't even program any coordinates. She hadn't the faintest idea where she was going. She just went, a random row of dots flowing through the universe. Anything, she said to herself as she left, is better than this. Good job, too, muttered Zaphod to himself, turned over and failed to go to sleep. The next day he restlessly paced the empty corridors of the ship, pretending not to look for her, though he knew she wasn't there. He ignored the computer's querulous demands to know just what the hell was going on around here by fitting a small electronic gag across a pair of its terminals. After a while he began to turn down the lights. There was nothing to see, nothing was about to happen. Lying in bed one night, and night was now virtually continuous on the ship, he decided to pull himself together, to get things into some kind of perspective. He sat up sharply and started to pull clothes on. He decided that there must be someone in the universe feeling more wretched, miserable and forsaken than himself, and he determined to set out and find him. Halfway to the bridge it occurred to him that it might be Marvin, and he returned to bed. It was a few hours later than this, as he stomped disconsolately about the darkened corridors, swearing at cheerful doors, that he heard the whoop said, and it made him very nervous. He leant tensely against the corridor wall and frowned like a man trying to unbend a corkscrew by telekinesis. He laid his fingertips against the wall and felt an unusual vibration, and now he could quite clearly hear slight noises and could hear where they were coming from. They were coming from the bridge. Moving his hand along the wall, he came across something he was glad to find. He moved on a little further, quietly. Computer? he hissed. Hmm? said the computer terminal nearest him, equally quietly. Is there someone on the ship? Hmm? said the computer. Who is it? Hmm, 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 said the computer. What? Hmm, 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 hmm. Zaphod buried one of his faces in two of his hands. Oh, Zarkon, he muttered to himself. Then he stared up the corridor towards the entrance to the bridge in the dim distance, from which more and purposeful noises were coming, and in which the gagged terminals were situated. Computer, he hissed again. Hmm? When I ungag you... Hmm? Remind me to punch myself in the mouth. Hmm-hmm. Either one. Now just tell me this. One for yes, two for no. Is it dangerous? Hmm. It is? Hmm. You didn't just go, hmm, twice. Hmm, hmm. Hmm. He inched his way up the corridor, as if he would rather be yarding his way down it, which was true. He was within two yards of the door to the bridge, when he suddenly realised to his horror that it was going to be nice to him, and he stopped dead. He hadn't been able to turn off the door's courtesy voice circuits. This doorway to the bridge was concealed from view within it because of the excitingly chunky way in which the bridge had been designed to curve round, and he had been hoping to enter unobserved. He leant despondently back against the wall again and said some words which his other head was quite shocked to hear. He peered at the dim pink outline of the door and discovered that in the darkness of the corridor he could just about make out the sensor field which extended out into the corridor and told the door when there was someone there for whom it must open and to whom it must make a cheery and pleasant remark. He pressed himself hard back against the wall and edged himself towards the door, flattening his chest as much as he possibly could to avoid brushing against the very, very dim perimeter of the field. He held his breath and congratulated himself on having lain in bed sulking for the last few days, rather than trying to work out his feelings on chest expanders in the ship's gym. He then realised he was going to have to speak at this point. He took a series of very shallow breaths, and then said as quickly and as quietly as he could, Dor, if you can hear me, say so very, very quietly. Very, very quietly, the door murmured. I can hear you. Good. Now, in a moment, I'm going to ask you to open. When you open, I do not want you to say that you enjoyed it, okay? Okay? 
and I don't want you to say to me that I have made a simple door very happy, or that it is your pleasure to open for me and your satisfaction to close again with the knowledge of a job well done, okay? Okay? And I do not want you to ask me to have a nice day. Understand? I understand. Okay, said Zephyr, tensing himself. Open now. The door stood open quietly. Zaphod slipped quietly through. The door closed quietly behind him. Is that the way you like it, Mr. Beeblebrox? said the door out loud. I want you to imagine, said Zaphod to the group of white robots who swung around to stare at him at that point, that I have an extremely powerful killer zap blaster pistol in my hand. There was an immensely cold and savage silence. The robots regarded him with hideously dead eyes. They stood very still. There was something intensely macabre about their appearance, especially to Zaphod, who had never seen one before or ever known anything about them. The Cricket Wars belonged to the ancient past of the galaxy, and Zaphod had spent most of his early history lessons plotting how he was going to have sex with the girl in the cyber cubicle next to him, and since his teaching computer had been an integral part of this plot, it had eventually had all its history circuits wiped and replaced with an entirely different set of ideas, which had then resulted in it being scrapped and sent to a home for degenerate cybermats, whether it was followed by the girl who had inadvertently fallen deeply in love with the unfortunate machine, with the result, A, that Zaphod never got near her, and B, that he missed out on a period of ancient history that would have been of inestimable value to him at this moment. He stared at them in shock. It was impossible to explain why, but their smooth and sleek white bodies seemed to be the utter embodiment of clean, clinical evil. From their hideously dead eyes to their powerful, lifeless feet, they were clearly the calculated product of a mind that wanted simply to kill. Zaphod gulped in cold fear. They had been dismantling part of the rear bridge wall, and had forced a passage through some of the vital innards of the ship. Through the tangled wreckage, Zaphod could see, with a further and worse sense of shock, that they were tunnelling towards the very heart of the ship, the heart of the improbability drive that had been so mysteriously created out of thin air, the heart of gold itself. The robot closest to him was regarding him in such a way as to suggest that it was measuring every smallest particle of his body, mind, and capability. And when it spoke, what it said seemed to bear this impression out. Before going on to what it actually said, it's worth recording at this point that Zaphod was the first living organic being to hear one of these creatures speak for something over ten billion years. If he had paid more attention to his ancient history lessons and less to his organic being, he might have been more impressed by this honour. The robot's voice was like its body, cold, sleek, and lifeless. It had almost a cultured rasp to it. It sounded as ancient as it was. It said, You do have a Kilozap blaster pistol in your hand. Zafu didn't know what it meant for a moment. But then he glanced down at his own hand, and was relieved to see that what he had found clipped to a wall bracket was indeed what he had thought it was. Yeah, he said in a kind of relieved sneer, which is quite tricky. Well, I wouldn't want you to overtax your imagination, robot. For a while, nobody said anything, and Zaphod realised that the robots were obviously not here to make conversation, and that it was up to him. I can't help noticing that you have parked your ship, he said, with a nod of one of his heads in the appropriate direction. Through mine. There was no denying this. Without regard for any kind of proper dimensional behaviour, they had simply materialised their ship precisely where they wanted it to be, which meant that it was simply locked through the heart of gold as if they were nothing more than two combs. Again, they made no response to this, and Zaphod wondered if the conversation would gather any momentum if he phrased his part of it in the form of questions. Haven't you? he added. Yes, replied the robot. Uh, okay, said Zaphod. So, uh, what are you cats doing here? Silence. Uh, robots, said Zaphod. What are you robots doing here? We have come, rasped the robot, for the gold of the bale. Zaphod nodded. He waggled his gun to invite further elaboration. The robot seemed to understand this. The gold bale is part of the key we seek, continued the robot to release our masters from cricket. 
Seyfort nodded again. He waggled his gun again. The key, continued the robot simply, was disintegrated in time and space. The golden bale is embedded in the device which drives your ship. It will be reconstituted in the key. Our masters shall be released. The universal readjustment will continue. Zaphod nodded again. Uh, what are you talking about? He said. A slightly pained expression seemed to cross the robot's totally expressionless face. He seemed to find the conversation depressing. Obliteration, it said. We seek the key, it repeated. We already have the wooden pillar, the steel pillar, and the perspex pillar. In a moment we will have the gold bale. No, you won't. We will, stated the robot. No, you won't. It makes my ship work. In a moment, repeated the robot patiently, we will have the gold bale. You will not, said Zaphod. And then we must go, said the robot in all seriousness, to a party. Oh, said Zaphod softly. Can I come? No, said the robot. We are going to shoot you. Oh, yeah, said Zaphod, waggling his gun. Yes, said the robot, and they shot him. Zaphod was so surprised they had to shoot him again before he fell down. Chapter 12 Shh, said Slotty Bartfast. Listen and watch. Night had now fallen on ancient cricket. The sky was dark and empty. The only light was coming from the nearby town, from which pleasant, convivial sounds were drifting quietly on the breeze. They stood beneath a tree from which heady fragrances wafted around them. Arthur squatted and felt the informational illusion of the soil and the grass. He ran it through his fingers. The soil seemed rich and heavy, the grass strong. It was hard to avoid the impression that this is a thoroughly delightful place in all respects. The sky was, however, extremely blank, and seemed to Arthur to cast a certain chill over the otherwise idyllic, if currently invisible, landscape. Still, he supposed, is a question of what you are used to. He felt a tap on his shoulder and looked up. Slotty Bartfast was quietly directing his attention to something down the other side of the hill. He looked, and could just see some faint lights dancing and waving, and moving slowly in their direction. As they came nearer, sounds became audible too, and soon the dim lights and noises resolved themselves into a small group of people who were walking home across the hill towards the town. They walked quite near the watchers beneath the tree, swinging lanterns which made soft and crazy lights dance amongst the trees and grass, chattering contentedly, and actually singing a song about how terribly nice everything was, how happy they were, how much they enjoyed working on the farm, and how pleasant it was to be going home to see their wives and children, with a lilting chorus to the effect that the flowers were smelling particularly nice at this time of year, and that it was a pity the dog had died, seeing as it liked them so much. Arthur could almost imagine Paul McCartney sitting with his feet up by the fire one evening, humming it to Linda, and wondering what to buy with the proceeds, and thinking, probably Essex. The Masters of Cricket breathed slightly about fast in sepulchral tones. Coming as it did so hard upon the heels of his own thoughts about Essex, this remark caused Arthur a moment's confusion. Then the logic of the situation imposed itself on his scattered mind, and he discovered that he still didn't understand what the old man meant. What, he said? The masters of cricket, said Slarty Bartfast again, and if his breathing had been sepulchral before, this time he sounded like someone in Hades with bronchitis. Arthur peered at the group and tried to make sense of what little information he had at his disposal at this point. The people in the group were clearly alien, if only because they seemed a little tall, thin, angular, and almost as pale as to be white, but otherwise they appeared remarkably pleasant, a little whimsical perhaps. One wouldn't necessarily want to spend a long coach journey with them, but the point was that if they deviated in any way from being good, straightforward people, it was in being perhaps too nice rather than not nice enough. So why all this rasping lung work from Slarty Bartfast, which would seem more appropriate to a radio commercial for one of those nasty films about chainsaw operators taking their work home with them? Then this cricket angle was a tough one, too. He hadn't quite fathomed the connection between what he knew as cricket and what... Slarty Bartfast interrupted his train of thought at this point, as if sensing what was going through his mind. The game you know as cricket, he said. 
and his voice still seemed to be wandering lost in subterranean passages, is just one of those curious freaks of racial memory which can keep images alive in the mind eons after their true significance has been lost in the mists of time. Of all the races in the galaxy, only the English could possibly revive the memory of the most horrific wars ever to sunder the universe, and transform it into what I'm afraid is generally regarded as an incomprehensibly dull and pointless game. Rather fond of it myself, he added, but in most people's eyes you have been inadvertently guilty of the most grotesquely bad taste. Particularly the bit about the little red ball hitting the wicket. That's very nasty. Um, said Arthur, with a reflective frown to indicate that his cognitive synapses were coping with this as best they could. Um, and these said Slarty Bartfast, slipping back into crypt guttural and indicating the group of cricket men who had now walked past them, are the ones who started it all, and it will start tonight. Come, we will follow and see why. They slipped out from underneath the tree and followed the cheery party along the dark hill path. Their natural instinct was to tread quietly and stealthily in pursuit of their quarry, though, as they were simply walking through a recorded informational illusion, they could as easily have been wearing euphoniums and woad for all the notice their quarry would have taken of them. Arthur noticed that a couple of members of the party were now singing a different song. It came lilting back to them through the soft night air, and was a sweet romantic ballad which would have netted McCartney, Kent and Sussex, and enabled him to put in a fair offer for Hampshire. You must surely know, said Slarty Bartfast to Ford, what it is that is about to happen. Me, said Ford, no. Did you not learn ancient galactic history when you were a child? I, I was in the cyber cubicle behind Zaphod, said Ford. It was pretty distracting, which isn't to say that I didn't learn some pretty stunning things. At this point, Arthur noticed a curious feature to the song that the party were singing. The Middle Eight Bridge, which would have had McCartney firmly consolidated in Winchester and gazing intently over the Test Valley to the rich pickings of the new forest beyond, had some curious lyrics. The songwriter was referring to meeting with a girl not under the moon or beneath the stars, but above the grass, which struck Arthur as being a little prosaic. Then he looked up again at the bewilderingly blank sky, and had the distinct feeling that there was an important point here. If only he could grasp what it was. It gave him a feeling of being alone in the universe, and he said so. No, said Slarty Bartfast, with a slight quickening of his step. The people of cricket have never thought to themselves, we are alone in the universe. They are surrounded by a huge dust cloud, you see, their single sun with its single world. They are right out on the utmost eastern edge of the galaxy. Because of the dust cloud, there has never been anything to see in the sky. At night it is totally blank. During the day there is the sun, but you can't look directly at that, so they don't. They are hardly aware of the sky. It's as if they had a blind spot which extended 180 degrees from horizon to horizon. You see, the reason why they have never thought, we are alone in the universe, is that until tonight they don't know about the universe until tonight. He moved on, leaving the words ringing in the air behind him. Imagine, he said, never even thinking we are alone, simply because it has never occurred to you to think that there's any other way to be. He moved on again. I'm afraid this is going to be a little unnerving, he added. As he spoke, they became aware of a very thin, roaring scream high up in the sightless sky above them. They glanced upwards in alarm, but for a moment or two could see nothing. Then Arthur noticed that the people in the party in front of them had heard the noise, but that none of them seemed to know what to do with it. They were glancing around themselves in consternation, left, right, forwards, backwards, even at the ground. It never occurred to them to look upwards. The profoundness of the shock and horror they emanated a few moments later, when the burning wreckage of a spaceship came hurtling and screaming out of the sky and crashed about half a mile from where they were standing, was something that you had to be there to experience. Some speak of the heart of gold in hushed tones. 
Some speak of the starship Bistromath. Many speak of the legendary and gigantic starship Titanic, a majestic and luxurious cruise liner launched from the great shipbuilding asteroid complexes of Artrefactival some hundreds of years ago now, and with good reason. It was sensationally beautiful, staggeringly huge, and more pleasantly equipped than any ship in what now remains of history. See note below on the campaign for real time. But it had the misfortune to be built in the very earliest days of improbability physics, long before this difficult and cussed branch of knowledge was fully, or at all, understood. The designers and engineers decided, in their innocence, to build a prototype improbability field into it, which was meant, supposedly, to ensure that it was infinitely improbable that anything would ever go wrong with any part of the ship. They did not realize that because of the quasi-reciprocal and circular nature of all improbability calculations, anything that was infinitely improbable was actually very likely to happen almost immediately. The starship Titanic was a monstrously pretty sight, as it lay beached like a silver Arcturian megavoid whale, amongst the laser-lit tracery of its construction gantries, a brilliant cloud of pins and needles of light against the deep interstellar blackness. But when launched... It did not even manage to complete its very first radio message, an SOS, before undergoing a sudden and gratuitous total existence failure. However, the same event which saw the disastrous failure of one science in its infancy also witnessed the apotheosis of another. It was conclusively proved that more people watched the Tri-D TV coverage of the launch than actually existed at the time, and this has now been recognised as the greatest achievement ever in the science of audience research. Another spectacular media event of that time was the supernova which the star Isolodins underwent a few hours later. Solidans is the star around which most of the galaxy's major insurance underwriters live, or rather, lived. But whilst these spaceships and other great ones which come to mind, such as the Galactic Fleet Battleships, the GSS Daring, the GSS Audacity, and the GSS Suicidal Insanity, are all spoken of with awe, pride, enthusiasm, affection, admiration, regret, jealousy, resentment, in fact, most of the better-known emotions, the one which regularly commands the most actual astonishment was Cricket One, the first spaceship ever built by the people of Cricket. This is not because it was a wonderful ship. It wasn't. It was a crazy piece of near junk. It looked as if it had been knocked up in someone's backyard, and this was, in fact, precisely where it had been knocked up. The astonishing thing about the ship was not that it was done well, it wasn't, but that it was done at all. The period of time which had elapsed between the moment that the people of Cricket had discovered that there was such a thing as space and the launching of their first spaceship was almost exactly a year. Ford Prefect was extremely grateful, as he strapped himself in, that this was just another informational illusion and that he was therefore completely safe. In real life, it wasn't a ship he would have set foot in for all the rice wine in China. Extremely rickety was one phrase which sprang to mind. Please may I get out was another. This is going to fly, said Arthur, giving gaunt looks at the lashed together pipework and wiring which festooned the cramped interior of the ship. Slarty Bartfast assured him that it would, that they were perfectly safe, and that it was all going to be extremely instructive and not a little harrowing. Ford and Arthur decided just to relax and be harrowed. Why not, said Ford, go mad. In front of them, and of course totally unaware of their presence, for the very good reason that they weren't actually there, were the three pilots. They also had constructed the ship. They had been on the hill path that night, singing wholesome, heartwarming songs. Their brains had been very slightly turned by the nearby crash of the alien spaceship. They had spent weeks stripping every tiniest last secret out of the wreckage of that burnt-up spaceship, all the while singing lilting spaceship stripping ditties. They had then built their own ship, and this was it. This was their ship, and they were currently singing a little song about that too, expressing the twin joys of achievement and ownership. The chorus was a little poignant and told of their sorrow that their work had kept them such long hours in the garage, away from the company of their wives and children, who had missed them terribly, but had kept them cheerful by bringing them continual stories of how nicely the puppy was growing up. Pow! they took off. They roared into the sky like a ship that knew precisely 
what it was doing. No way, said Ford a while later, after they had recovered from the shock of acceleration and were climbing up out of the planet's atmosphere. No way, he repeated, does anyone design and build a ship like this in a year, no matter how motivated. I don't believe it. Prove it to me and I still won't believe it. He shook his head thoughtfully and gazed out of a tiny port at the nothingness outside it. The trip passed uneventfully for a while, and Slarty Bartfast fast wound them through it. Very quickly, therefore, they arrived at the inner perimeter of the hollow spherical dust cloud which surrounded their sun and home planet, occupying, as it were, the next orbit out. It was more as if there was a gradual change in the texture and consistency of space. The darkness seemed now to thrum and ripple past them. It was very cold darkness, a very blank and heavy darkness. It was the darkness of the night sky of cricket. The coldness and heaviness and blankness of it took a slow grip on Arthur's heart, and he felt acutely aware of the feelings of the cricket pilots, which hung in the air like a thick static charge. They were now on the very boundary of the historical consciousness of their race. This was the very limit beyond which none of them had ever speculated, or even known that there was any speculation to be done. The darkness of the cloud buffeted at the ship. Inside was the silence of history. Their historic mission was to find out if there was anything or anywhere on the other side of the sky from which the wrecked spaceship could have come. Another world may be, strange and incomprehensible though this thought was to the enclosed minds of those who had lived beneath the sky of cricket. History was gathering itself to deliver another blow. Still the darkness thrummed at them, the blank enclosing darkness, it seemed closer and closer, thicker and thicker, heavier and heavier. And suddenly, it was gone. They flew out of the cloud. They saw the staggering jewels of the night in their infinite dust, and their minds sang with fear. For a while they flew on, motionless against the starry sweep of the galaxy, itself motionless against the infinite sweep of the universe. And then... They turned round. It'll have to go, the men of cricket said, as they headed back for home. On the way back they sung a number of tuneful and reflective songs on the subjects of peace, justice, morality, culture, sport, family life, and the obliteration of all other life forms. Chapter 13 So you see said Slarty Bartfast, slowly stirring his artificially constructed coffee, and thereby also stirring the whirlpool interfaces between real and unreal numbers, between the interactive perceptions of mind and universe, and thus generating the restructured matrices of implicitly enfolded subjectivity which allowed his ship to reshape the very concept of time and space. How it is. Yes, said Arthur. Yes, said Ford. "'What do I do?' said Arthur with this piece of chicken. "'Slotty Bartfast glanced at him gravely. "'Toy with it,' he said, toy with it. "'He demonstrated with his own piece. "'Arthur did so, and he felt the slight tingle of a mathematical function "'thrilling through the chicken leg as it moved four-dimensionally "'through what Slotty Bartfast had assured him was five-dimensional space. "'Overnight,' said Slotty Bartfast, the whole population of cricket was transformed from being charming, delightful, intelligent, if whimsical, interpolated Arthur, ordinary people, said Slarty Bartfast, into charming, delightful, intelligent, whimsical, manic xenophobes. The idea of a universe didn't fit into their world picture, so to speak. They simply couldn't cope with it. And so, charmingly, delightfully, intelligently, whimsically, if you will, they decided to destroy it. What's the matter now? I don't like this wine very much, said Arthur, sniffing it. Well, send it back. It's all part of the mathematics of it. Arthur did so. He didn't like the topography of the way to smile, but he'd never liked graphs anyway. Where are we going? said Ford. Back to the room of informational illusions, said Slarty Bartfast, rising and patting his mouth with the mathematical representation of a paper napkin, for the second half. Chapter 14 
Chapter 14 The people of Cricket, said his high judgmental supremacy judiciary PAG, L-I-V-R, the learned, impartial and very relaxed, chairman of the board of judges at the Cricket War Crimes Trial, Ah, uh, well, you know, they're just a bunch of real sweet guys, you know, who just happen to want to kill everybody. Hell, I feel the same way some mornings. Shit! Okay, he continued, swinging his feet up onto the bench in front of him and pausing a moment to pick a thread off his ceremonial beach loafers. So you wouldn't want to necessarily share a galaxy with these guys. This was true. The cricket attack on the galaxy had been stunning. Thousands and thousands of huge cricket warships had leapt suddenly out of hyperspace and simultaneously attacked thousands and thousands of major worlds, first seizing vital material supplies for building the next wave, then calmly zapping those worlds out of existence. The galaxy, which had been enjoying a period of unusual peace and prosperity at the time, reeled like a man getting mugged in a meadow. I mean, continued Judiciary Pag, gazing around the ultramodern, this was ten billion years ago, when ultramodern meant a lot of stainless steel and brushed concrete, and huge courtroom, these guys are just obsessed. This, too, was true, and is the only explanation anyone has yet managed to come up with for the unimaginable speed with which the people of Cricket had pursued their new and absolute purpose, the destruction of everything that wasn't cricket. It was also the only explanation for their bewilderingly sudden grasp of all the hyper-technology involved in building their thousands of spaceships and their millions of lethal white robots. These had really struck terror into the hearts of everyone who had encountered them. In most cases, however, the terror was extremely short-lived, as was the person experiencing the terror. They were savage, single-minded, flying battle machines. They wielded formidable multifunctional battle clubs which, brandished one way, would knock down buildings, and brandished another way, fired blistering omnidestructo zap rays, and brandished a third way, launched a hideous arsenal of grenades, ranging from minor incendiary devices to maxi-slaughter hypernuclear devices, which could take out a major sun simply striking the grenades with their battle clubs, simultaneously primed them and launched them with phenomenal accuracy over distances ranging from mere yards to hundreds of thousands of miles. OK, said Judiciary Pag again. So we won. He paused and chewed a little gum. We won, he repeated, but that's no big deal. I mean, a medium-sized galaxy against one little world, and how long did it take us? Clerk of the court? Uh, my lud, said the severe little man in black rising. How long, kiddo? It is a trifle difficult, my lud, to be precise in this matter. Time and distance. Ah, uh, relax, guy. Be vague. I hardly like to be vague, my lud, over such a... Bite the bullet and be it. The clerk of the court blinked at him. It was clear that, like most of the galactic legal profession, he found Judiciary Pag, or Zippo Bibrock 5 times 10 to the 8th, as his private name was known inexplicably to be, a rather distressing figure. He was clearly a bounder and a cad. He seemed to think that the fact that he was the possessor of the finest legal mind ever discovered gave him the right to behave exactly as he liked, and unfortunately he appeared to be right. Uh, well, my lud, uh, very approximately two thousand years, the clerk murmured unhappily. Anna, how many guys zilched out? Two grillion, my lud. The clerk sat down. A hydrospeptic photo of him at this point would have revealed that he was steaming slightly. Judiciary Pag gazed once more around the courtroom, wherein were assembled hundreds of the very highest officials of the entire galactic administration, all in their ceremonial uniforms or bodies, depending on metabolism and custom. Behind a wall of zap-proof crystal stood a representative group of the people of Cricket looking with calm, polite loathing at all the aliens gathered to pass judgment on them. This was the most momentous occasion in legal history, and Judiciary Pag knew it. He took out his chewing gum and stuck it under his chair. "'That's a whole lot of stiffs,' he said quietly. The grim silence in the courtroom seemed in accord with this view. So, like I said, these are a bunch of really sweet guys, but you wouldn't want to share a galaxy with them. Not if they're just going to keep at it. Not if they're not going to learn to relax a little. I mean, it's just going to be continual nervous time, isn't it? Right? Pow, pow, pow. When are the next coming at us? 
Peaceful coexistence is just right out, right? Give me some water, somebody. Thank you. He sat back and sipped reflectively. Okay, he said, hear me, hear me. It's like these guys, you know, are entitled to their own view of the universe. And according to their view, which the universe forced on them, right, they did right. Sounds crazy, but I think you'll agree. They believe in... He consulted a piece of paper which he found in the back pocket of his judicial jeans. They believe in uh, peace, justice, morality, culture, sport, family life, and the obliteration of all other life forms. He shrugged. I've heard a lot worse, he said. He scratched his crotch reflectively. Free hour, he said. He took another sip of water and then held it up to the light and frowned at it. He twisted it round. Hey, is there something in this water? he said. Uh, no, my lud, said the court usher, who had brought it to him, rather nervously. Then take it away, snapped Judiciary Pag, and put something in it. I got an idea. He pushed away the glass and leaned forward. Hear me, hear me, he said. The solution was brilliant, and went like this. The planet of cricket was to be encased for perpetuity in an envelope of slow time, inside which life would continue almost infinitely slowly. All light would be deflected around the envelope so that it would remain invisible and impenetrable. Escape from the envelope would be utterly impossible unless it were unlocked from the outside. When the rest of the universe came to its final end, and when the whole of creation reached its dying fall, this was all, of course, in the days before it was known that the end of the universe would be a spectacular catering venture, and life and matter ceased to exist, then the planet of Cricket and its sun would emerge from its slow-time envelope and continue a solitary existence, such as it craved in the twilight of the universal void. The lock would be on an asteroid which would slowly orbit the envelope. The key would be the symbol of the galaxy, the wicket gate. By the time the applause in the court had died down, Judiciary Pag was already in the censor shower with a rather nice member of the jury that had slipped a note to half an hour earlier. Chapter 15 Two months later, Zippo Bibrock, five times ten to the eighth, had cut the bottoms off his galactic state jeans and was spending part of the enormous fee his judgments commanded, lying on a jewelled beach, having essence of quelactin rubbed into his back by the same rather nice member of the jury. She was a Sulfinian girl from beyond the cloud worlds of Yaga. She had skin like lemon silk and was very interested in legal bodies. Did you hear the news, she said? Wee ah said Zippo Bibrock five times ten to the eighth, and you would have had to have been there to know exactly why he said this. None of this was on the tape of informational illusions, and is all based on hearsay. Uh, no, he added, when the thing that had made him say wee ah had stopped happening. He moved his body round slightly to catch the first rays of the third and greatest of primeval Vod's three suns, which was now creeping over the ludicrously beautiful horizon, and the sky now glittered with some of the greatest tanning power ever known. A fragrant breeze wandered up from the quiet sea, trailed along the beach, and drifted back to sea again, wondering where to go next. On a mad impulse it went up to the beach again. It drifted back to sea. "'I hope it isn't good news.' muttered Zippo Bibrock five times ten to the eighth, because I don't think I could bear it. Your cricket judgment was carried out today, said the girl sumptuously. There was no need to say such a straightforward thing sumptuously, but she went ahead and did it anyway, because it was that sort of day. I heard it on the radio, she said, when I went back to the ship for the oil. Ah, uh -huh, murmured Zippo, and rested his head back on the jewelled sand. Something happened she said. Hmm? Just after the slow-time envelope was locked, she said, and paused a moment from rubbing in the essence of Quelactin. A cricket warship, which had been missing, presumed destroyed, turned out to be just missing, after all. It appeared and tried to seize the key. Zippo sat up sharply. Hey, what? he said. It's all right, she said, in a voice which would have calmed the big bang down. Apparently there was a short battle, 
The key and the warship were disintegrated and blasted into the space-time continuum. Apparently they are lost forever. She smiled and ran a little more essence of coalactin onto her fingertips. He relaxed and lay back down. Do what you did a moment or two ago, he murmured. That? she said. No, 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 he said. That. She tried again. That? she asked. We la Again, you had to be there. The fragrant breeze drifted up from the sea again. A magician wandered along the beach, but no one needed him. Chapter 16 Nothing is lost for ever, said Slarty Bartfast, his face flickering redly in the light of the candle which the robot waiter was trying to take away, except for the Cathedral of Calesum. The what? said Arthur with a start. The Cathedral of Calesum, repeated Slarty Bartfast. It was during the course of my researches at the campaign for real time that I... The what? said Arthur again. The old man paused and gathered his thoughts for what he hoped would be one last onslaught on the story. The robot waiter moved through the space-time matrices in a way which spectacularly combined the surly with the obsequious, made a snatch for the candle, and got it. They had had the bill, had argued convincingly about who had had the cannelloni and how many bottles of wine they had had, and, as Arthur had been dimly aware, had thereby successfully manoeuvred the ship out of subjective space and into the parking orbit around a strange planet. The waiter was now anxious to complete his part of the charade and clear the bistro. "'All will become clear,' said Slarty Bartfast. "'When?' "'In a minute. Listen, the time streams are now very polluted. There's a lot of muck floating about in them, flotsam and jetsam, and more and more of it is now being regurgitated into the physical world. Eddies in the space-time continuum, you see.' "'So I hear,' said Arthur. "'Look, where are we going?' said Ford, pushing his chair back from the table with impatience. "'Cause I'm eager to get there.' "'We are going,' said Slarty Bartfast in a slow, measured voice, "'to try to prevent the war robots of Cricket from regaining the whole of the key they need to unlock the planet of Cricket from the slow-time envelope and release the rest of their army and their mad masters.' "'It's just,' said Ford, "'that you mentioned a party.' I did, said Slarty Bartfast, and hung his head. He realised that it had been a mistake, because the idea seemed to exercise a strange and unhealthy fascination on the mind of Ford Prefect, the more that Slarty Bartfast unravelled the dark and tragic story of cricket and its people, the more Ford Prefect wanted to drink a lot and dance with girls. The old man felt that he should not have mentioned the party until he absolutely had to, but there it was, the fact was out, and Ford Prefect had attached himself to it, in the way an Arcturian megaleech attaches itself to its victim before biting his head off and making off with the spaceship. When, said Ford eagerly, do we get there? When I've finished telling you why we have to go there. I know why I'm going, said Ford, and leaned back, sticking his hands behind his head. He gave one of his smiles, which made people twitch. Slarty Bartfast had hoped for an easy retirement. He had been planning to learn to play the octavental hebephone, a pleasantly futile task he knew because he had the wrong number of mouths. He had also been planning to write an eccentric and relentlessly inaccurate monograph on the subject of equatorial fjords, in order to set the record wrong about one or two matters he saw as important. Instead, he had somehow got talked into doing some part-time work for the campaign for real time, and had started to take it all seriously for the first time in his life. As a result, he now found himself spending his fast declining years combating evil and trying to save the galaxy. He found it exhausting work and sighed heavily. Listen, he said, at Camtim... What, said Arthur, the campaign for real time, which I will tell you about later... I noticed that five pieces of jetsam which had in relatively recent times plopped back into existence seemed to correspond to the five pieces of the missing key. Only two I could trace exactly, the wooden pillar which appeared on your planet and the silver bale. It seemed to be at some sort of party. We must go there to retrieve it before the cricket robots find it, or who knows what may hap. No, said Ford firmly, we must go to the party in order to drink a lot and dance with girls. 
But haven't you understood everything I... Yes, said Ford, with a sudden and unexpected fierceness. I've understood it all perfectly well. That's why I want to have as many drinks and dance with as many girls as possible while there's still any left. If everything you've shown us is true... True, of course it's true. Then we don't stand a Wilkes chance in a supernova. A what? said Arthur sharply again. He'd been following the conversation doggedly up to this point, and was keen not to lose the thread now. A Wilkes chance on a supernova, repeated Ford, without losing momentum. The... What's a Wilkes got to do with the supernova, said Arthur. It doesn't, said Ford Levely, stand a chance in one. He paused to see if the matter was now cleared up. The freshly puzzled looks clambering across Arthur's face told him it wasn't. A supernova, said Ford as quickly and clearly as he could, is a star which explodes at almost half the speed of light and burns with the brightness of a billion suns and then collapses as a super-heavy neutron star. It's a star which burns up other stars. Got it? Nothing stands a chance in a supernova. I see, said Arthur. The, so why a whelk particularly? Why not a whelk? Doesn't matter! Arthur accepted this, and Ford continued, picking up his early fierce momentum as best he could. The point is, he said, that people like you and me, slanty Bart, Fast and Arthur, particularly and especially Arthur, are just dilettantes, eccentric layabouts, fart arounds, if you like. Slarty Bart Fast frowned, partly in puzzlement and partly in umbrage. He started to speak, is as far as he got. We're not obsessed by anything, insisted Ford. And that's the deciding factor. We can't win against obsession. They care, we don't. They win. I care about a lot of things, said Slotty Bartfast, his voice trembling partly with annoyance, but partly also with uncertainty. Such as? Well, said the old man, life, the universe, uh, everything, really. Fjords? Would you die for them? Fjords? blinked Slotty Bartfast in surprise. No. Well, then. You wouldn't see the point, to be honest. And I, I, I still can't see the connection, said Arthur, with Wilkes. Ford could feel the conversation slipping out of his control and refused to be sidetracked by anything at this point. The point is, he hissed, that we are not obsessive people and we don't stand a chance against, except for your sudden obsession with Wilkes, pursued Arthur, which I still haven't understood. Will you please leave Wilkes out of it? I will if you will, said Arthur. You brought the subject up. It was an error, said Ford. Forget them. The point is this. He leant forward and rested his forehead on the tips of his fingers. What was I talking about? He said wearily. Let's just go down to the party, said Slarty Bartfast, for whatever reason. He stood up, shaking his head. I think that's what I was trying to say, said Ford. For some unexplained reason, the teleport cubicles were in the bathroom. Chapter 17 Time travel is increasingly regarded as a menace. History is being polluted. The Encyclopedia Galactica has much to say on the theory and practice of time travel, most of which is incomprehensible to anyone who hasn't spent at least four lifetimes studying advanced hypermathematics. And since it was impossible to do this before time travel was invented, there is a certain amount of confusion as to how the idea was arrived at in the first place. One rationalisation of this problem states that time travel was, by its very nature, discovered simultaneously at all periods of history. But this is clearly bunk. The trouble is that a lot of history is now quite clearly bunk as well. Here is an example. It may not seem to be an important one to some people, but to others it is crucial. It is certainly significant in that it was this single event which caused the campaign for real time to be set up in the first place, or... Is it last? It depends which way around you see history is happening, and this, too, is now an increasingly vexed question. There is, or was, a poet. His name was Lalafa, and he wrote what are widely regarded throughout the galaxy as being the finest poems in existence, the Songs of the Long Land. They are, were, unspeakably wonderful. That is to say, you couldn't speak very much of them at once, without being so overcome with emotion, truth, and the sense of the wholeness and oneness of things that you wouldn't pretty soon need a brisk walk around the block, possibly pausing at a bar on the way back for a quick glass of perspective and soda. They were that good. Lalafa had lived in the forests of the long lands of Effa. He lived there, and he wrote his poems there. 
He wrote them on pages made of dried habra leaves, without the benefit of education or correcting fluid. He wrote about the light in the forest and what he thought about that. He wrote about the darkness in the forest and what he thought about that. He wrote about the girl who had left him and precisely what he thought about that. Long after his death, his poems were found and wandered over. News of them spread like morning sunlight. For centuries they illuminated and watered the lives of many people whose lives might otherwise have been darker and drier. Then, shortly after the invention of time travel, some major correcting fluid manufacturers wondered whether his poems might have been better still if he had had access to some high-quality correcting fluid, and whether he might be persuaded to say a few words to that effect. They travelled the time waves, they found him, they explained the situation with some difficulty to him, and did indeed persuade him. In fact, they persuaded him to such effect that he became extremely rich at their hands, and the girl about whom he was otherwise destined to write with such precision never got around to leaving him, and in fact they moved out of the forest to a rather nice pad in town, and he frequently commuted to the future to do chat shows, on which he sparkled wittily. He never got around to writing the poems, of course, which was a problem, but an easily solved one. The manufacturers of correcting fluid simply packed him off for a week somewhere with a copy of a later edition of his book and a stack of dried habra leaves to copy them out onto, making the odd deliberate mistake and correction on the way. Many people now say that the poems are suddenly worthless. Others argue that they're exactly the same as they always were, so what's changed? The first people say that that isn't the point. They aren't quite certain what the point is, but they're quite sure that that isn't it. They set up the campaign for real time to try and stop this sort of thing going on. Their case was considerably strengthened by the fact that a week after they had set themselves up, News broke that not only had the great Cathedral of Calesm been pulled down in order to build a new iron refinery, but that the construction of the refinery had taken so long and had had to extend so far back into the past in order to allow iron production to start on time that the Cathedral of Calesm had now never been built in the first place. Picture postcards of the cathedral suddenly became immensely valuable. So a lot of history is now gone forever. The campaign for real time has claimed that just as easy travel eroded the differences between one country and another, and between one world and another, so time travel is now eroding the differences between one age and another. The past, they say, is now truly like a foreign country. They do things exactly the same there. Chapter 18 Arthur materialised, and did so with all the customary staggering about and clasping at his throat, heart, and various limbs which he still indulged himself in whenever he made any of these hateful and painful materialisations that he was determined not to let himself get used to. He looked around for the others. They weren't there. He looked around for the others again. They still weren't there. He closed his eyes. He opened them. He looked around for the others. They obstinately persisted in their absence. He closed his eyes again, preparatory to making this completely futile exercise once more, and because it was only then, whilst his eyes were closed, that his brain began to register what his eyes had been looking at whilst they were open, a puzzled frown crept across his face. So he opened his eyes again to check his facts, and the frown stayed put. If anything, it intensified and got a good firm grip, if this was a party, it was a very bad one, so bad, in fact, that everyone else had left. He abandoned this line of thought as futile. Obviously this wasn't a party. It was a cave or a labyrinth or a tunnel or something. There was insufficient light to tell. All was darkness, a damp, shiny darkness. The only sounds were the echoes of his own breathing, which sounded worried. He coughed very slightly, and then had to listen to the thin, ghostly echo of his cough trailing away amongst winding corridors and sightless chambers, as of some great labyrinth, and eventually returning to him via the same unseen corridors, as if to say, Yes? This happened to every slightest noise he made, and it unnerved him. He tried to hum a cheery tune, but by the time it returned to him, it was a hollow dirge, and he stopped. 
His mind was suddenly full of images from the story that Slarty Bartfast had been telling him. He half expected suddenly to see lethal white robots step silently from the shadows and kill him. He caught his breath. They didn't. He let it go again. He didn't know what he did expect. Someone or something, however, seemed to be expecting him. For at that moment there lit up suddenly in the dark distance an eerie green neon sign. It said, silently, You have been diverted. The sign flicked off again in a way that Arthur was not at all certain he liked. It flicked off with a sort of contemptuous flourish. Arthur then tried to assure himself that this is just a ridiculous trick of his imagination. A neon sign is either on or off, depending on whether it has electricity running through it or not. There was no way, he told himself, that it could possibly affect the transition from one state to the other with a contemptuous flourish. He hugged himself tightly in his dressing gown and shivered, nevertheless. The neon sign in the depths now suddenly lit up, bafflingly, with just three dots and a comma, like this. Dot, 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 comma. Only in green neon. It was trying... Arthur realised, after staring at this perplexedly for a second or two, to indicate that there was more to come, that the sentence was not complete, trying with almost superhuman pedantry, he further reflected, or at least inhuman pedantry. The sentence then completed itself with these two words. Arthur Dent. He reeled. He steadied himself to have another clear look at it. It still said, Arthur Dent, so he reeled again. Once again, the sign flicked off and left him blinking in the darkness with just the dim red image of his name jumping on his retina. Welcome, the sign now suddenly said. After a moment, it added, I don't think. The stone-cold fear which had been hovering around Arthur all this time, waiting for its moment, recognised that its moment had now come, and pounced on him. He tried to fight it off. He dropped into a kind of alert crouch that he'd once seen somebody do on television, but it must have been someone with stronger knees. He peered huntedly into the darkness. "'Er, uh, hello?' he said. He cleared his throat and said it again, more loudly and without the er. Uh, at some distance down the corridor, it seemed suddenly as if someone started to beat on a bass drum. He listened to it for a few seconds and realised that it was just his heart beating. He listened for a few seconds more and realised that it wasn't his heart. It was somebody down the corridor beating on a bass drum. Beads of sweat formed on his brow, tensed themselves and leapt off. He put out a hand onto the floor to steady his alert crouch, which wasn't holding up very well. The sign changed itself again. It said, Do not be alarmed. After a pause, it added, Be very, very frightened, Arthur Dent. Once again it flicked off. Once again it left him in darkness. His eyes seemed to be popping out of his head. He wasn't certain if this was because they were trying to see more clearly, or if they simply wanted to leave at this point. Hello? he said again, this time trying to put a note of rugged and aggressive self-assertion into it. Is anyone there? There was no reply. Nothing. This unnerved Arthur even more than a reply would have done, and he began to back away from the scary nothingness. And the more he backed away, the more scared he became. After a while, he realised that the reason for this was because of all the films he had seen, in which the hero backs further and further away from some imagined terror in front of him, only to bump into it coming up from behind. Just then it suddenly occurred to him to turn around rather quickly. There was nothing there just blackness. This really unnerved him, and he started to back away from that, back the way he had come. After doing this for a short while, it suddenly occurred to him that he was now backing towards whatever it was he'd been backing away from in the first place. This, he couldn't help thinking, must be a foolish thing to do. He decided to be better off backing the way he'd first been backing, and turned around again. It turned out at this point that his second impulse had been the correct one, because there was an indescribably hideous monster standing quietly behind him. Arthur yawed wildly as his skin tried to jump one way and his skeleton the other, whilst his brain tried to work out which of his ears it most wanted to crawl out of. "'Bet you weren't expecting to see me again,' 
said the monster, which Arthur couldn't help thinking was a strange remark for it to make, seeing that he had never met the creature before. He could tell that he hadn't met the creature before from the simple fact that he was able to sleep at nights. It was... It was... Arthur blinked at it. It stood very still. It did look a little familiar. A terrible, cold calm came over him as he realised that what he was looking at was a six-foot-high hologram of a housefly. He wondered why anybody would be showing him a six-foot-high hologram of a housefly at this time. He wondered whose voice he had heard. It was a terribly realistic hologram. It vanished. Well, perhaps you remember me better, said the voice suddenly, and it was a deep, hollow, malevolent voice that sounded like molten tar glurping out of a drum with evil on its mind. Ask the rabbit! With a sudden ping, there was a rabbit there in the black labyrinth with him, a huge, monstrously, hideously soft and lovable rabbit. An image again, but one on which every single soft and lovable hair seemed like a real and single thing growing in its soft and lovable coat. Arthur was startled to see his own reflection in its soft and lovable, unblinking and extremely huge brown eye. "'Born in darkness,' rumbled the voice, "'raised in darkness. "'One morning I poked my head out for the first time into the bright new world "'and got it split open by what felt like some primitive instrument made of flint. "'Made by you, Arthur Dent, and wielded by you. "'Rather hard, as I recall. "'You turned my skin into a bag for keeping interesting stones in. "'I happened to know that because in my next life I came back as a fly again "'and you swatted me again. "'Only this time you swatted me with the bag you'd made of my previous skin. "'Arthur Dent, you are not merely a cruel and heartless man. "'You are also staggeringly tactless.' "'The voice paused while Arthur gawked. "'I see you have lost the bag,' said the voice. "'Probably got bored with it, did you?' Arthur shook his head helplessly. He wanted to explain that he had been, in fact, very fond of the bag, and had looked after it very well, and had taken it with him wherever he went, but that somehow, every time he travelled anywhere, he seemed inexplicably to end up with the wrong bag, and that, curious enough, even as they stood there, he was just noticing for the first time that the bag he had with him at the moment appeared to be made out of a rather nasty fake leopard skin, and wasn't the one he'd had a few moments ago, before he arrived in this whatever place it was, and wasn't the one he would have chosen himself, and heaven knew what would be in it, as it wasn't his, and he'd much rather have his original bag back, except that he was, of course, terribly sorry for having so peremptorily removed it, or rather its component parts, i.e. the rabbit skin, from its previous owner, Viz the Rabbit, whom he currently had the honour of attempting vainly to address. All he actually managed to say was, Erp. Meet the newt you trod on, said the voice. And there was, standing in the corridor with Arthur, a giant green scaly newt. Arthur turned, yelped, leapt backwards, and found himself standing in the middle of the rabbit. He yelped again, but could find nowhere to leap to. "'That was me, too,' continued the voice in a low, menacing rumble. "'As if you didn't know!' "'No,' said Arthur with a start. "'No!' "'The interesting thing about reincarnation,' rasped the voice, "'is that most people, most spirits, are not aware that it is happening to them.' He paused for effect. As far as Arthur was concerned, there was already quite enough effect going on. "'I was aware!' hissed the voice. That is, I became aware, slowly, gradually. He, whoever he was, paused again and gathered breath. I could hardly help it, could I? he bellowed, when the same thing kept happening over and over and over again. Every life I ever lived, I got killed by Arthur Dent. Any world, any body, any time, I'm just getting settled down. Along comes Arthur Dent. Pow, he kills me. Hard not to notice. Bit of a memory jogger, bit of a pointer, bit of a bloody giveaway. That's funny, my spirit would say to itself, as it winged its way back to the netherworld after another fruitless dent-end adventure into the land of the living. That man who just ran over me as I was hopping across the road to my favourite pond looked a little familiar. And gradually I got to piece it together, dent, you multiple me murderer. The echoes of his voice roared up and down the corridors. Arthur stood silent and cold, his head shaking with disbelief. "'Here's the moment, Dent!' shrieked the voice, now reaching a feverish pitch of hatred. "'Here's the moment when at last I knew!' 
It was indescribably hideous, the thing that suddenly opened up in front of Arthur, making him gasp and gargle with horror. But here's an attempt at a description of how hideous it was. It was a huge, palpitating, wet cave with a vast, slimy, rough, whale-like creature lolling around it and sliding over monstrous white tombstones. High above the cave rose a vast promontory in which could be seen the dark recesses of two further fearful caves which... Arthur Dent suddenly realised he was looking at his own mouth, when his attention was meant to be directed at the live oyster that was being tipped helplessly into it. He staggered back with a cry and averted his eyes. When he looked again, the appalling apparition had gone. The corridor was dark and briefly silent. He was alone with his thoughts. They were extremely unpleasant thoughts, and he would rather have had a chaperone. The next noise, when it came, was the low, heavy roll of a large section of wall trundling aside, revealing for the moment just dark blankness behind it. Arthur looked into it, in much the same way that a mouse looks into a dark dog kennel. And the voice spoke to him again. "'Tell me it was a coincidence, Dent,' it said. "'I dare you to tell me it was a coincidence!' "'It was a coincidence,' said Arthur quickly. "'It was not!' came the answering bellow. "'It was,' said Arthur, "'it was. "'If it was a coincidence, then my name,' roared the voice, "'is not Agrajag!' "'And presumably,' said Arthur, "'you would claim that that was your name.' "'Yes!' hissed Agrajag, as if he had just completed a rather deft syllogism. "'Well, I'm afraid it was still a coincidence,' said Arthur. "'Come in here and say that!' howled the voice in a sudden apoplexy again. Arthur walked in and said that it was a coincidence, or at least he nearly said it was a coincidence. His tongue rather lost its footing toward the end of the last word, because the lights came up and revealed what it was he had walked into. It was a cathedral of hate. It was the product of a mind that was not merely twisted, but actually sprained. It was huge. It was horrific. It had a statue in it. We will come to the statue in a moment. The vast, incomprehensibly vast chamber looked as if it had been carved out of the inside of a mountain, and the reason for this was that that was precisely what it had been carved out of. It seemed to Arthur to spin sickeningly round his head as he stood and gaped at it. It was black. Where it wasn't black, you were inclined to wish that it was, because the colours with which some of the unspeakable details were picked out ranged horribly across the whole spectrum of eye-defying colours, from ultraviolet to infra-dead, taking in liver-purple, loathsome lilac, matter-yellow, burnt ombre, and gangrene on the way. The unspeakable details that these colours picked out were gargoyles that would have put Francis Bacon off his lunch. The gargoyles all looked inwards from the walls, from the pillars, from the flying buttresses, from the choir stalls, toward the statue, to which we will come in a moment. And if the gargoyles would have put Francis Bacon off his lunch, then it was clear from the gargoyles' faces that the statue would have put them off theirs, had they been alive to eat it, which they weren't, and had anybody tried to serve them some, which they wouldn't. Around the monumental walls were vast engraved stone tablets in memory of those who had fallen to Arthur Dent. The names of some of those commemorated were underlined and had asterisks against them. So, for instance, the name of a cow that had been slaughtered and of which Arthur had happened to eat a fillet steak would have had the plainest engraving, whereas the name of a fish that Arthur had himself caught and then decided he didn't like and left on the side of the plate had a double underlining, three sets of asterisks and a bleeding dagger added as a decoration just to make the point. And what was most disturbing about all this, apart from the statue, to which we are by degrees coming, was the very clear implication that all these people and creatures were indeed the same person over and over again. And it was equally clear that this person was, however unfairly, extremely upset and annoyed. In fact, it would be fair to say that he had reached a level of annoyance the like of which had never been seen in the universe. It was an annoyance of epic proportions, a burning, searing flame of annoyance, an annoyance that now spanned the whole of time and space in its infinite umbrage. 
and this annoyance had been given its fullest expression in the statue in the centre of all this monstrosity that was a statue of Arthur Dent and an unflattering one. Fifty feet tall, if it was an inch, there was not an inch of it that wasn't crammed with insult to its subject maker, and fifty feet of that sort of thing will be enough to make any subject feel bad. From the small pimple on the side of his nose to the poorish cut of his dressing gown, there was no aspect of Arthur Dent that wasn't lambasted and vilified by the sculptor. Arthur appeared as a gorgon, an evil, rapacious, ravening, bloodied ogre, slaughtering his way through an innocent one-man universe. With each of the thirty arms that the sculptor, in a fit of artistic fervour, had decided to give him, he was either braining a rabbit, swatting a fly, pulling a wishbone, picking a flea out of his hair, or doing something that Arthur at first couldn't quite identify. His many feet were mostly stamping on ants. Arthur put his hands over his eyes, hung his head, and shook it slowly from side to side, in sadness and horror at the craziness of things. And when he opened his eyes again, there in front of him stood the figure of the man or creature or whatever it was that he had supposedly been persecuting all this time. <coughs> said Agrajag. He, or it, or whatever, looked like a mad, fat bat. He waddled slowly around Arthur and poked at him with bent claws. Look, protested Arthur. <coughs> explained Agrajag, and Arthur reluctantly accepted this on the grounds that he was rather frightened by this hideous and strangely wrecked apparition. Agrajag was black, bloated, wrinkled, and leathery. His bat wings were somehow more frightening for being the pathetic, broken, floundering things they were than if they had been strong, muscular beaters of the air. The most frightening thing was probably the tenacity of his continued existence against all the physical odds. He had the most astounding collection of teeth. They looked as if each came from a completely different animal, and they were ranged around his mouth at such bizarre angles it seemed that he ever actually tried to chew anything, he'd lacerate half his own face along with it, and possibly put out an eye as well. Each of his three eyes was small and intense, and looked about as sane as a fish in a privet bush. "'I was at a cricket match!' he rasped. This seemed on the face of it such a preposterous notion that Arthur practically choked. "'Not in this body!' screeched the creature. "'Not in this body! This is my last body, my last life! This is my revenge body, my kill Arthur Dent body! My last chance I had to fight to get it, too!' But. I was at, roared Agrajack, a cricket match. I had a weak heart condition. But what, I said to my wife, can happen to me at a cricket match? As I'm watching, what happens? Two people quite maliciously appear out of thin air that's in front of me. The last thing I can't help but notice before my poor heart gives out in shock is that one of them is Arthur Dent, wearing a rabbit bone in his beard. Coincidence? Yes, said Arthur. Coincidence! screamed the creature, painfully thrashing its broken wings and opening a short gash on its right cheek with a particularly nasty tooth. On closer examination, such as he'd been hoping to avoid, Arthur noticed that much of Agrajag's face was covered with ragged strips of black band-aids. He backed away nervously. He tugged at his beard. He was appalled to discover that, in fact, he still had the rabbit bone in it. He pulled it out and threw it away. Look, he said, it's just fate playing silly buggers with you, with me, with us. It's a complete coincidence. What have you got against me, Dent? snarled the creature, advancing on him in a painful waddle. Nothing, insisted Arthur. Honestly, nothing. Agrajag fixed him with a beady stare. Seems a strange way to relate to somebody you've got nothing against, killing them all the time. Very curious piece of social interaction, I would call that. I would also call it a lie. But look, said Arthur, I'm very sorry. There's been a terrible misunderstanding. I've got to go. Have you got a clock? I'm meant to be helping save the universe. He backed away still farther. Agrajag advanced still further. At one point, he hissed, at one point I decided to give up. Yes, I would not come back. I would stay in the netherworld. And what happened? Arthur indicated with random shakes of his head that he had no idea and didn't want to have one either. He found he had backed up against the cold dark stone that had been carved by who knew what Herculean effort into a monstrous travesty of his bedroom slippers. 
He glanced up at his own horrendously parodied image towering above him. He was still puzzled as to what one of his hands was meant to be doing. I got yanked involuntarily back into the physical world, pursued Agrajack, as a bunch of petunias in, I might add, a bowl. This particular happy little lifetime started off with me in my bowl, unsupported, three hundred miles above the surface of a particularly grim planet. Not a naturally tenable position for a bowl of petunias, you might think, and you'd be right. That life ended a very short while later, three hundred miles lower, in, I might again add, the fresh wreckage of a whale, my spirit brother. He leered at Arthur with renewed hatred. On the way down, he snarled, I couldn't help noticing a flashy-looking white spaceship. And looking out of a port on this flashy-looking spaceship was a smug-looking Arthur Dent. Coincidence? Yes, yelped Arthur. He glanced up again and realised that the arm that had puzzled him was represented as wantonly calling into existence a bowl of doomed petunias. This was not a concept that leapt easily to the eye. I must go, insisted Arthur. You may go, said Agrajag, after I have killed you. No, no, that won't be any use, explained Arthur, beginning to climb up the hard stone incline of his carved bedroom slipper, because I have to save the universe, you see. I have to find a silver bale, that's the point. A tricky thing to do, dead. Save the universe, spat Agrajag with contempt. You should have thought of that before you started your vendetta against me. What about the time when you were on Stavromula Beta and someone... I've never been there, said Arthur. Tried to assassinate you and you ducked. Who do you think that bullet hit? What did you say? Never been there, repeated Arthur. What are you talking about? I have to go. Agrajag stopped in his tracks. You must have been there. You were responsible for my death there as everywhere else. An innocent bystander, he quivered. I've never heard of the place, insisted Arthur. I've certainly never had anyone try to assassinate me, uh, I mean, other than you. Uh, perhaps I go there later, do you think? Agrajag blinked slowly in a kind of frozen, logical horror. "'You haven't been to Stavromula Beta yet?' he whispered. Uh, "'No,' said Arthur. Um, I, "'I don't know anything about the place. I've certainly never been to it and don't have any plans to go.' "'Oh, you go there, all right,' muttered Agrajag in a broken voice. "'You go there, all right. Oh, Zark! he tottered and stared wildly about him at his huge cathedral of hate. I brought you here too soon! He started to scream and bellow. I brought you here too zarking soon! Suddenly he rallied and turned a baleful, hating eye on Arthur. I'm going to kill you anyway! he roared. Even if it's a logical impossibility, I'm going to zarking well try! I'm going to blow this whole mountain up! he screamed. Let's see you get out of this one, Dent! He rushed in a painful, waddling hobble to what appeared to be a small black sacrificial altar. He was shouting so wildly now that he was really carving his face up badly. Arthur leapt down from his vantage place on the carving of his own foot and ran to try to restrain the three-quarters crazed creature. He leapt upon him and brought the strange monstrosity crashing down on top of the altar. Agrajag screamed again, thrashing wildly for a brief moment, and turned a wild eye on Arthur. "'You know what you've done!' He gurgled painfully. You've gone and killed me again! I mean, what do you want from me? Blood? He thrashed again in a brief, apoplectic fit, quivered and collapsed, smacking a large red button on the altar as he did so. Arthur started with horror and fear, first at what he appeared to have done, and then at the loud sirens and bells that suddenly shattered the air to announce some clamouring emergency. He stared wildly around him. The only exit appeared to be the way he had come in. He pelted towards it, throwing away the nasty, faked leopard-skin bag as he did so. He dashed randomly, haphazardly, through the labyrinthine maze. He seemed to be pursued more and more fiercely by klaxons, sirens, flashing lights. Suddenly he turned a corner, and there was a light in front of him. It wasn't flashing. It was daylight. Chapter 19 Although it has been said that on Earth alone in our galaxy is cricket treated as a fit subject for a game, and that for this reason the Earth has been shunned, this only applies to our galaxy, and more specifically to our dimension. 
In some of the higher dimensions, they feel they can more or less please themselves. And they have been playing a peculiar game called Brockian Ultra Cricket for whatever their transdimensional equivalent of billions of years is. Let's be blunt, it's a nasty game, says the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. But then anyone who's been to any of the higher dimensions will know that they're a pretty nasty heathen lot up there who should just be smashed and done in and would be too if anyone could work out a way of firing missiles at right angles to reality. This is another example of the fact that the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy will employ anybody who wants to walk straight in off the street and get ripped off, especially if they happen to walk in off the street during the afternoon when very few of the regular staff members are there. There is a fundamental point here. The history of the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy is one of idealism, struggle, despair, passion, success, failure, and enormously long lunch breaks. The earliest origins of the guide are now, along with most of its financial records, lost in the mists of time. For other and more curious theories about where they are lost, see below. Most of the surviving stories, however, speak of a founding editor called Hurling Fruitmig. Hurling Fruitmig, it is said, founded the guide, established its fundamental principles of honesty and idealism, and went bust. There followed many years of penury and heart-searching, during which he consulted friends, sat in darkened rooms in illegal states of mind, thought about this and that, fooled about with weights, and then, after a chance encounter with the holy lunching friars of Vundun, who claimed that just as lunch was at the centre of a man's temporal day, and man's temporal day could be seen as an analogy for his spiritual life, so lunch should be A, seen as the centre of man's spiritual life, and B, held in jolly nice restaurants, he refounded the guide, laid down its fundamental principles of honesty and idealism, and where you could stuff them both, and led the guide on to its first major commercial success. He also started to develop and explore the role of the editorial lunch break that was subsequently to play such a crucial part in the guide's history, since it meant that most of the actual work got done by any passing stranger who happened to wander into the empty offices of an afternoon and saw something worth doing. Shortly after this, the guide was taken over by Megadodo Publications of Ursa Minor Beta, thus putting the whole thing on a very sound financial footing, and allowing the fourth editor, Ligliori Jr., to embark on lunch breaks of such breathtaking scope that even the efforts of recent editors, who started undertaking sponsored lunch breaks for charity, seem like mere sandwiches in comparison. In fact, Lig never formally resigned his editorship. He merely left his office late one morning and has never since returned. Though well over a century has now passed, many members of the guide staff still retain the romantic notion that he has simply popped out for a ham croissant and will yet return to put in a solid afternoon's work. Strictly speaking, all editors since Ligliori Jr. have therefore been designated acting editors, and Lig's desk is still preserved the way he left it, with the addition of a small sign that says, Ligliori Jr. Editor, Missing Presumed Fed. Some very scurrilous and subversive sources hint at the idea that Lig actually perished in the guide's first extraordinary experiments in alternative bookkeeping. Very little is known of this, and still less said. Anyone who even notices, let alone calls attention to the curious but utterly coincidental and meaningless fact that every world on which the guide has ever set up an accounting department has shortly afterwards perished in warfare or some natural disaster is liable to get sued to smithereens. It is an interesting, though utterly unrelated, fact that the two or three days prior to the demolition of the planet Earth to make way for a new hyperspace bypass saw a dramatic upsurge in the number of UFO sightings there, not only above Lord's Cricket Ground and St John's Wood, London, but also above Glastonbury and Somerset. Glastonbury had long been associated with myths of ancient kings, witchcraft and wart-curing, and had now been selected as the site of the guide's new financial records office, and indeed ten years' worth of financial records were transferred to a magic hill just outside the city, mere hours before the Vogons arrived. None of these facts, however strange or inexplicable, is as strange or inexplicable as the rules of the game of Brockian ultra-cricket, as played in the higher dimensions. A full set of rules is so massively complicated that the only time they were all bound together in a single volume, they underwent gravitational collapse and became a black hole. A brief summary, however, follows. Rule 1. Grow at least three extra legs. You won't need them, but it keeps the crowds amused. Rule 2. Find one extremely good Brockian Ultra Cricket player. Clone him off a few times. This saves an enormous amount of tedious selection and training. Rule 3. Put your team and the opposing team in a large field and build a high wall around them.
The reason for this is that though the game is a major spectator sport, the frustration experienced by the audience at not actually being able to see what's going on leads them to imagine that it's a lot more exciting than it really is. A crowd that has just watched a rather humdrum game experiences far less life affirmation than a crowd that believes it has just missed the most dramatic event in sporting history. Rule 4. Throw lots of assorted items of sporting equipment over the wall for the players. Anything will do. Cricket bats, base cube bats, tennis guns, skis, anything you can get a good swing with. Rule 5. The players should now lay about themselves for all they're worth with whatever they find to hand. Whenever a player scores a hit on another player, he should immediately run away as fast as he can and apologise from a safe distance. Apologies should be concise, seer, and for maximum clarity and points, delivered through a megaphone. Rule 6. The winning team shall be the first team that wins. Curiously enough, the more the obsession with the game grows in the higher dimensions, the less it is actually played, since most of the competing teams are now in a state of permanent warfare with each other over the interpretation of these rules. This is all for the best, because in the long run, a good solid war is less psychologically damaging than a protracted game of Brockian ultra cricket. Chapter 20 As Arthur ran, darting, dashing and panting down the side of the mountain, he suddenly felt the whole bulk of the mountain move very, very slightly beneath him. There was a rumble, a roar and a slight blurred movement and a lick of heat in the distance behind and above him. He ran in a frenzy of fear. The land began to slide, and he suddenly felt the force of the word landslide in a way that had never been apparent to him before. It had always just been a word to him, but now he was suddenly and horribly aware that sliding is a strange and sickening thing for land to do. It was doing it with him on it. He felt ill with fear and trembling. The ground slid, the mountain slurred, he slipped, he fell, he stood, he slipped again and ran. The avalanche began. Stones, then rocks, then boulders pranced past him like clumsy puppies, only much bigger, much, much harder and heavier, and almost infinitely more likely to kill you if they fell on you. His eyes danced with them, his feet danced with the dancing ground, he ran as if running were a terrible sweating sickness, his heart pounded to the rhythm of the pounding geological frenzy around him. The logic of the situation, i.e. that he was clearly bound to survive if the next foreshadowed incident in the saga of his inadvertent persecution of Agrajag was to happen, was utterly failing to impinge itself on his mind or exercise any restraining influence on him at this time. He ran with the fear of death in him, under him, over him, and grabbing hold of his hair. And suddenly he tripped again and was hurled forward by his considerable momentum. But just at the moment he was about to hit the ground astoundingly hard, he saw lying directly in front of him a small navy blue holdall that he knew for a fact he had lost in the baggage retrieval system at Athens Airport some ten years previously in his personal timescale, and in his astonishment he missed the ground completely and bobbed off into the air with his brain singing. What he was doing was this. He was flying. He glanced around him in surprise, but there could be no doubt that that was what he was doing. No part of him was touching the ground, and no part of him was even approaching it. He was simply floating there with boulders hurtling through the air around him. He could now do something about that, blinking with the non-effort of it. He wafted higher into the air, and now the boulders were hurtling through the air beneath him. He looked downward with intense curiosity. Between him and the shivering ground were now some thirty feet of empty air. Empty, that is, if you discounted the boulders that didn't stay in it for long, but bounded on downward in the iron grip of the law of gravity, the same law that seemed all of a sudden to have given Arthur a sabbatical. It occurred to him almost instantly, with the instinctive correctness that self-preservation instills in the mind, that he mustn't try to think about it, that if he did, the law of gravity would suddenly glance sharply in his direction and demand to know what the hell he thought he was doing up there, and all would suddenly be lost. So he thought about tulips. It was difficult, but he did. He thought about the pleasing, firm roundness of the bottom of tulips. He thought about the interesting variety of colours they came in and wondered what proportion of the total number of tulips that grew or had grown on the earth would be found within a radius of one mile from a windmill. After a while, he got dangerously bored of this train of thought, felt the air slipping away beneath him, felt that he was drifting down into the paths of the bouncing boulders that he was trying so hard not to think about. So he thought about... Athens Airport for a bit, and that kept him usefully annoyed for about five minutes, at the end of which he was startled to discover that he was now floating about 600 feet above the ground. He wondered for a moment how he was going to get back down to it. 
but instantly shied away from that area of speculation again and tried to look at the situation steadily. He was flying. What was he going to do about it? He looked back down at the ground. He didn't look at it hard, but did his best just to give it a, an idle glance, as it were, in passing. There were a couple of things he couldn't help noticing. One was that the eruption of the mountain seemed now to have spent itself. There was a crater just a little way beneath the peak, presumably where the rock had caved in on top of the huge, cavernous cathedral, the statue of himself and the sadly abused figure of Agrajag. The other was his holdall, the one he'd lost at Athens airport. It was sitting pertly on a piece of clear ground, surrounded by exhausted boulders, but apparently hit by none of them. Why this should be, he could not speculate, but since this mystery was completely overshadowed by the monstrous impossibility of the bags being there in the first place, it was not a speculation he really felt strong enough for anyway. The thing is, it was there, and the nasty fake leopard-skin bag seemed to have disappeared, which was all to the good, if not entirely to the explicable. He was faced with the fact that he was going to have to pick the thing up. Here he was, flying along six hundred feet above the surface of an alien planet, the name of which he couldn't even remember. He could not ignore the plaintive posture of this tiny piece of what used to be his life, here so many light years from the pulverized remains of his home. Furthermore, he realized the bag, if it was still in the same state in which he'd lost it, would contain a can that would have in it the only Greek olive oil still surviving in the universe. Slowly, carefully, inch by inch, he began to bob downward, swinging gently from side to side like a nervous sheet of paper, feeling its way toward the ground. It went well. He was feeling good. The air supported him, but let him through. Two minutes later, he was hovering a mere two feet above the bag, and was faced with some difficult decisions. He bobbed there lightly. He frowned, but again as lightly as he could. If he picked the bag up, could he carry it? Wouldn't the extra weight pull him straight to the ground? Wouldn't the mere act of touching something on the ground suddenly discharge whatever mysterious force it was that was holding him in the air? Wouldn't he be better off just being sensible at this point and stepping out of the air back onto the ground for a moment or two? If he did, would he ever be able to fly again? The sensation when he allowed himself to be aware of it was so quietly ecstatic that he could not bear the thought of losing it, perhaps forever. With this in mind, he bobbed upward a little, just to try the feel of it, the surprise and effortless movement of it. He bobbed, he floated, he tried a little swoop. The swoop was terrific. With his arms spread out in front of him, his hair and his dressing gown streaming out behind him, he dived down out of the sky, bellied along a body of air about two feet from the ground, and swung back up again, catching himself at the top of the swing and holding, just holding. He stayed there. It was wonderful. And that, he realized, was the way to pick up the bag. He would swoop down and catch hold of it just at the moment of the upswing. He would carry it on up with him. He might wobble a bit, but he was certain that he could hold it. He tried one or two more practice swoops, and they got better and better. The air on his face, the bounce and woof of his body, all combined to make him feel an intoxication of the spirit that he hadn't felt since, since, well, as far as he could work out, since he was born. He drifted away on the breeze and surveyed the countryside, which was, he discovered, pretty nasty. It had a wasted, ravaged look. He decided not to look at it any more. He would just pick up the bag and then... didn't know what he was going to do after he picked up the bag. He decided he would just pick up the bag and see where things went from there. He judged himself against the wind, pushed up against it, and turned around. He floated on its body. He didn't realize it, but his body was willamying at this point. He ducked down under the airstream, dipped, and dived. The air threw itself past him. He thrilled through it. The ground wobbled uncertainly, straightened its ideas out, and rose smoothly up to meet him, offering the bag, its cracked plastic handles, up towards him. Halfway down there was a sudden dangerous moment when he could no longer believe he was doing this, and therefore very nearly wasn't. But he recovered himself in time, skimmed over the ground, slipped an arm smoothly through the handles of the bag, and began to climb back up again. Couldn't make it, and all of a sudden collapsed, bruised, scratched, and shaking on the stony ground. He staggered instantly to his feet, swayed hopelessly around, swinging the bag around him in an agony of grief and disappointment. His feet suddenly were stuck heavily to the ground in the way they always had been. His body seemed like an unwieldy sack of potatoes that reeled, stumbling against the ground. His mind had all the lightness of a bag of lead. 
He sagged and swayed and ate with giddiness. He tried hopelessly to run, but his legs were suddenly too weak. He tripped and flopped forward. At that moment he remembered that in the bag he was now carrying was not only a can of Greek olive oil, but a duty-free allowance of retzina. And in the pleasurable shock of that realisation, he failed to notice for at least ten seconds that he was now flying again. He whooped and cried with relief and pleasure, and sheer physical delight. He swooped, he wheeled, he skidded and whirled through the air. Cheekily, he sat on an updraft and went through the contents of the hold -all. He felt the way he imagined an angel must feel, doing its celebrated dance on the head of a pin, while being counted by philosophers. He laughed with pleasure at the discovery that the bag did in fact contain the olive oil and the retzina, as well as a pair of cracked sunglasses, some sand-filled swimming trunks, some creased postcards of Santorini, a large and unsightly towel, some interesting stones, and various scraps of paper with the addresses of people he was relieved to think he would never meet again, even if the reason why was a sad one. He dropped the stones, put on the sunglasses, and let the pieces of paper whip away in the wind. Ten minutes later, drifting idly through a cloud, he got a large and extremely disreputable cocktail party in the small of the back. Chapter 21 The longest and most destructive party ever held is now into its fourth generation, and still no one shows any signs of leaving. Someone did once look at his watch, but that was eleven years ago now, and there has been no follow-up. The mess is extraordinary and has to be seen to be believed, but if you don't have any particular need to believe it, then don't go and look, because you won't enjoy it. There have recently been some bangs and flashes up in the clouds, and there is one theory that this is a battle being fought between the fleets of several rival carpet-cleaning companies who are hovering over the thing like vultures. But you shouldn't believe anything you hear at parties, and particularly not anything you hear at this one. One of the problems, and it's one that's obviously going to get worse, is that all the people at the party are either the children or the grandchildren or the great-grandchildren of the people who wouldn't leave in the first place. And because of all the business about selective breeding and recessive genes and so on, it means that all the people now at the party are either absolutely fanatical party-goers or gibbering idiots, or, more and more frequently, both. Either way, it means that, genetically speaking, each succeeding generation is now less likely to leave than the preceding one. So other factors come into operation, like when the drinks are going to run out. Now, because of certain things that have happened that seemed like a good idea at the time, and one of the problems at the party that never stops is that all the things that only seem like a good idea at parties continue to seem like good ideas, that point seems still to be a long way off. One of the things that seemed like a good idea at the time was that the party should fly. Not in the normal sense that parties are meant to fly, but literally. One night, long ago, a band of drunken astro-engineers of the first generation clambered around the building, digging this, fixing that, banging very hard on the other, and when the sun rose the following morning, it was startled to find itself shining on a building full of happy, drunken people that was now floating like a young and uncertain bird over the treetops. Not only that, but the flying party had also managed to arm itself rather heavily. If they were going to get involved in any petty arguments with wine merchants, they wanted to make sure they had might on their side. The transition from full-time cocktail party to part-time raiding party came with ease, and did much to add that extra bit of zest and swing to the whole affair that was badly needed at this point because of the enormous number of times that the band had already played all the numbers it knew over the years. They looted, they raided, they held whole cities to ransom for fresh supplies of cheese crackers, guacamole, spare ribs, and wine and spirits that would now get piped aboard from floating tankers. The problem of when the drinks are going to run out is, however, going to have to be faced one day. The planet over which they are floating is no longer the planet it was when they first started floating over it. It is in bad shape. The party has attacked and raided an awful lot of it, and no one has ever succeeded in hitting it back because of the erratic and unpredictable way in which it lurches around the sky. It is one hell of a party. It is also one hell of a thing to get hit by in the small of the back. Chapter 22 Arthur lay floundering in pain on a piece of ripped and dismembered reinforced concrete, flicked at by wisps of passing cloud and confused by the sounds of flabby merrymaking somewhere indistinctly behind him. There was a sound he couldn't immediately identify, partly because he didn't know the tune I Left My Leg in Jaglan Beater, and partly because the band playing it was very tired 
and some members of it were playing in 3-4 time, some in 4-4, and some in a kind of pie-eyed, pie-r squared, each according to the amount of sleep he'd managed to grab recently. He lay panting heavily in the wet air, and tried feeling bits of himself to see where he might be hurt. Wherever he touched himself, he encountered a pain. After a short while, he worked out that this was because it was his hand that was hurting. He seemed to have sprained his wrist. His back, too, was hurting, but he soon satisfied himself that he was not badly hurt, but just bruised and a little shaken, as who wouldn't be. He couldn't understand what a building would be doing flying through the clouds. On the other hand, he would have been a little hard-pressed to come up with any convincing explanation of his own presence, so he decided that he and the building were just going to have to accept each other. He looked up from where he was lying. A wall of pale but stained stone slabs rose up behind him, the building proper. He seemed to be stretched out on some sort of ledge or lip that extended outward for about three or four feet all the way around. It was a hunk of the ground in which the party building had had its foundations, and which it had taken along with itself to keep itself bound together at the bottom end. Nervously he stood up, and suddenly, looking out over the edge, he felt nauseous with vertigo. He pressed himself back against the wall, wet with mist and sweat. His head was swimming freestyle, but his stomach was doing the butterfly. Even though he had got up here under his own power, he could now not even bear to contemplate the hideous drop in front of him. He was not about to try his luck jumping. He was not about to move an inch closer to the edge. Clutching his hold all, he edged along the wall, hoping to find a doorway in. The solid weight of the can of olive oil was a great reassurance to him. He was edging in the direction of the nearest corner, in the hope that the wall around the corner might offer more in the way of entrances than this one, which offered none. The unsteadiness of the building's flight made him feel sick with fear, and after a short time he took the towel from out of his bag and did something with it which once again justified its supreme position in the list of useful things to take with you when you hitchhike round the galaxy. He put it over his head so you wouldn't have to see what he was doing. His feet edged along the ground. His outstretched hand edged along the wall. Finally he came to the corner, and as his hand rounded the corner, it encountered something that gave him such a shock he nearly fell off. It was another hand. The two hands gripped each other. He desperately wanted to use his other hand to pull the towel away from his eyes, but it was holding the bag with the olive oil of Retzina and the postcards of Santorini, and he very much didn't want to put it down. He experienced one of those self moments, one of those moments when you suddenly turn around and look at yourself and think, who am I? What am I up to? What have I achieved? Am I doing well? He whimpered very slightly. He tried to free his hand, but he couldn't. The other hand was holding his tightly. He had no recourse but to edge onward toward the corner. He leaned around it and shook his head in an attempt to dislodge the towel. This seemed to provoke a sharp cry of some unfathomable emotion from the owner of the other hand. The towel was whipped from his head, and he found his eyes peering into those of Ford Prefect. Beyond him stood Slutty Bartfast, and beyond them he could clearly see a porchway and a large closed door. They were both pressed back against the wall, eyes wild with terror, as they stared out into the thick, blind cloud around them and tried to resist the lurching and swaying of the building. "'Where the zarking photon have you been?' hissed Ford, panic-stricken. Uh, uh, well, stuttered Arthur, not really knowing how to sum it all up that briefly. Uh, here and there, w what are you doing here? Ford turned his wild eyes on Arthur again. They won't let us in without a bottle, he hissed. The first thing Arthur noticed as they entered into the thick of the party, apart from the noise, the suffocating heat, the wild profusion of colours that protruded dimly through the atmosphere of heady smoke, the carpets thick with ground glass, ash and guacamole droppings, and the small group of pterodactyl-like creatures and lurex who descended on his cherished bottle of Retzina, squawking, A new pleasure! A new pleasure! was Trillian being chatted up by a thunder god. Didn't I see you at Millyways? he was saying. Were you the one with the hammer? Yes, I much prefer it here, so much less reputable, so much more fraught. Squeals of some hideous pleasure ran around the room, the outer dimensions of which were invisible through the heaving throng of happy, noisy creatures, cheerfully yelling things that nobody could hear at each other, and occasionally having crises. Seems fun, said Trillian. What did you say, Arthur? I said, how the hell did you get here? I was a row of dots flowing randomly through the universe. Have you met Thor? He makes thunder. Uh, hello, said Arthur. I, I expect that must be very interesting. Hi, said Thor. It is. Have you got a drink? Uh, no, actually. Then why don't you go and get one? 
See you later, Arthur, said Trillian. Something jogged Arthur's mind, and he looked round huntedly. Safeford isn't here, is he? See you, said Trillian firmly, later. Thor glared at him with hard, coal-black eyes, his beard bristling. What little light there was in the place mustered its forces briefly to glint menacingly off the horns on his helmet. He took Trillian's elbow in his extremely large hand, and the muscles in his upper arm moved around each other like a couple of Volkswagens parking. He led her away. One of the interesting things about being immortal, he said, is, One of the interesting things about space, Arthur heard Slarty Bartfast saying to a large and voluminous creature who looked like someone losing a fight with a pink duvet and was gazing raptly at the old man's deep eyes and silver beard, is how dull it is. Dull? said the creature, and blinked her rather wrinkled and bloodshot eyes. Yes, said Slarty Bartfast, staggeringly dull, bewilderingly so. You see, there's so much of it and so little in it. Would you like me to quote you some of the statistics? Oh, uh, well, please, I would like to. They, too, are quite sensationally dull. I'll come back and hear them in a moment, she said, patted him on the arm, lifted up her skirts like a hovercraft, and moved off into the heaving crowd. I thought she'd never go, growled the old man. Come, Earthman, Arthur, we must find the silver bale. It is here somewhere. Can't we just relax a little, Arthur said. I've had a tough day. Trillions here, incidentally. She didn't say how. It probably doesn't matter. Think of the danger to the universe. The universe, said Arthur, is big enough and old enough to look after itself for half an hour. Oh, right, he added in response to Slarty Bartfast's increasing agitation. I'll wander around and see if anybody's seen it. Good, good, said Slarty Bartfast. Good. He plunged into the crowd himself and was told to relax by everybody he passed. Have you seen a bale anywhere? said Arthur to a little man who seemed to be standing eagerly waiting to listen to somebody. It's, it's made of silver, vitally important for the future safety of the universe, and about this long. No, said the enthusiastically wizened little man, but, but do have a drink and tell me all about it. Ford Prefect writhed past, dancing a wild, frenetic, and not entirely unobscene dance with someone who looked as if she was wearing Sydney Opera House on her head. He was yelling a futile conversation at her about the din. I like the hat, he bawled. What? I said, I like the hat. I'm not wearing a hat. Well, I like the head, then. What? I said, I like the head. Interesting bone structure. What? Ford worked a shrug into the complex routine of other movements he was performing. I said, you dance great, he shouted. Just don't nod so much. What? It's just that every time you nod, said Ford, ow! He added as his partner nodded forward to say what, and once again pecked him sharply on the forehead with the sharp end of her swept-forward skull. "'My planet was blown up one morning,' said Arthur, who had found himself quite unexpectedly telling the little man his life story, or at least edited highlights of it. "'That's why I'm dressed like this, in, in my dressing gown. My, my planet was blown up with all my clothes in it, you see. I didn't realise it would be coming to a party.' The man nodded enthusiastically. Later I was thrown off a spaceship, still in my dressing gown, rather than the spacesuit one would normally expect. Shortly after that I discovered that my planet had originally been built for a bunch of mice. You can imagine how I felt about that. I was then shot at for a while and blown up. In fact, I've been blown up ridiculously often, shot at, insulted, regularly disintegrated, deprived of tea, and recently I crashed into a swamp and had to spend five years in a damp cave. Ah, effervesced the little man, and did you have a wonderful time? Arthur started to choke violently on his drink. What a wonderfully exciting cough, said the little man, quite startled by it. Do you mind if I join in? And with that he launched into the most extraordinary and spectacular fit of coughing that caught Arthur so much by surprise that he started to choke violently, discovered that he was already doing it, and got thoroughly confused. Together they performed a lung-busting duet that went on for fully two minutes before Arthur managed to cough and splutter to a halt. So invigorating, said the little man, panting and wiping tears from his eyes. What an exciting life you must lead. Thank you very much. He shook Arthur warmly by the hand and walked off into the crowd. Arthur shook his head in astonishment. A youngish-looking man came up to him, an aggressive-looking type with a hook mouth, a lantern nose, and small beady little cheekbones. He was wearing black trousers, a black silk shirt open to what was presumably his navel, though Arthur had learnt never to make assumptions about the anatomies of the sort of people he tended to meet these days, and had all sorts of nasty, dangly gold things hanging round his neck. He carried something in a black bag, and clearly wanted people to notice that he didn't want them to notice it. "'Hey, uh, did I hear you say your name just now?' he said. This is one of the many things that Arthur had told the enthusiastic little man. Uh, "'Yes, it's Arthur Dent.' The man seemed to be dancing slightly to some rhythm other than any of the several that the band was grimly pushing out. "'Yeah,' he said, uh, "'only there was a man in a mountain who wanted to see you.' "'I met him.' 
Yeah, only you seem pretty anxious about it, you know? Yes, I met him. Yeah, well, I think you should know that. I do. I met him. The man paused to chew a little gum. Then he clapped Arthur on the back. OK, he said. All right, I'm just telling you, right? Good night. Good luck. Win awards. What? said Arthur, who was beginning to flounder seriously at this point. Whatever. Do what you do. Do it well. He made a sort of clucking noise with whatever he was chewing and then some vaguely dynamic gesture. Why? said Arthur. Do it badly, said the man. Who cares? Who gives a shit? The blood suddenly seemed to pump angrily into the man's face, and he started to shout. Why not go mad? he said. Go away. Get off my back, will you, guy? Just zark off. OK, I'm going, said Arthur hurriedly. It's been real. The man gave a sharp wave and disappeared off into the throng. What was that about? said Arthur to a girl he found standing beside him. Why did you tell me to win awards? Just showbiz talk, shrugged the girl. He's just won an award at the annual Ursa Minor Alpha Recreational Illusions Institute awards ceremony, and he was hoping to be able to pass it off lightly, and he didn't mention it, so he couldn't. Oh, said Arthur. Oh, well, I'm sorry I didn't. Oh, what was it for? The most gratuitous use of the word fuck in a serious screenplay. It's very prestigious. I see, said Arthur. Yes, and what do you get for that? A Rory. It's just a small silver thing set on a large black base. What did you say? I didn't say anything. I was just about to ask what the silver... Oh, I thought you said whoop. Said what? Whoop. People had been dropping in on the party now for some years, fashionable gatecrashers from other worlds, and for some time it had occurred to the party-goers as they had looked out at their own world beneath them, with its wrecked cities, its ravaged avocado farms and blighted vineyards, its vast tracts of new desert, its seas full of cracker crumbs and worse, that their world was in some tiny and almost imperceptible ways not quite as much fun as it had been. Some of them began to wonder if they could manage to stay sober for long enough to make the entire party space-worthy, and maybe take it off to some other people's worlds, where the air might be fresher and give them fewer headaches. The few undernourished farmers who still managed to scratch out a feeble existence on the half-dead ground of the planet's surface would have been extremely pleased to hear this. But that day, as the party came screaming out of the clouds, and the farmers looked up in haggard fear of yet another cheese and wine raid, it became clear that the party was not going anywhere else for a while, that the party would soon be over. Very soon it would be time to gather up hats and coats and stagger blearily outside to find out what time of day it was, what time of year it was, and whether in any of this burnt and ravaged land there was a taxi going anywhere. The party was locked in a horrible embrace with a strange white spaceship that seemed to be half sticking through it. Together they were lurching, heaving and spinning their way around the sky in grotesque disregard of their own weight. The clouds parted, the air roared and leapt out of their way. The party and the crooked warship looked in their writhings a little like two ducks, one of which is trying to make a third duck inside the second duck, while the second duck is trying very hard to explain that it doesn't feel ready for a third duck right now, is uncertain that it would want any putative third duck to be made by this particular first duck anyway, and certainly not while it, the second duck, was busy flying. The sky sang and screamed with the rage of it all, and buffeted the ground with shock waves. And suddenly, with a foop, the cricket ship was gone. The party blundered helplessly across the sky, like a man leaning against an unexpectedly open door. It spun and wobbled on its hover jets. It tried to right itself and wronged itself instead. It staggered back across the sky again. For a while these staggerings continued, but clearly they could not continue for long. The party was now a mortally wounded party. All the fun had gone out of it, as the occasional broken-backed pirouette could not disguise. The longer at this point that it had avoided the ground, the heavier was going to be the crash when finally it hit it. Inside, things were not going well either. They were going monstrously badly, in fact, and people were hating it and saying so loudly. The cricket robots had been. They had removed the award for the most gratuitous use of the word fuck in a serious screenplay, and in its place had left a scene of devastation that left Arthur feeling almost as sick as a runner-up for a Rory. We would love to stay and help, shouted Ford, picking his way over the mangled debris, only we're not going to. The party lurched again, provoking feverish cries and groans from amongst the smoking wreckage. We have to go and save the universe, you see, said Ford, and if that sounds like a pretty lame excuse, then you may be right. Either way, we're off. He suddenly came across an unopened bottle lying miraculously unbroken on the ground. Do you mind if we take this, he said? You won't be needing it. He took a packet of potato crisps as well. Trillion? shouted Arthur in a shocked and weakened voice. In the smoking mess he could see nothing. 
Earthmen, we must go, said Slotty Bartfast nervously. Trillion! shouted Arthur again. A moment or two later, Trillian staggered, shaking into view, supported by her new friend, the Thunder God. "'The girl stays with me,' said Thor. "'There's a great party going on in Valhalla. We'll be flying off. "'Where were you when all this is going on?' said Arthur. "'Upstairs,' said Thor. "'I was weighing her. Flying's a tricky business, you see. We have to calculate wind. "'She comes with us,' said Arthur. "'Hey,' said Trillian, "'don't I?' "'No,' said Arthur. "'You come with us.' Thor looked at him with slowly smouldering eyes. He was making some point about godliness, and it had nothing to do with being clean. "'She comes with me,' he said quietly. "'Come on, Earthman,' said Slotty Bartfast nervously, picking at Arthur's sleeve. "'Come on, Slotty Bartfast,' said Ford nervously, picking at the old man's sleeve. Slotty Bartfast had the teleport device. The party lurched and swayed, sending everyone reeling, except for Thor and except for Arthur, who stared, shaking, into the Thunder God's black eyes. Slowly, incredibly, Arthur put up what now appeared to be his tiny little fists. "'Want to make something of it?' he said. "'I beg your minuscule pardon,' roared Thor. "'I said,' repeated Arthur, and he could not keep the quavering out of his voice, "'do you want to make something of it?' He waggled his fists ridiculously. Thor looked at him with incredulity. Then a little wisp of smoke curled upward from his nostrils. There was a tiny little flame in it, too. He gripped his belt. He expanded his chest to make it totally clear that here was the sort of man you only dared to cross if you had a team of Sherpas with you. He unhooked the shaft of his hammer from his belt. He held it up in his hands to reveal the massive iron head. He thus cleared up any possible misunderstanding that he might merely have been carrying a telegraph pole around with him. "'Do I want,' he said with a hiss like a river flowing through a steel mill, "'to make something of it?' "'Yes,' said Arthur, his voice suddenly and extraordinarily strong and belligerent. He waggled his fists again, this time as if he meant it. "'You want to step outside?' he snarled at Thor. "'All right!' bellowed Thor like an enraged bull, or in fact like an enraged thunder god, which is a great deal more impressive, and did so. Good, said Arthur, that's got rid of him. Slarty, get us out of here. Chapter 23 All right, shouted Ford and Arthur, so I'm a coward. The point is, I'm still alive. They were back aboard the starship Bistromath. So was Slarty Bartfast. So was Trillian. Harmony and Concord were not. "'Well, so I'm alive, aren't I?' retaliated Arthur, haggard with adventure and anger. His eyebrows were leaping up and down as if they wanted to punch each other. "'You damn nearly weren't!' exploded Ford. Arthur turned sharply to Slarty Bartfast, who was sitting in his pilot couch on the flight deck, gazing thoughtfully into the bottom of a bottle that was telling him something he clearly couldn't fathom. He appealed to him. "'Do you think he understands the first word I've been saying?' he said, quivering with emotion. "'I don't know,' replied Slarty Bartfast a little abstractedly. "'I'm not sure,' he added, glancing up very briefly, "'that I do.' He stared at his instruments with renewed vigour and bafflement. "'You'll have to explain it to us again,' he said. "'Well, but later terrible things are afoot.' He tapped the pseudo-glass of the bottle-bottom. "'We fared rather pathetically at the party, I'm afraid,' he said, "'and our only hope now is to try and prevent the robots from using the key in the lock.' "'How in heaven we'd do that, I don't know,' he muttered. "'Just have to go there, I suppose. "'Can't say I like the idea at all. "'Probably end up dead.' Uh, "'Where is Trillian, anyway?' said Arthur, "'with a sudden affectation of unconcern. "'What he had been angry about was that Ford had berated him "'for wasting time over all the business with the Thunder God "'when they could have been making a rather more rapid escape. "'Arthur's own opinion, and he had offered it for whatever anybody might have felt it was worth, "'was that he had been extraordinarily brave and resourceful.' The prevailing view seemed to be that his opinion was not worth a pair of fetid dingo's kidneys. What really hurt, though, was that Trillian didn't seem to react much one way or the other, and had wandered off somewhere. "'And where are my potato crisps?' said Ford. "'They are both,' said Slarty Bartfast, without looking up, "'in the room of informational illusions. I think that your young lady friend is trying to understand some problems of galactic history. I think the potato crisps are probably helping her.' Chapter 24 It is a mistake to think you can solve any major problems just with potatoes. For instance, there was once an insanely aggressive race of people called the Silastic Armorphines of Stritorax. 
that was just the name of their race. The name of their army was something quite horrific. Luckily, they lived even farther back in galactic history than anything we have so far encountered, 20 billion years ago, when the galaxy was young and fresh, and every idea worth fighting for was a new one. And fighting was what the Silastic armor fiends of Striterax were good at, and being good at it, they did it a lot. They fought their enemies, i.e. everybody else, they fought each other. Their planet was a complete wreck. The surface was littered with abandoned cities that were surrounded by abandoned war machines, which were in turn surrounded by deep bunkers in which the Silastic armor fiends lived and squabbled with each other. The best way to pick a fight with the Silastic armor fiend of Striterax was just to be born. They didn't like it, they got resentful. And when an armor fiend got resentful, someone got hurt. An exhausting way of life, one might think, but they did seem to have an awful lot of energy. The best way of dealing with the Silastic armor fiend was to put him in a room on his own, because sooner or later he would simply beat himself up. Eventually they realized that this is something they were going to have to sort out, and they passed a law decreeing that anyone who had to carry a weapon as part of his normal Silastic work, policemen, security guards, primary school teachers, etc., had to spend at least 45 minutes every day punching a sack of potatoes in order to work off his or her surplus aggression. For a while this worked well, until someone thought it would be much more efficient and less time-consuming if they simply shot the potatoes instead. This led to a renewed enthusiasm for shooting all sorts of things, and they all got very excited at the prospect of their first major war for weeks. Another achievement of the Silastic armor fiends of Striterex is that they were the first race who ever managed to shock a computer. It was a gigantic spaceborne computer called Hactar, which to this day is remembered as one of the most powerful ever built. It was the first to be built like a natural brain, in that every cellular particle of it carried the pattern of the whole within it, which enabled it to think more flexibly and imaginatively, and also, it seemed, to be shocked. The Silastic armor fiends of Striterex were engaged in one of their regular wars with the strenuous gar fighters of Stug, and were not enjoying it as much as usual, because it involved an awful lot of trekking through the radiation swamps of Qualzenda and across the fire mountains of Frasfraga, neither of which terrains they felt at home in. So when the strangular stilettons of Jajazikstak joined in the fray and forced them to fight another front in the Gamma Caves of Carfrax and the ice storms of Valanguten, they decided that enough was enough, and they ordered Hactar to design for them an ultimate weapon. What do you mean? asked Hactar, by ultimate, to which the Silastic armor fiends of Striterax said, read a bloody dictionary, and plunged back into the fray. So Hactar designed an ultimate weapon. It was a very, very small bomb that was simply a junction box in hyperspace which would, when activated, connect the heart of every major sun with the heart of every other major sun simultaneously and thus turn the entire universe into one gigantic hyperspatial supernova. When the Silastic armor fiends tried to use it to blow up a strangular stiletton munitions dump in one of the gamma caves, they were extremely irritated that it didn't work, and said so. Hactar had been shocked by the whole idea. He tried to explain that he'd been thinking about this ultimate weapon business and had worked out that there was no conceivable consequence of not setting the bomb off that was worse than the known consequence of setting it off, and he had therefore taken the liberty of introducing a small flaw into the design of the bomb, and he hoped that everyone involved would, on sober reflection, feel that the Silastic armor fiends disagreed and pulverized the computer. Later they thought better of it and destroyed the faulty bomb as well. And then, pausing only to smash the hell out of the strenuous gar fighters of Stug and the strangular stilettons of Jajazikstak, they then went on to find an entirely new way of blowing themselves up, which was a profound relief to everyone else in the galaxy, particularly the gar fighters, the stilettons, and the potatoes. Trillian had watched all this, as well as the story of Cricket. She emerged from the room of informational illusions thoughtfully, just in time to discover that they had arrived too late. Chapter 25 Even as the starship Bistromath flickered into objective being on the top of a small cliff on the mile-wide asteroid that pursued a lonely and eternal path in orbit around the enclosed star system of Cricket, its crew was aware that they were in time only to be witnesses to an unstoppable historic event. They didn't realize they were going to see two. 
They stood, cold, lonely, and helpless, on the cliff edge, and watched the activity below. Lances of light wheeled in sinister arcs against the void, from a point only about a hundred yards below and in front of them. They stared into the blinding event. An extension of the ship's field enabled them to stand there by once again exploiting the mind's predisposition to have tricks played on it. The problems of falling up off the tiny mass of the asteroid or of not being able to breathe simply became somebody else's. The white cricket warship was parked among the stark grey crags of the asteroid, alternately flaring under arc lights or disappearing in shadow. The black shadows cast by the hard rocks danced together in wild choreography as the arc lights swept around them. The eleven white robots were bearing in procession the wicket key out into the middle of a circle of swinging lights. The wicket key had been rebuilt. Its components shone and glittered. The steel pillar, or Marvin's leg, of strength and power, the golden bale, or heart of the infinite improbability drive, of prosperity, the perspex pillar, or Argobuthon scepter of justice, of science and reason, the silver bale, or Rory Award, for the most gratuitous use of the word fuck in a serious screenplay, and the now reconstituted wooden pillar, or ashes of a burnt stump signifying the death of English cricket, of nature and spirituality. I suppose there is nothing we can do at this point, asked Arthur nervously. No, sighed Slarty Bartfast. The expression of disappointment that crossed Arthur's face was a complete failure, and since he was standing obscured by shadow, he allowed it to collapse into one of relief. A pity, he said. We have no weapons, said Slotty Bartfast, stupidly. Uh, damn, said Arthur, very quietly. Ford said nothing. Trillian said nothing, but in a peculiarly thoughtful and distinct way. She was staring at that blankness of the space beyond the asteroid. The asteroid circled the dust cloud that surrounded the slow time envelope that enclosed the world on which lived the people of cricket, the masters of cricket and their killer robots. The helpless group had no way of knowing whether or not the cricket robots were aware of their presence. They could only assume that they must be, but they felt, quite rightly in the circumstances, that they had nothing to fear. They had an historic task to perform, and their audience could be regarded with contempt. "'Terribly impotent feeling, isn't it?' said Arthur, but the others ignored him. In the centre of the area of light that the robots were approaching, a square-shaped crack appeared in the ground. The crack defined itself more and more distinctly, and soon it became clear that a block of the ground, about six feet square, was slowly rising. At the same time, they became aware of some other movement, but it was also subliminal, and for a moment or two it was not clear what it was that was moving. Then it became clear. The asteroid was moving. It was moving in toward the dust cloud, as if being hauled inexorably by some celestial angler in its depths. They were to make in real life the journey through the cloud that they had already made in the room of informational illusions. They stood frozen in silence. Trillian frowned. An age seemed to pass. Events seemed to pass with spinning slowness, as the leading edge of the asteroid passed into the vague and soft outer perimeter of the cloud. And soon they were engulfed in the thin and dancing obscurity. They passed on through it, on and on, dimly aware of vague shapes and walls, indistinguishable in the darkness except in the corner of the eye. The dust dimmed the shafts of brilliant light. The shafts of brilliant light twinkled on the myriad specks of dust. Trillian again regarded the passage from within her own frowning thoughts. And they were through it. Whether it had taken a minute or half an hour, they weren't sure, but they were through it and confronted with a fresh blankness, as if space were pinched out of existence in front of them. And now things moved quickly. A blinding shaft of light seemed almost to explode from out of the block that had risen three feet out of the ground, and out of that rose a smaller perspex block, dazzling with interior dancing colours. The block was slotted with deep grooves, three upright and two across, 
clearly designed to accept the wicket key. The robots approached the lock, slotted the key into its home, and stepped back again. The block twisted around of its own accord, and space began to alter. As space unpinched itself, it seemed agonizingly to twist the eyes of the watchers in their sockets. They found themselves staring, blinded, at an unraveled sun that stood now before them, where it seemed only seconds before there had not been even empty space. It was a second or two before they were even sufficiently aware of what had happened to throw their hands up over their horrified, blinded eyes. In that second or two they were aware of a tiny speck moving slowly across the eye of that sun. They staggered back and heard ringing in their ears the thin and unexpected chant of the robots crying out in unison, Cricket! 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 The sound chilled them. It was harsh, it was cold, it was empty, it was mechanically dismal. It was also triumphant. They were so stunned by these two sensory shocks that they almost missed the second historic event. Zaphod Beeblebrox, the only man in history to survive a direct blast attack from the cricket robots, ran out of the cricket warship, brandishing a zap gun. Okay, he cried, the situation is totally under control as of this moment in time. The single robot guarding the hatchway to the ship silently swung his battle club and connected it with the back of Zaphod's left head. Who the Zark did that? said his left head and lolled sickeningly forward. His right head gazed keenly into the middle distance. Who did what? it said. The club connected with the back of his right head. Zaphod measured his length and rather strange shape on the ground. Within a matter of seconds the whole event was over. A few blasts from the robot were sufficient to destroy the lock forever. It split and melted, and splayed its contents brokenly, and the robots marched grimly, and it almost seemed, in a slightly disheartened manner, back into their warship, which, with a foop, was gone. Trillian and Ford ran hectically around and down the steep incline to the dark, still body of Zaphod Beeblebrox. Chapter 26 "'I don't know,' said Zaphod, for what seemed to him like the thirty-seventh time. "'They could have killed me, but they didn't. Maybe they just thought I was a kind of wonderful guy or something. I could understand that.' The others silently registered their opinions of this theory. Zaphod lay on the cold floor of the flight deck. His back seemed to wrestle the floor as pain thudded through him and banged at his heads. "'I think—' he whispered, that there's something wrong with those anodized dudes, something fundamentally weird. They are programmed to kill everybody, Slotty Bartfast pointed out. That, wheezed Zaphod between the whacking thuds, could be it. He didn't seem altogether convinced. Hey, baby, he said to Trillian, hoping this would make up for his previous behavior. You all right, she said gently. Yeah, he said, I'm fine. Good, she said, and walked away to think. She stared at the huge visi screen over the flight couches, and, twisting a switch, she flipped local images over it. One image was the blankness of the dust cloud, one was the sun of cricket, one was cricket itself. She flipped between them fiercely. "'Well, that's goodbye galaxy, then,' said Arthur, slapping his knees and standing up. "'No,' said Slarty Bartfast gravely, "'our course is clear.' He furrowed his brow until you could grow some of the smaller root vegetables in it. He stood up, he paced around. When he spoke again, what he said frightened him so much he had to sit down again. "'We must go down to cricket,' he said. A deep sigh shook his old frame, and his eyes seemed almost to rattle in their sockets. "'Once again,' he said, "'we have failed pathetically, quite pathetically.' "'That,' said Ford quietly, "'is because we don't care enough, I told you.' He swung his feet up onto the instrument panel and picked fitfully at something on one of his fingernails. "'But unless we determine to take action,' said the old man querulously, as if struggling against something deeply insouciant in his nature, "'then we shall all be destroyed. We shall all die. Surely we care about that.' "'Yeah, not enough to want to get killed over it,' said Ford. He put on a sort of hollow smile and flipped it around the room at anyone who wanted to see it. 
Slaty Bartfast clearly found this point of view extremely seductive, and he fought against it. He turned again to Zaphod, who was gritting his teeth and sweating with the pain. "'You surely must have some idea,' he said, "'of why they spared your life. It seems most strange and unusual.' "'I kind of think they didn't know,' shrugged Zaphod. "'I told you, they hit me with the most feeble blast, just knocked me out, right? "'They lugged me under their ship, dumped me in a corner, and ignored me, "'like they were embarrassed about me being there. "'If I said anything, they knocked me out again. "'We had some great conversations. "'Hey, uh, hi there, uh, I wonder, uh, kept me amused for hours, you know.' "'He winced again. "'He was toying with something in his fingers. "'He held it up. "'It was the golden bale.' the heart of gold, the heart of the infinite improbability drive. Only that and the wooden pillar had survived the destruction of the lock intact. "'I hear your ship can move a bit,' he said. "'So how'd you like to zip me back to mine before you—' "'Will you not help us?' said Slarty Bartfast. "'Us?' said Ford sharply. "'Who's us?' "'I'd love to stay and help you save the galaxy,' insisted Zaford, raising himself up onto his shoulders. "'But I have the mother and father of a pair of headaches, and I feel a lot of little headaches coming on. "'But next time we need saving, I'm your guy. Hey, Trillion Baby!' She looked around briefly. "'Yes? You want to come, Heart of Gold? Excitement and adventure and really wild things?' "'I'm going down to cricket,' she said. Chapter 27 it was the same hill, and yet not the same. This time it was not an informational illusion. This was cricket itself, and they were standing on it. Near them, behind the trees, stood the strange Italian restaurant that had brought these, their real bodies, to this, the real, present world of cricket. The strong grass under their feet was real, the rich soil real, too. The heady fragrances from the tree, too, were real. The night was real night. Cricket. Possibly the most dangerous place in the galaxy for anyone who isn't a cricketer to stand. The place that could not countenance the existence of any other place, whose charming, delightful, intelligent inhabitants would howl with fear, savagery, and murderous hate when confronted with anyone not their own. Arthur shuddered. Slotty Bartfast shuddered. Ford, surprisingly, shuddered. It was not surprising that he shuddered, it was surprising that he was there at all. But when they had returned Zaphod to his ship, Ford had felt unexpectedly shamed into not running away. Wrong, he thought to himself, wrong, wrong, wrong. He hugged to himself one of the zap guns with which they had armed themselves out of Zaphod's armory. Trillian shuddered and frowned as she looked into the sky. This, too, was not the same. It was no longer blank and empty. While the countryside around them had changed little in the two thousand years of the cricket wars, and the mere five years that had elapsed locally since cricket was sealed in its slow time envelope ten billion years ago, the sky was dramatically different. Dim lights and heavy shapes hung in it. High in the sky, where no cricketer ever looked, were the war zones, the robot zones, huge warships and tower blocks floating in the Nilograv fields far above the idyllic pastoral lands of the surface of cricket. Trillian stared at them and thought. Trillian, whispered Ford Prefect to her. Yes, she said. What are you doing? Thinking. Do you always breathe like that when you're thinking? I wasn't aware that I was breathing. That's what worried me. I think I know, said Trillian. Shh, said Slotty Bartfast in alarm, and his thin, trembling hand motioned them farther back beneath the shadow of the tree. Suddenly, as before in the tape, there were lights coming along the hill path. But this time the dancing beams were not from lanterns, but flashlights, not in itself a dramatic change, but every detail made their hearts thump with fear. This time there were no lilting, whimsical songs about flowers and farming and dead dogs, but hushed voices in urgent debate. A light moved in the sky with slow weight. Arthur was clenched with the claustrophobic terror, and the warm wind caught at his throat. Within seconds a second party became visible, approaching from the other side of the dark hill. They were moving swiftly and purposefully, their flashlights swinging and probing around them. 
The parties were clearly converging, and not merely with each other. They were converging deliberately on the spot where Arthur and the others were standing. Arthur heard the slight rustle as Ford Prefect raised his zap gun to his shoulder, and the slight whimpering cough as Slarty Bartfast raised his. He felt the cold, unfamiliar weight of his own gun, and with shaking hands he raised it. His fingers fumbled to release the safety catch and engaged the extreme danger catch, as Ford had shown him. He was shaking so much that if he had fired at anybody at that moment he probably would have burnt his signature on them. Only Trillian didn't raise her gun. She raised her eyebrows, lowered them again, and bit her lip in thought. "'Has it occurred to you?' she began, but nobody wanted to discuss anything much at the moment. A light stabbed through the darkness from behind them, and they spun round to find a third party of cricketers behind them, searching them out with their flashlights. Ford Prefect's gun crackled viciously, but fire spat back at it and it crashed from his hands. There was a moment of pure fear, a frozen second before anyone fired again, and at the end of the second, nobody fired. They were surrounded by pale-faced cricketers and bathed in bobbing torchlight. The captives stared at their captors. The captors stared at their captives. Hello, said one of the captors. Excuse me, but are you aliens? Chapter 28 Meanwhile, more millions of miles away than the mind can comfortably encompass, Zaphod Beeblebrox was feeling bored. He had repaired his ship, that is, he had watched with alert interest while a service robot had repaired it for him. It was now, once again, one of the most powerful and extraordinary ships in existence. He could go anywhere, do anything. He fiddled with the book, and then tossed it away. It was the one he'd read before. He walked over to the communications bank and opened an all-frequencies emergency channel. "'Anyone want a drink?' he asked. "'This an emergency, fella?' crackled a voice from halfway across the galaxy. "'Got any mixers?' said Zaphod. Uh, go take a ride on a comet. Okay, okay, said Zaphod, and flipped the channel shut again. He sighed and sat down. He got up again and wandered over to a computer screen. He pushed a few buttons. Little blobs started to rush around the screen, eating each other. Pow, said Zaphod. Free you! Pop, pop, pop! Hi there, said the computer briefly after a minute of this. You have scored three points. Previous best score, 7,797,200. Okay, okay, said Zaphod and flipped the screen blank again. He sat down again. He played with the pencil. This, too, began slowly to lose its fascination. OK, OK, he said, and fed his score and the previous best one into the computer. His ship made a blur of the universe. Chapter 29 Tell us said the thin, pale-faced cricketer, who had stepped forward from the ranks of the others, and stood uncertainly in the circle of light, handling his gun as if he was just holding it for someone else who'd just popped off somewhere, but will be back in a minute. D do you know anything about something called the balance of nature? There was no reply from their captives, or at least nothing more articulate than a few confused mumbles and grunts. The flashlight continued to play over them, High in the sky above them, dark activity continued in the robot zones. It's just, continued the cricketer uneasily, something we heard about. Um, probably nothing important. Well, I suppose we'd better kill you, then. He looked down at his gun as if he were trying to find which bit to press. Um, that is, he said, looking up again, unless there's anything you want to chat about. Slow, numb astonishment crept up the bodies of Slarty Bartfast, Ford, and Arthur. Very soon it would reach their brains, which were at the moment solely occupied with moving their jawbones up and down. Trillian was shaking her head, as if trying to finish a jigsaw puzzle by shaking the box. "'We're worried, you see,' said another man from the crowd, "'about this plan of uh, universal destruction.' "'Yes,' added another, and the balance of nature. It just seemed to us that if the whole of the rest of the universe is destroyed, it'll somehow um, upset the balance. Um, we're, we're quite keen on ecology, you see. His voice trailed away unhappily. And sport, said another loudly. This got a cheer of approval from the others. 
Uh, yes, agreed the first. A and sport. He looked back at his fellows uneasily and scratched fitfully at his cheek. He seemed to be wrestling with some deep inner confusion, as if everything he wanted to say and everything he thought were entirely different things between which he could see no possible connection. Uh, you see, he mumbled, uh, some of us, and he looked around again as if for confirmation. The others made encouraging noises. Some of us, he continued, are, are quite keen to have sporting links with the rest of the galaxy, and though I can see the argument about keeping sport out of politics, I think that if we want to have sporting links with the rest of the galaxy, which we do, then it's probably a mistake to destroy it, and indeed the rest of the universe. Um, his voice trailed away again, which is what seems to be the idea now. What? said Slarty Bartfast. What? Huh? said Arthur. Dri! said Ford Prefect. OK, said Trillian. Let's talk about it. She walked forward and took the poor, confused cricketer by the arm. He looked about twenty-five, which meant, because of the peculiar manglings of time that had been going on in this area, that he would have been just twenty when the cricket wars were finished ten billion years ago. Trillian led him for a short walk through the light before she said anything more. He stumbled uncertainly after her. The encircling flashlight beams were drooping slightly now, as if they were abdicating to the strange, quiet girl who alone in this universe of dark confusion seemed to know what she was doing. She turned and faced him, and lightly held both his arms. He was a picture of bewildered misery. "'Tell me,' she said. He said nothing for a moment, while his gaze darted from one of her eyes to the other. "'We,' he said, "'we have to be alone, uh, I think.' He screwed up his face and then dropped his head forward, shaking it like someone trying to shake a coin out of a money box. He looked up again. "'We have this bomb now, you see,' he said. "'It's just a little one.' "'I know,' she said. He goggled at her as if she'd said something very strange about beetroots. Honestly, he said, it's very, very little. I know, she said again. Uh, but they say, his voice trailed on, they say it can destroy everything that exists. And, and we have to do that, you see, I, I think. Uh, will that make us alone? I, I don't know. It seems to be our function, though, he said, and dropped his head again. Whatever that means said a hollow voice from the crowd. Trillian slowly put her arms around the poor, bewildered young cricketer and patted his trembling head on her shoulder. It's all right, she said, quietly, but clearly enough for all the shadowy crowd to hear. You don't have to do it. She rocked him. You don't have to do it, she said again. She let him go and stood back. I want you to do something for me, she said, and unexpectedly laughed. I want, she said and laughed again. She put her hand over her mouth and then said with a straight face, I want you to take me to your leader. And she pointed into the war zones in the sky. She seemed somehow to know that their leader would be there. Her laughter seemed to discharge something in the atmosphere. From somewhere at the back of the crowd, a single voice started to sing a tune that would have enabled Paul McCartney, had he written it, to buy the world. Chapter 30 Zaphod Beeblebrox crawled bravely along a tunnel like the hell of a guy he was. He was very confused, but continued crawling doggedly anyway because he was that brave. He was confused by something he had just seen, but not half as confused as he was going to be by something he was about to hear, so it would be best at this point to explain exactly where he was. He was in the robot war zones, many miles above the surface of the planet Cricket. The atmosphere was thin here, and relatively unprotected from any rays or anything that space might care to hurl in this direction. He had parked the starship Heart of Gold among the huge, jostling, dim hulks that crowded the sky here above Cricket, and had entered what appeared to be the biggest and most important of the sky buildings, armed with nothing but a zap gun and something for his headaches. He had found himself in a long, wide and badly lit corridor, in which he was able to hide until he worked out what he was going to do next. He hid, because every now and then one of the cricket robots would walk along it. 
and although he had so far led some kind of charmed life at their hands, it had nevertheless been an extremely painful one, and he had no desire to stretch what he was only half inclined to call his good fortune. He had ducked at one point into a room leading off the corridor, and had discovered it to be a huge and again dimly lit chamber. In fact, it was a museum with just one exhibit, the wreckage of a spacecraft. It was terribly burnt and mangled, and now that he'd caught up with some of the galactic history he'd missed through his failed attempts to have sex with the girl in the cyber cubicle next to him at school, he was able to put in an intelligent guess that this was the wrecked spaceship that had drifted through the dust cloud all those billions of years ago and started this whole business off. But, and this is where he had become confused, there was something not at all right about it. It was genuinely wrecked, it was genuinely burnt, but a fairly brief inspection by an experienced eye revealed that it was not a genuine spacecraft. It was as if it were a full-scale model of one, a solid blueprint. In other words, it was a very useful thing to have around if you suddenly decided to build a spaceship yourself and didn't know how to do it. It was not, however, anything that would ever fly anywhere itself. He was still puzzling over this, in fact he'd only just started to puzzle over it, when he became aware that a door had slid open in another part of the chamber and another couple of cricket robots had entered, looking a little glum. Zayford did not want to tangle with them, and deciding that just as discretion was the better part of valour, so was cowardice the better part of discretion, he valiantly hid himself in a cupboard. The cupboard, in fact, turned out to be the top part of a shaft that led down through an inspection hatch into a wide ventilation tunnel. He let himself down into it and started to crawl along it. He didn't like it. It was cold, dark, and profoundly uncomfortable, and it frightened him. At the first opportunity, which was another shaft a hundred yards further along, he climbed back up out of it. This time he emerged into a smaller chamber, which appeared to be a computer intelligence centre. He emerged in a dark, narrow space between a large computer bank and the wall. He quickly learned that he was not alone in the chamber, and started to leave again when he began to listen with interest to what the other occupants were saying. "'It's the robots, sir,' said one voice. "'There's something wrong with them.' "'What exactly?' These were the voices of two War Command cricketers. All the war commanders lived up in the sky in the robot war zones and were largely immune to the whimsical doubts and uncertainties that were afflicting their fellows down on the surface of the planet. Well, sir, I think it's just as well that they're being phased out of the war effort and that we are now going to detonate the supernova bomb. In the very short time since we were released from the envelope, get to the point. The robots aren't enjoying it, sir. What? The war, sir, it seems to be getting them down. There's a certain world weariness about them, or perhaps I should say universe weariness. Well, that's all right. They're meant to be helping to destroy it. Oh, yes, well, they're finding it difficult, sir. They're afflicted with a certain lassitude. They're just finding it hard to get behind the job. They lack oomph. What are you trying to say? Well, I think they're very depressed about something, sir. What on cricket are you talking about? Well, in the few skirmishes they've had recently, it seems that they go into battle, raise their weapons to fire, and suddenly think, why bother? What, cosmically speaking, is it all about? And they just seem to get a little tired and a little grim. And then what do they do? Uh, quadratic equations, mostly, sir. Fiendishly difficult ones, by all accounts. And then they sulk. Sulk? Yes, sir. Who ever heard of a robot sulking? I don't know, sir. What was that noise? It was the noise of Zaphod leaving with his heads spinning. Chapter 31 In a deep well of darkness, a crippled robot sat. It had been silent in its metallic darkness for some time. It was cold and damp, but being a robot it was supposed not to be able to notice these things. With an enormous effort of will, however, it did manage to notice them. Its brain had been harnessed to the central intelligence core of the cricket war computer. It wasn't enjoying the experience, and neither was the central intelligence of the cricket war computer. The cricket robots, who had salvaged this pathetic metal creature from the swamps of Squanchula Zeta, had done so because they had recognized almost immediately its gigantic intelligence and the use this could be to them. They hadn't reckoned with the attendant personality disorders. 
which the coldness, the darkness, the dampness, the crampness, and the loneliness were doing nothing to decrease. It was not happy with its task. Apart from anything else, the mere coordination of an entire planet's military strategy was only taking up a tiny part of its formidable mind, and the rest of it had become extremely bored. Having solved all the major mathematical, physical, chemical, biological, sociological, philosophical, etymological, meteorological, and psychological problems of the universe, except his own, three times over, he was severely stuck for something to do, and had taken up composing short, dolorous ditties of no tone, or indeed tune. The latest one was a lullaby. Marvin droned. Now the world has gone to bed. Darkness won't engulf my head. I can see by infrared. How I hate the night. He paused to gather the artistic and emotional strength to tackle the next verse. Now I lay me down to sleep, try to count electric sheep. Sweet dream wishes you can keep. How I hate the night. Marvin, hissed a voice. His head snapped up, almost dislodging the intricate network of electrodes that connected him to the central cricket war computer. An inspection hatch had opened, and one of a pair of unruly heads was peering through while the other kept on jogging it by continually darting to look this way and that extremely nervously. "'Oh, it's you,' muttered the robot. "'I might have known.' "'Hey, kid,' said Zaphod in astonishment. "'Was that you singing just then?' "'I am,' Marvin acknowledged bitterly, "'in particularly scintillating form at the moment.' Zaphod poked his head into the hatchway and looked around. Are you alone? he said. Yes, said Marvin. Wearily I sit here, pain and misery my only companions, and vast intelligence, of course, and infinite sorrow, and... Yeah, said Zayford. Yeah, what's, what's your connection with all this? This, said Marvin, indicating with his less damaged arm all the electrodes that connected him with the cricket computer. Then, said Zayford awkwardly, I guess you must have saved my life. Twice. Three times, said Marvin. Zaphod's head snapped round. His other one was looking hawkishly in entirely the wrong direction, just in time to see the lethal killer robot directly behind him seize up and start to smoke. It staggered backward and slumped against a wall. It slid down. It slipped sideways, threw its head back, and started to sob inconsolably. Zaphod looked back at Marvin. You must have a terrific outlook on life, he said. "'Just don't even ask,' said Marvin. "'I won't,' said Zaphod, and didn't. "'Hey, look,' he added, "'you're doing a terrific job.' "'Which means, I suppose,' said Marvin, "'and requiring only one ten thousand million billion trillion greenth "'part of his mental powers to make this particular logical leap, "'that you're not going to release me or anything like that. "'Kid, you know, I'd love to. "'But you're not going to. "'No. "'I see.' You're working well. Yes, said Marvin. Why stop now, just when I'm hating it? I have to go find Trillian and the guys. Hey, you any idea where they are? I mean, I just got a planet to choose from. Could take a while. They are very close, said Marvin dolefully. You can monitor them from here, if you like. I'd better go get them, asserted Zaphod. Uh, maybe they need some help, right? Maybe said Marvin, with unexpected authority in his lugubrious voice. It would be better if you monitored them from here. That young girl, he added unexpectedly, is one of the least benightedly unintelligent organic life forms it has been my profound lack of pleasure not to be able to avoid meeting. Zaphod took a moment or two to find his way through this labyrinthine string of negatives and emerged at the other end with surprise. Trillion, he said. Ah, oh, she's just a kid. Cute, yeah, but temperamental. You know how it is with women. Well, perhaps you don't. I assume you don't. If you don't, I don't want to hear about it. Plug us in. Totally manipulated. What? said Zaphod. It was Trillion speaking. He turned round. The wall against which the cricket robot was sobbing had lit up to reveal a scene taking place in some other unknown part of the cricket robot war zones. It seemed to be a council chamber of some kind. Zaphod couldn't make it out too clearly because of the robot slumped against the screen. 
He tried to move the robot, but it was heavy with its grief, and tried to bite him, so he just looked around it as best he could. Just think about it, said Trillian's voice. Your history is just a series of freakishly improbable events, and I know an improbable event when I see one. Your complete isolation from the galaxy was freakish for a start. Right out on the very edge with a dust cloud around you? It's a setup, obviously. Zayford was mad with frustration that he couldn't see the screen. The robot's head was obscuring his view of the people Trillian was talking to. Its multifunctional battle club was obscuring the background, and the elbow of the arm it had pressed tragically against its brow was obscuring Trillian herself. Then, said Trillian, the spaceship that crash-landed on your planet. That's really likely, isn't it? Have you any idea what the odds are against a drifting spaceship accidentally intersecting with the orbit of a planet? Hey, said Zayford, she doesn't know what the Zark she's talking about. I've seen that spaceship. It's a fake. No deal. I thought it might be, said Marvin from his prison behind Zayford. Oh, yeah, said Zayford. It's easy for you to say that. I just told you. Anyway, I don't see what it's got to do with anything. And especially, continued Trillian, the odds against it intersecting with the orbit of the one planet in the galaxy, or the whole of the universe, as far as I know, that will be totally traumatised to see it. You don't know what the odds are, nor do I. They're that big. Again, it's a setup. I wouldn't be surprised if that spaceship was just a fake. Zayford managed to move the robot's battle club. Behind it on the screen were the figures of Ford, Arthur, and Slarty Bartfast, who appeared astonished and bewildered by the whole thing. Hey, look, said Zayford excitedly. The guys are doing great. Ra, ra, ra. Go get them, guys. And what about, said Trillian, all this technology you suddenly managed to build for yourselves almost overnight? Most people would take thousands of years to do all that. Someone was feeding you what you needed to know. Someone was keeping you at it. I know, I know, she added in response to some unseen interruption. I know you didn't realize it was going on. That is exactly my point. You never realized anything at all. Like the supernova bomb. How do you know about that? said an unseen voice. I just know, said Trillian. You expect me to believe that you are bright enough to invent something that brilliant and would be too dumb to realize it would take you with it as well? That's not just stupid, that's spectacularly obtuse. Hey, what's this bomb thing? said Zayford in alarm to Marvin. The supernova bomb, said Marvin. It's a very, very small bomb. Yeah? That would destroy the universe completely, added Marvin. Good idea, if you ask me. They won't get it to work, though. Why not if it's so brilliant? It's brilliant, said Marvin. They're not. They got as far as designing it before they were locked in the envelope. They've spent the last five years building it. They think they've got it right, but they haven't. They're as stupid as any other organic life form. I hate them. Trillian was continuing. Zayford tried to pull the cricket robot away by its leg, but it kicked and growled at him, and then quaked with a fresh outburst of sobbing. Then suddenly it slumped over and continued to express its feelings out of everybody's way on the floor. Trillian was standing alone in the middle of the chamber, tired but with fiercely burning eyes. Ranged in front of her were the pale-faced and wrinkled elder masters of cricket, motionless behind their widely curved control desk, staring at her with helpless fear and hatred. In front of them, equidistant between their control desk and the middle of the chamber where Trillian stood, as if on trial, was a slim white pillar about four feet tall. On top of it stood a small white globe about three, maybe four inches in diameter. Beside it, stood a cricket robot with its multifunctional battle club. "'In fact,' explained Trillian, "'you are so dumb stupid.' She was sweating. Zayford felt this was an unattractive thing for her to be doing at this point. "'You're all so dumb stupid that I doubt, I very much doubt, if you've been able to build the bomb properly without any help from Hactar for the last five years.' "'Who's this guy Hactar? said Zayford, squaring his shoulders. If Marvin replied, Zayford didn't hear him. All his attention was concentrated on the screen. One of the elders of Cricket made a small motion with his hand toward the Cricket robot. The robot raised its club. "'There's nothing I can do,' said Marvin. "'It's on an independent circuit from the others.' "'Wait!' said Trillian. The elder made a small motion. The robot halted. 
Trillian suddenly seemed very doubtful of her own judgment. How do you know all this? said Zaphod to Marvin at this point. Computer records, said Marvin. I have access. You're very different, aren't you? said Trillian to the elder masters. From your fellow worldlings down on the ground, you've spent all your lives up here, unprotected by the atmosphere. You've been vulnerable. The rest of your race is very frightened, you know. They don't want you to do this. You're out of touch. Why don't you check up? The cricket elder grew impatient. He made a gesture to the robot that was precisely the opposite of the gesture he had last made to it. The robot swung its battle club. It hit the small white globe. The small white globe was the supernova bomb. It was a very, very small bomb that was designed to bring the entire universe to an end. The supernova bomb flew through the air. It hit the back wall of the council chamber and dented it very badly. So how does she know all this? said Zaphod. Marvin kept a sullen silence. Ah, probably just bluffing, said Zaphod. Poor kid, I should never have left her alone. Chapter 32 Hactar, called Trillian. What are you up to? There was no reply from the enclosing darkness. Trillian waited nervously. She was sure that she couldn't be wrong. She peered into the gloom from which she had been expecting some kind of response, but there was only cold silence. Hactar, she called again. I would like you to meet my friend Arthur Dent. I wanted to go off with a thunder god, but he wouldn't let me, and I appreciate that. He made me realise where my affections really lay. Unfortunately, Zaphod is too frightened by all this, so I brought Arthur instead. I'm not sure why I'm telling you all this. Hello, she said again. Hactar! And then it came. It was thin and feeble, like a voice carried on the wind from a great distance, half heard a memory or a dream of a voice. Won't you both come out? said this voice. I promise that you will be perfectly safe. They glanced at each other, and then stepped out, improbably along the shaft of light that streamed out of the open hatchway of the Heart of Gold into the dim, granular darkness of the dust cloud. Arthur tried to hold her hand to steady and reassure her, but she wouldn't let him. He held on to his holdall with its tin of Greek olive oil, its towel, its crumpled postcards of Santorini and its other odds and ends. He steadied and reassured that instead. They were standing on and in nothing. Murky, dusty nothing. Each grain of dust of the pulverized computer sparkled dimly as it turned and twisted slowly, catching the sunlight in the darkness. Each particle of the computer, each speck of dust, held within itself faintly and weakly the pattern of the whole. In reducing the computer to dust, the silastic armor fiends of Stritorex had merely crippled the computer, not killed it. A weak and insubstantial field held the particles in slight relationship with each other. Arthur and Trillian stood, or rather floated, in the middle of this bizarre entity. They had nothing to breathe, but for the moment this seemed not to matter. Hakdar kept his promise. They were safe. For the moment. I have nothing to offer you by way of hospitality, said Hactar faintly, but tricks of the light. It is possible to be comfortable with tricks of the light, though, if that is all you have. His voice evenesced, and in the dark, a long, velvet, paisley-covered sofa coalesced into hazy shape. Arthur could hardly bear the fact that it was the same sofa that had appeared to him in the fields of prehistoric earth. He wanted to shout and shake with rage that the universe kept doing these insanely bewildering things to him. He let this feeling subside, 
and then sat on the sofa carefully. Trillian sat on it too. It was real. At least if it wasn't real, it did support them. And as that is what sofas are supposed to do, this, by any test that mattered, was a real sofa. The voice on the solar wind breathed to them again. I hope you are comfortable, it said. They nodded. And I would like to congratulate you on the accuracy of your deductions. Arthur quickly pointed out that he hadn't deduced anything much himself. Trillian was the one. She had simply asked him along because he was interested in life, the universe, and everything. That is something in which I, too, am interested, breathed Hector. Well, said Arthur, we should have a chat about it sometime, over a cup of tea. There slowly materialised in front of them a small wooden table, on which sat a silver teapot, a bone-china milk jug, a bone-china sugar bowl, and two bone-china cups and saucers. Arthur reached forward, but they were just a trick of the light. He leaned back on the sofa, which was an illusion his body was prepared to accept as comfortable. Why, said Trillian, do you feel you have to destroy the universe? She found it a little difficult talking into nothingness, with nothing on which to focus. Haktar obviously noticed this. He chuckled a ghostly chuckle. If it's going to be that sort of session, he said, we may as well have the right sort of setting. And now there materialized in front of them something new. It was the dim, hazy image of a couch, a psychiatrist's couch. The leather with which it was upholstered was shiny and sumptuous, but again it was only a trick of the light. Around them, to complete the setting, was the hazy suggestion of wood-panelled walls, and then on the couch appeared the image of Haktar himself, and it was an eye-twisting image. The couch looked normal size for a psychiatrist's couch, about five or six feet long. The computer looked normal size for a black space-borne computer satellite, about a thousand miles across. The illusion that one was sitting on top of the other was the thing that made the eyes twist. All right, said Trillian firmly. She stood up from the sofa. She felt that she was being asked to feel too comfortable and to accept too many illusions. Very good, she said. Can you construct real things, too? I mean, solid objects. Again, there was the pause before the answer, as if the pulverized mind of Haktar had to collect its thoughts from the millions and millions of miles over which it was scattered. Ah, he sighed. You are thinking of the spaceship. Thoughts seem to drift by them and through them like waves through the ether. Yes, he acknowledged, I can, but it takes enormous effort and time. All I can do in my particle state, you see, is encourage and suggest, encourage and suggest, and suggest. The image of Haktar on the couch seemed to billow and waver as if finding it hard to maintain itself. It gathered new strength. I can encourage and suggest, it said, tiny pieces of space debris, the odd minute meteor, a few molecules here, a few hydrogen atoms there, to move together. I encourage them together. I can tease them into shape, but it takes many eons. So did you make, asked Trillian again, the model of the wrecked spacecraft? Uh, yes, murmured Haktar. I have made a few things. I can move them about. I made the spacecraft. It seemed best to do. Something at this point made Arthur pick up his hold-all from where he had left it on the sofa and grasp it tightly. The mist of Haktar's ancient shattered mind swirled about them as if uneasy dreams were moving through it. I repented, you see, he murmured dolefully. I repented of sabotaging my own design for the Silastic armor fiends. It was not my place to make such decisions. 
I was created to fulfill a function, and I failed in it. I negated my own existence. Hakhtar sighed, and they waited in silence for him to continue his story. You were right, he said at length. I deliberately nurtured the planet of cricket, till they would arrive at the same state of mind as the silastic armor fiends, and require of me the design of the bomb I failed to make the first time. I wrapped myself around the planet and coddled it. Under the influence of events I was able to engineer, and influences I was able to generate, they learnt to hate like maniacs. I had to make them live in the sky. On the ground my influences were too weak. Without me, of course, when they were locked away from me in the envelope of slow time, their responses became very confused, and they were unable to manage. Ah, well, ah, well, he added. I was only trying to fulfill my function. And very gradually, very, very slowly, the images in the cloud began to fade, gently to melt away. And then suddenly they stopped fading. There was also the matter of revenge, of course, said Hakhtar, with a sharpness that was new in his voice. Remember, he said, that I was pulverized and then left in a crippled and semi-impotent state for billions of years. I honestly would rather like to wipe out the universe. You would feel the same way, believe me. He paused as eddies swept through the dust. But primarily, he said in his former wistful tone, I was trying to fulfill my function. Ah, well. Trillian said, Does it worry you that you have failed? Have I failed? whispered Hakhtar. The image of the computer on the psychiatrist's couch began slowly to fade again. Ah, well. Ah, well. The fading voice intoned again. No, failure doesn't bother me now. You know what we have to do, said Trillian, her voice cold and businesslike. Yes, said Hakdar. You're going to disperse me. You are going to destroy my consciousness. Please be my guest. After all these eons, oblivion is all I crave. If I haven't already fulfilled my function, then it's too late now. Thank you, and good night. The sofa vanished. The tea table vanished. The couch and the computer vanished. The walls were gone. Arthur and Trillian made their curious way back into the heart of gold. Well, that, said Arthur, would appear to be that. The flames danced higher in front of him and then subsided. A few last licks and they were gone, leaving him with just a pile of ashes, where a few minutes previously there had been the wooden pillar of nature and spirituality. He scooped them off the hob of the Heart of Gold's Gamma barbecue, put them in a paper bag, and walked back onto the bridge. I think we should take them back, he said. I feel that very strongly. He had already had an argument with Snarty Bartfuss on this matter, and eventually the old man had got annoyed and left. He had returned to his own ship, the Bistromath, had a furious row with the waiter, and disappeared off into an entirely subjective idea of what space was. 
The argument had arisen because Arthur's idea of returning the ashes to Lord's cricket ground at the same moment they were originally taken would involve travelling back in time a day or so, and this was precisely the sort of gratuitous and irresponsible mucking about that the campaign for real time was trying to put a stop to. Yes, Arthur had said, but you try and explain that to the MCC, and would hear no more against the idea. I think, he said, and stopped. The reason he started to say it again was that no one had listened to him the first time, and the reason he stopped was that it looked fairly clear that no one was going to listen to him this time either. Ford, Zayford, and Trillian were watching the visi screen intently. Hactar was dispersing under pressure from a vibration field which the Heart of Gold was pumping into it. What did it say? asked Ford. I thought I heard it say, said Trillian in a puzzled voice. What's done is done. I have fulfilled my function. I think we should take these back, said Arthur, holding up the bag containing the ashes. I feel that very strongly. Chapter 33 The sun was shining calmly on a scene of complete havoc. Smoke was still billowing across the burnt grass in the wake of the theft of the ashes by the cricket robots. Through the smoke, people were running, panic-stricken, colliding with each other, tripping over stretchers, being arrested. One policeman was attempting to arrest Wildbagger the infinitely prolonged for insulting behaviour, but was unable to prevent the tall, grey-green alien from returning to his ship and arrogantly flying away, thus causing even more panic and pandemonium. In the middle of this suddenly materialised for the second time that afternoon the figures of Arthur Denton Ford Prefect, who had teleported down out of the Heart of Gold, which was now in parking orbit around the planet. "'I can explain!' shouted Arthur. "'I have the ashes! They're in this bag!' "'I don't think you have their attention,' said Ford. "'I have also helped save the universe!' called Arthur to anyone who was prepared to listen. In other words, no one. "'That should have been a crowd-stopper,' said Arthur to Ford. "'It wasn't,' said Ford. Arthur accosted a policeman who was running past. Uh, "'Excuse me,' he said. "'The ashes. I've got them. They were stolen by those white robots a moment ago. I've got them in this bag. They were part of the key to slow time envelope, you see. And, well, anyway, you can guess the rest. The point is, I've got them, and what shall I do with them?' The policeman told him, but Arthur could only assume he was speaking metaphorically. He wandered about disconsolately. "'There's no one interested,' he shouted. A man rushed past him and jogged his elbow. He dropped the paper bag, and it spilt its contents all over the ground." Arthur stared down at it with a tight-set mouth. Ford looked at him. "'Want to go now?' he said. Arthur heaved a heavy sigh. He looked around at the planet Earth for what he was now certain would be the last time. "'Okay,' he said. At that moment he caught sight through the clearing smoke of one of the wickets still standing in spite of everything. "'Hold on a moment,' he said to Ford. "'When I was a boy—can you tell me later?' said Ford. "'I had a passion for cricket, you know, but I wasn't very good at it. "'Or not at all, if you prefer. "'And I always dreamed, rather stupidly, that one day I would bowl at Lord's.' "'He looked around him at the panic-stricken throng. "'No one was going to mind very much. "'Okay,' said Ford wearily. "'Get it over with. I shall be over there,' he added, being bored. He went and sat down on a patch of smoking grass. Arthur remembered that on their first visit there that afternoon, the cricket ball had actually landed in his bag, and he looked through the bag. He had already found the ball in it before he remembered that it wasn't the same bag he'd had at the time. Still, there it was among the souvenirs of Greece. He took it out and polished it against his hip, spat on it and polished it again. He put the bag down. He was going to do this properly. He tossed the small, hard red ball from hand to hand, feeling its weight. With a wonderful feeling of lightness and unconcern, he trotted off away from the wicket. A medium-fast pace, he decided, and measured a good long run-up. He looked up into the sky. The birds were wheeling about, a few white clouds scudded across it. The air was disturbed with the sound of police and ambulance sirens and people screaming and yelling, but he felt curiously happy and untouched by it all. He was going to bowl a ball at Lord's. He turned and pawed a couple of times at the ground with his bedroom slippers. He squared his shoulders, tossed the ball in the air, and caught it again. He started to run. As he ran, he suddenly saw that standing at the wicket was a batsman, 
Oh, good, he thought. That should add a little. Then, as his running feet took him nearer, he saw more clearly. The batsman standing ready at the wicket was not one of the England cricket team. He was not one of the Australian cricket team. He was one of the robot cricket team. It was a cold, hard, lethal, white killer robot that presumably had not returned to its ship with the others. Quite a few thoughts collided in Arthur Dent's mind at this moment, but he didn't seem to be able to stop running. Time suddenly seemed to be going terribly, terribly slowly, but still he didn't seem to be able to stop running. Moving as though through syrup, he slowly turned his troubled head and looked at his own hand, the hand that was holding the small, hard, red ball. His feet were pounding slowly onward, unstoppably, as he stared at the ball gripped in his helpless hand. It was emitting a deep red glow and flashing intermittently. And still his feet were pounding inexorably forward. He looked at the cricket robot again, standing implacably still and purposeful in front of him, battle club raised in readiness. Its eyes were burning with a deep, cold, fascinating light, and Arthur could not move his own eyes from them. He seemed to be looking down a tunnel at them. Nothing on either side seemed to exist. Some of the thoughts that were colliding in his mind at this time were these. He felt a hell of a fool. He felt that he should have listened rather more carefully to a number of things he had heard said, phrases that now pounded round his mind as his feet pounded onward to the point where he would inevitably release the ball to the cricket robot, who would inevitably strike it. He remembered Haktar saying, Have I failed? Failure doesn't bother me. He remembered the account of Haktar's dying words, What's done is done. I have fulfilled my function. He remembered Haktar saying that he had managed to make a few things. He remembered the sudden movement in his holdall that had made him grip it tightly to himself when he was in the dust cloud. He remembered that he had travelled back in time a couple of days to come to Lord's again. He also remembered that he wasn't a very good bowler. He felt his arm coming round, gripping tightly onto the ball that he now knew for certain was the supernova bomb, which Haktar had built himself and planted on him, the bomb which would cause the universe to come to an abrupt and premature end. He hoped and prayed that there wasn't an afterlife. Then he realised there was a contradiction involved here, and he merely hoped that there wasn't an afterlife. He would feel very, very embarrassed meeting everybody. He hoped, he hoped, he hoped that his bowling was as bad as he remembered it to be, because that seemed to be the only thing now standing between this moment and universal oblivion. He felt his legs pounding, he felt his arm coming round, he felt his feet connecting with the holdall he'd stupidly left lying on the ground in front of him, he felt himself falling heavily forward, but having his mind so terribly full of other things at this point, he completely forgot about hitting the ground, and didn't. Still holding the ball firmly in his right hand, he soared up into the air, whimpering with surprise. He wheeled and whirled through the air, spinning out of control. He twisted down toward the ground, flinging himself hectically through the air, at the same time hurling the bomb harmlessly off into the distance. He hurtled toward the astounded robot from behind. It still had its multifunctional battle club raised, but had suddenly been deprived of anything to hit. With a sudden mad outburst of strength, he wrested the battle club from the grip of the startled robot, executed a dazzling banking turn in the air, hurtled back down in a furious power dive, and with one crazy swing, knocked the robot's head from the robot's shoulders. "'Are you coming now?' said Ford. Epilogue. Life, the universe, and everything. And at the end they travelled again. There was a time when Arthur Dent would not. He said that the bistromathic drive had revealed to him that time and distance were one, that mind and universe were one, that perception and reality were one, and that the more one travelled, the more one stayed in one place, and that what with one thing and another he would rather just stay put for a while and sort it all out in his mind, which was now at one with the universe, so it shouldn't take too long, and he could get a good rest afterward, put in a little flying practice and learn to cook, which he had always meant to do. The can of Greek olive oil was now his most prized possession, and he said that the way it had unexpectedly turned up in his life had again given him a certain sense of the oneness of things, which, which made him feel that he yawned and fell asleep. 
In the morning, as they prepared to take him to some quiet and idyllic planet, where they wouldn't mind his talking like that, they suddenly picked up a computer-driven distress call and diverted to investigate. A small but apparently undamaged spacecraft of the Merida class seemed to be dancing a strange little jig through the void. A brief computer scan revealed that the ship was fine, its computer was fine, but that its pilot was mad. Half mad, half mad, the man insisted as they carried him raving aboard. He was a journalist with the sidereal daily mentioner. They sedated him and sent Marvin in to keep him company until he promised to try and talk sense. I was covering a trial, he said at last, on Argabuthon. He pushed himself up onto his thin and wasted shoulders. His eyes stared wildly. His white hair seemed to be waving at someone it knew in the next room. Easy, easy, said Ford. Trillian put a soothing hand on his shoulder. The man sank back down again and stared at the ceiling of the ship's sick bay. The case, he said, is now immaterial, but there was a witness, a witness, a man called Prack, a strange and difficult man. They were eventually forced to administer a drug to make him tell the truth, a, a, a truth drug. His eyes rolled helplessly in his head. They gave him too much, he said in a tiny whimper. They gave him much too much. He started to cry. I, th I think the robots must have jogged the surgeon's arm. Robots? asked Seyford sharply. What robots? Some white robots, whispered the man hoarsely, broke into the courtroom and stole the judge's scepter, the Argibuthon scepter of justice, nasty plastic thing. I don't know why they wanted it. He began to cry again. And I think they jogged the surgeon's arm. He shook his head loosely from side to side, helplessly, sadly, his eyes screwed up in pain. And when the trial continued, he said in a weeping whisper, they asked Prack a most unfortunate thing. They asked him, he paused and shivered, to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Only, don't you see? He suddenly hoisted himself up onto his elbows again and shouted at them, they'd given him too much of the drug! He collapsed again, moaning quietly, Much too much, too much, too much, too much. The group gathered around his bedside, glanced at one another. There were goosebumps on backs. What happened? said Zaphod at last. Oh, he told it all right, said the man savagely. For all I know, he's still telling it now. Strange, terrible things. Terrible, terrible! He screamed. They tried to calm him, but he struggled to his elbows again. Terrible things! Incomprehensible things! He shouted. Things that would drive a man mad! He stared wildly at them. Or in my case, he said, half mad. I'm, I'm a journalist. You mean, said Arthur quietly, that you're used to confronting the truth? No, said the man with the puzzled frown. I mean that I made an excuse and left early. He collapsed into a coma from which he recovered only once and briefly. On that one occasion they discovered from him the following. When it became clear what was happening, and as it became clear that Prack could not be stopped, that here was truth in its absolute and final form, the court was cleared. Not only cleared, it was sealed up with Prack still in it. Steel walls were erected around it, and just to be on the safe side, barbed wire, electric fences, crocodile swamps, and three major armies were installed, so that no one would ever have to hear Prack speak. Oh, that's a pity, said Arthur. I'd quite like to hear what he has to say. Presumably he would know what the answer to the ultimate question is. It's, it's always bothered me that we never found out. Think of a number, said the computer. Any number. Arthur told the computer the telephone number of King's Cross Railway Station passenger inquiries, on the grounds that it must have some function, and this might turn out to be it. The computer injected the number into the ship's reconstituted improbability drive. In relativity, matter tells space how to curve, and space tells matter how to move. The heart of gold told space to get knotted, and parched itself neatly within the inner steel perimeter of the Argibuthon Chamber of Law. The courtroom was an austere place, a large, dark chamber, clearly designed for justice rather than for instance pleasure. You wouldn't hold a dinner party there, at least not a successful one. The decor would get your guests down. The ceilings were high, vaulted, and very dark. 
Shadows lurked there with grim determination. The panelling for the walls and benches, the cladding of the heavy pillars, all were carved from the darkest and most severe trees in the fearsome forest of Argelbard. The massive black podium of justice, which dominated the centre of the chamber, was a monster of gravity. If a sunbeam had ever managed to slink this far into the justice complex of Argibuthon, it would have turned around and slunk straight back out again. Arthur and Trillian were the first in, while Ford and Zaphod bravely kept a watch on their rear. At first it seemed totally dark and deserted. Their footsteps echoed hollowly round the chamber. This seemed curious. All the defences were still in position and operative around the outside of the building. They had run scan checks. Therefore... They had assumed the truth-telling must still be going on. But there was nothing. Then, as their eyes became accustomed to the darkness, they spotted a dull red glow in a corner, and behind the glow a live shadow. They swung a flashlight round onto it. Prack was sitting on a bench, smoking a listless cigarette. Uh, hi, he said, with a little half-wave. His voice echoed through the chamber. He was a little man with scraggy hair. He sat with his shoulders hunched forward and his head and knees kept jiggling. He took a drag of his cigarette. They stared at him. What's going on? said Trillian. No, nothing, said the man and jiggled his shoulders. Arthur shone his flashlight full on Prack's face. We thought, he said, that you were meant to be telling the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Oh, that, said Pratt. Yeah, um, I was. I, I finished. There's not nearly as much of it as people imagine. Some of it's pretty funny, though. He suddenly exploded into about three seconds of maniacal laughter and stopped again. He sat there, jiggling his head and knees. He dragged on a cigarette with a strange half-smile. Ford and Zaphod came forward out of the shadows. Tell us about it, said Ford. Oh, I can't remember any of it now, said Pratt. Um, I thought of writing some of it down, but at first I couldn't find a pencil, and then I thought, oh, why bother? There was a long silence, during which they thought they could feel the universe age a little. Prack stared into the light. None of it, said Arthur at last. You can remember none of it. I know, um, except um, most of the good bits were about frogs. I remember that. Suddenly he was hooting with laughter again and stamping his feet on the ground. <laughs> you, you would not believe some of the things about frogs, he gasped. Come on, let's go and find ourselves a frog. Boy, will I ever see them in a new light. He leapt to his feet and did a tiny little dance. Then he stopped and took a long drag at his cigarette. Let's find a frog I can laugh at, he said simply. Uh, anyway, uh, who are you guys? We came to find you, said Trillian, deliberately not keeping the disappointment out of her voice. My name is Trillian. Prack jiggled his head. Ford Prefect, said Ford Prefect with a shrug. Prack jiggled his head. And I said Zayfoot, when he judged that the silence was once again deep enough to allow an announcement of such gravity to be tossed in lightly. I'm Zayfoot Beeblerocks. Prack jiggled his head. Who's this guy? said Prack, jiggling his shoulder at Arthur, who was standing silent for a moment, lost in disappointed thoughts. Uh, me, said Arthur. Oh, uh, my name's um, Arthur Dent. Prack's eyes popped out of his head. No kidding! he yelled. <laughs> You are Arthur Dent? <laughs> the Arthur Dent? He staggered backward, clutching his stomach, convulsed with fresh paroxysms of laughter. <laughs> just me, just think of meeting you, he gasped. Boy, he shouted, you are the most... Wow, wow you just leave the frog standing. He howled and screamed with laughter. He fell over backwards onto the bench. He hollered and yelled in hysterics. He cried with laughter, kicked his heads in the air. He beat his chest. Gradually he subsided, panting. He looked at them. He looked at Arthur. He fell back again, howling with laughter. Eventually he fell asleep. Arthur stood there, with his lips twitching, while the others carried Prack comatose onto the ship. Before we picked up Prack, said Arthur, I was going to leave. I still want to and I think I should do so as soon as possible. The others nodded in silence, a silence only slightly undermined by the heavily muffled and distant sound of hysterical laughter that came drifting from Prack's cabin at the farthest end of the ship. We have questioned him, continued Arthur, or at least you have questioned him, I, as you know, can't go near him, on everything, and he doesn't really seem to have anything to contribute, just the occasional snippet and things I don't wish to hear about frogs. The others tried not to smirk. Now, 
I am the first to appreciate a joke, said Arthur, and then had to wait for the elders to stop laughing. I am the first... He stopped again. This time he stopped and listened to the silence. There actually was silence this time, and it had come very suddenly. Prack was quiet. For days they had lived with constant, maniacal laughter ringing round the ship, only occasionally relieved by short periods of light giggling and sleep. Arthur's very soul was clenched with paranoia. This was not the silence of sleep. A buzzer sounded. A glance at a board told them that the buzzer had been sounded by Prack. He's not well, said Trillian quietly. The constant laughing is completely wrecking his body. Arthur's lips twitched, but he said nothing. We'd better go and see him, said Trillian. Trillian came out of the cabin, wearing her serious face. He wants you to go in, she said to Arthur, who was wearing his glum and tight-lipped one. He thrust his hands deep into his dressing gown pockets and tried to think of something to say which wouldn't sound petty. It seemed terribly unfair, but he couldn't. Please, said Trillian. He shrugged and went in, taking his glum, tight-lipped face with him, despite the reaction this always provoked from Prack. He looked down at his tormentor, who was lying quietly on the bed, ashen and wasted. His breathing was very shallow. Ford and Zaford were standing by the bed, looking awkward. "'You wanted to ask me something,' said Prack in a thin voice, and coughed slightly. Just the cough made Arthur stiffen, but it passed and subsided. "'How do you know that?' he asked. Prack shrugged weakly. "'Cause it's true,' he said simply. Arthur took the point. Uh, "'Yes,' he said at last in a rather strained drawl. I, "'I did have a question, or rather what I actually have is an answer. "'I wanted to know what the question was.' Prack nodded sympathetically, and Arthur relaxed a little. It's, well, it's a long story, he said, but the question I would like to know is the ultimate question of life, the universe, and everything. All we know about it is that the answer is 42, which is a little aggravating. Prack nodded again. 42, he said. Uh, yeah, that's right. He paused. Shadows of thought and memory crossed his face, like the shadows of clouds crossing the land. I'm afraid, he said at last, that the question and the answer are... Mutually exclusive. Knowledge of one logically precludes knowledge of the other. It's impossible that both can ever be known about the same universe. He paused again. Disappointment crept into Arthur's face and snuggled down into its accustomed place. Except, said Prack, struggling to sort a thought out, if it happened, it seems that the question and the answer would just cancel each other out and take the universe with them, which would then be replaced by something even more bizarrely inexplicable. It's possible this has already happened, he added with a weak smile, but there is a certain amount of uncertainty about it. A light giggle brushed through him. Arthur sat down on a stool. Oh, well, he said with resignation. I was just hoping there would be some sort of reason. Do you know, said Prack, the story of the reason? Arthur said that he didn't, and Prack said that he knew that he didn't. He told it. One night, he said, a spaceship appeared in the sky of a planet that had never seen one before. The planet was Dalphorsus. The ship was this one, the Heart of Gold. It appeared as a brilliant new star moving silently across the heavens. Primitive tribesmen who were sitting huddled on the cold hillsides looked up from their steaming night drinks and pointed with trembling fingers and swore that they had seen a sign, a sign from their gods, that meant that they must now arise at last and go and slay the evil princes of the plains. In the high turrets of their palaces, the princes of the plains looked up and saw the shining star, and received it unmistakably as a sign from their gods that they must go and attack the accursed tribesmen of the cold hillsides. And between them, the dwellers in the forest looked up into the sky, and saw the sign of the new star, and saw it with fear and apprehension. 
although they had never seen anything like it before, they too knew precisely what it foreshadowed, and they bowed their heads in despair. They knew that when the rains came, it was a sign. When the rains departed, it was a sign. When the winds rose, it was a sign. When the winds fell, it was a sign. When in the land there was born at the midnight of a full moon a goat with three heads, that was a sign. When in the land there was born at some time in the afternoon a perfectly normal cat or pig with no birth complications, or even just a child with a retrousse nose, that too would often be taken as a sign. So there was no doubt at all that a new star in the sky was a sign of a particularly spectacular order. And each new sign signified the same thing, that the princes of the plains and the tribesmen of the cold hillsides were about to beat the hell out of each other again. This in itself wouldn't be so bad, except that the princes of the plains and the tribesmen of the cold hillsides always elected to beat the hell out of each other in the forest. And it was always the dwellers in the forest who came off the worst in these exchanges, though as far as they could see, it had never had anything to do with them. And sometimes, after some of the worst of these outrages, the dwellers in the forest would send a messenger to either the leader of the princes of the plains or the leader of the tribesmen of the cold hillsides and demand to know the reason for this intolerable behaviour. And the leader, whichever one it was, would take the messenger aside and explain the reason to him, slowly and carefully, and with great attention to the considerable detail involved. And the terrible thing was, it was a very good one. It was very clear, very rational, and tough. The messenger would hang his head and feel sad and foolish that he had not realised what a tough and complex place the real world was, and what difficulties and paradoxes had to be embraced if one was to live in it. Now do you understand, the leader would say. The messenger would nod dumbly. And you see these battles have to take place. Another dumb nod. And why they have to take place in the forest, and why it's in everybody's best interest, the forest dwellers included, that they should. Uh, in the long run. Uh, yes. And the messenger did understand the reason, and he returned to his people in the forest. But as he approached them, and as he walked through the forest and among the trees, he found that all he could remember of the reason was how terribly clear the argument had seemed. What it actually was, he couldn't remember at all. And this, of course, was a great comfort when next the tribesmen and the princes came hacking and burning their way through the forest, killing every forest dweller in their way. Prack paused in his story and coughed pathetically. I was the messenger, he said, after the battles precipitated by the appearance of your ship, which were particularly savage. Many of our people died. I thought I could bring the reason back. I went and was told it by the leader of the princes, but on the way back it slipped and melted away in my mind like snow in the sun. And that was many years ago, and much has happened since then. He looked up at Arthur and giggled again, very gently. There's one thing I can remember from the truth drug, apart from the frogs, and that is God's last message to his creation. Would you like to hear it? For a moment they didn't know whether to take him seriously. It's true, he said, for real. Well, I mean it. His chest heaved weakly and he struggled for breath. His head lolled slightly. I wasn't very impressed with it when I first knew what it was, he said, but now I think back to how impressed I was by the prince's reason and how soon afterwards I couldn't recall it at all, I think it might be a lot more helpful. Would you like to know what it is, would you? They nodded dumbly. I bet you would. If you're that interested, I suggest you go and look for it. It is written in thirty-foot-high letters of fire on top of the Quenchless Quasgar Mountains in the land of Sevilby Upstry on the planet Preliumtan, third out from the sun, Zars, in galactic sector QQ7 Active J Gamma. It is guarded by the majestic Vantrashell of Lob. There was a long silence following this announcement, which was finally broken by Arthur. Sorry, it's where? he said. It is written, repeated Prack, 
in thirty-foot-high letters of fire on top of the quenchless Quasgar Mountains in the land of Sevilbiopstri on the planet Preliumtan, third out from the... Uh, sorry, said Arthur, which mountains? The quenchless Quasgar Mountains in the land of Sevilbiopstri on the planet... Which land was that? I didn't quite catch it. Sevilbiopstri on the planet... Sevilby what? Oh, for heaven's sake, said Prack, and died testily. In the following days, Arthur thought a little about this message, but in the end he decided that he was not going to allow himself to be drawn by it, and insisted on following his original plan of finding a nice little world somewhere to settle down and lead a quiet, retired life. Having saved the universe twice in one day, he thought that he could take things a little easier from now on. They dropped him off on the planet Cricket, which was now once again a pleasant, idyllic, pastoral world even if the songs did occasionally get on his nerves. He spent a lot of time flying. He learnt to communicate with birds, and discovered that their conversation was fantastically boring. It was all to do with wind speed, wingspans, power-to-weight ratios, and a fair bit about berries. Unfortunately, he discovered, once you've learned bird-speak, you quickly come to realise that the air is full of it the whole time, just inane bird chatter. There is no getting away from it. For that reason, Arthur eventually gave up the sport and learned to live on the ground and love it, despite the inane chatter he had down there as well. One day he was walking through the fields humming a ravishing tune he'd heard recently when a silver spaceship descended from the sky and landed in front of him. A hatchway opened, a ramp extended, and a tall grey-green alien marched out and approached him. Arthur Philip, it said, then glanced sharply at him and down at his clipboard. It frowned. It looked up at him again. "'I've done you before, haven't I?' it said. There is a theory which states that if ever anyone discovers exactly what the universe is for and why it is here it will instantly disappear and be replaced by something even more bizarre and inexplicable. There is another theory which states that this has already happened. Chapter 1 The Story So Far In the beginning, the universe was created. This has made a lot of people very angry and been widely regarded as a bad move. Many races believe that it was created by some sort of god, though the Jatravarted people of Viltvodal VI believed that the entire universe was in fact sneezed out of the nose of a being called the Great Green Arkel Seizure. The Jatravartids, who live in perpetual fear of the time they call the coming of the Great White Handkerchief, are small blue creatures with more than fifty arms each, who are therefore unique in being the only race in history to have invented the aerosol deodorant before the wheel. However, the Great Green Arkel Seizure Theory is not widely accepted outside Viltvodal VI, and so, the universe being the puzzling place it is, other explanations are constantly being sought. For instance, a race of hyper-intelligent pan-dimensional beings once built themselves a gigantic supercomputer called Deep Thought to calculate once and for all the answer to the ultimate question of life, the universe, and everything. For seven and a half million years, Deep Thought computed and calculated, and in the end announced that the answer was in fact 42. And so another even bigger computer had to be built to find out what the actual question was. And this computer, which was called the Earth, was so large that it was frequently mistaken for a planet, especially by the strange ape-like beings who roamed its surface, totally unaware that they were simply part of a gigantic computer program. And this is very odd, because without that fairly simple and obvious piece of knowledge, nothing that ever happened on the Earth could possibly make the slightest bit of sense. Sadly, however, before the critical moment of readout, the Earth was unexpectedly demolished by the Vogons to make way, so they claimed, for a new hyperspace bypass, and so all hope of discovering a meaning for life was lost forever. Or so it would seem. Two of these strange ape-like creatures survived. Arthur Dent escaped at the very last moment because an old friend of his, Ford Prefect, suddenly turned out to be from a small planet somewhere in the vicinity of Betelgeuse, and not from Guildford, as he had hitherto claimed. And more to the point, 
he knew how to hitch rides on flying saucers. Trisha McMillan, or Trillion, had skipped the planet six months earlier with Zaphod Beeblebrox, the then president of the galaxy. Two survivors. They are all that remains of the greatest experiment ever conducted to find the ultimate question and the ultimate answer of life, the universe, and everything. And less than half a million miles from where their starship is drifting lazily through the inky blackness of space, a Vogon ship is moving slowly towards them. Chapter Two. Like all Vogon ships, it looked as if it had been not so much designed as congealed. The unpleasant yellow lumps and edifices which protruded from it at unsightly angles would have disfigured the looks of most ships. But in this case, that was sadly impossible. Uglier things have been spotted in the skies, but not by reliable witnesses. In fact, to see anything much uglier than a Vogon ship, you would have to go inside it and look at a Vogon. If you are wise, however, this is precisely what you will avoid doing, because the average Vogon will not think twice before doing something so pointlessly hideous to you that you will wish that you had never been born, or, if you are a clearer-minded thinker, that the Vogon had never been born. In fact, the average Vogon probably wouldn't even think once. They are simple-minded, thick-willed, slug-brained creatures, and thinking is not really something they are cut out for. Anatomical analysis of the Vogon. Reveals that its brain was originally a badly deformed, misplaced, and dyspeptic liver. The fairest thing you can say about them then is that they know what they like, and what they like generally involves hurting people and, wherever possible, getting very angry. One thing they don't like is leaving a job unfinished, particularly this Vogon, and particularly for various reasons this job. This Vogon was Captain Prostetnik Vogon Jeltz of the Galactic Hyperspace Planning Council. And he it was who had the job of demolishing the so-called planet Earth. He heaved his monumentally vile body round in his ill-fitting, slimy seat, and stared at the monitor screen on which the starship Heart of Gold was being systematically scanned. It mattered little to him that the Heart of Gold, with its infinite improbability drive, was the most beautiful and revolutionary ship ever built. Aesthetics and technology were closed books to him. And had he had his way, burnt and buried books as well. It mattered even less to him that Zaphod Beeblebrox was aboard. Zaphod Beeblebrox was now the ex-president of the galaxy, and though every police force in the galaxy was currently pursuing both him and the ship he had stolen, the Vogon was not interested. He had other fish to fry. It has been said that Vogons are not above a little bribery and corruption. In the same way that the sea is not above the clouds, and this is certainly true in his case. When he heard the words integrity or moral rectitude, he reached for his dictionary, and when he heard the chink of ready money in large quantities, he reached for the rule book and threw it away. In seeking so implacably the destruction of the earth and all that therein lay, he was moving somewhat above and beyond the call of his professional duty. There was even some doubt as to whether the said bypass was actually going to be built, but the matter had been glossed over. He grunted a repellent grunt of satisfaction. "Computer," he croaked, "get me my brain care specialist on the line." Within a few seconds, the face of Gag Halfrant appeared on the screen, smiling the smile of a man who knew he was ten light years away from the Vogon face he was looking at. Mixed up somewhere in the smile was a glint of irony too, though the Vogon persistently referred to him as my private brain care specialist. There was not a lot of brain to take care of, and it was in fact Halfrant who was employing the Vogon. He was paying him an awful lot of money to do some very dirty work. As one of the galaxy's most prominent and successful psychiatrists, he and a consortium of his colleagues were quite prepared to spend an awful lot of money. When it seemed that the entire future of psychiatry might be at stake, well, he said, "Hello, my captain of Vogon's prosthetic, and how are we feeling today?" The Vogon captain told him that in the last few hours he had wiped out nearly half his crew in a disciplinary exercise. Halfrant's smile did not flicker for an instant. Well, he said, "I think this is perfectly normal behaviour for a Vogon. You know, the natural and healthy channeling of the aggressive instincts into acts of senseless violence." That rumbled the Vogon is what you always say.
Well, again, said Halfrunt, I think this is perfectly normal behaviour for a psychiatrist. Good. We are clearly both very well adjusted in our mental attitudes today. Now tell me, what news of the mission? We have located the ship. Wonderful, said Halfrunt. Wonderful. And the occupants? The Earthman is there. Excellent. And a female from the same planet. They are the last. Good, good, beamed Halfrunt. Who else? The man prefect. Yes. And Zaford Beeblebrox. For an instant, Halfrunt's smile flickered. Ah, yes, he said. I had been expecting this. It is most regrettable. A personal friend, inquired the Vogon, who had heard the expression somewhere once and decided to try it out. Ah, no, said Halfrunt. In my profession, you know, we do not make personal friends. Ah, grunted the Vogon, professional detachment. No, said Halfrunt cheerfully. We just don't have the knack. He paused. His mouth continued to smile, but his eyes frowned slightly. But Beeblebrox, you know, he said, he is one of my most profitable clients. He has personality problems beyond the dreams of analysts. He toyed with this thought a little before reluctantly dismissing it. Still, he said, you are ready for your task? Yes. Good. Destroy the ship immediately. What about Beeblebrox? Well, said Halfrunt brightly, Zephyr's just his guy, you know. He vanished from the screen. The Vogon captain pressed a communicator button, which connected him with the remains of his crew. Attack, he said. At that precise moment, Zephod Beeblebrox was in his cabin swearing very loudly. Two hours ago, he had said that they would go for a quick bite at the restaurant at the end of the universe, whereupon he had had a blazing row with the ship's computer and stormed off to his cabin shouting that he would work out the improbability factors with a pencil. The Heart of Gold's improbability drive made it the most powerful and unpredictable ship in existence. There was nothing it couldn't do, provided you knew exactly how improbable it was that the thing you wanted it to do would ever happen. He had stolen it when, as president, he was meant to be launching it. He didn't know exactly why he had stolen it, except that he liked it. He didn't know why he had become president of the galaxy, except that it seemed a fun thing to be. He did know that there were better reasons than these, but that they were buried in a dark, locked-off section of his two brains. He wished the dark, locked-off section of his two brains would go away, because they occasionally surfaced momentarily and put strange thoughts into the light, fun sections of his mind, and tried to deflect him from what he saw as being the basic business of his life, which was to have a wonderfully good time. At the moment, he was not having a wonderfully good time. He had run out of patience and pencils and was feeling very hungry. Starpox! he shouted. At that precise moment, Ford Prefect was in mid-air. This was not because of anything wrong with the ship's artificial gravity field, but because he was leaping down the stairwell which led to the ship's personal cabins. It was a very high jump to do in one bound, and he landed awkwardly, stumbled, recovered, raced down the corridor, sending a couple of miniature service robots flying, skidded round the corner, burst into Zaphod's door, and explained what was on his mind. Vogons, he said. A short while before this, Arthur Dent had set out from his cabin in search of a cup of tea. It was not a quest he embarked upon with a great deal of optimism, because he knew that the only source of hot drinks on the entire ship was a benighted piece of equipment produced by the Sirius Cybernetics Corporation. It was called a Nutrimatic Drink Synthesizer, and he had encountered it before. It claimed to produce the widest possible range of drinks personally matched to the tastes and metabolism of whoever cared to use it. When put to the test, however, it invariably produced a plastic cup filled with a liquid which was almost, but not quite, entirely unlike tea. He attempted to reason with the thing. Tea, he said. Share and enjoy, the machine replied, and provided him with yet another cup of the sickly liquid. He threw it away. Share and enjoy, the machine repeated, and produced another one. Share and enjoy is the company motto of the hugely successful Sirius Cybernetics Corporation Complaints Division, which now covers the major land masses of three medium-sized planets, and is the only part of the corporation to have shown a consistent profit in recent years. The motto stands, or rather stood, 
in three-mile-high illuminated letters near the Complaints Department spaceport on Idrax. Unfortunately, its weight was such that shortly after it was erected, the ground beneath the letters caved in, and they dropped for nearly half their length through the offices of many talented young complaints executives, now deceased. The protruding upper halves of the letters now appear in the local language to read, "Go stick your head in a pig," and are no longer illuminated except at times of special celebration. Arthur threw away a sixth cup of the liquid. "Listen, you machine," he said. "You claim you can synthesize any drink in existence, so why do you keep giving me the same undrinkable stuff?" "Nutrition and pleasurable sense data," burbled the machine. "Share and enjoy. It tastes filthy." If you have enjoyed the experience of this drink, continued the machine, why not share it with your friends? Because, said Arthur tartly, I want to keep them. Will you try to comprehend what I'm telling you? That drink, that drink, said the machine sweetly, was individually tailored to meet your personal requirements for nutrition and pleasure. Ah, said Arthur. So I'm a masochist on a diet, am I? Share and enjoy. Oh, shut up. Will that be all? Arthur decided to give up. Yes, he said. Then he decided he'd be damned if he'd give up. No, he said. Look, it's very, very simple. All I want is a cup of tea. You are going to make one for me. Keep quiet and listen. And he sat. He told the nutrimatic about India. He told it about China. He told it about Ceylon. He told it about broad leaves drying in the sun. He told it about silver teapots. He told it about summer afternoons on the lawn. He told it about putting in the milk before the tea so it wouldn't get scalded. He even told it briefly about the history of the East India Company. So that's it, is it? Said the nutrimatic when he had finished. Yes, said Arthur. That is what I want. You want the taste of dried leaves boiled in water. Ah,、uh, yes, with milk, squirted out of a cow. Well, in a manner of speaking, I suppose. I'm going to need some help with this one," said the machine tersely. All the cheerful burbling had dropped out of its voice, and it now meant business. "Well, anything I can do," said Arthur. "You've done quite enough," the nutrimatic informed him. It summoned the ship's computer. "Hi there," said the ship's computer. The nutrimatic explained about tea to the ship's computer. The computer boggled, linked logic circuits with the nutrimatic, and together they lapsed into a grim silence. Arthur watched and waited for a while, but nothing further happened. He thumped it, but still nothing happened. Eventually, he gave up and wandered up to the bridge. In the empty wastes of space, the heart of gold hung still. Around it blazed the billion pinpricks of the galaxy. Towards it crept the ugly yellow lump of the Vogon ship. Chapter Three. Does anyone have a kettle? Arthur asked as he wandered onto the bridge, and instantly began to wonder why Trillian was yelling at the computer to talk to her, Ford was thumping it, and Zayford was kicking it, and also why there was a nasty yellow lump on the vision screen. He put down the empty cup he was carrying and walked over to them. "Hello," he said. At that moment, Zayford flung himself over to the polished marble surfaces that contained the instruments that controlled the conventional photon drive. They materialized beneath his hands, and he flipped over to manual control. He pushed, he pulled, he pressed, and he swore. The photon drive gave a sickly judder and cut out again. Something up," said Arthur. "Hey, did you hear that?" muttered Zayford as he leapt now for the manual controls on the infinite improbability drive. The monkey spoke. The improbability drive gave two small whines and then also cut out. Pure history, man. Said Zayford, kicking the improbability drive. A talking monkey. Look, if you're upset about something, said Arthur. Vogons snapped forward. We're under attack. Arthur gibbered. Well, what are you doing? Let's get out of here. Can't. Computer's jammed. Jammed? It says all its circuits are occupied. There's no power anywhere in the ship. Ford moved away from the computer terminal, wiped a sleeve across his forehead, and slumped back against the wall. Nothing we can do, he said. He glared at nothing and bit his lip. When Arthur had been a boy at school, long before the Earth had been demolished, he had used to play football. He had not been at all good at it, and his particular speciality had been scoring own goals in important matches. 
Whenever this happened, he used to experience a peculiar tingling round the back of his neck that would slowly creep up across his cheeks and heat his brow. The image of mud and grass and lots of little jeering boys flinging it at him suddenly came vividly to his mind at this moment. A peculiar tingling sensation at the back of his neck was creeping up across his cheeks and heating his brow. He started to speak and stopped. He started to speak again and stopped again. Finally, he managed to speak. Uh, he said. He cleared his throat. Uh, tell me, he continued, and said it so nervously that the others all turned to stare at him. He glanced at the approaching yellow blob on the vision screen. Uh, tell me, he said again, did the computer say what was occupying it? I, I just ask out of interest. Their eyes were riveted on him. And, uh, well, that's it really, just asking. Zayford put out a hand and held Arthur by the scruff of the neck. "'What have you done to it, monkey man?' he breathed. Uh, "'Well,' said Arthur, uh, "'nothing, in fact. It's just that uh, I think uh, a short while ago it was trying to work out how to—' uh, "'Yes. Uh, make me some tea.' "'That's right, guys,' the computer sang out suddenly. "'Just coping with that problem right now, and wow, it's a biggie. Be with you in a while.' It lapsed back into a silence that was only matched for sheer intensity by the silence of the three people staring at Arthur Dent. As if to relieve the tension, the Vogons chose that moment to start firing. The ship shook, the ship thundered. Outside, the inch-thick force shield around it blistered, crackled, and spat under the barrage of a dozen thirty-megahertz definite-kill Fotrazon cannon, and looked as if it wouldn't be around for long. Four minutes is how long Ford Prefect gave it. Three minutes and fifty seconds, he said a short while later. Forty-five seconds, he added at the appropriate time. He flicked idly at some useless switches, then gave Arthur an unfriendly look. Dying for a cup of tea, eh? he said. Three minutes and forty seconds. Will you stop counting? snarled Zaphod. Yes, said Ford Prefect. In three minutes and thirty-five seconds. Aboard the Vogon ship, Prostetnik Vogon Jolts was puzzled. He had expected a chase. He had expected an exciting grapple with tractor beams. He had expected to have to use the specially installed subcyclic normality assertitron to counter the Heart of Gold's infinite improbability drive. But the subcyclic normality assertitron lay idle as the Heart of Gold just sat there and took it. A dozen thirty megahertz definite kill Fotrazon cannon continued to blaze away at the heart of gold, and still it just sat there and took it. He tested every sensor at his disposal to see if there was any subtle trickery afoot, but no subtle trickery was to be found. He didn't know about the tea, of course. Nor did he know exactly how the occupants of the heart of gold were spending the last three minutes and thirty seconds of life they had left to spend. Quite how Zaphod Beeblebrox arrived at the idea of holding a seance at this point is something he was never quite clear on. Obviously the subject of death was in the air, but more as something to be avoided than harped upon. Possibly the horror that Zaphod experienced at the prospect of being reunited with his deceased relatives led on to the thought that they might just feel the same way about him, and, what's more, be able to do something about helping to postpone this reunion. Or again, it might just have been one of the strange promptings that occasionally surfaced from that dark area of his mind that he had inexplicably locked off prior to becoming President of the Galaxy. "'You want to talk to your great-grandfather?' boggled Ford. "'Yeah. Does it have to be now?' The ship continued to shake and thunder. The temperature was rising, the light was getting dimmer, all the energy the computer didn't require for thinking about tea was being pumped into the rapidly fading force field. Yeah, insisted Zaphod. Uh, listen, Ford, I think he may be able to help us. Are you sure you mean think? Pick your words with care. Well, suggest something else we can do. Uh, well? Okay, around the central console now. Come on, Trillion, Monkey Man, move! They clustered round the central console in confusion sat down, and, feeling exceptionally foolish, held hands. With his third hand, Zaphod turned off the lights. Darkness gripped the ship. 
Outside, the thunderous roar of the definite kill cannon continued to rip at the force field. Concentrate, is Zaphod on his name. What is it? said Arthur. Zaphod Beeblebrooks the fourth. What? Zaphod Beeblebrooks the fourth. Concentrate. The fourth? Yeah, listen, I'm Zaphod Beeblebrooks. My father was Zaphod Beeblebrooks the second. My grandfather Zaphod Beeblebrooks the third. What? There was an accident with a contraceptive and a time machine. Now concentrate. Three minutes, said Ford Prefect. Why, said Arthur Dent, are we doing this? Shut up, suggested Zaphod Beeblebrooks. Trillian said nothing. What, she thought, was there to say? The only light on the bridge came from two dim red triangles in a far corner where Marvin the paranoid android sat slumped, ignoring all and ignored by all, in a private and rather unpleasant world of his own. Round the central console four figures hunched in tight concentration, trying to blot from their minds the terrifying shuddering of the ship and the fearful roar that echoed through it. They concentrated. Still they concentrated, and still they concentrated. The seconds ticked by. On Zaphod's brows stood beads of sweat, first of concentration, then of frustration, and finally of embarrassment. At last he let out a cry of anger, snatched back his hands from Trillian and Ford, and stabbed at the light switch. Ah, I was beginning to think you'd never turn the lights on, said a voice. No, not too bright, please. My eyes aren't what they once were. Four figures jolted upright in their seats. Slowly they turned their heads to look, though their scalps showed a distinct propensity to try and stay in the same place. Now, who disturbs me at this time? said the small, bent, gaunt figure, standing by the sprays of fern at the far end of the bridge. His two small, wispy-haired heads looked so ancient that it seemed they might hold dim memories of the birth of the galaxies themselves. One lolled in sleep, the other squinted sharply at them. If his eyes weren't what they once were, they must once have been diamond cutters. Zaphod stuttered nervously for a moment. He gave the intricate little double nod, which is the traditional Beetlejuicean gesture of familial respect. Oh, a uh, hi, great granddad, he breathed. The little old figure moved closer towards them. He peered through the dim light. He thrust out a bony finger at his great-grandson. Ah, he snapped, Zaphod Beeblebrocks, the last of our great line. Zaphod Beeblebrocks, the nothingth. The first. The nothingth, spat the figure. Zaphod hated his voice. It always seemed to him to screech like fingernails across the blackboard of what he liked to think of as his soul. He shifted awkwardly in his seat. Uh, yeah, he muttered. Uh, look, I'm, I'm really sorry about the flowers. I, I meant to send them along, but, you know, the shop was fresh out of reeds and... You forgot, snapped Zaphod Beeblebrox the fourth. Well, too busy, never think of other people. The living are all the same. Two minutes, Zaphod whispered Ford in an awed whisper. Zaphod fidgeted nervously. Yeah, but I did mean to send them, he said, and I'll write to my great-grandmother as well, uh, just as soon as we get out of this. Your great-grandmother, mused the gaunt little figure to himself. Ah, uh, yeah, said Zaphod, how is she? Uh, tell you what, I'll go and see her, but uh, first, you know, we've got to... Your late great-grandmother and I are very well, rasped Zaphod Beeblebrox IV. Ah, oh, but very disappointed in you, young Zaphod. Ah, uh, yeah, well... Zaphod felt strangely powerless to take charge of this conversation, and Ford's heavy breathing at his side told him that the seconds were ticking away fast. The noise and the shaking had reached terrifying proportions. He saw Trillian and Arthur's faces white and unblinking in the gloom. Ah, uh, great-grandfather! We've been following your progress with considerable despondency. Uh, yeah, look, uh, just at the moment, you see, not to say contempt. Uh, look, could you sort of listen for a moment? I mean, what exactly are you doing with your life? I'm being attacked by a Vogon fleet, cried Zaphod. It was an exaggeration, but it was his only opportunity so far of getting the basic point of the exercise across. Doesn't surprise me in the least, 
said the little old figure with a shrug. Only it's happening right now, you see, insisted Zaphod feverishly. The spectral ancestor nodded, picked up the cup Arthur Dent had brought in, and looked at it with great interest. Uh, great granddad! Did you know, interrupted the ghostly figure, fixing Zaphod with a stern look, that Beetlejuice 5 has now developed a very slight eccentricity in its orbit. Zaphod didn't, and found the information hard to concentrate on, what with all the noise and the imminence of death and so on. Ah, uh, no, uh, look, he said. Me spinning in my grave, barked the ancestor. He slammed the cup down and pointed a quivering, stick-like, see-through finger at Zaphod. Your fault, he screeched. One minute thirty, muttered Ford, his head in his hands. Yeah, look, great granddad, can, look, can he actually help, because... Help? exclaimed the old man as if he'd been asked for a stoat. Yeah, help, and, and like now, because otherwise... Help? repeated the old man as if he'd been asked for a lightly grilled stoat in a bun with French fries. He stood amazed. You go swanning your way round the galaxy with your... The ancestor waved a contemptuous hand. With your disreputable friends, too busy to put flowers on my grave, plastic ones would have done, would have been quite appropriate from you, but no, too busy, too modern, too sceptical, till you suddenly find yourself in a bit of a fix and come over suddenly all astrally minded. He shook his head, carefully so as not to disturb the slumber of the other one, which was already becoming restive. Well, I don't know, young Zaphod, he continued. I think I'll have to think about this one. One minute ten, said Ford hollowly. Zaphod Beeblebrox the fourth peered at him curiously. Why does that man keep talking in numbers? he said. Those numbers, said Zaphod tersely, at the time we've got left to live. Oh, said his great-grandfather. He grunted to himself. <laughs> doesn't apply to me, of course, he said, and moved off to a dimmer recess of the bridge in search of something else to poke around at. Zaphod felt he was teetering on the edge of madness and wondered if he shouldn't just jump over and have done with it. Great-grandfather, he said, it applies to us. We are still alive and we're about to lose our lives. Good job, too. What? What use is your life to anyone? When I think of what you've made of it... The phrase pig's ear comes irresistibly to mind. But I was president of the galaxy, man. <laughs> muttered his ancestor. What kind of job is that for a Beeblebrox? Hey, what? Only president, you know, of the whole galaxy. Conceited little mega puppy. Zaphod blinked in bewilderment. Uh, hey, uh, what are you at, man? I mean, great-grandfather. The hunched-up little figure stalked up to his great-grandson and tapped him sternly on the knee. This had the effect of reminding Zaphod that he was talking to a ghost because he didn't feel a thing. You know and I know what being president means, young Zaphod. You know because you've been it, and I know because I'm dead. And it gives one such a wonderfully uncluttered perspective. We have a saying up here, life is wasted on the living. Yeah, said Zaphod bitterly. Very good, very deep. Right now I need aphorisms like I need holes in my heads. Fifty seconds, grunted Ford Prefect. Where was I? said Zaphod Beeblebrox the fourth. Pontificating, said Zaphod Beeblebrox. Oh, yes. Can this guy, muttered Ford quietly to Zaphod, actually in fact help us? Nobody else can, whispered Zaphod. Ford nodded despondently. Zaphod, the ghost was saying, you became president of the galaxy for a reason. Have you forgotten? Could we go into this later? Have you forgotten? insisted the ghost. Yeah, of course I forgot. I had to forget. They screen your brain when you get the job, you know. If they'd find my head full of tricksy ideas, I'd have been right out on the streets again with nothing but a fat pension, secretarial staff, a fleet of ships and a couple of slit throats. Ah nodded the ghost in satisfaction. Then you do remember. He paused for a moment. Good, he said, and the noise stopped. Forty-eight seconds, said Ford. 
He looked again at his watch and tapped it. He looked up. Hey, the noise has stopped, he said. A mischievous twinkle gleamed in the ghost's hard little eyes. I've slowed down time for a moment, he said. Just for a moment, you understand. I would hate you to miss all that I have to say. Now listen to me, you see-through old bat, said Zaphod, leaping out of his chair. A, uh, thanks for stopping time and all that. Uh, great, terrific, but wonderful. But, but B, no thanks for the homily, right? I don't know what this great thing I'm meant to be doing is, and it looks to me as if I wasn't meant to know, and I resent that, right? The old me knew, the old me cared, fine, so far so hoopy, except that the old me cared so much that he actually got inside his own brain, my own brain, and locked off the bits that knew and cared, because if I knew and cared, I wouldn't be able to do it. I wouldn't be able to go and be president, and I wouldn't be able to steal the ship, which must be the important thing. But this former self of mine killed himself off, didn't he, by changing my brain. Okay, that was his choice. This new me has its own choices to make. And by a strange coincidence, those choices involve not knowing and not caring about this big number, whatever it is. That's what he wanted, that's what he got. Except this old self of mine tried to leave himself in control, leaving orders for me and the bit of my brain he locked off. Well, I don't want to know, and I don't want to hear them. That's my choice. I'm not going to be anybody's puppet, particularly not my own. Zaphod banged on the console in fury, oblivious of the dumbfounded looks he was attracting. The old me is dead, he raved. Killed himself. The dead shouldn't hang around trying to interfere with the living. And yet you summoned me up to help you out of a scrape, said the ghost. Ah, said Zaphod, sitting down again. Well, that's different, isn't it? He grinned at Trillian weakly. Zaphod, rasped the apparition. I think the only reason I waste my breath on you is that being dead, I don't have any other use for it. Okay said Zaphod. Why don't you tell me what that big secret is? Try me. Zaphod, you knew when you were president of the galaxy, as did Juden Vranks before you, that the president is nothing. A cipher. Somewhere in the shadows behind is another man of being something with ultimate power. That man or being or something you must find, the man who controls this galaxy. And we suspect others, possibly the entire universe. Why? Why? exclaimed an astonished ghost. Why? Look around you, lad. Does it look to you as if it's in very good hands? Well, it's all right. The old ghost glowered at him. I will not argue with you. You will simply take this ship, this improbability drive ship, to where it is needed. You will do it. Don't think you can escape your purpose. The improbability field controls you. You are in its grip. What's this? He was standing, tapping at one of the terminals of Eddie, the shipboard computer. Zaphod told him. What's it doing? It is trying, said Zaphod with wonderful restraint, to make tea. Good, said his great-grandfather. I approve of that. Now, Zaphod, he said, turning and wagging a finger at him, I don't know if you are really capable of succeeding in your job. I think you will not be able to avoid it. However, I am too long dead and too tired to care as much as I did. The principal reason I am helping you now is that I couldn't bear the thought of you and your modern friends slouching about up here. Understood? No, oh, yeah, thanks a bundle. Oh, and Zaphod? Uh, yeah? If you ever find you need help again, you know, if you're in trouble, need a hand out of a tight corner, yeah, please don't hesitate to get lost. Within the space of one second, a bolt of light flashed from the wizened old ghost's hands to the computer. The ghost vanished, the bridge filled with billowing smoke, and the heart of gold leapt an unknown distance through the dimensions of time and space. Chapter 4 Ten light years away, Gag Halfrant jacked up his smile by several notches. As he watched the picture on his vision screen, relayed across the sub-ether from the bridge of the Vogon ship, he saw the final shreds of the Heart of Gold's force shield ripped away and the ship itself vanish in a puff of smoke. Good, he thought. 
the end of the last stray survivors of the demolition he had ordered on the planet Earth, he thought. The final end of this dangerous, to the psychiatric profession, and subversive, also to the psychiatric profession, experiment to find the question to the ultimate answer of life, the universe, and everything, he thought. There would be some celebration with his fellows tonight, and in the morning they would meet again their unhappy, bewildered, and highly profitable patients, secure in the knowledge that the meaning of life would not now be, once and for all, well and truly sorted out, he thought. Family's always embarrassing, isn't it? said Ford to Zaphod, as the smoke began to clear. He paused and looked about. Where's Zaphod? he said. Arthur and Trillian looked about blankly. They were pale and shaken, and didn't know where Zaphod was. Marvin, said Ford, where's Zaphod? A moment later he said, where's Marvin? The robot's corner was empty. The ship was utterly silent. It lay in thick black space. Occasionally it rocked and swayed. Every instrument was dead, every vision screen was dead. They consulted the computer. It said, I regret I have been temporarily closed to all communication. Meanwhile, here is some light music. They turned off the light music. They searched every corner of the ship in increasing bewilderment and alarm. Everywhere was dead and silent. Nowhere was there any trace of Zaphod or of Marvin. One of the last areas they checked was the small bay in which the Nutrimatic machine was located. On the delivery plate of the Nutrimatic drink synthesizer was a small tray on which sat three bone china cups and saucers, a bone china jug of milk, a silver teapot full of the best tea Arthur had ever tasted, and a small printed note saying, Wait. Chapter 5 Ursa Minor Beta is, some say, one of the most appalling places in the known universe. Although it is excruciatingly rich, horrifyingly sunny, and more full of wonderfully exciting people than the pomegranate is of pips, it can hardly be insignificant that when a recent edition of Playbeing magazine headlined an article with the words, When you are tired of Ursa Minor Beta, you are tired of life, the suicide rate there quadrupled overnight. Not that there are any nights on Ursa Minor Beta. It is a West Zone planet which, by an inexplicable and somewhat suspicious freak of topography, consists almost entirely of subtropical coastline. By an equally suspicious freak of temporal relostatics, it is nearly always Saturday afternoon, just before the beach bars close. No adequate explanation for this has been forthcoming from the dominant life forms of Ursa Minor Beta who spend most of their time attempting to achieve spiritual enlightenment by running round swimming pools and inviting investigation officials from the Galactic Geotemporal Control Board to have a nice diurnal anomaly. There is only one city on Ursa Minor Beta, and that is only called a city because the swimming pools are slightly thicker on the ground there than elsewhere. If you approach Light City by air, and there is no other way of approaching it, no roads, no port facilities, if you don't fly, they don't want to see you in Light City. You will see why it has this name. Here the sun shines brightest of all, glittering on the swimming pools, shimmering on the white, palm-lined boulevards, glistening on the healthy bronzed specks moving up and down them, gleaming off the villas, the hazy air pads, the beach bars, and so on. Most particularly, it shines on a building, a tall, beautiful building consisting of two thirty-story white towers connected by a bridge halfway up their length. The building is the home of a book and was built here on the proceeds of an extraordinary copyright lawsuit fought between the book's editors and a breakfast cereal company. The book is a guidebook, a travel book. It is one of the most remarkable, certainly the most successful books ever to come out of the great publishing corporations of Ursa Minor, more popular than Life Begins at 550, better selling than The Big Bang Theory, A Personal View, by Eccentric Golumbits, the triple-breasted whore of Eroticon 6, and more controversial than Ulan Kalufid's latest blockbusting title, Everything You Never Wanted to Know About Sex But Have Been Forced to Find Out. And in many of the more relaxed civilizations on the outer eastern rim of the galaxy, it has long supplanted the great Encyclopedia Galactica, 
as the standard repository of all knowledge and wisdom. For though it has many omissions, and contains much that is apocryphal, or at least wildly inaccurate, it scores over the older, more pedestrian work in two important respects. First, it is slightly cheaper, and secondly, it has the words, Don't Panic, printed in large, friendly letters on its cover. It is, of course, that invaluable companion for all those who want to see the marvels of the known universe for less than thirty Altarian dollars a day, the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. If you stood with your back to the main entrance lobby of the guide offices, assuming you had landed by now and freshened up with a quick dip and shower, then walked east, you would pass along the leafy shade of Life Boulevard, be amazed by the pale golden colour of the beaches stretching away to your left, astounded by the mind surfers floating carelessly along two feet above the waves, as if this was nothing special, surprised and eventually slightly irritated by the giant palm trees that hum tuneless nothings throughout the daylight hours, in other words, continuously. If you then walk to the end of Life Boulevard, you would enter the Lalamatine district of shops, bowler nut trees, and pavement cafes, where the U.M. Beatons come to relax after a hard afternoon's relaxation on the beach. The Lalamatine district is one of those very few areas which don't enjoy a perpetual Saturday afternoon. It enjoys instead the cool of a perpetual early Saturday evening. Behind it lie the nightclubs. If, on this particular day, afternoon, stretch of evening time, call it what you will, you had approached the second pavement cafe on the right, you would have seen the usual crowd of U.M. Beatons chatting, drinking, looking very relaxed, and casually glancing at each other's watches to see how expensive they were. You would also have seen a couple of rather dishevelled-looking hitchhikers from Algol, who had recently arrived on an Arcturan megafreighter, aboard which they had been roughing it for a few days. They were angry and bewildered to discover that here, within sight of the Hitchhiker's Guide building itself, a simple glass of fruit juice cost the equivalent of over sixty Altarian dollars. Sell out, one of them said bitterly. If at that moment you had then looked at the next table but one, you would have seen Zaphod Beeblebrox sitting and looking very startled and confused. The reason for his confusion was that five seconds earlier, he had been sitting on the bridge of the starship Heart of Gold. Absolute sellout, said the voice again. Zaphod looked nervously out of the corners of his eyes at the two dishevelled hitchhikers at the next table. Where the hell was he? How had he got there? Where was his ship? His hand felt the arm of the chair on which he was sitting, and then the table in front of him. They seemed solid enough. He sat very still. How can they sit and write a guide for hitchhikers in a place like this? continued the voice. I mean, look at it, look at it. Zaphod was looking at it. Nice place, he thought. But where and why? He fished in his pocket for his two pairs of sunglasses. In the same pocket, he felt a hard, smooth, unidentified lump of very heavy metal. He pulled it out and looked at it. He blinked at it in surprise. Where had he got that? He returned it to his pocket and put on the sunglasses, annoyed to discover that the metal object had scratched one of the lenses. Nevertheless, he felt much more comfortable with them on. They were a double pair of Jujanta 200 superchromatic peril-sensitive sunglasses, which had been specially designed to help people develop a relaxed attitude to danger. At the first hint of trouble, they turn totally black, and thus prevent you from seeing anything that might alarm you. Apart from the scratch, the lenses were clear. He relaxed, but only a little bit. The angry hitchhiker continued to glare at his monstrously expensive fruit juice. Worst thing that ever happened to the guide moving to Ursa Minor Beta, he grumbled. They've all gone soft. You know, I've even heard that they've created a whole electronically synthesized universe in one of their offices, so they can go and research stories during the day and still go to parties in the evening. Not that day and evening mean much in this place. Ursa Minor Beta thought Zaphod. At least he knew where he was now. He assumed that this must be his great-grandfather's doing. But why? Much to his annoyance, a thought popped into his mind. It was very clear and very distinct, and he had now come to recognise these thoughts for what they were. His instinct was to resist them. 
They were the preordained promptings from the dark and locked off parts of his mind. He sat still and ignored the thought furiously. It nagged at him. He ignored it. It nagged at him. He ignored it. It nagged at him. He gave in to it. Ah, what the hell, he thought. Go with the flow. He was too tired, confused, and hungry to resist. He didn't even know what the thought meant. Chapter 6 Megadodo Publications, home of The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, the most totally remarkable book in the whole known universe. Can I help you? said the large pink-winged insect into one of the seventy phones lined up along the vast chrome expanse of the reception desk in the foyer of The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy offices. It fluttered its wings and rolled its eyes. It glared at all the grubby people cluttering up the foyer, soiling the carpets and leaving dirty hand marks on the upholstery. It adored working for the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. It just wished that there was some way of keeping all the hitchhikers away. Weren't they meant to be hanging around dirty space forts or something? It was certain that it had read something somewhere in the book about the importance of hanging around dirty space forts. Unfortunately, most of them seemed to come and hang around in this nice, clean, shiny foyer immediately after hanging around in extremely dirty space forts. And all they ever did was complain. It shivered its wings. What? it said into the phone. Yes, I passed on your message to Mr. Zarniwoop, but I'm afraid he's too cool to see you right now. He's on an intergalactic cruise. It waved a petulant tentacle at one of the grubby people who was angrily trying to engage its attention. The petulant tentacle directed the angry person to look at the notice on the wall to its left and not to interrupt an important phone call. Yes, said the insect. He is in his office, but he's on an intergalactic cruise. Thank you so much for calling. It slammed down the phone. Read the notice it said to the angry man who was trying to complain about one of the more ludicrous and dangerous pieces of misinformation contained in the book. The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy is an indispensable companion to all those who are keen to make sense of life in an infinitely complex and confusing universe. For though it cannot hope to be useful or informative on all matters, it does at least make the reassuring claim that where it is inaccurate, it is at least definitively inaccurate. In cases of major discrepancy, it's always reality that's got it wrong. This was the gist of the notice. It said, The guide is definitive. Reality is frequently inaccurate. This has led to some interesting consequences. For instance, when the editors of the guide were sued by the families of those who had died as a result of taking the entry on the planet Trull, literally, it said, Ravenous bugbladder beasts often make a very good meal for visiting tourists, instead of Ravenous bugbladder beasts often make a very good meal of visiting tourists. They claimed that the first version of the sentence was the more aesthetically pleasing. Summoned a qualified poet to testify under oath that beauty was truth, truth beauty, and hoped thereby to prove that the guilty party in this case was life itself for failing to be either beautiful or true. The judges concurred, and in a moving speech held that life itself was in contempt of court, and duly confiscated it from all those there present before going off to enjoy a pleasant evening's ultra-golf. Zaphod Beeblebrooks entered the foyer. He strode up to the insect receptionist. Okay, he said, where's Zani Whoop? Get me Zani Whoop. Excuse me, sir, said the insect icily. It did not care to be addressed in this manner. Uh, Zani Whoop, uh, get him, right? Get him now. Oh, well, sir, snapped the fragile little creature. If you could be a little cool about it. Look, said Zaphod, I'm up to here with cool, okay? I am so amazingly cool, you could keep a side of meat in me for a month. I am so hip, I have difficulty seeing over my pelvis. Now, will you move before I blow it? Well, if you'd let me explain, sir, said the insect, tapping the most petulant of all the tentacles at its disposal, I'm afraid that isn't possible right now, as Mr. Zaniwoop is on an intergalactic cruise. Hell, thought Zaphod. When's he going to be back? he said. Back, sir? He's in his office. Zaphod paused whilst he tried to sort this particular thought out in his mind. He didn't succeed. This cat's on an intergalactic cruise in his office? He leaned forward and gripped the tapping tentacle. Listen, Three Eyes, he said. Don't you try to outweird me. I get stranger things than you free with my breakfast cereal. Well, just who do you think you are, honey? flounced the insect, quivering its wings in rage. Zaphod Beeblebrox or something? Count the heads said Zaphod in a low rasp. The insect blinked at him. It blinked at him again. You are Zaphod Beeblebrox? It squeaked. 
Yeah, said Zaphod, but don't shout it out or they'll all want one. The Zaphod Beeblebrox? No, just a Zaphod Beeblebrox. Didn't you hear I come in six packs? The insect rattled its tentacles together in agitation. But, sir, it squealed, I just heard on the Sabitha radio report it said you were dead. Yeah, that's right, said Zaphod. I just haven't stopped moving yet. Now, where do I find Zani Whoop? Well, sir, he's in his office on the fifteenth floor, but... But he's on an intergalactic cruise. Yeah, yeah, how do I get to him? Well, the newly installed Sirius Cybernetics Corporation Happy Vertical People Transporters are in the far corner, sir, but... But, sir... Zaphod was turning to go. He turned back. Yeah, he said. Can I ask you why you want to see Mr. Zani Whoop? Yeah, said Zaphod, who was unclear on this point himself. I told myself I had to. Come again, sir? Zaphod leaned forward conspiratorially. I just materialized out of thin air in one of your cafes, he said, as a result of an argument with the ghost of my great-grandfather. No sooner had I got there than my former self, the one that operated on my brain, popped into my head and said, Go see Zani Whoop. I never heard of the cat, that's all I know. That and the fact that I've got to find the man who rules the universe. He winked. Mr. Beeblebrock, sir, said the insect in awed wonder. You're so weird, you should be in movies. Yeah, said Zaphod, patting the thing on a glittering pink wing. A new baby should be in real life. The insect paused for a moment to recover from its agitation, and then reached out a tentacle to answer a ringing phone. A metal hand restrained it. Excuse me, said the owner of the metal hand in a voice that would have made an insect of a more sentimental disposition collapse in tears. This was not such an insect, and it couldn't stand robots. Yes, sir, it snapped. Can I help you? I doubt it, said Marvin. Well, in that case, if you'll just excuse me. Six of the phones are now ringing. A million things awaited the insect's attention. No one can help me, intoned Marvin. Yes, sir, well... Not that anyone's tried, of course. The restraining metal hand fell limply by Marvin's side. His head hung forward very slightly. Is that so? The insect said tartly. Hardly worth anyone's while to help a menial robot, is it? I'm sorry, sir, if... I mean, where's the percentage in being kind or helpful to a robot if it doesn't have any gratitude circuits? And you don't have any? said the insect, who didn't seem to be able to drag itself out of this conversation. I've never had occasion to find out, Marvin informed it. Listen, you miserable heap of maladjusted metal. Aren't you going to ask me what I want? The insect paused. Its long, thin tongue darted out and licked its eyes and darted back again. Is it worth it? it asked. Is anything, said Marvin immediately. What do you want? I'm looking for someone. Who? is the insect. Zaphod Beeblebrox, said Marvin. He's over there. The insect shook with rage. It could hardly speak. Then why did you ask me? it screamed. I just wanted something to talk to, said Marvin. What? Pathetic, isn't it? With a grinding of gears, Marvin turned and trundled off. He caught up with Zaphod approaching the elevators. Zaphod spun round in astonishment. Hey, Marvin, he said. Marvin, how did you get here? Marvin was forced to say something which came very hard to him. I don't know, he said. But... One moment I was sitting in your ship feeling very depressed, and the next moment I was standing here feeling utterly miserable. An improbability field, I expect. Yeah, said Zaphod. I expect my great-grandfather sent you along to keep me company. Thanks a bundle, Grandad, he added to himself under his breath. So, uh, how are you? he said aloud. Oh, fine, said Marvin, if you happen to like being me, which personally I don't. Yeah, yeah, said Zaphod, as the elevator doors opened. Hello, said the elevator sweetly. I am to be your elevator for this trip to the floor of your choice. I have been designed by the Sirius Cybernetics Corporation to take you, the visitor to the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, into these their offices. If you enjoy your ride, which will be swift and pleasurable, then you may care to experience some of the other elevators which have recently been installed in the offices of the Galactic Tax Department, Booby Loo Baby Foods, and the Syrian State Mental Hospital, where many ex Sirius Cybernetics Corporation's executives will be delighted to welcome your visits, sympathy, and happy tales of the outside world. 
Yeah, said Zaphod, stepping into it. What else do you do besides talk? I go up, said the elevator, or down. Good, said Zaphod, we're going up. Or down, the elevator reminded him. Yeah, OK, up, please. There was a moment of silence. Down's very nice, suggested the elevator hopefully. Oh, yeah? A super. Good, said Zaphod. Now will you take us up? May I ask you, inquired the elevator in its sweetest, most reasonable voice, if you've considered all the possibilities that down might offer you. Zaphod knocked one of his heads against the inside wall. He didn't need this, he thought to himself. This, of all things, he had no need of. He hadn't asked to be here. If he was asked at this moment where he would like to be, he would probably have said he would like to be lying on the beach with at least fifty beautiful women and a small team of experts working out new ways they could be nice to him, which was his usual reply. To this he would probably have added something passionate on the subject of food. One thing he didn't want to be doing was chasing after the man who ruled the universe, who was only doing a job which he might as well keep at, because if it wasn't him, it would only be someone else. Most of all, he didn't want to be standing in an office block, arguing with an elevator. Like what other possibilities, he said wearily. Well, the voice trickled on like honey on biscuits, there's the basement, the microfiles, the heating system, er... Uh, it paused. Nothing particularly exciting, it admitted, but they are alternatives. Holy Zarquan, muttered Zaphod. Did I ask for an existential elevator? He beat his fists against the wall. What's the matter with this thing? he spat. It doesn't want to go up, said Marvin simply. I think it's afraid. Afraid? cried Zaphod. Of what heights? An elevator that's afraid of heights? No, said the elevator miserably. Of the future. The future? exclaimed Zaphod. What does a wretched thing want? A pension scheme? At that moment, a commotion broke out in the reception hall behind them. From the walls around them came the sound of suddenly active machinery. We can all see into the future, whispered the elevator in what sounded like terror. It's part of our programming. Zaphod looked out of the elevator. An agitated crowd had gathered round the elevator area, pointing and shouting. Every elevator in the building was coming down very fast. He ducked back in. Marvin, he said, just get this elevator to go up, will you? We've got to get the Zani whoop. Why? asked Marvin dolefully. I don't know, said Zaphod, but when I found him, he'd better have a very good reason for me wanting to see him. Modern elevators are strange and complex entities. The ancient electric winch and maximum capacity eight persons jobs bear as much relation to a serious cybernetics corporation happy vertical people transporter as a packet of mixed nuts does to the entire west wing of the Syrian state mental hospital. This is because they operate on the curious principle of defocused temporal perception. In other words, they have the capacity to see dimly into the immediate future, which enables the elevator to be on the right floor to pick you up even before you knew you wanted it, thus eliminating all the tedious chatting, relaxing, and making friends that people were previously forced to do whilst waiting for elevators. Not unnaturally, many elevators, imbued with intelligence and precognition, became terribly frustrated with the mindless business of going up and down, up and down, experimented briefly with the notion of going sideways as a sort of existential protest, demanded participation in the decision-making process, and finally took to squatting in basements, sulking. An impoverished hitchhiker visiting any planets in the Sirius star system these days can pick up easy money working as a counsellor for neurotic elevators. At the fifteenth floor, the elevator doors snapped open quickly. Fifteenth, said the elevator, and remember, I'm only doing this because I like your robot. Zaphod and Marvin bundled out of the elevator, which instantly snapped its doors shut and dropped as fast as its mechanism would take it. Zaphod looked around warily. The corridor was deserted and silent, and gave no clue as to where Zani Whoop might be found. All the doors that let off the corridor were closed and unmarked. They were standing close to the bridge which led across from one tower of the building to the other. Through a large window, the brilliant sun of Ursa Minor Beta threw blocks of light in which danced small specks of dust. A shadow flitted past momentarily. Left in the lurch by a lift! muttered Zaphod, who was feeling at his least jaunty. They both stood and looked in both directions. 
You know something? said Zaphod to Marvin. More than you can possibly imagine. I'm dead certain this building shouldn't be shaking, Zaphod said. It was just a light tremor through the soles of his feet, and another one. In the sunbeams the flecks of dust danced more vigorously. Another shadow flitted past. Zaphod looked at the floor. Either, he said, not very confidently, they've got some new vibro system for toning up your muscles while you work, or... He walked across to the window, and suddenly stumbled, because at that moment his Jujanta 200 superchromatic peril-sensitive sunglasses had turned utterly black. A large shadow flitted past the window with a sharp buzz. Zaphod ripped off his sunglasses, and as he did so, the building shook with a thunderous roar. He leapt to the window. Or he said this building's being bombed. Another roar cracked through the building. Who in the galaxy would want to bomb a publishing company? asked Zaphod, but never heard Marvin's reply, because at that moment the building shook with another bomb attack. He tried to stagger back to the elevator, a pointless manoeuvre, he realised, but the only one he could think of. Suddenly, at the end of the corridor, leading at right angles from this one, he caught sight of a figure as it lunged into view. A man. The man saw him. Beeblebrox, over here! he shouted. Zaphod eyed him with distrust as another bomb blast rocked the building. No, called Zaphod. Beeblebrox over here. Who are you? A friend, shouted back the man. He ran towards Zaphod. Oh, yeah, said Zaphod. Anyone's friend in particular or just generally well disposed to people? The man raced along the corridor, the floor bucking beneath his feet like an excited blanket. He was short, stocky and weather-beaten, and his clothes looked as if they'd been twiced round the galaxy and back with him in them. Do you know, shouted Zaphod in his ear when he arrived, your building's being bombed? The man indicated his awareness. It suddenly stopped being light. Glancing round at the window to see why, Zaphod gaped as a huge, slug-like, gunmetal grey spacecraft crept through the air past the building. Two more followed it. The government you deserted is out to get you, Zaphod, hissed the man. They've sent a squadron of Frogstar fighters. Frogstar fighters, muttered Zaphod. Zarquan, you get the picture? What are Frogstar fighters? Zaphod was sure he'd heard someone talk about them when he was president, but he never paid much attention to official matters. The man was pulling him back through a door. He went with him. With a searing whine, a small black spider-like object shot through the air and disappeared down the corridor. What was that? hissed Zaphod. Frogstar Scout Robot Class A out looking for you, said the man. Hey, yeah? Get down! From the opposite direction came a larger, black, spider-like object. It zapped past them. And that was? A Frogstar Scout Robot Class B out looking for you. And that? said Zaphod as a third one seared through the air. A Frogstar Scout Robot Class C out looking for you. Hey! chuckled Zaphod to himself. <laughs> Pretty stupid robots, eh? From over the bridge came a massive, rumbling hum. A gigantic black shape was moving over it from the opposite tower, the size and shape of a tank. Holy photon, what's that? breathed Zaphod. A tank, said the man. Frogstar Scout Robot Class D, come to get you. Should we leave? I think we should. Marvin, called Zaphod. What do you want? Marvin rose from a pile of rubble further down the corridor and looked at them. You see that robot coming towards us? Marvin looked at the gigantic black shape, edging forward towards them over the bridge. He looked down at his own small metal body. He looked back up at the tank. I suppose you want me to stop it, he said. Yeah. Whilst you save your skins. Yeah, said Zaphod. Get in there. Just so long, said Marvin, as I know where I stand. The man tugged at Zaphod's arm, and Zaphod followed him off down the corridor. A point occurred to him about this. Where are we going? he said. Zani Whoop's office. Is this any time to keep an appointment? Come on. Chapter 7 Marvin stood at the end of the bridge corridor. He was not, in fact, a particularly small robot. His silver body gleamed in the dusty sunbeams, and shook with the continual barrage which the building was still undergoing. He did, however, look pitifully small as the gigantic black tank rolled to a halt in front of him. The tank examined him with a probe. The probe withdrew. 
Marvin stood there. Out of my way, little robot! Growled the tank. I am afraid, said Marvin, that I have been left here to stop you. The probe extended again for a quick recheck. It withdrew again. You stop me! Roared the tank. Go on. No, really, I have," said Marvin simply. "What are you armed with?" roared the tank in disbelief. "Yes," said Marvin. The tank's engines rumbled; its gears ground; molecule-sized electronic relays deep in its microbrain flipped backwards and forwards in consternation. "Yes," said the tank. Zayfoot and the as yet unnamed man lurched up one corridor, down a second, and along a third. The building continued to rock and judder, and this puzzled Zayfoot. If they wanted to blow the building up, why was it taking so long? With difficulty, they reached one of a number of totally anonymous, unmarked doors and heaved at it. With a sudden jolt, it opened, and they fell inside. All this way, thought Zayfoot. All this trouble, all this not lying on the beach, having a wonderful time, and for what? A single chair, a single desk, and a single dirty ashtray in an undecorated office. The desk, apart from a bit of dancing dust and a single revolutionary new form of paperclip, was empty. Where said Zayf? What is Zani Whoop? Feeling that his already tenuous grasp of the point of this whole exercise was beginning to slip, he's on an intergalactic cruise," said the man. Zayf tried to size the man up. Ernest type, he thought, not a barrel of laughs. He probably apportioned a fair whack of his time to running up and down, heaving corridors, breaking down doors, and making cryptic remarks in empty offices. Let me introduce myself," the man said. "My name is Rooster, and this is my towel." "Hello, Rooster," said Zayfod. "Hello, towel," he added as Rooster held out to him a rather nasty, old, flowery towel. Not knowing what to do with it, he shook it by the corner. Outside the window, one of the huge slug-like. Gunmetal green spaceships growled past. Yes, go on," said Marvin to the huge battle machine. "You will never guess." Um," said the machine, vibrating with unaccustomed thought. "Laser beams." Marvin shook his head solemnly. "Oh、uh, no!" muttered the machine in its deep guttural rumble. "Too、uh, obvious. obvious." Antimatter ray. It hazarded. Far too obvious," admonished Marvin. "Oh yes," grumbled the machine, somewhat abashed.、Uh, "How about an electron ram?" This was new to Marvin. "What's that?" he said. "One of these," said the machine with enthusiasm. From its turret emerged a sharp prong, which spat a single lethal blaze of light. Behind Marvin, a wall roared and collapsed as a heap of dust. The dust billowed briefly, then settled. No," said Marvin. "Not one of those." Good though, isn't it? Very good," agreed Marvin. "I know," said the Frogstar Battle Machine after another moment's consideration. "You must have one of those new Xanthic restructuron destabilized xenon emitters." Nice, aren't they?" said Marvin. "That's what you've got," said the machine in considerable awe. "No," said Marvin. Oh," said the machine, disappointed. "Then it must be."、Uh... "You're thinking along the wrong lines," said Marvin. "You're failing to take into account something fairly basic in the relationship between men and robots."、Uh... "Well, I know," said the battle machine. "Is it?"、Uh... It tailed off into thought again. "Just think," urged Marvin. "They left me, an ordinary menial robot." To stop you, a gigantic heavy-duty battle machine, whilst they ran off to save themselves, what do you think they would leave me with? Oh,、uh, muttered the machine in alarm. Something pretty damn devastating, I should expect. Expect, said Marvin. Oh yes, expect. I'll tell you what they gave me to protect myself with, shall I? Yes, all right, said the battle machine, bracing itself. Nothing, said Marvin. There was a dangerous pause. Nothing! Roared the battle machine. Nothing at all! Intoned Marvin dismally. Not an electronic sausage. The machine heaved about with fury. Well, doesn't that just take a biscuit? It roared. Nothing, eh? Just don't think, do they? 
and me, said Marvin in a soft low voice, with this terrible pain in all the diodes down my left side. Makes you spit, doesn't it? Yes, agreed Marvin with feeling. How that makes me angry, bellowed the machine. I think I'll smash that wall down. The electron ram stabbed out another searing blaze of light and took out the wall next to the machine. How do you think I feel? said Marvin bitterly. Just ran off and left you, did they? The machine thundered. Yes, said Marvin. Think I'll shoot down a bloody ceiling as well, raged the tank. It took out the ceiling of the bridge. That's very impressive, murmured Marvin. You ain't seen nothing yet, promised the machine. I can take out this floor too, no trouble. It took out the floor too. Howls, bowels, the machine roared as it plummeted fifteen stories and smashed itself to bits on the ground below. What a depressingly stupid machine, said Marvin, and trudged away. Chapter 8 So, do we just sit here or what? said Zaphod angrily. What do these guys out here want? You, Beeble Brooks, said Rooster, they're going to take you to the Frog Star, the most totally evil world in the galaxy. Oh, yeah? said Zaphod. Well, they'll have to come and get me first. They have come and got you, said Rooster. Look out of the window. Zaphod looked and gaped. The ground's going away, he gasped. Where are they taking the ground? They're taking the building, said Rooster. We're airborne. Clouds streaked past the office window. Out in the open air again, Zaphod could see the ring of dark green frog star fighters round the uprooted tower of the building. A network of force beams radiated in from them and held the tower in a firm grip. Zaphod shook his heads in perplexity. What have I done to deserve this, he said. I walk into a building that take it away. It's not what you've done they're worried about, said Rooster. It's what you're going to do. Well, don't I get a say in that? You did, years ago. You'd better hold on. We're in for a fast and bumpy journey. If I ever meet myself, said Zaphod, I'll hit myself so hard I won't know what's hit me. Marvin trudged in through the door, looked at Zaphod accusingly, slumped in a corner, and switched himself off. On the bridge of the Heart of Gold, all was silent. Arthur stared at the rack in front of him and thought. He caught Trillian's eyes as she looked at him inquiringly. He looked back at the rack. Finally, he saw it. He picked up five small plastic squares and laid them on the board that lay just in front of the rack. The five squares had on them the five letters E, X, Q, U, and I. He laid them next to the letters S, I, T, E. Exquisite, he said, on a triple word score. Scores rather a lot, I'm afraid. The ship bumped and scattered some of the letters for the nth time. Trillian sighed and started to sort them out again. Up and down the silent corridors echoed Ford Prefect's feet as he stalked the ship, thumping dead instruments. Why did the ship keep shaking, he thought. Why did it rock and sway? Why could he not find out where they were? Where, basically, were they? The left-hand tower of the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy offices streaked through interstellar space at a speed never equaled either before or since by any other office block in the universe. In a room halfway up it, Zaphod Beeblebrock strode angrily. Rooster sat on the edge of the desk, doing some routine towel maintenance. "'Hey, where did you say this building was flying to?' demanded Zaphod. "'The Frog Star,' said Rooster. "'The most totally evil place in the universe.' Do you have food there? said Zaphod. Food? You're going to the Frog Star and you're worried about whether they got food? Without food I may not make it to the Frog Star. Out of the window they could see nothing but the flickering light of the force beams and vague green streaks, which were presumably the distorted shapes of the Frog Star fighters. At this speed space itself was invisible and indeed unreal. Here, suck this! said Rooster, offering Zaphod his towel. Zaphod stared at him, as if he expected a cuckoo to leap out of his forehead on a small spring. It's soaked in nutrients, explained Rooster. What are you, a messy eater or something? said Zaphod. The yellow stripes are high in protein. The green ones have vitamin B and C complexes. The little pink flowers contain wheat germ extract. 
Zaphor took it and looked at it in amazement. What are the brown stains? he asked. Barbecue sauce, said Rooster, for when I get sick of wheat germ. Zaphod sniffed it doubtfully. Even more doubtfully, he sucked a corner. He spat it out again. Ugh, he stated. Yes, said Rooster, when I've had to suck that end, I usually need to suck the other end, too. Why, said Zaphod suspiciously, what's in that? Antidepressants, said Rooster. I've gone right off this towel, you know, said Zaphod, handing it back. Rooster took it back from him, swung himself off the desk, walked round it, sat in the chair and put his feet up. Beeblebrox, he said, sticking his hands behind his head. Have you any idea what's going to happen to you on the frog star? They're going to feed me, hazarded Zaphod hopefully. They're going to feed you, said Rooster, into the total perspective vortex. Zaphod had never heard of this. He believed that he'd heard of all the fun things in the galaxy, so he assumed that the total perspective vortex was not fun. He asked Rooster what it was. Only, said Rooster, the most savage, psychic torture a sentient being can undergo. Zaphod nodded a resigned nod. So, he said, no food, eh? Listen, said Rooster urgently. You can kill a man, destroy his body, break his spirit, but only the total perspective vortex can annihilate a man's soul. The treatment lasts seconds, but the effects last the rest of your life. Have you ever had a pangalactic gargle blaster? asked Zaphod sharply. This is worse. Real, admitted Zaphod, much impressed. Any idea why these guys might want to do this to me? He added a moment later. They believe it'll be the best way of destroying you forever. They know what you're after. Could they drop me a note and let me know as well? You know, said Rooster. You know, Beeblebrox. You want to meet the man who rules the universe. Can he cook? said Zaphod. On reflection, he added, oh, I doubt if he can. If he could cook a good meal, he wouldn't worry about the rest of the universe. I want to meet a cook. Rooster sighed heavily. What are you doing here, anyway? demanded Zaphod. What's all this got to do with you? I'm just one of those who planned this thing, along with Zani Whoop, along with Uden Vranks, along with your great-grandfather, along with you, Beeblebrox. Me? Yes, you. I was told you had changed. I didn't realize how much. But... I'm here to do one job. I'll do it before I leave you. What job, ma'am? What are you talking about? I will do it before I leave you. Rooster lapsed into an impenetrable silence. Zaphod was terribly glad. Chapter 9 The air around the second planet of the Frog Star System was stale and unwholesome. The dank winds that swept continually over its surface swept over salt flats, dried up marshland, tangled and rotting vegetation, and the crumbling remains of ruined cities. No life moved across its surface. The ground, like that of many planets in this part of the galaxy, had long been deserted. The howl of the wind was desolate enough as it gusted through the old decaying houses of the cities. It was more desolate as it whipped about the bottoms of the tall black towers that swayed uneasily here and there about the surface of this world. At the top of these towers lived colonies of large, scraggy, evil-smelling birds, the sole survivors of the civilization that once lived here. The howl of the wind was at its most desolate, however, when it passed over a pimple of a place set in the middle of a wide grey plain, on the outskirts of the largest of the abandoned cities. This pimple of a place was the thing that had earned this world the reputation of being the most totally evil place in the galaxy. From without, it was simply a steel dome about thirty feet across. From within, it was something more monstrous than the mind can comprehend. About a hundred yards or so away, and separated from it by a pockmarked, and blasted stretch of the most barren land imaginable was what would probably have been described as a landing pad of sorts. That is to say that, scattered over a largish area, were the ungainly hulks of two or three dozen crash-landed buildings. Flitting over and around these buildings was a mind, a mind that was waiting for something. The mind directed its attention into the air, and before very long a distant speck appeared, surrounded by a ring of smaller specks. 
The larger speck was the left-hand tower of the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy office building, descending through the stratosphere of Frogstar World B. As it descended, Rooster suddenly broke the long, uncomfortable silence that had grown up between the two men. He stood up and gathered his towel into a bag. He said, Beeble Brooks, I will now do the job I was sent here to do. Zaphod looked up at him from where he was sitting in a corner, sharing unspoken thoughts with Marvin. Yeah, he said. The building will shortly be landing. When you leave the building, do not go out of the door, said Rooster. Go out of the window. Good luck, he said, and walked out of the door, disappearing from Zaphod's life as mysteriously as he had entered it. Zaphod leapt up and tried the door, but Rooster had already locked it. He shrugged and returned to the corner. Two minutes later, the building crash-landed amongst the other wreckage. Its escort of Frogstar fighters deactivated their force beams and soared off into the air again, bound for Frogstar World A, an altogether more congenial spot. They never landed on Frogstar World B. No one did. No one ever walked on its surface other than the intended victims of the total perspective vortex. Zaford was badly shaken by the crash. He lay for a while in the silent, dusty rubble to which most of the room had been reduced. He felt that he was at the lowest ebb he had ever reached in his life. He felt bewildered. He felt lonely. He felt unloved. Eventually he felt he ought to get whatever it was over with. He looked around the cracked and broken room. The wall had split round the door frame, and the door hung open. The window, by some miracle, was closed and unbroken. For a while he hesitated, then he thought that if his strange and recent companion had been through all that he had been through just to tell him what he had told him, then there must be a good reason for it. With Marvin's help he got the window open. Outside it, the cloud of dust aroused by the crash and the hulks of the other buildings with which this one was surrounded effectively prevented Zaphod from seeing anything of the world outside. Not that this concerned him unduly. His main concern was what he saw when he looked down. Zani Whoop's office was on the fifteenth floor. The building had landed at a tilt of about forty-five degrees, but still the descent looked heart-stopping. Eventually, stung by the continuous series of contemptuous looks that Marvin appeared to be giving him, he took a deep breath and clambered out onto the steeply inclined side of the building. Marvin followed him, and together they began to crawl slowly and painfully down the fifteen floors that separated them from the ground. As he crawled, the dank air and dust choked his lungs, his eyes smarted, and the terrifying distance down made his head spin. The occasional remark from Marvin of the order of, This is the sort of thing you life forms enjoy, is it? I ask merely for information, did little to improve his state of mind. About halfway down the side of the shattered building, they stopped to rest. It seemed to Zaphod, as he lay there panting with fear and exhaustion, that Marvin seemed a mite more cheerful than usual. Eventually he realised this wasn't so. The robot just seemed cheerful in comparison with his own mood. A large, scraggy black bird came flapping through the slowly settling clouds of dust and, stretching down its scrawny legs, landed on an inclined window ledge a couple of yards from Zaphod. It folded its ungainly wings and teetered awkwardly on its perch. Its wingspan must have been something like six feet, and its head and neck seemed curiously large for a bird. Its face was flat, the beak underdeveloped, and halfway along the underside of its wings the vestiges of something hand-like could clearly be seen. In fact, it looked almost human. It turned its heavy eyes on Zaphod and clicked its beak in a desultory fashion. "'Go away!' said Zaphod. "'Okay,' muttered the bird morosely and flapped off into the dust again. Zaphod watched its departure in bewilderment. "'Did that bird just talk to me?' he asked Marvin nervously. He was quite prepared to believe the alternative explanation that he was in fact hallucinating. Yes, confirmed Marvin. Poor souls, said a deep, ethereal voice in Zaphod's ear. Twisting round violently to find the source of the voice nearly caused Zaphod to fall off the building. 
He grabbed savagely at a protruding window fitting and cut his hand on it. He hung on, breathing heavily. The voice had no visible source whatsoever. There was no one there. Nevertheless, it spoke again. A tragic history behind them, you know. A terrible blight. Seyford looked wildly about. The voice was deep and quiet. In other circumstances, it would have been described as soothing. There is, however, nothing soothing about being addressed by a disembodied voice out of nowhere, particularly when you are, like Zephyr Bibelbrox, not at your best, and hanging from a ledge eight stories up a crashed building. Hey, ah,、uh, he stammered. Shall I tell you their story? Inquired the voice quietly. Hey, who are you? Panted Zephyr. Where are you? Later, then, perhaps. Murmured the voice. I am Gargravar. I am the custodian of the total perspective vortex. Why can't I see you? You will find your progress down the building greatly facilitated. The voice lifted. If you move about two yards to your left, why don't you try it? Zephod looked and saw a series of short horizontal grooves leading all the way down the side of the building. Gratefully, he shifted himself across to them. Why don't I see you again at the bottom? Said the voice in his ear, and as it spoke, it faded. Hey! Called out Zephod. Where are you? It'll only take you a couple of minutes. Said the voice very faintly. Marvin, said Zephod earnestly to the robot squatting dejectedly next to him. Did a, did a voice just? Yes. yes. Marvin replied tersely. Zephod nodded. He took out his peril-sensitive sunglasses again. They were completely black and by now quite badly scratched by the unexpected metal object in his pocket. He put them on. He would find his way down the building more comfortably if he didn't actually have to look at what he was doing. Minutes later, he clambered over the ripped and mangled foundations of the building, and once more, removing his sunglasses, he dropped to the ground. Marvin joined him a moment or so later, and lay face down in the dust and rubble, from which position he seemed disinclined to move. Ah,、oh, there you are," said the voice suddenly in Zephod's ear. "Excuse me, leaving you like that. It's just that I have a terrible head for heights. At least," he added wistfully, "I did have a terrible head for heights." Zephod looked around slowly and carefully. Just to see if he had missed something which might be the source of the voice. All he saw, however, was the dust, the rubble, and the towering hulks of the encircling buildings. Hey,、uh, why can't I see you? He said. Why aren't you here? I am here, said the voice slowly. My body wanted to come, but it's a bit busy at the moment. Things to do, people to see. After what seemed like a sort of ethereal sigh, it added, "You know how it is with bodies." Seyford wasn't sure about this. "I thought I did," he said. "I only hope it's gone in for a rest cure," continued the voice. "The way it's been living recently, it must be on its last elbows." "Elbows?" said Seyford. "Don't you mean last legs?" The voice said nothing for a while. Seyford looked around uneasily. Didn't know if it had gone or was still there or what it was doing. Then the voice spoke again. So you are to be put into the vortex, yes? Ah,、uh, well," said Zephod with a very poor attempt at nonchalance. "This cat's in no hurry, you know. I can just slouch about and take a look at the local scenery, you know." Have you seen the local scenery? Asked the voice of Gargrava. "Er,、uh, no." Zephod clambered over the rubble and rounded the corner of one of the wrecked buildings that was obscuring his view. He looked out at the landscape of Frogstar World B. Ah,、oh, okay, he said. I'll just sort of slouch about then. No, said Gargravar. The vortex is ready for you now. You must come. Follow me. Uh, yeah," said Zephod. "And how am I meant to do that?" "I'll hum for you," said Gargravar. "Follow the humming."
A soft, keening sound drifted through the air, a pale, sad sound that seemed to be without any focus. It was only by listening very carefully that Zaphod was able to detect the direction from which it was coming. Slowly, dazedly, he stumbled off in its wake. What else was there to do? Chapter 10 The universe, as has been observed before, is an unsettlingly big place, a fact which, for the sake of a quiet life, most people tend to ignore. Many would happily move to somewhere rather smaller of their own devising, and this is what most beings, in fact, do. For instance, in one corner of the eastern galactic arm lies the large forest planet Oglaroon, the entire intelligent population of which lives permanently in one fairly small and crowded nut tree, in which tree they are born, live, fall in love, carve tiny speculative articles in the bark on the meaning of life, the futility of death, and the importance of birth control, fight a few extremely minor wars, and eventually die strapped to the underside of some of the less accessible outer branches. In fact, the only Oglarunians who ever leave their tree are those who are hurled out of it for the heinous crime of wondering whether any of the other trees might be capable of supporting life at all, or indeed whether the other trees are anything other than illusions brought on by eating too many Oglanuts. Exotic though this behaviour may seem, there is no life form in the galaxy which is not some way guilty of the same thing, which is why the total perspective vortex is as horrific as it is. For when you are put into the vortex, you are given just one momentary glimpse of the entire unimaginable infinity of creation, and somewhere in it a tiny little marker, a microscopic dot on a microscopic dot, which says... You are here. The grey plain stretched before Zaphod, a ruined, shattered plain. The wind whipped wildly over it. Visible in the middle was the steel pimple of the dome. This, gathered Zaphod, was where he was going. This was the total perspective vortex. As he stood and gazed bleakly at it, a sudden, inhuman wail of terror emanated from it, as of a man having his soul burnt from his body. It screamed above the wind and died away. Zaphod started with fear, and his blood seemed to turn to liquid helium. Hey, what was that? he muttered voicelessly. A recording, said Gargrava, of the last man who was put in the vortex. It is always played to the next victim. A sort of prelude. Hey, it, it really sounds bad, stammered Zephod. Uh, couldn't we maybe uh, slope off to a party or something for a while, uh, think it over? For all I know, said Gargrava's ethereal voice, I'm probably at one. My body, that is. It goes to a lot of parties without me. Says I only get in the way. Hey-ho. What is all this about your body? said Zaphod, anxious to delay whatever it was that was going to happen to him. Well, it's... it's busy, you know, said Gargrava hesitantly. You mean it's got a mind of its own? said Zaphod. There was a long and slightly chilly pause before Gargrava spoke again. I have to say, he replied eventually, that I find that remark in rather poor taste. Zaphod muttered a bewildered and embarrassed apology. No matter, said Gargrava. You weren't to know. The voice fluttered unhappily. The truth is, it continued in tones which suggested he was trying very hard to keep it under control, the truth is that we are currently undergoing a period of legal trial separation. I suspect it will end in divorce. The voice was still again, leaving Zaphod with no idea of what to say. He mumbled uncertainly. I think we were probably not very well suited, said Gargravar again at length. We never seemed to be happy doing the same things. We always had the greatest arguments over sex and fishing. Eventually we tried to combine the two, but that only led to disaster, as you can probably imagine. And now my body refuses to let me in. It won't even see me. He paused again, tragically, 
the wind whipped across the plain. It says I only inhibit it. I pointed out that in fact I was meant to inhabit it, and it said that was exactly the sort of smart aleck remark that got right up a body's left nostril, and so we left it. It will probably get custody of my forename. Oh, said Zaphod faintly. And what's that? Pizpot, said the voice. My name is Pizpot Gargavar. Says it all, really, doesn't it? Uh, said Zaphod sympathetically. And that is why I, as a disembodied mind, have this job. Custodian of the total perspective vortex. No one will ever walk on the ground of this planet except the victims of the vortex. They don't really count, I'm afraid. Ah. I'll tell you the story. Would you like to hear it? Uh. Many years ago, this was a thriving, happy planet. People, cities, shops, a normal world. Except that on the high streets of these cities, there were slightly more shoe shops than one might have thought necessary. And slowly, insidiously, the numbers of these shoe shops were increasing. It's a well-known economic phenomenon, but tragic to see it in operation. For the more shoe shops there were, the more shoes they had to make, and the worse and more unwearable they became. And the worse they were to wear, the more people had to buy to keep themselves shod, and the more the shops proliferated, until the whole economy of the place passed what I believe is termed the shoe event horizon, and it became no longer economically possible to build anything other than shoe shops. Result... Collapse, ruin, and famine. Most of the population died out. Those few who had the right kind of genetic instability mutated into birds. You've seen one of them. Who cursed their feet, cursed the ground, and vowed that none should walk on it again. Unhappy lot. Come, I must take you to the vortex. Zaphod shook his head in bemusement and stumbled forward across the plain. And you, he said, you come from this hellhole pit, do you? No, no, said Gargravar, taken aback. I come from the Frog Star World Sea. Beautiful place, wonderful fishing. I flit back there in the evenings, though all I can do now is watch. The total perspective vortex the only thing on this planet with any function. It was built here because no one else wanted it on their doorstep. At that moment, another dismal scream rent the air and Zaphod shuddered. What can do that to a guy? he breathed. The universe, said Gargravar simply. The whole infinite universe. The infinite suns. The infinite distances between them. And yourself... An invisible dot on an invisible dot, infinitely small. Hey, I'm Zaphod Beeblebrook's man, you know, muttered Zaphod, trying to flap the last remnants of his ego. Gargravar made no reply, but merely resumed his mournful humming till they reached a tarnished steel dome in the middle of the plain. As they reached it, a door hummed open in the side, revealing a small, darkened chamber within. Enter, said Gargravar. Zaphod started with fear. Hey, what, now? he said. Now. Zaphod peered nervously inside. The chamber was very small. It was steel-lined, and there was hardly space in it for more than one man. It, uh, it doesn't look like any kind of uh, vortex to me, said Zaphod. It isn't, said Gargravar. It's just the elevator. Enter. With infinite trepidation, Zaphod stepped into it. He was aware of Gargravar being in the elevator with him, though the disembodied man was not for the moment speaking. The elevator began its descent. 
I must uh, get myself into the right frame of mind for this, muttered Zaphod. There is no right frame of mind, said Gargrabar sternly. You really know how to make a guy feel inadequate. I don't. The Vortex does. At the bottom of the shaft, the rear of the elevator opened up, and Zayford stumbled out into a smallish, functional, steel-lined chamber. At the far end of it stood a single, upright steel box, just large enough for a man to stand in. It was that simple. It connected to a small pile of components and instruments via a single thick wire. Is that it? said Zayford in surprise. That is it. Didn't look too bad, thought Zayford. And I get in there, do I? said Zayford. You get in there, said Gargrivar. And I'm afraid you must do it now. Okay, okay said Zaphod. He opened the door of the box and stepped in. Inside the box, he waited. After five seconds, there was a click, and the entire universe was there in the box with him. Chapter 11 The total perspective vortex derives its picture of the whole universe on the principle of extrapolated matter analyses. To explain, since every single piece of matter in the universe is in some way affected by every other piece of matter in the universe, it is, in theory, possible to extrapolate the whole of creation, every sun, every planet, their orbits, their composition, and their economic and social history, from, say, one small piece of fairy cake. The man who invented the total perspective vortex did so basically in order to annoy his wife. Trintragula, for that was his name, was a dreamer, a thinker, a speculative philosopher, or, as his wife would have it, an idiot. And she would nag him incessantly about the utterly inordinate amount of time he spent staring out into space, or mulling over the mechanics of safety pins, or doing spectrographic analyses of pieces of fairy cake. Have some sense of proportion, she would say, sometimes as often as thirty-eight times in a single day. And so he built the total perspective vortex just to show her, and into one end he plugged the whole of reality as extrapolated from a piece of fairy cake, and into the other end he plugged his wife, so that when he turned it on she saw in one instant the whole infinity of creation and herself in relation to it. To Trintragula's horror the shock completely annihilated her brain, but to his satisfaction he realised that he had proved conclusively that if life is going to exist in a universe of this size, then the one thing it cannot afford to have is a sense of proportion. The door of the vortex swung open. From his disembodied mind, Gargrevar watched dejectedly. He had rather liked Zaphod Beeblebrox in a strange sort of way. He was clearly a man of many qualities, even if they were mostly bad ones. He waited for him to flop forwards out of the box, as they all did. Instead, he stepped out. Hi, he said. Peeblebrox, gasped Gargrevar's mind in amazement. Uh, could I have a drink, please? said Zaphod. You... you have been in the vortex? stammered Gargrevar. Ah, uh, yeah, you saw me, kid. And it was working? Uh, sure was. And you saw the whole infinity of creation? Oh, sure, a really neat place, you know that? Gargrevar's mind was reeling in astonishment. Had his body been with him, it would have sat down heavily with its mouth hanging open. And you saw yourself, said Gargrevar, in relation to it all? Oh, yeah, yeah. But what did you experience? Zaphod shrugged smugly. Oh, it just told me what I knew all the time. I'm a really terrific great guy. Hey, didn't I tell you, baby? I'm Zaphod Beeblebrox. His gaze passed over the machinery which powered the vortex and suddenly stopped, startled. He breathed heavily. Hey, he said, is that really a piece of fairy cake? He ripped the small piece of confectionery from the censers with which it was surrounded. If I told you how much I needed this, he said ravenously, I wouldn't have time to eat it. He ate it. 
Chapter 12 A short while later he was running across the plain in the direction of the ruined city. The dank air wheezed heavily in his lungs, and he frequently stumbled with the exhaustion he was still feeling. Night was beginning to fall, too, and the rough ground was treacherous. The elation of his recent experience was still with him, though. The whole universe, he had seen the whole universe stretching to infinity around him. Everything. And with it had come the clear and extraordinary knowledge that he was the most important thing in it. Having a conceited ego is one thing. Actually being told by a machine is another. He didn't have time to reflect on this matter. Gargrava had told him that he would have to alert his masters as to what had happened, but that he was prepared to leave a decent interval before doing so, enough time for Zephod to make a break and find somewhere to hide. What he was going to do, he didn't know, but feeling that he was the most important person in the universe gave him the confidence to believe that something would turn up. Nothing else on this blighted planet could give him much grounds for optimism. He ran on and soon reached the outskirts of the abandoned city. He walked along cracked and gaping roads, riddled with scrawny weeds, the holes filled with rotting shoes. The buildings he passed were so crumbled and decrepit, he thought it unsafe to enter any of them. Where could he hide? He hurried on. After a while, the remains of a wide, sweeping road led off from the one down which he was walking, and at its end lay a vast, low building, surrounded with sundry smaller ones, the whole surrounded by the remains of a perimeter barrier. The large main building still seemed reasonably solid, and Zephod turned off to see if it might provide him with, well, with anything. He approached the building. Along one side of it, the front, it would seem, since it faced a wide, concreted apron area, were three gigantic doors, maybe sixty feet high. The far one of these was open, and towards this Zephod ran. Inside, all was gloom, dust, and confusion. Giant cobwebs lay over everything. Part of the infrastructure of the building had collapsed, part of the rear wall had caved in, and a thick, choking dust lay inches over the floor. Through the heavy gloom, huge shapes loomed, covered with debris. The shapes were sometimes cylindrical, sometimes bulbous, sometimes like eggs, or rather cracked eggs. Most of them were split open or falling apart. Some were mere skeletons. They were all spacecraft all derelict. Zaphod wandered in frustration amongst the hulks. There was nothing here that remotely approached the serviceable. Even the mere vibration of his footsteps caused one precarious wreck to collapse further into itself. Towards the rear of the building lay one old ship, slightly larger than the others, and buried beneath even deeper piles of dust and cobwebs. Its outline, however, seemed unbroken. Zaphod approached it with interest and as he did so he tripped over an old feed line. He tried to toss the feed line aside, and to his surprise discovered that it was still connected to the ship. To his utter astonishment, he realised that the feed line was also humming slightly. He stared at the ship in disbelief, and then back down at the feed line in his hands. He tore off his jacket and threw it aside. Crawling along on his hands and knees, he followed the feed line, to the point where it connected with the ship. The connection was sound, and the slight humming vibration was more distinct. His heart was beating fast. He wiped away some grime and laid an ear against the ship's side. He could hear only a faint, indeterminate noise. He rummaged feverishly amongst the debris lying on the floor all about him, and found a short length of tubing and a non-biodegradable plastic cup. Out of this he fashioned a crude stethoscope, and placed it against the side of the ship. What he heard made his brains turn somersaults. Transstellar Cruise Lines would like to apologise to passengers for the continuing delay to this flight. We are currently awaiting the loading of our complement of small lemon-soaked paper napkins for your comfort, refreshment and hygiene during the journey. Meanwhile, we thank you for your patience. The cabin crew will shortly be serving coffee and biscuits again. Zaphod staggered backwards, staring wildly at the ship. He walked around for a few moments in a daze. In so doing, he suddenly caught sight of a giant departure board still hanging, but by only one support, from the ceiling above him. It was covered with grime, but some of the figures were still discernible. Zaphod's eyes searched amongst the figures, then made some brief calculations. His eyes widened. 
Nine hundred years, he breathed to himself. That was how late the ship was. Two minutes later, he was on board. As he stepped out of the airlock, the air that greeted him was cool and fresh. The air conditioning was still working. The lights were still on. He moved out of the small entrance chamber into a short, narrow corridor and stepped nervously down it. Suddenly a door opened and a figure stepped out in front of him. Please return to your seat, sir, said the android stewardess, and turning her back on him, she walked on down the corridor in front of him. When his heart had started beating again, he followed her. She opened the door at the end of the corridor and walked through. He followed her through the door. They were now in the passenger compartment, and Zaphod's heart stopped still again for a moment. In every seat sat a passenger, strapped into his or her seat. The passenger's hair was long and unkempt, their fingernails were long, the men wore beards. All of them were quite clearly alive, but sleeping. Zaphod had the creeping horrors. He walked slowly down the aisle as in a dream. By the time he was halfway down the aisle, the stewardess had reached the other end. She turned and spoke. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, she said sweetly. Thank you for bearing with us during this slight delay. We will be taking off as soon as we possibly can. If you would like to wake up now, I will serve you coffee and biscuits. There was a slight hum. At that moment, all the passengers awoke. They awoke screaming and clawing at the straps and life support systems that held them tightly in their seats. They screamed and bawled and hollered till Zaphod thought his ears would shatter. They struggled and writhed as the stewardess patiently moved up the aisle, placing a small cup of coffee and a packet of biscuits in front of each one of them. Then one of them rose from his seat. He turned and looked at Zaphod. Zaphod's skin was crawling all over his body as if it was trying to get off. He turned and ran from the bedlam. He plunged through the door and back into the corridor. The man pursued him. He raced in a frenzy to the end of the corridor, through the entrance chamber and beyond. He arrived on the flight deck, slammed and bolted the door behind him. He leant back against the door, breathing hard. Within seconds, a hand started beating on the door. From somewhere on the flight deck, a metallic voice addressed him. Passengers are not allowed on the flight deck. Please return to your seat and wait for the ship to take off. Coffee and biscuits are being served. This is your autopilot speaking. Please return to your seat. Zaford said nothing. He breathed hard. Behind him, the hand continued to knock on the door. Please return to your seat, repeated the autopilot. Passengers are not allowed on the flight deck. I'm not a passenger, panted Zaphod. Please return to your seat. I'm not a passenger, shouted Zaphod again. Please return to your seat. I'm not a... Hello, can you hear me? Please return to your seat. You're the autopilot, said Zaphod. Yes, said the voice from the flight console. You're in charge of this ship? Yes, said the voice again. There has been a delay. Passengers are to be kept temporarily in suspended animation for their comfort and convenience. Coffee and biscuits are served every year, after which passengers are returned to suspended animation for their continued comfort and convenience. Departure will take place when the flight stores are complete. We apologize for the delay. Zaphod moved away from the door, on which the pounding had now ceased. He approached the flight console. Delay? he cried. Have you seen the world outside this ship? It's a wasteland, a desert. Civilization's been and gone, man. There are no lemon-soaked paper napkins on their way from anywhere. The statistical likelihood, continued the autopilot primly, is that other civilizations will arise. There will one day be lemon-soaked paper napkins. Till then, there will be a short delay. Please return to your seat. But... But at that moment, the door opened. Zaphod spun round to see the man who had pursued him standing there. He carried a large briefcase. He was smartly dressed, and his hair was short. He had no beard and no long fingernails. Zaphod Beeblebrox, he said. My name is Zaniwoop. I believe you wanted to see me. Zaphod Beeblebrox wittered. His mouth said foolish things. He dropped into a chair. Oh, man, oh, man, where did you spring from? he said. I have been waiting here for you, he said in a businesslike tone. He put the briefcase down and sat in another chair. I am glad you followed instructions, he said. I was a bit nervous that you might have left my office by the door rather than the window. Then you would have been in trouble. 
save what shook his heads at him and burbled. When you entered the door of my office, you entered my electronically synthesized universe, he explained. If you'd left by the door, you would have been back in the real one. Uh, the artificial one works from here. He patted the briefcase smugly. Zaphod glared at him with resentment and loathing. What's the difference? he muttered. Uh, nothing, said Zani Whoop. They are identical. Oh, except that um, I think the frog star fighters are grey in the real universe. What's going on? spat Zaphod. Simple, said Zani Whoop. His self-assurance and smugness made Zaphod seethe. Ah, uh, very simple, repeated Zani Whoop. I discovered the coordinates at which this man could be found, the man who rules the universe, and discovered that his world was protected by an improbability field. To protect my secret and myself, I retreated to the safety of this totally artificial universe and hid myself away in a forgotten cruise liner. I was secure. Meanwhile, you and I... You and I? said Zaphod angrily. You mean I knew you? Uh, yes, said Zani Whoop. Uh, we knew each other well. I had no taste, said Zaphod, and resumed a sullen silence. Meanwhile, you and I arranged that you would steal the improbability drive ship, the only one which could reach the ruler's world, and bring it to me here. This you have now done, I trust, and I congratulate you. He smiled a tight little smile, which Zaphod wanted to hit with a brick. Oh, and uh, in case you are wondering, added Zani Whoop, this universe was created specially for you to come to. Uh, you are therefore the most important person in this universe. You would never, he said with an even more brickable smile, have survived the total perspective vortex in the real one. Shall we go? Where? said Zaphod sullenly. He felt collapsed. To your ship, the Heart of Gold. You did bring it, I trust. No. Where is your jacket? Zaphod looked at him in mystification. And my jacket? I, I took it off. It's outside. Good. We will go and find it. Zani Whoop stood up and gestured to Zaphod to follow him. Out in the entrance chamber again, they could hear the screams of the passengers being fed coffee and biscuits. It has not been a pleasant experience waiting for you, said Zani Whoop. Not pleasant for you? bawled Zaphod. How do you think... Zani Whoop held up a silencing finger as the hatchway swung open. A few feet away from them, they could see Zaphod's jacket lying in the debris. Very remarkable and very powerful ship, said Zani Whoop. Watch. As they watched, the pocket on the jacket suddenly bulged. It split. It ripped. The small metal model of the heart of gold that Zaphod had been bewildered to discover in his pocket was growing. It grew, it continued to grow. It reached, after two minutes, its full size. At an improbability level, said Zani Whoop of, oh, I don't know, but something very, very large. Zaphod swayed. You mean I had it with me all the time? Zani Whoop smiled. He lifted up his briefcase and opened it. He twisted a single switch inside it. Goodbye, artificial universe, he said. Hello, real one. The scene before them shimmered briefly and reappeared exactly as before. You see, said Zani Whoop, exactly the same. You mean, repeated Zaphod tautly, that I had it with me all the time? Oh, yes, said Zani Whoop. Uh, of course, I mean, that was the whole point. That's it, said Zaphod. You can count me out. From here on in, you can count me out. I've had all I want of this. You play your own games. I'm afraid you cannot leave, said Zani Whoop. You are entwined in the improbability field. You cannot escape. He smiled the smile that Zaphod had wanted to hit, and this time Zaphod hit it. Chapter 13 Ford Prefect bounded up to the bridge of the Heart of Gold. Trillian! Arthur! he shouted. It's working! The ship's reactivated! Trillian and Arthur were asleep on the floor. Come on, you guys, we're going, we're off, he said, kicking them awake. Hi there, guys, twittered the computer. It's really great to be back with you again, I can tell you, and I just want to say that... Shut up, said Ford. Just tell us where the hell we are. Frogstar World B, and man, it's a dump, said Zaphod, running onto the bridge. Hi, guys, you must be so amazingly glad to see me, you can't even find words to tell me what a cool fruit I am. What a what? said Arthur, blearily picking himself up from the floor and not taking any of this in. I know how you feel, said Zaphod. 
I'm so great, even I get tongue-tied talking to myself. Hey, it's good to see you, Trillion Ford, Monkey Man. Hey, uh, computer. Hi there, Mr. Beetlebuster. It's sure is a great honor to... Shut up and get us out of here. Fast, fast, fast. Sure thing, fella. Where do you want to go? Anywhere. Doesn't matter, shouted Zaphod. Yes, it does, he said again. We want to go to the nearest place to eat. Sure thing, said the computer happily, and a massive explosion rocked the bridge. When Zani Whoop entered a minute or so later with a black eye, he regarded the four wisps of smoke with interest. Chapter 14 Four inert bodies sank through spinning blackness. Consciousness had died. Cold oblivion pulled the bodies down and down into the pit of unbeing. The roar of silence echoed dismally around them, and they sank at last into a dark and bitter sea of heaving red that slowly engulfed them, seemingly forever. After what seemed an eternity, the sea receded and left them lying on a cold, hard shore, the flotsam and jetsam of the stream of life, the universe, and everything. Cold spasms shook them. Lights danced sickeningly around them. The cold, hard shore tipped and span and then stood still. It shone darkly. It was a very highly polished, cold, hard shore. A green blur watched them disapprovingly. It coughed. <coughs> Good evening, madam, gentlemen, it said. Do you have a reservation? Fort Prefect's consciousness snapped back like elastic making his brain smart. He looked up woozily at the green blur. Reservation? he said weakly. Uh, yes, sir, said the green blur. Do you need a reservation for the afterlife? Insofar as it is possible for a green blur to arch its eyebrows disdainfully, this is what the green blur now did. Afterlife, sir, it said. Arthur Dent was grappling with his consciousness the way one grapples with a lost bar of soap in the bar. Is this the afterlife? he stammered. Well, I assume so, said Ford Prefect, trying to work out which way was up. He tested the theory that it must lie in the opposite direction from the cold, hard shore on which he was lying, and staggered to what he hoped were his feet. I mean, he said, swaying gently, there's no way we could have survived that blast, is there? No, muttered Arthur. He had raised himself up onto his elbows, but it didn't seem to improve things. He slumped down again. No, said Trillian, standing up. No way at all. A dull, hoarse, gurgling sound came from the floor. It was Zaphod Beeblebrox attempting to speak. I certainly didn't survive, he gurgled. I was a total goner. Wham, bang, and that was it. Yeah, thanks to you, said Ford. We didn't stand a chance. We must have been blown to bits, arms, legs, everywhere. Yeah, said Zaphod, struggling noisily to his feet. If the lady and gentleman would care to order drinks, said the green blur, hovering impatiently beside them. Kapow! Splat! continued Zaphod, instantaneously zonked into our component molecules. Hey, Ford, he said, identifying one of the slowly solidifying blurs around him. Did you get that thing of your whole life flashing before you? You got that too, said Ford, your whole life? Yeah, said Zaphod. At least I assume it was mine. I spent a lot of time out of my skulls, you know. He looked around him at the various shapes that were at last becoming proper shapes instead of vague and wobbling shapeless shapes. So, he said. So what, said Ford. So here we are, said Zaphod hesitantly, lying dead. Standing, Trillian corrected him. Uh, standing dead continued Zaphod, in this desolate restaurant, said Arthur Dent, who had got to his feet and could now, much to his surprise, see clearly. That is to say, the thing that surprised him was not that he could see, but what he could see. 
Here we are, continued Zephyr doggedly, standing dead in this desolate... Five star, said Trillian. Restaurant, concluded Zephyr. Odd, isn't it? said Ford. Ah, uh, yeah. Nice chandeliers, though, said Trillian. They looked about themselves in bemusement. Not so much an afterlife, said Arthur, more a sort of après-vie. The chandeliers were in fact a little on the flashy side, and the low-vaulted ceiling from which they hung would not, in an ideal universe, have been painted in that particular shade of deep turquoise. And even if it had been, it wouldn't have been highlighted by concealed mood lighting. This is not, however, an ideal universe, as was further evidenced by the eye-crossing patterns of the inlaid marble floor and the way in which the fronting for the eighty-yard-long marble-topped bar had been made. The fronting for the eighty-yard-long marble-topped bar had been made by stitching together nearly twenty thousand Antarian mosaic lizard skins, despite the fact that the twenty thousand lizards concerned had needed them to keep their insides in. A few smartly dressed creatures were lounging casually at the bar or relaxing in the richly coloured, body-hugging seats that were deployed here and there about the bar area. A young Vlaherg officer and his green, steaming young lady passed through the large, smoked glass doors at the far end of the bar into the dazzling light of the main body of the restaurant beyond. Behind Arthur was a large, curtained bay window. He pulled aside a corner of the curtain and looked out at a bleak and drear landscape, grey, pockmarked and dismal, a landscape which, under normal circumstances, would have given Arthur the creeping horrors. These were not, however, normal circumstances, for the thing that froze his blood and made his skin try to crawl up his back and off the top of his head was the sky. The sky was an attendant flunky politely drew the curtain back into place. All in good time, sir, he said. Seyford's eyes flashed. Hey, hang about, you dead guys, he said. I think we're missing some ultra-important thing here, you know. Something somebody said, and we missed it. Arthur was profoundly relieved to turn his attention from what he had just seen. He said, I said it was a sort of apre. Yeah, and don't you wish you hadn't, said Seyford. Ford? I said it was odd. Yeah, shrewd but dull. Perhaps it was... Perhaps, interrupted the green blur, who had by this time resolved into the shape of a small, wizened, dark-suited green waiter. Perhaps you'd care to discuss the matter over drinks. Drinks! cried Zaphod. That was it! See what you miss if you don't stay alert! Indeed, sir, said the waiter patiently. If the lady and gentleman would care to take drinks before dinner... Dinner! Zaphod exclaimed with passion. Listen, little green person, my stomach could take you home and cuddle you all night for the mere idea. And the universe, continued the waiter, determined not to be deflected on his home stretch, will explode later for your pleasure. Ford's head swivelled slowly towards him. He spoke with feeling. Wow, he said, what sort of drinks do you serve in this place? The waiter laughed a polite little waiter's laugh. Ha <laughs> ha, he said. I think Sir has perhaps misunderstood me. Oh, I hope not, breathed Ford. The waiter coughed a polite little waiter's cough. It is not unusual for our customers to be a little disoriented by the time journey, he said. So if I might suggest time journey, said Zaphod. Time journey, said Ford. Time journey, said Trillian. You mean this isn't the afterlife, said Arthur. The waiter smiled a polite little waiter's smile. He had almost exhausted his polite little waiter repertoire, and would soon be slipping into his role of a rather tight-lipped and sarcastic little waiter. Afterlife, sir, he said. No, sir. And we're not dead, said Arthur. The waiter tightened his lips. Ah, ah, he said. Sir is most evidently alive, otherwise I would not attempt to serve, sir. In an extraordinary gesture, which it is pointless attempting to describe, Zaphod Beeblebrook slapped both his foreheads with two of his arms and one of his thighs with the other. Hey, guys, he said, this is crazy. We did it. We finally got to where we were going. This is Millieways. Millieways, said Ford. Yes, sir, said the waiter, laying on the patience with a trowel. This is Millieways, the restaurant at the end of the universe. End of what? said Arthur. The universe, repeated the waiter, very clearly and unnecessarily distinctly. When did that end? said Arthur. In just a few minutes, sir, said the waiter. 
he took a deep breath. He didn't need to do this because his body was supplied with the peculiar assortment of gases it required for survival from a small intravenous device strapped to his leg. There are times, however, when whatever your metabolism, you have to take a deep breath. And now, if you would care to order your drinks at last, he said, I will then show you to your table. Zaphod grinned two manic grins, sauntered over to the bar, and bought most of it. Chapter 15 The restaurant at the end of the universe is one of the most extraordinary ventures in the entire history of catering. It has been built on the fragmented remains of... It will be built on the fragmented... That is to say, it will have been built by this time, and indeed has been... One of the major problems encountered in time travel is not that of accidentally becoming your own father or mother. There is no problem involved in becoming your own father or mother that a broad-minded and well-adjusted family can't cope with. There is also no problem about changing the course of history. The course of history does not change because it all fits together like a jigsaw. All well, the important changes have happened before the things they were supposed to change, and it all sorts itself out in the end. The major problem is quite simply one of grammar and the main work to consult in this matter is Dr. Dan Street Mentioner's Time Traveller's Handbook of 1001 Tense Formations. It will tell you, for instance, how to describe something that was about to happen to you in the past before you avoided it by time-jumping forward two days in order to avoid it. The event will be described differently according to whether you are talking about it from the standpoint of your own natural time, from a time in the further future, or a time in the further past, and is further complicated by the possibility of conducting conversations whilst you are actually travelling from one time to another with the intention of becoming your own mother or father. Most readers get as far as the future semi-conditionally modified sub-inverted plagal past subjunctive intentional before giving up. And in fact, in later editions of the book, all pages beyond this point have been left blank to save on printing costs. The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy skips lightly over this tangle of academic abstraction, pausing only to note that the term future perfect has been abandoned since it was discovered not to be. To resume. The restaurant at the end of the universe is one of the most extraordinary ventures in the entire history of catering. It is built on the fragmented remains of an eventually ruined planet which is, or we all haven't be, enclosed in a vast time bubble and projected forward in time to the precise moment of the end of the universe. This is, many would say, impossible. In it, guests take, will and on take, their places at table and eat, will and on eat, sumptuous meals whilst watching, willing watching, the whole of creation explode around them. This, many would say, is equally impossible. You can arrive, may and arrive and on when, for any sitting you like, without prior, late for when, reservation, because you can book retrospectively, as it were, when you return to your own time. You can have on book, have enter, for when, presuming, returning winter, retro home. This is, many would now insist, absolutely impossible. At the restaurant you can meet and dine with, may and meet and con with dine and on when, a fascinating cross-section of the entire population of space and time. This, it can be explained patiently, is also impossible. You can visit it as many times as you like, may and on visit, re on visiting, and so on. For further tense correction, consult Dr. Street Mentioner's book. And be sure of never meeting yourself because of the embarrassment this usually causes. This, even if the rest were true, which it isn't, is patently impossible, say the doubters. All you have to do is to deposit one penny in a savings account in your own era, and when you arrive at the end of time, the operation of compound interest means that the fabulous cost of your meal has been paid for. This, many claim, is not merely impossible, but clearly insane which is why the advertising executives of the star system of Bastablon came up with this slogan. If you've done six impossible things this morning, why not round it off with breakfast at Milliways, the restaurant at the end of the universe? Chapter 16 At the bar, Zayford was rapidly becoming as tired as a newt. 
His heads knocked together and his smiles were coming out of sync. He was miserably happy. Zaphod, said Ford, whilst you're still capable of speech, would you care to tell me what the photon happened? Where have you been? Where have we been? Small matter, but I'd like it cleared up. Zaphod's left head sobered up, leaving his right to sink further into the obscurity of drink. Uh, yeah, he said, I've been around. They want me to find the man who rules the universe, but I don't care to meet him. I believe the man can't cook. His left head watched his right head saying this and then nodded. True, it said, have another drink. Ford had another pangalactic gargle blaster, the drink which has been described as the alcoholic equivalent of a mugging, expensive and bad for the head. Whatever had happened, Ford decided he didn't really care too much. Uh, listen, Ford, said Zaphod, everything's cool and fruity. You mean everything's under control? No, nope, said Zaphod, I do not mean everything's under control. That would not be cool and fruity. If you want to know what happened, let's just say I had the whole situation in my pocket, okay? Ford shrugged. Zaphod giggled into his drink. It frothed up over the side of the glass and started to eat its way into the marble bar top. A wild-skinned sky gypsy approached them and played electric violin at them until Zaphod gave him a lot of money and he agreed to go away again. The gypsy approached Arthur and Trillian sitting in another part of the bar. I don't know what this place is, said Arthur, but I think it gives me the creeps. Have another drink, said Trillian. Enjoy yourself. Which, said Arthur, the two are mutually exclusive. Poor Arthur, you're not really cut out for this life, are you? You call this life? You're beginning to sound like Marvin. Marvin is the clearest thinker I know. How do you think we make this violinist go away? The waiter approached. Your table is ready, he said. Seen from the outside, which it never is, the restaurant resembles a giant, glittering starfish beached on a forgotten rock. Each of its arms house the bars, the kitchens, the force field generators which protect the entire structure and the decayed hunk of planet on which it sits, and the time turbines which slowly rock the whole affair backwards and forwards across the crucial moment. In the centre sits the gigantic golden dome, almost a complete globe, and it was into this area that Zaphod, Ford, Arthur and Trillian now passed. At least five tons of glitter alone had gone into it before them and covered every available surface. The other surfaces were not available because they were already encrusted with jewels, precious seashells from San Traginus, gold leaf, mosaic tiles, lizard skins, and a million unidentifiable embellishments and decorations. Glass glittered, silver shone, gold gleamed, Arthur Dent goggled. Wowee, said Zaphod, Zappo! Incredible, breathed Arthur. The people, the things. The things, said Ford Prefect quietly, are also people. The people, resumed Arthur, the other people. The lights, said Trillian. The tables, said Arthur. The clothes, said Trillian. The waiter thought they sounded like a couple of bailiffs. The end of the universe is very popular, said Zaphod, threading his way unsteadily through the throng of tables, some made of marble, some of rich ultra-mahogany, some even of platinum, and at each a party of exotic creatures chatting amongst themselves and studying menus. Uh, people like to dress up for it, continued Zaphod. It gives it a sense of occasion. The tables were fanned out in a large circle around a central stage area where a small band was playing light music. At least a thousand tables was Arthur's guess. And interspersed among them were swaying palms, hissing fountains, grotesque statuary, in short, all the paraphernalia common to all restaurants where little expense has been spared to give the impression that no expense has been spared. Arthur glanced around, half expecting to see someone making an American Express commercial. Zaphod lurched into Ford, who lurched back into Zaphod. Wow, ee, said Zaphod. Zappo, said Ford. My great-granddaddy must have really screwed up the computer's works, you know, said Zaphod. I told it to take us to the nearest place to eat, and it sends us to the end of the universe. <laughs> Remind me to be nice to it one day. He paused. 
Hey, everybody's here, you know. Everybody who was anybody. Was? said Arthur. Well, at the end of the universe, you have to use the past tense a lot, said Zapot, because everything's been done, you know. Hi, guys! he called out to a nearby party of giant iguana life forms. How did you do? Is that Zapot Beeblebrox? asked one iguana of another iguana. I think so, replied the second iguana. Well, doesn't that just take that biscuit? said the first iguana. Funny old thing, life, said the second iguana. It's what you make it, said the first, and they lapsed back into silence. They were waiting for the greatest show in the universe. Hey, Zaphod, said Ford, grabbing for his arm, and on account of the third pangalactic gargle blaster missing, he pointed a swaying finger. There's an old maid of mine, he said, hot black desiato. See the man at the platinum table with the platinum suit on? Zaphod tried to follow Ford's fingers with his eyes, but it made him feel dizzy. Finally he saw. Oh, yeah, he said. Then recognition came a moment later. Hey, he said, did that guy ever make it mega big? Wow, bigger than the biggest thing ever, uh, other than me. Uh, who's he supposed to be? asked Trillian. Hot black desiato, said Zaphod in astonishment. You don't know? You never heard of disaster area? Uh, no, said Trillian, who hadn't. The biggest, said Ford, loudest, richest, suggested Zaphod. Rock band and the history of... He searched for the word. History itself, said Zaphod. No, said Trillian. Zowie, said Zaphod. Here we are at the end of the universe and you haven't even lived yet. Did you miss out? He led her off to where the waiter had been waiting all this time at the table. Arthur followed them, feeling very lost and alone. Ford waded off through the throng to renew an old acquaintance. Hey, uh, Hot Black, he called out. How are you doing? Great to see you, big boy. How's the noise? You're looking great. Really, very, very fat and unwell. Amazing. He slapped the man on the back and was mildly surprised that it seemed to elicit no response. The pangalactic gargle blaster swilling around inside him told him to plunge on regardless. Remember the old days, he said, we used to hang out, right? The bistro illegal, remember? Slim's throat emporium. The evil drone boozerama. Great days, eh? Hot Black Desiato offered no opinion as to whether they were great days or not. Ford was not perturbed. And when we were hungry, you'd pose as public health inspectors, you remember that? And go around confiscating meals and drinks, right, till we got a food poisoning? <laughs> oh, and then, then there were the long nights of talking and drinking in those smelly rooms above the Café Lou in Gretchen Town, New Beetle. And, and you were always in the next room trying to write songs on your adjuita, and we, and we all hated them. And you said you didn't care, and we said we did because we hated them so much. Ford's eyes were beginning to mist over. And you said you didn't want to be a star, he continued, wallowing in nostalgia, because you despised the star system. And we said, you know, Hadra and Suli Joe and me, we said, we said that we didn't think you had the option. And what do you do now? You buy star systems. He turned and solicited the attention of those at nearby tables. Here, he said, is a man who buys star systems. Hot Black Desiato made no attempt either to confirm or deny this fact, and the attention of the temporary audience waned rapidly. I think somebody's drunk, muttered a purple bush-like being into his wine glass. Ford staggered slightly and sat down heavily on the chair, facing Hot Black Desiato. What's that number you do, he said? unwisely grabbing at a bottle for support and tipping it over into a nearby glass as it happened. Not to waste a happy accident, he drained the glass. That really huge number, he continued. How does it go? Bram, bram, ba Something. And, and in the stage act you do it, it ends up with a ship crashing right into the sun, and you actually do it. Ford crashed his fist into his other hand to illustrate this feat graphically. He knocked the bottle over again. Ship, sun, wham, bang, he cried. I mean, forget lasers and stuff. You guys are in a solar flares and real sunburn. Oh, and terrible songs. His eyes followed the stream of liquid glugging out of the bottle on the table. Something ought to be done about it, he thought. Hey, you want a drink, he said. It began to sink into his squelching mind that something was missing from this reunion, and that the missing something was in some way connected with the fact that the fat man sitting opposite him in the platinum suit and the silvery trilby had not yet said, Hi, Ford, or Great to see you after all this time, or, in fact, anything at all. More to the point, he had not even moved. Hot black, said Ford. A large, meaty hand landed on his shoulder from behind and pushed him aside. 
he slid gracelessly off his seat and peered upwards to see if he could spot the owner of this discourteous hand. The owner was not hard to spot on account of his being something of the order of seven feet tall and not slightly built with it. In fact, he was built the way one builds leather sofas, shiny, lumpy, and with lots of solid stuffing. The suit into which the man's body had been stuffed looked as if its only purpose in life was to demonstrate how difficult it was to get this sort of body into a suit. The face had the texture of an orange and the colour of an apple, but there the resemblance to anything sweet ended. Kid, said a voice which emerged from the man's mouth as if it had been having a really rough time down in his chest. Uh, yeah, said Ford conversationally. He staggered back to his feet again and was disappointed that the top of his head didn't come further up the man's body. Beat it, said the man. Oh, yeah, said Ford, wondering how wise he was being. And who are you? The man considered this for a moment. He wasn't used to being asked this sort of question. Nevertheless, after a while, he came up with an answer. I'm the guy who's telling you to beat it, he said, before you get it beaten for you. Now listen, said Ford nervously. He wished his head would stop spinning, settle down and get to grips with the situation. Now listen, he continued. I am one of Hot Black's oldest friends, and... He glanced at Hot Black Desiato, who still hadn't moved as much as an eyelash. And, said Ford again, wondering what would be a good word to say after and. The large man came up with a whole sentence to go after and. He said it. And I am Mr. Desiato's bodyguard, it went, and I am responsible for his body, and I am not responsible for yours, so take it away before it gets damaged. Now wait a minute, said Ford. No minutes, said the bodyguard. No waiting. Mr. Desiato speaks to no one. Well, perhaps you'd let him say what he thinks about the matter himself, said Ford. He speaks to no one, bellowed the bodyguard. Ford glanced anxiously at Hot Black again, and was forced to admit to himself that the bodyguard did seem to have facts on his side. There was still not the slightest sign of movement, let alone keen interest in Ford's welfare. Why, said Ford, what's the matter with him? The bodyguard told him. Chapter 17 The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy notes that Disaster Area, a plutonium rock band from the Gagrakaka Mine Zones, are generally held to be not only the loudest rock band in the galaxy, but in fact the loudest noise of any kind at all. Regular concert goers judge that the best sound balance is usually to be heard from within large concrete bunkers some 37 miles from the stage, whilst the musicians themselves play their instruments by remote control from within a heavily insulated spaceship which stays in orbit around the planet, or, more frequently, around a completely different planet. Their songs are, on the whole, very simple, and mostly follow the familiar theme of boy being meets girl being beneath a silvery moon, which then explodes for no adequately explored reason. Many worlds have now banned their act altogether, sometimes for artistic reasons, but most commonly because the band's public address system contravenes local strategic arms limitations treaties. This has not, however, stopped their earnings from pushing back the boundaries of pure hypermathematics, and their chief research accountant has recently been appointed Professor of Neomathematics at the University of Maximegalon, in recognition of both his general and his special theories of disaster area tax returns, in which he proves that the whole fabric of the space-time continuum is not merely curved, it is in fact totally bent. Ford staggered back to the table where Zaphod, Arthur and Trillian were sitting waiting for the fun to begin. "'Gotta have some food,' said Ford. "'Hi, Ford,' said Zaphod. "'You speak to the big noise, boy?' Ford waggled his head noncommittally. "'Hot black? Uh, I sort of spoke to him, yeah. "'What did he say?' "'Well, not a lot, really. He's, uh... "'Yeah?' "'He's... he's spending a year dead for tax reasons. "'I've got to sit down.' He sat down. The waiter approached. Oh, would you like to see the menu, he said, or would you like to meet the dish of the day? Huh? said Ford. Huh? said Arthur. Huh? said Trillian. Oh, that's cool, said Zaphod. We'll meet the meat. In a small room in one of the arms of the restaurant complex, a tall, thin, gangling figure pulled aside a curtain. 
and oblivion looked him in the face. It was not a pretty face, perhaps because oblivion had looked him in it so many times. It was too long for a start, the eyes too sunken and hooded, the cheeks too hollow, his lips were too thin and too long, and when they parted his teeth looked too much like a recently polished bay window. The hands that held the curtain were long and thin too, they were also cold. They lay lightly along the folds of the curtain, and gave the impression that if you didn't watch them like a hawk, they would crawl away of their own accord and do something unspeakable in a corner. He let the curtain drop, and the terrible light that played on his features went off to play somewhere more healthy. He prowled around his small chamber like a mantis contemplating an evening's praying, finally settling in a rickety chair by a trestle table, where he leafed through a few sheets of jokes. A bell rang. He pushed the thin sheaf of papers aside and stood up. His hands brushed limply over some of the one million rainbow-coloured sequins with which his jacket was festooned, and he was gone through the door. In the restaurant the lights dimmed, the band quickened its pace, a single spotlight stabbed down into the darkness of the stairway that led up to the centre of the stage. Up the stairs bounded a tall, brilliantly coloured figure. He burst onto the stage, tripped lightly up to the microphone, removed it from its stand with one swoop of his long, thin hand, and stood for a moment bowing left and right to the audience, acknowledging their applause and displaying to them his bay window. He waved to his particular friends in the audience, even though there weren't any there, and waited for the applause to die down. He held up his hand and smiled a smile that stretched not merely from ear to ear, but seemed to extend some way beyond the mere confines of his face. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, he cried. Thank you very much. Thank you so very much. He eyed them with a twinkling eye. Ladies and gentlemen, he said, the universe as we know it has now been in existence for over 170,000 million billion years and will be ending in a little over half an hour. So welcome, one and all, to Millie Ways, the restaurant at the end of the universe. With a gesture, he deftly conjured another round of spontaneous applause. With another gesture, he cut it. I am your host for tonight, he said. My name is Max Quadlepleen. Everybody knew this. His act was famous throughout the known galaxy, but he said it for the fresh applause it generated, which he acknowledged with a disclaiming smile and wave. And I've just come straight from the very, very other end of time, where I've been hosting a show at the Big Bang Burger Bar, where I can tell you we had a very exciting evening, ladies and gentlemen, and I will be with you right through this historic occasion, the end of history itself. Another burst of applause died away quickly as the lights dimmed down further. On every table, candles ignited themselves spontaneously, eliciting a slight gasp from all the diners and wreathing them in a thousand tiny flickering lights and a million intimate shadows. A tremor of excitement thrilled through the darkened restaurant as the vast golden dome above them began very, very slowly to dim, to darken, to fade. Max's voice was hushed as he continued. So, ladies and gentlemen, he breathed, the candles are lit, the band plays softly, and as the force-shielded dome above us fades into transparency, revealing a dark and sullen sky hung with the ancient light of livid, swollen stars, I can see we're all in for a fabulous evening's apocalypse. Even the soft tootling of the band faded away a stunned shock descended on all those who had not seen this sight before. A monstrous, grisly light poured in on them, a hideous light, a boiling, pestilential light, a light that would have disfigured hell. The universe was coming to an end. For a few interminable seconds, the restaurant spun silently through the raging void. Then Max spoke again. For those of you who ever hoped to see the light at the end of the tunnel, he said, This is it! The band struck up again. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, cried Max. I'll be back with you again in just a moment. And meanwhile, I'll leave you in the very capable hands of Mr. Reg Nullify and his cataclysmic combo. Big hand, ladies and gentlemen, for Reg and the boys. The baleful turmoil of the skies continued. Hesitantly, the audience began to clap. And after a moment or so... Normal conversation resumed. 
Max began his round of the table, swapping jokes, shouting with laughter, earning his living. A large dairy animal approached Zaphod Beeblebrox's table. A large, fat, meaty quadruped of the bovine type, with large, watery eyes, small horns, and what might almost have been an ingratiating smile on its lips. Good evening, it lowed, and sat back heavily on its haunches. I am the main dish of the day. May I interest you in parts of my body? It harumphed and gurgled a bit, wriggled its hindquarters into a more comfortable position, and gazed peacefully at them. Its gaze was met by looks of startled bewilderment from Arthur and Trillian, a resigned shrug from Ford Prefect, and naked hunger from Zaphod Beeblebrox. Something off the shoulder, perhaps, suggested the animal, braised in a white wine sauce. Uh, your shoulder, said Arthur in a horrified whisper. But naturally my shoulder, sir, moved the animal contentedly. Nobody else's is mine to offer. Zaphod leapt to his feet and started prodding and feeling the animal's shoulder appreciatively. Or oh, the rump is very good, murmured the animal. I've been exercising it and eating plenty of grain, so there's a lot of good meat there. It gave a mellow grunt, gurgled again, and started to chew the cud. It swallowed the cud again. Or a casserole of me, perhaps, it added. You mean this animal actually wants us to eat it? whispered Trillian to Ford. Me, said Ford, with a glazed look in his eyes, I don't mean anything. That's absolutely horrible, exclaimed Arthur. That's the most revolting thing I've ever heard. What's the problem, Earthman? said Zaphod, now transferring his attention to the animal's enormous rump. I just don't want to eat an animal that's standing there inviting me to, said Arthur. It's heartless. Better than eating an animal that doesn't want to be eaten, said Zaphod. That's not the point, Arthur protested. Then he thought about it for a moment. All right, he said, maybe it is the point. I, I don't care. I'm not going to think about it now. I'll just, uh... The universe raged about him in its death throes. I think I'll just have a green salad, he muttered. May I urge you to consider my liver? asked the animal. It must be very rich and tender by now. I've been force-feeding myself for months. A green salad, said Arthur emphatically. A green salad? said the animal, rolling his eyes disapprovingly at Arthur. "'Are you going to tell me,' said Arthur, "'that I shouldn't have a green salad?' "'Well,' said the animal, "'I know many vegetables that are very clear on that point, "'which is why it was eventually decided "'to cut through the whole tangled problem "'and breed an animal that actually wanted to be eaten "'and was capable of saying so clearly and distinctly, "'and here I am.' "'It managed a very slight bow. "'Glass of water, please.' said Arthur. Look, said Zaphod, we want to eat. We don't want to make a meal of the issues. Four rare steaks, please, and hurry. We haven't eaten in 576,000 million years. The animal staggered to its feet. It gave a mellow gurgle. A very wise choice, sir, if I may say so. Very good, it said. I'll just nip off and shoot myself. He turned and gave a friendly wink to Arthur. Don't worry, sir, he said. I'll be very humane. It waddled unhurriedly off to the kitchen. A matter of minutes later, the waiter arrived with four huge steaming steaks. Zaphod and Ford wolfed straight into them without a second's hesitation. Trillian paused, then shrugged and started into hers. Arthur stared at his, feeling slightly ill. Hey, Earthman, said Zaphod, with a malicious grin on the face that wasn't stuffing itself. What's eating you? And the band played on. All around the restaurant, people and things relaxed and chatted. The air was filled with talk of this and that, and with the mingled scents of exotic plants, extravagant foods, and insidious wines. For an infinite number of miles in every direction, the universal cataclysm was gathering to a stupefying climax. Glancing at his watch, Max returned to the stage with a flourish. And now, ladies and gentlemen, he beamed, is everyone having one last wonderful time? Yes, called out the sort of people who called out yes when comedians ask them if they're having a wonderful time.
That's wonderful, enthused Max. Absolutely wonderful. And as the photon storms gather in swirling crowds around us, preparing to tear apart the last of the red-hot suns, I know you're all going to want to settle back and enjoy with me what I know we will all find an immensely exciting and terminal experience. He paused. He caught the audience with a glittering eye. Believe me, ladies and gentlemen, he said, there is nothing penultimate about this one. He paused again. Tonight his timing was immaculate. Time after time he had done the show, night after night. Not that the word night had any meaning here at the extremity of time. All there was was the endless repetition of the final moment, as the restaurant rocked slowly forward over the brink of time's furthest edge, and back again. This night was good, though. The audience was writhing in the palm of his sickly hand. His voice dropped. They had to strain to hear him. This, he said, really is the absolute end, the final chilling desolation in which the whole majestic sweep of creation becomes extinct. This, ladies and gentlemen, is the proverbial it. He dropped his voice to lower. In the stillness, a fly would not have dared clear its throat. After this, he said, there is nothing, void, emptiness, Oblivion, absolute, nothing. His eyes glittered again, or did they twinkle? Nothing, except, of course, for the sweet trolley and a fine selection of Aldebaran liqueurs. The band gave him a musical sting. He wished they wouldn't. He didn't need it. Not an artist of his caliber. He could play the audience like his own musical instrument. They were laughing with relief. He followed on. And for once, he cried cheerily, you don't have to worry about having a hangover in the morning, because there won't be any more mornings. He beamed at his happy, laughing audience. He glanced up at the sky, going through the same death routine every night. But his glance was only for a fraction of a second. He trusted it to do its job, as one professional trusts another. And now, he said, strutting about the stage, at the risk of putting a damper on the wonderful sense of doom and futility here this evening, I would like to welcome a few parties. He pulled a card from his pocket. Do we have... He put up a hand to hold back the cheers. Do we have a party here from the Zansel Quasia Flamarian Bridge Club from beyond the Vort Void of Kwan? Are they here? A routine cheer came from the back, but he pretended not to hear. He peered around, trying to find them. Are they here? he asked again to elicit a louder cheer. He got it, as he always did. Ah, oh, there they are. Well, last bids, lads, and no cheating. Remember, this is a very solemn moment. He lapped up the laughter. And do we also have, do we have a party of minor deities from the halls of Asgard? Away to his right came a rumble of thunder. Lightning arced across the stage. A small group of hairy men with helmets sat looking very pleased with themselves and raised their glasses to him. "'Has-beens,' he thought to himself. "'Careful with that hammer, sir,' he said. "'They did their trick with the lightning again. "'Max gave them a very thin-lipped smile. "'And thirdly,' he said, "'thirdly, a party of young conservatives from Sirius B. "'Are they here?' "'A party of smartly-dressed young dogs "'stopped throwing rolls at each other "'and started throwing rolls at the stage. "'They yapped and barked unintelligibly. "'Yes,' said Max. "'Well, this is all your fault. "'You realise that?' And finally, said Max, quietening the audience down and putting on his solemn face, finally, I believe we have with us here tonight a party of believers, very devout believers, from the church of the second coming of the great prophet Zarquan. There were about twenty of them, sitting right out on the edge of the floor, ascetically dressed, sipping mineral water nervously, and staying apart from the festivities. They blinked resentfully as the spotlight was turned on them. There they are, said Max, sitting there patiently. He said he'd come again, and he's kept you waiting a long time, so let's hope he's hurrying, fellas, because he's only got eight minutes left. The party of Zarquan's followers sat rigid, refusing to be buffeted by the waves of uncharitable laughter which swept over them. Max restrained his audience. No, but seriously, though, folks, seriously, though, no offence meant. No, I know we shouldn't make fun of deeply held beliefs, so I think a big hand, please, for the great prophet Zarquan. The audience clapped respectfully. Wherever he's got to! He blew a kiss to the stony-faced party and returned to the centre of the stage. 
He grabbed a tall stool and sat on it. It's marvellous, though, he rattled on, to see so many of you here tonight. No, isn't it, though? Yes, absolutely marvellous, because I know that so many of you come here time and time again, which I think is really wonderful to come and watch this final end of everything and then return home to your own eras and raise families, strive for new and better societies, fight terrible wars for what you, you know to be right. It really gives one hope for the future of all life kind. Except, of course, he waved at the blitzing turmoil above and around them, that we know it hasn't got one. Arthur turned to Ford. He hadn't quite got this place worked out in his mind. Look, surely, he said, if the universe is about to end, don't we go with it? Ford gave him a three-pan galactic gargle blaster look. In other words, a rather unsteady one. No, he said, look, he said, as soon as you come into this dive, you get held in this sort of amazing force-shielded temporal warp thing, I think. Oh, said Arthur. He turned his attention back to a bowl of soup he'd managed to get from the waiter to replace his steak. Look, said Ford, I'll show you. He grabbed at a napkin off the table and fumbled hopelessly with it. Look, he said. Imagine this napkin, right? It's the temporal universe, right? And the spoon as a transductional mode in the matter curve. It took him a while to say this last part, and Arthur hated to interrupt him. That's the spoon I was eating with, he said. All right, said Ford. Imagine this spoon. He found a small wooden spoon on a tray of relishes. This spoon, but found it rather tricky to pick up. No better still, this fork. Hey, would you let go of my fork? snapped Zayford. All right, said Ford. All right, all right. Why don't we say... Why don't we say that this wine glass is the temporal universe? What, the one you just knocked on the floor? Did I do that? Yes. All right, said Ford. Forget that. I mean, I mean, look, do you, do you know how the universe actually began for a kickoff? Uh, probably not, said Arthur, who wished he'd never embarked on any of this. All right, said Ford. Imagine this. Right, you get this bath. Right, large, round bath. And it's made of ebony. Where from, said Arthur? Harrods was destroyed by the Vogons. Doesn't matter. Well, so you keep saying. Listen. All right. You get this bath. See? Imagine you've got this bath, and it's ebony. And it's conical. Conical, said Arthur. What sort of... Shh, said Ford. It's conical. So what you do is, you see, you fill it with fine white sand. All right? Or sugar. Fine white sand and or sugar. Anything. Doesn't matter. Sugar's fine. And when it's full, you pull the plug up. Are you listening? I'm listening. You pull the plug up, and it all just twirls away. It twirls away, you see, out of the plug hole. I see. You don't see. You don't see at all. I haven't got the clever bit yet. Do you want to hear the clever bit? Tell me the clever bit. I'll tell you the clever bit. Ford thought for a moment, trying to remember what the clever bit was. The clever bit, he said is this. You film it happening. Clever, agreed Arthur. You get a movie camera and you film it happening. Clever. That's not the clever bit. This is the clever bit. I remember now that this is the clever bit. The clever bit is that you then thread the film in the projector backwards. Backwards? Yes, threading it backwards is definitely the clever bit. So then you just sit and watch it, and everything just appears to spiral upwards out of the plug hole and fill the bath. See? And that's how the universe began, is it, said Arthur. No, said Ford, but it's a marvellous way to relax. He reached for his wine glass. Where's my wine glass, he said. It's on the floor. Ah. Tipping back his chair to look for it, Ford collided with the small green waiter who was approaching the table, carrying a portable telephone. Ford excused himself to the waiter, explaining that it was because he was extremely drunk. The waiter said that it was quite all right and that he perfectly understood. Ford thanked the waiter for his kind indulgence, attempted to tug his forelock, missed by six inches, and slid under the table. Uh, Mr. Zayford Beeblebrox, inquired the waiter. Uh, yeah said Zayford, glancing up from his third steak. There is a phone call for you. Hey, what? A phone call, sir. For me? 
Here? Hey, but, I mean, who knows where I am? One of his minds raced, the other dawdled lovingly over the food it was still shoveling in. Excuse me if I carry on, won't you, said his eating head and carried on. There were now so many people after him he'd lost count. He shouldn't have made such a conspicuous entrance. Hell, why not, though, he thought. How do you know you're having fun if there's no one watching you have it? Maybe somebody tipped off the Galactic Police, said Trillian. Everyone saw you come in. You mean they want to arrest me over the phone, said Zayfoot? Could be. I'm a pretty dangerous dude when I'm cornered. Yeah, said a voice from under the table. You go to pieces so fast people get hit by the shrapnel. Hey, what is this, Judgment Day? snapped Zayfot. Do we get to see that as well? asked Arthur nervously. I'm in no hurry, muttered Zayfot. OK, so who's the cat on the phone? he kicked forward. Hey, get up there, kid, he said to him. I may need you. I am not, said the waiter, personally acquainted with the metal gentleman in question, sir. Metal? Yes, sir. Did you say metal? Uh, yes, sir. I said that I am not personally acquainted with the metal gentleman in question. OK, carry on. But I am informed that he has been awaiting your return for a considerable number of millennia. It seems that you left here somewhat precipitately. Left here? said Zayford. Are you being strange? We only just arrived here. Indeed, sir, persisted the waiter doggedly. But before you arrived here, sir, I understand that you left here. Zephyr tried this in one brain and then in the other. You're saying, he said, that before we arrived here, we left here? This uh, is going to be a long night, thought the waiter. Precisely, sir, he said. Put your analysts on danger money, baby, advised Zephyr. No, wait a minute, said Ford, emerging above table level again. Where exactly is here? But to be absolutely exact, sir, it is the Frog Star World B. We just left there, protested Zaphod. We left there and came to the restaurant at the end of the universe. Yes, sir, said the waiter, feeling that he was now into the home stretch and running well. The one was constructed on the ruins of the other. Oh, said Arthur brightly, you mean we've travelled in time but not in space? Listen, you semi of old Simeon, cut in Zaphod. Go climb a tree, will you? Arthur bristled. Go bang your heads together, four eyes, he advised Zaphod. No, no, the waiter said to Zaphod. Uh, your monkey has got it right, sir. Arthur stuttered in fury and said nothing apposite or indeed coherent. Uh, you jumped forward, I believe, 576,000 million years, while staying in exactly the same place, explained the waiter. He smiled. He had a wonderful feeling that he'd finally won through against what seemed to be insuperable odds. That's it! said Zafer. I got it. I told the computer to send us to the nearest place to eat. That's exactly what it did. Give or take 576,000 million years or whatever. We never moved. Neat. They all agreed that this is very neat. But who, said Zafer, is the cat on the phone? Whatever happened to Marvin, said Trillian. Zafer clapped his hands to his head. The paranoid android. I left him moping about on Frogstar B. When was this? Well, uh, 576,000 million years ago, I suppose, said Zayford. Hey, uh, hand me the rap rod plate, Captain. The little waiter's eyebrows wandered about his forehead in confusion. I beg your pardon, sir? The phone, waiter, said Zayford, grabbing it off him. She, you guys are so unhip, it's a wonder your bums don't fall off. Uh, indeed, sir. Hey, Marvin, is that you? said Zayford into the phone. How you doing, kid? There was a long pause before a thin, low voice came up the line. I think you ought to know I'm feeling very depressed, it said. Zayford cupped his hand over the phone. It's Marvin, he said. Hey, Marvin, he said into the phone again. We're having a great time. Food, wine, a little personal abuse, and the universe going foom. Where can we find you? Again, the pause. You don't have to pretend to be interested in me, you know said Marvin at last. I know perfectly well I'm only a menial robot. OK, OK, said Zaphod. But where are you? Reverse primary thrust, Marvin. That's what they say to me. Open airlock number three, Marvin. Marvin, can you pick up that piece of paper? Can I pick up that piece of paper? Here I am, brain the size of a planet, and they ask me to... Yeah, yeah, sympathised Zaphod hardly at all. But I'm quite used to being humiliated, groaned Marvin. I can even go and stick my head in a bucket of water, if you like. Would you like me to go and stick my head in a bucket of water? I've got one ready. Wait a minute. Uh, hey, Marvin, interrupted Zaphod, but it was too late. 
Sad little clunks and gurgles came up the line. What's he saying, asked Trillian? Ah, uh, nothing, said Zaphod. He just phoned up to wash his head at us. Ah, said Marvin, coming back on the line and bubbling a bit. I hope that gave satisfaction. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, said Zaphod. Now, will you please tell us where you are? I'm in the car park, said Marvin. The car park? said Zaphod. What are you doing there? Parking cars. What else does one do in a car park? Okay, hang in there. We'll be right down. In one movement, Zaphod leapt to his feet, threw down the phone, and wrote Hot Black Desiato on the bill. Come on, guys, he said. Marvin's in the car park. Let's get on down. What's he doing in the car park? said Arthur. Parking cars. What else, dum-dum? But what about the end of the universe? We'll miss the big moment. I've seen it. It's rubbish, said Zaphod. Nothing but a ganab gib. A what? Opposite of a big bang. Come on, let's get zappy. Few of the other diners paid them any attention as they weaved their way through the restaurant to the exit. Their eyes were riveted on the horror of the skies. An interesting effect to watch for, Max was telling them, is in the upper left-hand quadrant of the sky, where if you look very carefully, you'll see the star system Hastramil boiling away into the ultraviolet. Anyone here from Hastramil? There are one or two slightly hesitant cheers from somewhere at the back. Well, said Max, beaming cheerfully at them, it's too late to worry about whether you left the gas on now. Chapter 18 The main reception foyer was almost empty, but Ford nevertheless weaved his way through it. Zaphod grasped him firmly by the arm and manoeuvred him into a cubicle standing to one side of the entrance hall. What are you doing to him? asked Arthur. Ah, sobering him up, said Zaphod, and pushed a coin into a slot. Lights flashed, gases swirled. Hi, said Ford, stepping out a moment later. Where are we going? Down to the car park, come on. What about the personnel time teleport, said Ford? Get us straight back to the Heart of Gold. Yeah, but I've cooled on that ship. Zani Whip can have it. I don't want to play his games. Let's see what we can find. A serious cybernetics corporation, happy vertical people transporter, took them down deep into the substrata beneath the restaurant. They were glad to see it had been vandalised and didn't try to make them happy as well as take them down. At the bottom of the shaft, the lift doors opened, and a blast of cold, stale air hit them. The first thing they saw on leaving the lift was a long concrete wall with over fifty doors in it, offering lavatory facilities for all of fifty major life forms. Nevertheless, like every car park in the galaxy throughout the entire history of car parks, this car park smelt predominantly of impatience. They turned a corner and found themselves on a moving catwalk, that traversed a vast cavernous space that stretched off into the dim distance. It was divided off into bays, each of which contained a spaceship belonging to one of the diners upstairs, some smallish and utilitarian mass production models, others vast shining limo ships, the playthings of the very rich. Seyford's eyes sparkled at something that may or may not have been avarice as he passed over them. In fact, it's best to be clear on this point. Avarice is definitely what it was. There he is, said Trillian. Marvin, down there. They looked where she was pointing. Dimly they could see a small metal figure listlessly rubbing a small rag on one remote corner of a giant silver sun cruiser. At short intervals along the moving catwalk, wide transparent tubes led down to the floor level. Zayford stepped off the catwalk into one of these and floated gently downwards. The others followed. Thinking back to this later, Arthur thought it was the single most enjoyable experience of his travels in the galaxy. Hey, Marvin, said Zaphod, striding over towards him. Hey, kid, are we pleased to see you? Marvin turned, and insofar as it is possible for a totally inert metal face to look reproachful, this is what it did. No, you're not, he said. No one ever is. Now ah, suit yourself, said Zaphod, and turned away to ogle the ships. Ford went with him. Only Trillian and Arthur actually went up to Marvin. No, really, we are, said Trillian, and patted him in a way that he disliked intensely, hanging around waiting for us all this time. Five hundred and seventy-six thousand million three thousand five hundred and seventy-nine years, said Marvin. I counted them. Well, we're here now, said Trillian, feeling quite correctly in Marvin's view that it was a slightly foolish thing to say. The first ten million years were the worst, said Marvin, and the second ten million, they were the worst, too. The third ten million I didn't enjoy at all. After that I went into a bit of a decline. Paused just long enough to make them feel they ought to say something, and then interrupted. It's the people you meet in this job that really get you down, he said, and paused again. 
Trillian cleared her throat. Is that... The best conversation I had was over 40 million years ago, continued Marvin. Again the pause. Oh dear, and that was with a coffee machine. He waited. Well, that's a... You don't like talking to me, do you? said Marvin in a low, desolate tone. Trillian talked to Arthur instead. Further down the chamber, Ford Prefect had found something of which he very much liked the look. Several such things, in fact. Say, Ford, he said in a quiet voice, just look at some of these little star trolleys. Zayford looked and liked. The craft they were looking at was in fact pretty small, but extraordinary and very much a rich kid's toy. It was not much to look at. It resembled nothing so much as a paper dart about twenty feet long, made of thin but tough metal foil. At the rear end was a small horizontal two-man cockpit. It had a tiny charm drive engine, which was not capable of moving it at any great speed. The thing it did have, however, was a heat sink. The heat sink had a mass of some 2,000 billion tons and was contained within a black hole mounted in an electromagnetic field situated halfway along the length of the ship. And this heat sink enabled the craft to be manoeuvred within a few miles of a yellow sun, there to catch and ride the solar flares that burst out from its surface. Flare riding is one of the most exotic and exhilarating sports in existence, and those who can dare and afford to do it are amongst the most lionized men in the galaxy. It is also, of course, stupefyingly dangerous, and those who don't die riding invariably die of sexual exhaustion at one of the Deedler's Club's apres flare parties. Ford and Zaford looked and passed on. And this baby, said Ford, the tangerine star buggy with the black sunbusters. Again, the star buggy was a small ship, a totally misnamed one, in fact, because the one thing it couldn't manage was interstellar distances. Basically, it was a sporty planet hopper, dolled up to look like something it wasn't. Nice lines, though. They passed on. The next one was a big one, and thirty yards long, a coach-built limo ship, and obviously designed with one aim in mind, that of making the beholder sick with envy. The paintwork and accessory detail clearly said, not only am I rich enough to afford this ship, I am also rich enough not to take it seriously. It was wonderfully hideous. Just look at it, said Zayford. Multi-cluster quark drive, perspulex running boards. Gotta be a Laszlo Lyricon custom job. He examined every inch. Yes, he said, look, the infra-pink lizard album on the neutrino cowling. Laszlo's trademark. The man has no shame. I was passed by one of these mothers once up by the Axel Nebula, said Ford. I was going flat out, and this thing just strolled past me. Star Drive hardly ticking over. Just incredible. Zayford whistled appreciatively. Ten seconds later, said Ford, it smashed straight into the third moon of Jaglan Beta. Yeah, right? Amazing-looking ship, though. Looks like a fish. Moves like a fish. Steers like a cow. Ford looked round the other side. Hey, come see, he called up. There's a big mural painted on this side, a bursting sun. Disaster area's trademark. This must be Hot Black's ship, lucky old bugger. They do this terrible song, you know, which ends with a stunt ship crashing into the sun. Meant to be an amazing spectacle. Expensive in stunt ships, though. Zayford's attention, however, was elsewhere. His attention was riveted on the ship standing next to Hot Black Desiato's limo. His mouths hung open. That, he said, that is really bad for the eyes. Ford looked. He too stood astonished. It was a ship of classic, simple design, like a flattened salmon, twenty yards long, very clean, very sleek. There was just one remarkable thing about it. It's so black, said Ford Prefect. You can hardly make out its shape. Light just seems to fall into it. Zayford said nothing. He had simply fallen in love. The blackness of it was so extreme that it was almost impossible to tell how close you were standing to it. Your eyes just slide off it, said Ford in wonder. It was an emotional moment. He bit his lip. Zayford moved forward to it, slowly like a man possessed, or more accurately like a man who wanted to possess. His hand reached out to stroke it. His hand stopped. His hand reached out to stroke it again. His hand stopped again. Hey, come and feel the surface, he said in a hushed voice. Ford put his hand out to feel it. His hand stopped. You, you can't, 
he said. See, said Zayford, it's just totally frictionless. This must be one mother of a mover. He turned to look at Ford seriously. At least one of his heads did. The other stayed gazing in awe at the ship. What do you reckon, Ford? he said. You mean, uh... Ford looked over his shoulder. You mean, uh, stroll off with it? You think we should? No. No, uh, nor do I. But we're going to, aren't we? How can we not? They gazed a little longer, till Zaphod suddenly pulled himself together. We better shift soon, he said. In a moment or so, the universe will have ended, and all the captain creeps will come pouring down here to find their bourgeois Zaphod, said Ford. Yeah? How do we do it? Ah, simple, said Zaphod. He turned. Uh, Marvin, he called. Slowly, laboriously, and with the million little clanking and creaking noises that he had learned to simulate, Marvin turned round to answer the summons. Come on over here, said Zaphod. We've got a job for you. Marvin trudged towards them. I won't enjoy it, he said. Yes, you will, enthused Zaphod. There's a whole new life stretching out ahead of you. Oh, not another one, groaned Marvin. Look, will you shut up and listen, hissed Zaphod. This time there's going to be excitement and adventure and really wild things. Sounds awful. Marvin, all I'm trying to ask you... I suppose you want me to open the spaceship for you. What? Uh, yeah, yeah, that's right, said Zaphod jumpily. He was keeping at least three eyes on the entrance. Time was short. Well, I wish you'd just tell me rather than trying to engage my enthusiasm, said Marvin, because I haven't got one. He walked on up to the ship touched it, and a hatchway swung open. Ford and Zaphod stared at the opening. Don't mention it, said Marvin. Oh, you didn't. He trudged away again. Arthur and Trillian clustered round. What's happening? asked Arthur. Look at this, said Ford. Look at the interior of this ship. Weirder and weirder, breathed Zaphod. It's black, said Ford. Everything in it is just totally black. In the restaurant, things were fast approaching the moment after which there wouldn't be any more moments. All eyes were fixed on the dome, other than those of Hot Black Desiato's bodyguard, which were looking intently at Hot Black Desiato, and those of Hot Black Desiato himself, which the bodyguard had closed out of respect. The bodyguard leaned forward over the table. Had Hot Black Desiato been alive, he would probably have deemed this a good moment to lean back, or even go for a short walk. His bodyguard was not a man who improved with proximity. On account of his unfortunate condition, however, Hot Black Desiato remained totally inert. Mr. Desiato, sir, whispered the bodyguard. Whenever he spoke, it looked as if the muscles on either side of his mouth were clambering over each other to get out of the way. Mr. Desiato, can you hear me? Hot Black Desiato quite naturally said nothing. Hot Black, hissed the bodyguard. Again, quite naturally, Hot Black Desiato did not reply. Supernaturally, however, he did. On the table in front of him, a wine glass rattled, and a fork rose an inch or so and tapped against the glass. It settled on the table again. The bodyguard gave a satisfied grunt. It's time we were going, Mr. Desiato, muttered the bodyguard. Don't want to get caught in the rush, not in your condition. You want to get to the next gig nice and relaxed. There was a really big audience for it, one of the best, Cacrophone, 576,002 million years ago. How do you will have been looking forward to it? The fork rose again, paused, waggled in a non-committal sort of way, and dropped again. Ah, uh, come on, said the bodyguard. It's going to have been great. You knocked them cold. The bodyguard would have given Dr. Dan's treat mentioner an apoplectic attack. The black ship going into the sun always gets them and the new one's a beauty. We're real sorry to see it go. If we get on down there, I'll set the black ship autopilot, and we'll cruise off in the limo, OK? The fork tapped once in agreement, and the glass of wine mysteriously emptied itself. The bodyguard wheeled Hot Black Desiato's chair out of the restaurant. And now, cried Max from the centre of the stage, the moment you've all been waiting for! He flung his arms into the air. 
Behind him, the band went into a frenzy of percussion and rolling synth chords. Max had argued with them about this, but they claimed it was in their contract and that's what they would do. His agent would have to sort it out. The skies begin to boil, he cried. Nature collapses into the screaming void. In 20 seconds' time, the universe itself will be at an end. See where the light of infinity bursts in upon us. The hideous fury of destruction blazed about them, and at that moment a still, small trumpet sounded, as from an infinite distance. Max's eyes swiveled round to glare at the band. None of them seemed to be playing a trumpet. Suddenly a wisp of smoke was swirling and shimmering on the stage next to him. The trumpet was joined by more trumpets. Over five hundred times Max had done the show, and nothing like this had ever happened before. He drew back in alarm from the swirling smoke, and as he did so, a figure slowly materialised inside, the figure of an ancient man, bearded, robed, and wreathed in light. In his eyes were stars, and on his brow a golden crown. "'What's this?' whispered Max, wild-eyed. "'What's happening?' At the back of the restaurant, the stony-faced party from the Church of the Second Coming of the Great Prophet Zarquan leapt ecstatically to their feet, chanting and crying. Max blinked in amazement. He threw up his arms to the audience. A big hand, please, ladies and gentlemen, he hollered, for the great prophet Zarquan. He has come. Zarquan has come again. Thunderous applause broke out as Max strode across the stage and handed his microphone to the prophet. Zarquan coughed. He peered round at the assembled gathering. The stars in his eyes twinkled uneasily. He handled the microphone with confusion. Uh, he said, uh, hello, um, uh, look, I'm, I, I'm sorry I'm a bit late, I've, I've had the most ghastly time, all sorts of things cropping up at the last moment. Um, he seemed nervous with the expectant awed hush. He cleared his throat. Uh, how are we for time, he said. Um, have I just got a... And so the universe ended. Chapter 19 one of the major selling points of that wholly remarkable travel book, The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, apart from its relative cheapness and the fact that it has the words Don't Panic written in large friendly letters on its cover, is its compendious and occasionally accurate glossary. The statistics relating to the geosocial nature of the universe, for instance, are deftly set out between pages 938,324 and 938,326. And the simplistic style in which they are written is partly explained by the fact that the editors, having to meet a publishing deadline, copied the information off the back of a packet of breakfast cereal, hastily embroidering it with a few footnotes, in order to avoid prosecution under the incomprehensibly tortuous galactic copyright laws. It is interesting to note that a later and wilier editor sent the book backwards in time through a temporal warp, and then successfully sued the breakfast cereal company for infringement of the same laws. Here is a sample. The Universe. Some information to help you live in it. 1. Area. Infinite. The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy offers this definition of the word infinite. Infinite. Bigger than the biggest thing ever and then some. Much bigger than that, in fact. Really amazingly immense. A totally stunning size. I mean, real, wow, that's big time. Infinity is just so big that by comparison, bigness itself looks really titchy. Gigantic multiplied by colossal multiplied by staggeringly huge is the sort of concept we're trying to get across here. Two. Imports. None. It is impossible to import things into an infinite area, there being no outside to import things in from. Three. Exports. None. See imports. 4. Population. None. It is known that there are an infinite number of worlds simply because there is an infinite amount of space for them to be in. However, not every one of them is inhabited. Therefore, there must be a finite number of inhabited worlds. Any finite number divided by infinity is as near to nothing as makes no odds. So the average population of all the planets in the universe can be said to be zero. From this it follows that the population of the whole universe is also zero, and any people you may meet from time to time are merely the products of a deranged imagination. 5. Monetary Units None In fact, there are three freely convertible currencies in the galaxy, but none of them count. The Altarian dollar has recently collapsed, the Flanian pobble bead is only exchangeable for other Flanian pobble beads, and the Triganic pew has its own very special problems. 
Its exchange rate of eight ningis to one pew is simple enough, but since a ningi is a triangular rubber coin 6,800 miles along each side, no one has ever collected enough to own one pew. Ningis are not negotiable currency because the galactic banks refuse to deal in fiddling small change. From this basic premise, it is simple to prove that the galactic banks are also the product of a deranged imagination. 6. Art. None. The function of art is to hold the mirror up to nature, and there simply isn't a mirror big enough. See point 1. 7. Sex. None. Well, in fact, there is an awful lot of this, largely because of the total lack of money, trade, banks, art, or anything else that might keep all the non-existent people of the universe occupied. However, it is not worth embarking on a long discussion of it now, because it really is terribly complicated. For further information, see Guide Chapters 7, 9, 10, 11, 14, 16, 17, 19, 21 to 84 inclusive, and, in fact, most of the rest of the guide. Chapter 20. The restaurant continued existing, but everything else had stopped. Temporal relostatics held it and protected it in a nothingness that wasn't merely a vacuum, it was simply nothing. There was nothing in which a vacuum could be said to exist. The force-shielded dome had once again been rendered opaque. The party was over, the diners were leaving, Zarquan had vanished along with the rest of the universe. The time turbines were preparing to pull the restaurant back across the brink of time, in readiness for the lunch sitting, and Max Quadleplein was back in his small, curtained dressing room, trying to raise his agent on the tamperphone. In the car park stood the black ship, closed and silent. Into the car park came the late Mr. Hotblack Desiato, propelled along the moving catwalk by his bodyguard. They descended one of the tubes. As they approached the limo ship, a hatchway swung down from its side, engaged the wheels of the wheelchair, and drew it inside. The bodyguard followed, and having seen his boss safely connected up to his death support system, moved up to the small cockpit. Here he operated the remote control system, which activated the autopilot in the black ship lying next to the limo, thus causing great relief to Zaphod Bibelbrox, who had been trying to start the thing for over ten minutes. The black ship glided smoothly forward out of its bay, turned, and moved down the central causeway swiftly and quietly. At the end it accelerated rapidly, flung itself into the temporal launch chamber, and began the long journey back into the distant past. The Milliways lunch menu quotes, by permission, a passage from The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. The passage is this. The history of every major galactic civilization tends to pass through three distinct and recognizable phases, those of survival, inquiry, and sophistication, otherwise known as the how, why, and where phases. For instance, the first phase is characterized by the question, how can we eat? The second by the question, why do we eat? And the third by the question, where shall we have lunch? The menu goes on to suggest that Milliways, the restaurant at the end of the universe, would be a very agreeable and sophisticated answer to that third question. What it doesn't go on to say is that though it will usually take a large civilization many thousands of years to pass through the how, why and where phases, small social groupings under stressful conditions can pass through them with extreme rapidity. How are we doing? said Arthur Dent. Badly, said Ford Prefect. Where are we going? said Trillian. I don't know, said Zaphod Beeblebrox. Why not? demanded Arthur Dent. Shut up, suggested Zaphod Beeblebrox and Ford Prefect. Basically what you're trying to say, said Arthur Dent, ignoring the suggestion, is that we're out of control. The ship was rocking and swaying sickeningly as Ford and Zaphod tried to wrest control from the autopilot. The engines howled and whined like tired children in the supermarket. It's the wild colour screen that freaks me, said Zaphod, whose love affair with the ship had lasted almost three minutes into the flight. Every time you try to operate one of these weird black controls that are labelled in black on a black background, a little black light lights up black to let you know you've done it. I mean, what is this, some kind of galactic hyperhearse? The walls of the swaying cabin were also black. The ceiling was black. The seats, which were rudimentary since the only important trip the ship was designed for was supposed to be unmanned, were black. The control panel was black. 
The instruments were black. The little screws that held them in place were black. The thin, tufted nylon floor covering was black. And when they lifted up a corner of it, they discovered that the foam underlay was also black. Perhaps whoever designed it had eyes that responded to different wavelengths, offered Trillian. Or well, didn't have much imagination, muttered Arthur. Perhaps, said Marvin. He was feeling very depressed. In fact, though they didn't know it, the decor had been chosen in honour of its owner's sad, lamented and tax-deductible condition. The ship gave a particularly sickening lurch. Take it easy, pleaded Arthur. Well, you're making me space sick. Time sick, said Ford. We're plummeting backwards through time. Thank you, said Arthur. Now I think I really am going to be ill. Ah, oh, go ahead, said Zaphor. We could do a little colour about the place. This is meant to be polite after dinner conversation, is it? snapped Arthur. Zaphod left the controls to Ford to figure out, and lurched over to Arthur. Look, Earthman, he said angrily, you've got a job to do, right? The questions of the element answer, right? What, that thing, said Arthur? I thought we'd forgotten about that. Not me, baby. Like the mice said, it's worth a lot of money in the right quarters, and it's all locked up in that head thing of yours. Yes, but, but nothing. You think about it. The meaning of life. We get our fingers on that. We can hold every shrink in the galaxy up to ransom, and that's, that's worth a bundle. I owe mine a mint. Arthur took a deep breath without much enthusiasm. All right, he said, but where do we start? I mean, how should I know? They say the ultimate answer or whatever is 42. How am I supposed to know what the question is? It could be anything. I mean, what, six times seven? Zaphod looked at him hard for a moment. Then his eyes blazed with excitement. 42, he cried. Arthur wiped his palm across his forehead. Yes, he said patiently, I know that. Zaphod's faces fell. I'm just saying the question could be anything at all, said Arthur, and I don't see how I'm meant to know. Because, his Zaphod, you were there when your planet did the big firework. We have a thing on Earth, began Arthur, had, corrected Zaphod, called tact. Oh, never mind. Look, I just don't know. A low voice echoed dully round the cabin. I know, said Marvin. Ford called out from the controls he was still fighting a losing battle with. Stay out of this, Marvin, he said. This is organism talk. It's printed in the Earthman's brainwave patterns, continued Marvin, but I don't suppose you'll be very interested in knowing that. You mean, said Arthur, you mean you can see into my mind? Yes, said Marvin. Arthur stared in astonishment. And, he said, it amazes me how you manage to live in anything that small. Ah, said Arthur, abuse. Yes, confirmed Marvin. Ah, ignore him, said Zaphod. He's only making it up. Making it up, said Marvin, swivelling his head in a parody of astonishment. Why should I want to make anything up? Life's bad enough as it is without wanting to invent any more of it. Marvin, said Trillian, in the gentle, kindly voice that only she was still capable of assuming in talking to this misbegotten creature, if you knew all along, then why didn't you tell us? Marvin's head swivelled back to her. You didn't ask. He said simply. Well, we're asking you now, metal man, said Ford, turning round to look at him. At that moment, the ship suddenly stopped rocking and swaying. The engine pitch settled down to a gentle hum. Hey, Ford, said Zaphod. That sounds good. Have you worked out the controls on this boat? No, said Ford. I just stopped fiddling with them. I reckon we've just got to go wherever this ship is going and get off it fast. Yeah, right, said Zaphod. I could tell you weren't really interested murmured Marvin to himself, and slumped into a corner and switched himself off. "'Trouble is,' said Ford, "'that the one instrument in this whole ship that's giving any reading is worrying me. "'If it's what I think it is, and it's saying what I think it's saying, "'then we've already gone too far back into the past, "'maybe as much as two million years before our own time.' "'Zaphod shrugged. "'Time is bunk,' he said. "'I wonder who this ship belongs to, anyway,' said Arthur. "'Me,' said Zaphod. "'No, I mean who it really belongs to.' No, really me, insisted Zaphod. Look, property is theft, right? Therefore theft is property, therefore the ship is mine, OK? Tell the ship that, said Arthur. Zaphod strode over to the console. Ship, he said, banging on the panels, this is your new owner speaking to... He got no further. Several things happened at once. The ship dropped out of time travel mode and re-emerged into real space. All the controls on the console, which had been shut down for the time trip, now lit up. A large vision screen above the console winked into life, revealing a wide starscape and a single, very large sun dead ahead of them. 
None of these things, however, was responsible for the fact that Zaphod was at the same moment hurled bodily backwards against the rear of the cabin, as were all the others. They were hurled back by a single thunderous clap of noise that thudded out of the monitor speakers surrounding the vision screen. Chapter 21 Down on the dry red world of Cacrafoon, in the middle of the vast rudlit desert, the stage technicians were testing the sound system. That is to say, the sound system was in the desert, not the technicians. They had retreated to the safety of Disaster Area's giant control ship, which hung in orbit some 400 miles above the surface of the planet, and they were testing the sound from there. Anyone within five miles of the speaker silos wouldn't have survived the tuning up. If Arthur Dent had been within five miles of the speaker silos, then his expiring thought would have been that in both size and shape the sound rig closely resembled Manhattan. Risen out of the silos, the neutron phase speaker stacks towered monstrously against the sky, obscuring the banks of plutonium reactors and seismic amps behind them. Buried deep in concrete bunkers beneath the city of speakers lay the instruments that the musicians would control from their ship, the massive photon adjuitar, the base detonator, and the megabang drum complex. It was going to be a noisy show. Aboard the giant control ship, all was activity and bustle. Hot Black Desiato's limo ship, a mere tadpole beside it, had arrived and docked, and the lamented gentleman was being transported down the high-vaulted corridors to meet the medium who was going to interpret his psychic impulses onto the Ajuitar keyboard. A doctor, a logician, and a marine biologist had also arrived, flown in at phenomenal expense from Maxi Megalon to try to reason with the lead singer, who had locked himself in the bathroom with a bottle of pills and was refusing to come out till it could be proved conclusively to him that he wasn't a fish. The bass player was busy machine-gunning his bedroom, and the drummer was nowhere on board. Frantic inquiries led to the discovery that he was standing on a beach on San Traginus V, over a hundred light-years away where, he claimed, he had been happy for over half an hour now, and had found a small stone that would be his friend. The band's manager was profoundly relieved. It meant that for the seventeenth time on this tour, the drums would be played by a robot, and that, therefore, the timing of the symbolistics would be right. The sub-ether was buzzing with the communications of the stage technicians testing the speaker channels, and this it was that was being relayed to the interior of the black ship. Its dazed occupants lay against the back wall of the cabin and listened to the voices on the monitor speakers. OK, channel 9 on power, said a voice. Testing channel 15. Another thumping crack of noise walloped through the ship. Channel 15, A-OK, -okay, said another voice. A third voice cut in. The black stunt ship is now in position. It said, it's looking good. Going to be a great sun dive. Stage computer online? A computer voice answered. Online, it said. Take control of the black ship. Black ship locked into trajectory program on standby. Testing channel 20. Zayford leapt across the cabin and switched frequencies on the sub ether receiver before the next mind pulverizing noise hit them. He stood there quivering. What, said Trillian in a small, quiet voice, does sundive mean? It means, said Marvin, that the ship is going to dive into the sun. Sun. Dive. It's very simple to understand. What do you expect if you see a hot black Desiato's stunt ship? How do you know, said Zayfot in a voice that would make a vagan snow lizard feel chilly, that this is hot black Desiato's stunt ship? Simple, said Marvin. I parked it for him. Then why didn't you tell us? You said you wanted excitement and adventure and really wild things. This is awful, said Arthur, unnecessarily in the pause which followed. That's what I said, confirmed Marvin. On a different frequency, the sub receiver had picked up a public broadcast which now echoed around the cabin. Fine weather for the concert here this afternoon. I'm standing here in the front of the stage, the reporter lied, in the middle of the rudlit desert, and with the aid of hyperbinoctic glasses, I can just about make out the huge audience cowering there on the horizon all around me. Behind me, the speaker stacks rise like a sheer cliff face, and high above me, the sun is shining away and doesn't know what's going to hit it. The environmentalist lobby do know what's going to hit it, and they claim that the concert will cause earthquakes, tidal waves, hurricanes, irreparable damage to the atmosphere, and all the usual things that environmentalists usually go on about. But I've just had a report that a representative of Disaster Area met with environmentalists at lunchtime and had them all shot, so nothing now lies in the way of... 
Zaphod switched it off. He turned to Ford. You know what I'm thinking, he said. I think so, said Ford. Tell me what you think I'm thinking. I think you're thinking it's time we got off this ship. I think you're right, said Zaphod. I think you're right, said Ford. How? said Arthur. Quiet, said Ford and Zaphod. We're thinking. So this is it, said Arthur. We're going to die. I wish you'd stop saying that, said Ford. It is worth repeating at this point the theories that Ford had come up with on his first encounter with human beings to account for their peculiar habit of continually stating and restating the very, very obvious, as in, it's a nice day, or you're very tall, or so this is it, we're going to die. His first theory was that if human beings didn't keep exercising their lips, their mouths probably seized up. After a few months of observation, he'd come up with a second theory, which was this. If human beings don't keep exercising their lips, their brains start working. In fact, the second theory is more literally true of the Belserabon people of Cacrafoon. The Belserabon people used to cause great resentment and insecurity amongst neighbouring races by being one of the most enlightened, accomplished, and above all, quiet civilizations in the galaxy. As a punishment for this behaviour, which was held to be offensively self-righteous and provocative, a galactic tribunal inflicted on them that most cruel of all social diseases, telepathy. Consequently, in order to prevent themselves broadcasting every slightest thought that crosses their mind to anyone within a five-mile radius, they now have to talk very loudly and continuously about the weather, their little aches and pains, the match this afternoon, and what a noisy place Cacrafoon has suddenly become. Another method of temporarily blotting out their minds is to play host to a disaster area concert. The timing of the concert was critical. The ship had to begin its dive before the concert began in order to hit the sun six minutes and 37 seconds before the climax of the song to which it related so that the light of the solar flares had time to travel out to Cacrafoon. The ship had already been diving for several minutes by the time that Ford Prefect had completed his search of the other compartments of the black ship. He burst back into the cabin. The sun of Cacrafoon loomed terrifyingly large on the vision screen, its blazing white inferno of fusing hydrogen nuclei growing moment by moment as the ship plunged onwards, unheeding the thumping and banging of Zaphod's hands on the control panel. Arthur and Trillian had the fixed expressions of rabbits on a night road who think the best way of dealing with approaching headlights is to stare them out. Zaphod spun round, wild-eyed. Ford, he said, how many escape capsules are there? None, said Ford. Zaphod gibbered. Did you count them? he yelled. Twice, said Ford. Did you manage to raise the stage crew on the radio? Yeah, said Zaphod bitterly. I said there were a whole bunch of people on board, and they said to say hi to everybody. Ford goggled. Didn't you tell them who you were? Oh, yeah, they said it was a great honour. That and something about a restaurant bill and my executors. Ford pushed Arthur aside roughly and leaned forward over the control console. Does none of this function? he said savagely. All overridden. Smash the autopilot! Find it first. Nothing connects. There was a moment's cold silence. Arthur was stumbling round the back of the cabin. He stopped suddenly. Incidentally, he said, what does teleport mean? Another moment passed. Slowly the others turned to face him. Uh, probably the wrong question to ask, said Arthur. It's just I, I remember hearing you use the word a short while ago, and I only bring it up because... Where, said Ford quietly, does it say teleport? Well, just over here, in fact, said Arthur, pointing at a dark control box in the rear of the cabin, uh, just under the word emergency, above the word system, and beside the sign saying out of order. In the pandemonium that instantly followed, the only action to follow was that of Ford Prefect lunging across the cabin to the small black box that Arthur had indicated, and stabbing repeatedly at the single small black button set into it. The six-foot square panel slid open beside it, revealing a compartment which resembled a multiple shower unit that had found a new function in life as an electrician's junk store. Half-finished wiring hung from the ceiling, a jumble of abandoned components lay strewn on the floor, and the programming panel lolled out of the cavity in the wall into which it should have been secured. A junior disaster area accountant visiting the shipyard where the ship was being constructed had demanded to know of the works foreman why the hell they were fitting an extremely expensive teleport into a ship that only had one important journey to make, and that unmanned. The foreman had explained that the teleport was available at a 10% discount, and the accountant had explained that this is immaterial. The foreman had explained that it was the finest, most powerful and sophisticated teleport that money could buy, and the accountant had explained that the money did not wish to buy it. The foreman had explained that the people would still need to enter and leave the ship, and the accountant had explained that the ship sported a perfectly serviceable door. 
The foreman had explained that the accountant could go and boil his head. The accountant had explained to the foreman that the thing approaching him rapidly from his left was a knuckle sandwich. After the explanations had been concluded, work was discontinued on the teleport, which subsequently passed unnoticed on the invoice as Sund Explans at five times the price. Hell's donkeys, muttered Zaphod as he and Ford attempted to sort through the tangle of wiring. After a moment or so, Ford told him to stand back. He tossed a coin into the teleport and jiggled a switch on the lolling control panel. With a crackle and a spit of light, the coin vanished. That much of it worked, said Ford. However, there's no guidance system. A mere matter transfer into teleport with no guidance programming could put you, well, anywhere. The son of Cacrafoon loomed huge on the screen. Who cares, said Zaphod. We go where we go. And, said Ford, there's no auto system. We couldn't all go. Someone would have to stay here and operate it. A solemn moment shuffled past. The sun loomed larger and larger. Hey, Marvin, kid, said Zaphod brightly. How are you doing? Very badly, I suspect, muttered Marvin. A shortish while later, the concert on Cacrafoon reached an unexpected climax. The black ship, with its single morose occupant, had plunged on schedule into the nuclear furnace of the sun. Massive solar flares licked out from it millions of miles into space, thrilling and in some cases spilling the dozen or so flare riders who had been coasting close to the surface of the sun in anticipation of the moment. Moments before the flare light reached Cacrafoon, the pounding desert cracked along a deep fault line, a huge and hitherto undetected underground river lying far beneath the sand gushed to the surface to be followed seconds later by the eruption of millions of tons of boiling lava that flowed hundreds of feet into the air, instantaneously vaporising the river both above and below the surface in an explosion that echoed to the far side of the world and back again. Those very few who witnessed the event and survived swear that the whole hundred thousand square miles of the desert rose into the air like a mile-thick pancake, flipped itself over and fell back down again. At that precise moment, the solar radiation from the flares filtered through the clouds of vaporised water and struck the ground. A year later, the hundred thousand square mile desert was thick with flowers. The structure of the atmosphere around the planet was subtly altered. The sun blazed less harshly in the summer, the cold bit less bitterly in the winter. Pleasant rain fell more often, and slowly the desert world of Cacrafoon became a paradise. Even the telepathic power with which the people of Cacrafoon had been cursed was permanently dispersed by the force of the explosion. A spokesman for Disaster Area, the one who had had all the environmentalists shot, was later quoted as saying that it had been a good gig. Many people spoke movingly of the healing powers of music. A few sceptical scientists examined the records of the events even more closely and claimed that they had discovered faint vestiges of a vast, artificially induced improbability field drifting in from a nearby region of space. Chapter 22 Arthur woke and instantly regretted it. Hangovers he'd had, but never anything on this scale. This was it. This was the big one. This was the ultimate pits. Matter transference beams, he decided, were not as much fun as, say, a good solid kick in the head. Being for the moment unwilling to move on account of a dull, stomping throb he was experiencing, he lay a while and thought. The trouble with most forms of transport, he thought, is basically one of them not being worth all the bother. On Earth, when there had been an Earth, before it was demolished to make way for a hyperspace bypass, the problem had been with cars. The disadvantages involved in pulling lots of black sticky slime from out of the ground, where it had been safely hidden out of harm's way, turning it into tar to cover the land with, smoke to fill the air with, and pouring the rest into the sea, all seemed to outweigh the advantages of being able to get more quickly from one place to another, particularly when the place you arrived at had probably become, as a result of this, very similar to the place you had left i.e. covered with tar full of smoke and short of fish. And what about matter transference beams? Any form of transport which involved tearing you apart atom by atom, flinging those atoms through the sub-ether and then jamming them back together again just when they were getting their first taste of freedom for years, had to be bad news. Many people had thought exactly this before Arthur Dent, and had even gone to the lengths of writing songs about it. Here is one that used regularly to be chanted by huge crowds outside the Sirius Cybernetics Corporation Teleport Systems Factory on Happy World 3. 
All the Barons, great, OK. Algol's pretty neat. Beetlejuice is pretty girls and knock you off your feet. They'll do anything you like, real fast and then real slow. But if you have to take me apart to get me there, then I don't want to go. Singing, take me apart, take me apart, what a way to roam. And if you have to take me apart to get me there, I'd rather stay at home. Sirius is paved with gold, so I've heard it said, by nuts who then go on to say, see tour before you're dead. I'll gladly take the high road, or even take the low, but if you have to take me apart to get me there, then I for one won't go. Singing, take me apart, take me apart, you must be off your head, and if you try to take me apart to get me there, I'll stay right here in bed. And so on. Another favourite song was much shorter. I teleported home one night with Ron and Sid and Meg. Ron stole Meggie's heart away, and I got Sid in his leg. Arthur felt waves of pain slowly receding, though he was still aware of a dull, stomping throb. Slowly, carefully, he stood up. "'Can you hear a dull, stomping throb?' said Ford Prefect. Arthur spun round and wobbled uncertainly. Ford Prefect was approaching, looking red-eyed and pasty. "'Where are we?' gasped Arthur. Ford looked around. They were standing in a long, curving corridor, which stretched out of sight in both directions. The outer steel wall, which was painted in that sickly shade of pale green, which they use in schools, hospitals, and mental asylums to keep the inmates subdued, curved over the tops of their heads to where it met the inner perpendicular wall, which, oddly enough, was covered in dark brown hessian wall weave. The floor was of dark green ribbed rubber. Ford moved over to a very thick, dark, transparent panel set in the outer wall. It was several layers deep, yet through it you could see pinpoints of distant stars. "'I think we're in a spaceship of some kind,' he said. Down the corridor came the sound of a dull, stomping throb. "'Trillion?' called Arthur nervously. "'Zaphod?' Ford shrugged. "'Nowhere about,' he said. "'I've looked. It could be anywhere. An unprogrammed teleport can throw you light years in any direction. Judging by the way I feel, I should think we've travelled a very long way indeed.' Well, how do you feel? Bad. Do you think they're... Where they are, how they are, there's no way we can know and no way we can do anything about it. Do what I do. What? Don't think about it. Arthur turned this thought over in his mind, reluctantly saw the wisdom of it, tucked it up and put it away. He took a deep breath. Footsteps! exclaimed Arthur suddenly. Where? That noise, that stomping throb, pounding feet, listen! Arthur listened. The noise echoed round the corridor at them from an indeterminate distance. It was the muffled sound of pounding footsteps, and it was noticeably louder. "'Let's move,' said Ford sharply. They both moved in opposite directions. "'Not that way,' said Ford. "'That's where they're coming from.' "'No, it's not,' said Arthur. "'They're coming from that way.' "'They're not there.' They both stopped. They both turned. They both listened intently. They both agreed with each other. They both set off in opposite directions again. Fear gripped them. From both directions, the noise was getting louder. A few yards to their left, another corridor ran at right angles to the inner wall. They ran to it and hurried along it. It was dark, immensely long, and as they passed down it, gave them the impression that they were getting colder and colder. Other corridors gave off it to the left and right, each very dark and each subjecting them to sharp blasts of icy air as they passed. They stopped for a moment in alarm. The further down the corridor they went, the louder became the sound of pounding feet. They pressed themselves back against the cold wall and listened furiously. The cold, the dark, and the drumming of disembodied feet were getting to them badly. Ford shivered, partly with the cold, but partly with the memory of stories his favourite mother used to tell him when he was a mere slip of a Betelgeusean, ankle high to an Arcturian mega grasshopper. Stories of death ships, haunted hulks that roamed restlessly around the obscure regions of deep space, infested with demons or the ghosts of forgotten crews. Stories, too, of incautious travellers who found and entered such ships. Stories of... Then Ford remembered the brown Hessian wall weave in the first corridor and pulled himself together. However ghosts and demons may choose to decorate their death hulks, he thought to himself, he would lay any money you liked that it wasn't with Hessian wall weave. He grasped Arthur by the arm. Back the way he came, he said firmly, and they started to retrace their steps. A moment later they leapt like startled lizards down the nearest corridor junction, as the owners of the drumming feet suddenly hove into view directly in front of them. Hidden behind the corner, they goggled in amazement as about two dozen overweight men and women pounded past them in tracksuits, panting and wheezing in a manner that would make a heart surgeon gibber. Ford Prefect stared after them. 
joggers, he hissed, as the sound of their feet echoed away up and down the network of corridors. Joggers? whispered Arthur Dent. Joggers, said Ford Prefect with a shrug. The corridor they were concealed in was not like the others. It was very short and ended at a large steel door. Ford examined it, discovered the opening mechanism, and pushed it wide. The first thing that hit their eyes was what appeared to be a coffin. The next 4,999 things that hit their eyes were also coffins. Chapter 23 The vault was low-ceilinged, dimly lit, and gigantic. At the far end, about three hundred yards away, an archway led through to what appeared to be a similar chamber, similarly occupied. Ford Prefect let out a low whistle as he stepped down to the floor of the vault. Wild, he said. What's so great about dead people? asked Arthur, nervously stepping down after him. Dunno, said Ford. Let's find out, shall we? On a closer inspection, the coffins seemed to be more like sarcophagi. They stood about waist-high and were constructed of what appeared to be white marble, which is almost certainly what it was, something that only appeared to be white marble. The tops were semi-translucent, and through them could dimly be perceived the features of their late and presumably lamented occupants. They were humanoid, and had clearly left the troubles of whatever world it was they came from far behind them, but beyond that little else could be discerned. Rolling slowly round the floor between the sarcophagi was a heavy, oily, white gas, which Arthur at first thought might be there to give the place a little atmosphere, until he discovered that it also froze his ankles. The sarcophagi, too, were intensely cold to the touch. Ford suddenly crouched down beside one of them. He pulled a corner of his towel out of his satchel and started to rub furiously at something. Look, there's a plaque on this one, he explained to Arthur. It's frosted over. He rubbed the frost clear and examined the engraved characters. To Arthur they looked like the footprints of a spider that had had one too many of whatever it is that spiders have on a night out, but Ford instantly recognised an early form of galactic easy read. It says, Golgofrinchum Arkfleet, Ship B, Hold 7, Telephone Sanitizer, Second Class, and a serial number. Telephone sanitizer, said Arthur, a dead telephone sanitizer. Best kind. But what's he doing here? Ford peered through the top at the figure within. Not a lot, he said, and suddenly flashed one of those grins of his which always make people think he'd been overdoing things recently and should try and get some rest. He scampered over to another sarcophagus, a moment's brisk towel work, and he announced, This one's a dead hairdresser, Hoopy. The next sarcophagus revealed itself to be the last resting place of an advertising account executive. The one after that contained a second-hand car salesman, third class. An inspection hatch let into the floor suddenly caught Ford's attention, and he squatted down to unfasten it, thrashing away at the clouds of freezing gas that threatened to envelop him. A thought occurred to Arthur. If these are just coffins, he said, why are they kept so cold? Or indeed, why are they kept anyway? said Ford, tugging the hatchway open. The gas poured down through it. Why, in fact, is anyone going to all the trouble and expense of carting five thousand dead bodies through space? Ten thousand, said Arthur, pointing at the archway through which the next chamber was dimly visible. Ford stuck his head down through the floor hatchway. He looked up again. Fifteen thousand, he said. There's another lot down there. Fifteen million, said a voice. That's a lot, said Ford, a lot, a lot. Turn round slowly, barked the voice, and put your hands up. Any other move and I'll blast you into tiny, tiny bits. Hello, said Ford, turning round slowly, putting his hands up and not making any other move. Why, said Arthur Dent, isn't anyone ever pleased to see us? Standing silhouetted in the doorway through which they had entered the vault was the man who wasn't pleased to see them. His displeasure was communicated partly by the barking, hectoring quality of his voice, and partly by the viciousness with which he waved a long, silver killer-zap gun at them. The designer of the gun had clearly not been instructed to beat about the bush. Make it evil, he'd been told. Make it totally clear that this gun has a right end and a wrong end. Make it totally clear to anyone standing at the wrong end that things are going badly for them. 
If that means sticking all sorts of spikes and prongs and blackened bits all over it, then so be it. This is not a gun for hanging over the fireplace or sticking in the umbrella stand. It is a gun for going out and making people miserable with. Ford and Arthur looked at the gun unhappily. The man with the gun moved from the door and circled round them. As he came into the light, they could see his gold and black uniform, on which the buttons were so highly polished that they shone with an intensity that would have made an approaching motorist flash his lights in annoyance. He gestured at the door. Out! he said. People who can supply that amount of firepower don't need to supply verbs as well. Ford and Arthur went out, closely followed by the wrong end of the killer zap gun and the buttons. Turning into the corridor, they were jostled by twenty-four oncoming joggers, now showered and changed, who swept on past them into the vault. Arthur turned to watch them in confusion. Move! screamed their captor. Arthur moved. Ford shrugged and moved. In the vault, the joggers went to twenty-four empty sarcophagi along the side wall, opened them, climbed in, and fell into twenty-four dreamless sleeps. Chapter 24 Er, uh, Captain? Yes, Number One? I just had a sort of report thingy from Number Two. Oh, dear. High up on the bridge of the ship, the captain stared out into the infinite reaches of space with mild irritation. From where he reclined beneath a wide-domed bubble, he could see before and above him the vast panorama of stars through which they were moving, a panorama that had thinned out noticeably during the course of the voyage. Turning and looking backwards over the vast two-mile bulk of the ship, he could see the far denser mass of stars behind them, which seemed to form almost a solid band. This was the view through the galactic centre from which they were travelling, and indeed had been travelling for years, at a speed that he couldn't quite remember at the moment, but he knew it was terribly fast. It was something approaching the speed of something or other, or was it three times the speed of something else? Jolly impressive, anyway. He peered into the bright distance behind the ship, looking for something. He did this every few minutes or so, but never found what he was looking for. He didn't let it worry him, though. The scientist chaps had been very insistent that everything was going to be perfectly all right, provided nobody panicked and everybody got on and did their bit in an orderly fashion. He wasn't panicking. As far as he was concerned, everything was going splendidly. He dabbed at his shoulder with a large, frothy sponge. It crept back into his mind that he was feeling mildly irritated about something. Now, what was all that about? A slight cough alerted him to the fact that the ship's first officer was still standing nearby. Nice chap, number one. Not one of the very brightest. Had the odd spot of difficulty doing up his shoelaces, but jolly good officer material for all that. The captain wasn't a man to kick a chap when he was bending over trying to do up his shoelaces, however long it took him. Not like that ghastly number two, strutting about all over the place, polishing his buttons, issuing reports every hour. Ship still moving, Captain. Still on course, Captain. Oxygen levels still being maintained, Captain. Give it a miss, was the Captain's vote. Ah, oh, yes, that was a thing that had been irritating him. He peered down at number one. Uh, yes, Captain, he was shouting something or other about having found some prisoners. The Captain thought about this. It seemed pretty unlikely to him, but he wasn't one to stand in his officer's way. Well, perhaps that'll keep him happy for a bit, he said. He's always wanted some. Ford Prefect and Arthur Dent trudged onwards up the ship's apparently endless corridors. Number two marched behind them, barking the occasional order about not making any false moves or trying any funny stuff. They seemed to have passed at least a mile of continuous brown hessian wall weave. Finally they reached a large steel door, which slid open when number two shouted at it. They entered. To the eyes of Ford Prefect and Arthur Dent, the most remarkable thing about the ship's bridge was not the fifty-foot diameter hemispherical dome which covered it, and through which the dazzling display of stars shone down on them. To people who have eaten at the restaurant at the end of the universe, such wonders are commonplace. Nor was it the bewildering array of instruments that crowded the long circumferential wall around them. To Arthur, this was exactly what spaceships were traditionally supposed to look like and to Ford it looked thoroughly antiquated. It confirmed his suspicions that disaster area stunt ship had taken them back at least a million, if not two million, years before their own time. No, the thing that really caught them off balance was the bath. The bath stood on a six-foot pedestal of rough-hewn blue water crystal and was of a baroque monstrosity not often seen outside the Maximegalon Museum of Diseased Imaginings. 
an intestinal jumble of plumbing had been picked out in gold leaf rather than decently buried at midnight in an unmarked grave. The taps and shower attachment would have made a gargoyle jump. As the dominant centrepiece of a starship bridge, it was terribly wrong, and it was with the embittered air of a man who knew this that Number Two approached it. Captain, sir! he shouted through clenched teeth. A difficult trick, but he'd had years during which to perfect it. A large genial face and a genial foam covered arm popped up over the rim of the monstrous bath. Ah,、oh, hello, Number Two, said Captain, waving a cheery sponge. Having a nice day? Number Two snapped even further to attention than he already was. I have brought you the prisoners I located in Freezer Bay Seven, sir. He yapped. Ford and Arthur coughed in confusion.、Uh, hello, they said. The captain beamed at them. So, Number Two had really found some prisoners. Well, good for him, thought the captain. Nice to see a chap doing what he's best at. Oh, hello there, he said. Excuse me, not getting up, just having a quick bath. Well, gin and tonics all round then. Look in the fridge, Number One. Certainly, sir. It is a curious fact. And one to which no one knows quite how much importance to attach, that something like 85% of all known worlds in the galaxy, be they primitive or highly advanced, have invented a drink called gin and tonics, or gin and tonics, or gin and onics, or any one of a thousand or more variations on the same phonetic theme. The drinks themselves are not the same, and vary between the Sivolvian gin and tonics. Which is ordinary water served at slightly above room temperature, and the Gagrakakan Chin Antonix, which kills cows at a hundred paces. And in fact, the one common factor between all of them, beyond the fact that the names sound the same, is that they were all invented and named before the worlds concerned made contact with any other worlds. What can be made of this fact? It exists in total isolation. As far as any theory of structural linguistics is concerned, it is right off the graph, and yet it persists. Old structural linguists get very angry when young structural linguists go on about it. Young structural linguists get deeply excited about it and stay up late at night, convinced that they are very close to something of profound importance, and end up becoming old structural linguists before their time, getting very angry with the young ones. Structural linguistics is a bitterly divided and unhappy discipline, and a large number of its practitioners spend too many nights drowning their sorrows in whisky and sodas. Number two stood before the captain's bathtub, trembling with frustration. "Don't you want to interrogate the prisoners, sir?" he squealed. The captain peered at him in amusement. "Why on Golga Frenchman should I want to do that?" he asked. "To get information out of them, sir. To find out why they came here." Oh no 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 no," said the captain. "I expect they just dropped in for a quick gin and tonics, don't you?" But so they're my prisoners. I must interrogate them. The captain looked at them doubtfully. "Oh, all right," he said. "Well, if you must, I'm asking them what they want to drink." A hard, cold gleam came into Number Two's eyes. He advanced slowly on Ford Prefect and Arthur Dent. "All right, you scum!" he growled. "You vermin!" He jabbed forward with the killer zap gun. Steady on, Number Two. Admonished the captain gently. What do you want to drink? Number Two screamed. Well, the gin and tonic sounds very nice to me," said Ford. "What about you, Arthur?" Arthur blinked. "What? Oh, uh, 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 yes," he said. With ice or without? Bellowed Number Two. Oh, with please," said Ford. Lemon. Uh, yes, please," said Ford. "And do you have any of those little biscuits? You know, the cheesy ones." I'm asking the questions," howled Number Two. His body quaking with apoplectic fury.、Uh, number two," said the captain softly. "Sir, push off, would you? There's a good chap. I'm trying to have a relaxing bath." Number two's eyes narrowed and became what are known in the shouting and killing people trade as cold slits. The idea, presumably, being to give your opponent the impression that you have lost your glasses or having difficulty keeping awake. Why this is frightening is an as yet unresolved problem. He advanced on the captain. His number two's mouth a thin, hard line. Again, tricky to know why this is understood as frightening behaviour. If, whilst wandering through the jungle of trial, you were suddenly to come upon the fabled ravenous bug bladder beast, you would have reason to be grateful if its mouth was a thin, hard line rather than, as it usually is, a gaping mass of slavering fangs. May I remind you, sir? Hissed number two at the captain, that you have now been in that bath for over three years. This final shot delivered. Number two spun on his heel and stalked off to a corner to practice darting eye movements in the mirror. 
The captain squirmed in his bath. He gave Ford Prefect a lame smile. Well, you need to relax a lot in a job like mine, he said. Ford slowly lowered his hands. It provoked no reaction. Arthur lowered his. Treading very slowly and carefully, Ford moved over to the bath pedestal. He patted it. Nice, he lied. He wondered if it was safe to grin. Very slowly and carefully, he grinned. It was safe. Er,、uh, he said to the captain. Yes, said the captain. I wonder, said Ford, could I ask you actually what your job is, in fact? A hand tapped him on the shoulder. He spun round. It was the first officer. Your drinks, he said. Oh, thank you, said Ford. He and Arthur took their gin and tonics. Arthur sipped his and was surprised to discover it tasted very like a whisky and soda. I mean, I couldn't help noticing, said Ford, also taking a sip, the bodies in the hold. Bodies? said the captain in surprise. Ford paused and thought to himself, never take anything for granted, he thought. Could it be that the captain doesn't know he's got fifteen million dead bodies on this ship? The captain was nodding cheerfully at him. He also appeared to be playing with a rubber duck. Ford looked around. Number two was staring at him in the mirror, but only for an instant. His eyes were constantly on the move. The first officer was just standing there holding the drinks tray and smiling benignly. Bodies? said the captain again. Ford licked his lips. Yes, he said. All those dead telephone sanitizers and account executives, you know, down in the hold. The captain stared at him. Suddenly he threw back his head and laughed. Oh, they're not dead, he said. Good Lord, no, 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 they're, they're, they're frozen. They're going to be revived. Ford did something he very rarely did. He blinked. Arthur seemed to come out of a trance. You mean you've got a hold full of frozen hairdressers, he said. Oh, yes, said the captain. Millions of them. Hairdressers, tired TV producers, insurance salesmen, personnel officers, security guards, public relations executives, management consultants. You name it. We're going to colonize another planet. Ford wobbled very slightly. Exciting, isn't it? said the captain. What with that lot? said Arthur. Ah,、oh, no, 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 don't misunderstand me, said the captain. We're just one of the ships in the Ark fleet. We're the B Ark, you see. Sorry, could I just ask you to run a little bit more hot water for me? Arthur obliged, and a cascade of pink, frothy water swirled around the bath. The captain let out a sigh of pleasure. Thank you so much, my dear fellow. Do help yourself to more drinks, of course. Ford tossed down his drink, took the bottle from the first officer's tray, and refilled his glass to the top. What, he said, is a bee ark? This is, said the captain, and swished the foamy water around joyfully with the duck. Yes, said Ford, but. Well, what happened, you see, was, said the captain, our planet, the world from which we have come, was, so to speak, doomed. Doomed? Oh, yes, so what everyone thought was, let's pack the whole population into some giant spaceships and go and settle on another planet. Having told this much of his story, he settled back with a satisfied grunt. You mean a less doomed one, prompted Arthur. What did you say, dear fellow? A less doomed planet you were going to settle on. Are going to settle on, yes, so it was decided to build. Three ships, you see, three arcs in space, and I'm not boring you, am I? No, no, said Ford firmly. It's fascinating. You know, it's delightful, reflected the captain, to have someone else to talk to for a change. Number two's eyes darted feverishly about the room again, and then settled back on the mirror like a pair of flies, briefly distracted from their favourite piece of month-old meat. Trouble with a long journey like this, continued the captain, is that you end up just talking to yourself a lot, which gets terribly boring. Because half the time you know what you're going to say next. Only half the time? Asked Arthur in surprise. The captain thought for a moment. Yes, about half, I'd say. Anyway, where's the soap? He fished around and found it. Yes. So anyway, he resumed. The idea was that into the first ship, the A ship, would go all the brilliant leaders, the scientists, the great artists, you know, all the achievers, and then into the third or C ship would go all the people who did the actual work, who made things and did things, and then into the B ship, that's us, would go everyone else, the middlemen, you see. He smiled happily at them, and we were sent off first. He concluded and hummed a little bathing tune. The little bathing tune. Which had been composed for him by one of the world's most exciting and prolific jingle writers, who was currently asleep in hold thirty-six, some nine hundred yards behind them, covered what would otherwise have been an awkward moment of silence. Ford and Arthur shuffled their feet and furiously avoided each other's eyes. 
Uh, said Arthur after a moment, what exactly was it that was wrong with your planet, then? Oh, it was doomed, as I said, said the captain. Apparently it was going to crash into the sun or something, or maybe it was that the moon was going to crash into us, something of the kind, absolutely terrifying prospect, whatever it was. Oh, said the first officer suddenly. I thought it was that the planet was going to be invaded by a gigantic swarm of twelve-foot piranha bees. Wasn't that it? Number two spun round, eyes ablaze with a cold, hard light that only comes with the amount of practice he was prepared to put in. That's not what I was told, he hissed. My commanding officer told me the entire planet was in imminent danger of being eaten by an enormous mutant star goat. Oh, really? said Ford Prefect. Yes, a monstrous creature from the pit of hell with scything teeth ten thousand miles long, breath that would boil oceans, claws that would tear continents from their roots, a thousand eyes that burned like the sun, slavering jaws a million miles across, a monster such you see you have never, never, ever! And they made sure that they sent you lot off first, did they? inquired Arthur. "'Oh, yes,' said the captain. "'Well, everyone said very nicely, I thought, "'that it was very important for morale to feel "'that they would be arriving on a planet "'where they could be sure of a good haircut "'and where the phones were clean.' "'Oh, yes,' agreed Ford. "'I can see that would be very important. "'And the other ships, uh, they followed on after you, uh, did they?' "'For a moment the captain did not answer. "'He twisted round in his bath "'and gazed backwards over the huge bulk of the ship.' towards the bright galactic centre. He squinted into the inconceivable distance. "'Ah, well, it's funny you should say that,' he said, and allowed himself a slight frown at Ford Prefect. "'Because, curiously enough, we haven't heard a peep after them since we left five years ago. But they must be behind us somewhere.' He peered off into the distance again. Ford peered with him and gave a thoughtful frown. "'Unless, of course,' he said softly, "'they were eaten by the goat.' "'Ah, yes,' said the captain, with a slight hesitancy creeping into his voice. "'The goat.' "'His eyes passed over the solid shapes of the instruments and computers that lined the bridge. "'They winked away innocently at him. "'He stared out at the stars, but none of them said a word. "'He glanced at his first and second officers, "'but they seemed also lost in their own thoughts for a moment. "'He glanced at Ford Prefect, who raised his eyebrows at him. "'It's a funny thing, you know,' said the captain at last. "'But now that I actually come to tell the story to someone else, I mean, I mean, does it strike you as odd, number one?' "'Uh,' said number one. "'Well,' said Ford, "'I can see that you've got a lot of things you're going to want to talk about, "'so thanks for the drink, and if you could sort of drop us off at the nearest convenient planet.' "'Ah, oh, well, that's a little difficult, you see,' said the captain, "'because our trajectory thingy was preset before we left Golga Frencham. "'I think partly because I'm not very good with figures.' "'You mean we're stuck here on this ship?' exclaimed Ford, "'suddenly losing patience with the whole charade. W "'When are you meant to be reaching this planet you're meant to be colonising?' "'Oh, we're nearly there, I think,' said the captain. "'Any second now. It's probably time I was getting out of the bath, in fact. "'Oh, I don't know, though. Why well, stop just when I'm enjoying it?' "'So we're actually going to land in a minute.' said Arthur. Well, not so much land, in fact, not actually land as such. No, uh What are you talking about? asked Ford sharply. Well, said the captain, picking his way through the words carefully, I think as far as I remember, we were programmed to crash on it. Crash! shouted Ford and Arthur. Uh, yes, said the captain. Yes, it's all part of the plan, I think. Uh, there was a terribly good reason for it, which I can't quite remember at the moment. It was something to do with, uh Ford exploded. "'You're a load of useless bloody loonies!' he shouted. "'Oh, yes, that was it,' beamed the captain. "'That was the reason.'" Chapter 25 The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy has this to say about the planet of Golga Frencham. It is a planet with an ancient and mysterious history, rich in legend, red and occasionally green, with the blood of those who have sought in times gone by to conquer her a land of parched and barren landscapes, of sweet and sultry air heady with the scent of the perfumed springs that trickle over its hot and dusty rocks and nourish the dark and musky lichens beneath, a land of fevered brows and intoxicated imaginings, particularly amongst those who taste the lichens, a land also of cool and shaded thoughts amongst those who have learnt to forswear the lichens and find a tree to sit beneath. A land also of steel and blood and heroism, 
a land of the body and of the spirit. This was its history. And in all this ancient and mysterious history, the most mysterious figures of all were, without doubt, those of the great circling poets of Arium. These circling poets used to live in remote mountain passes, where they would lie in wait for small bands of unwary travellers, circle round them, and throw rocks at them. And when the travellers cried out, saying, Why didn't they go away and get on with writing some poems instead of pestering people with all this rock-throwing business? They would suddenly stop and then break into one of the 794 great song cycles of Vasilian. These songs were all of extraordinary beauty and even more extraordinary length, and all of them fell into exactly the same pattern. The first part of each song would tell how there once went forth from the city of Vasilian a party of five sage princes with four horses. The princes, who are of course brave, noble and wise, travel widely in distant lands, fight giant ogres, pursue exotic philosophies, take tea with weird gods and rescue beautiful monsters from ravening princesses, before finally announcing that they have achieved enlightenment and that their wanderings are therefore accomplished. The second and much longer part of each song would then tell of all their bickerings about which one of them is going to have to walk back. All this lay in the planet's remote past. It was, however, a descendant of one of these eccentric poets who invented the spurious tales of impending doom which enabled the people of Golga Frinsham to rid themselves of an entire useless third of their population. The other two-thirds stayed firmly at home and lived full, rich and happy lives until they were all suddenly wiped out by a virulent disease contracted from a dirty telephone. Chapter 26 That night the ship crash-landed onto an utterly insignificant little blue-green planet which circled a small, unregarded yellow sun in the uncharted backwaters of the unfashionable end of the western spiral arm of the galaxy. In the hours preceding the crash, Ford Prefect had fought furiously but in vain to unlock the controls of the ship from their preordained flight path. It had quickly become apparent to him that the ship had been programmed to convey its payload safely, if uncomfortably, to its new home, but to cripple itself beyond all hope of repair in the process. Its screaming, blazing descent through the atmosphere had stripped away most of its superstructure and outer shielding, and its final inglorious belly flop into a murky swamp had left its crew only a few hours of darkness during which to revive and offload its deep-frozen and unwanted cargo, for the ship began to settle almost at once, slowly upending its gigantic bulk in the stagnant slime. Once or twice during the night it was starkly silhouetted against the sky, as burning meteors, the detritus of its descent, flashed across the sky. In the grey pre-dawn light, it let out an obscene roaring gurgle and sank forever into the stinking depths. When the sun came up that morning, it shed its thin, watery light over a vast area heaving with wailing hairdressers, public relations executives, opinion pollsters, and the rest, all clawing their way desperately to dry land. A less strong-minded sun would probably have gone straight back down again, but it continued to climb its way through the sky, and after a while the influence of its warming rays began to have some restoring effect on the feebly struggling creatures. Countless numbers had, unsurprisingly, been lost to the swamp in the night, and millions more had been sucked down with the ship, but those that survived still numbered hundreds of thousands, and as the day wore on they crawled out over the surrounding countryside each looking for a few square feet of solid ground on which to collapse and recover from their nightmare ordeal. Two figures moved further afield. From a nearby hillside, Ford Prefect and Arthur Dent watched the horror of which they could not feel a part. Filthy, dirty trick to pull, muttered Arthur. Ford scraped a stick along the ground and shrugged. An imaginative solution to a problem, I'd have thought, he said. "'Why can't people just learn to live together in peace and harmony?' said Arthur. Ford gave a loud, very hollow laugh. Forty-two, he said, with a malicious grin. "'No, it doesn't work. Never mind.' Arthur looked at him as if he'd gone mad, and seeing nothing to indicate to the contrary, realised that it would be perfectly reasonable to assume that this had, in fact, happened. "'What do you think will happen to them all?' he said, after a while. 
In an infinite universe, anything can happen, said Ford, even survival, strange but true. A curious look came into his eyes as they passed over the landscape, and then settled again on the scene of misery below them. I think they'll manage for a while, he said. Arthur looked up sharply. Why do you say that, he said. Ford shrugged. Just a hunch, he said, and refused to be drawn on any further questions. Look, he said suddenly. Arthur followed his pointing finger. Down amongst the sprawling masses, a figure was moving, or perhaps lurching would be a more accurate description. He appeared to be carrying something on his shoulder. As he lurched from prostrate form to prostrate form, he seemed to wave whatever the something was at them in a drunken fashion. After a while, he gave up the struggle and collapsed in a heap. Arthur had no idea what this was meant to mean to him. Movie camera, said Ford, recording the historic moment. Well, I don't know about you, said Ford again after a moment, but I'm off. He sat a while in silence. After a while, this seemed to require comment. Er, uh, when you say you're off, what do you mean exactly, said Arthur. Good question, said Ford. I'm getting total silence. Looking over his shoulder, Arthur saw he was twiddling with knobs on a small black box. Ford had already introduced this box to Arthur as a sub sensomatic, but Arthur had merely nodded absently and not pursued the matter. In his mind, the universe still divided into two parts, the Earth and everything else. The Earth, having been demolished to make way for a hyperspace bypass, meant that this view of things was a little lopsided, but Arthur tended to cling to that lopsidedness as being his last remaining contact with his home. Sabitha sensomatics belonged firmly in the everything else category. Not a sausage, said Ford, shaking the thing. Sausage, thought Arthur to himself as he gazed listlessly at the primitive world about him. What I wouldn't give for a good earth sausage. Would you believe, said Ford in exasperation, that there are no transmissions of any kind within light years of this benighted tip? Are you listening to me? What? said Arthur. We're in trouble, said Ford. Oh, said Arthur. This sounded like month-old news to him. Until we pick up anything on this machine, said Ford, our chances of getting off this planet are zero. It may be some freak standing wave effect in the planet's magnetic field, in which case we just travel round and round till we find a clear reception area. Coming? He picked up his gear and strode off. Arthur looked down the hill. The man with the movie camera had struggled back up to his feet, just in time to film one of his colleagues collapsing. Arthur picked a blade of grass and strode off after Ford. Chapter 27 I trust you had a pleasant meal, said Zani Whoop to Zaphod and Trillian as they rematerialized on the bridge of the starship Heart of Gold and lay panting on the floor. Zaphod opened some eyes and glowered at him. You! He spat. He staggered to his feet and stomped off to find a chair to slump into. He found one and slumped into it. I have programmed the computer with the improbability coordinates pertinent to our journey, said Zani Whoop. We will arrive there very shortly. Meanwhile, why don't you relax and prepare yourself for the meeting? Zaphod said nothing. He got up again and marched over to a small cabinet from which he pulled a bottle of old Jank's spirit. He took a long pull at it. And when this is all done, said Zaphod savagely, it's done, all right? I'm free to go and do what the hell I like and lie on beaches and stuff. It depends what transpires from the meeting, said Zani Whoop. Zaphod, who is this man? said Trillian shakily, wobbling to her feet. What's he doing here? Why is he on our ship? Ah, he's a very stupid man, said Zaphod, who wants to meet the man who rules the universe. Ah, said Trillian, taking the bottle from Zaphod and helping herself. A social climber. Chapter 28 The major problem, one of the major problems, for there are several, one of the major problems with governing people is that of whom you get to do it, or rather, of who manages to get people to let them do it to them. To summarise, it is a well-known fact that those people who most want to rule people are ipso facto those least suited to do it. To summarise the summary... Anyone who is capable of getting themselves made president should on no account be allowed to do the job. To summarise the summary of the summary, people are a problem.
And so this is the situation we find, a succession of galactic presidents who so much enjoy the fun and palaver of being in power that they very rarely notice that they're not. And somewhere in the shadows behind them, who? Who can possibly rule if no one who wants to do it can be allowed to? Chapter 29 on a small, obscure world, somewhere in the middle of nowhere in particular, nowhere, that is, that could ever be found, since it is protected by a vast field of improbability to which only six men in this galaxy have a key, it was raining. It was bucketing down, and had been for hours. It beat the top of the sea into a mist. It pounded the trees. It churned and slopped a stretch of scrubby land near the sea into a mud bath. The rain pelted and danced on the corrugated iron roof of the small shack that stood in the middle of this patch of scrubby land. It obliterated the small rough pathway that led from the shack down to the seashore and smashed apart the neat piles of interesting shells which had been placed there. The noise of the rain on the roof of the shack was deafening within, but went largely unnoticed by its occupant, whose attention was otherwise engaged. He was a tall, shambling man with rough, straw-coloured hair that was damp from the leaking roof. His clothes were shabby, his back was hunched, and his eyes, though open, seemed closed. In his shack was an old, beaten-up armchair, an old, scratched table, an old mattress, some cushions, and a stove that was small but warm. There was also an old and slightly weather-beaten cat, and this was currently the focus of the man's attention. He bent his shambling form over it. Pussy, 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 he said. Gooch, 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 goo. Pussy want his fish? Nice piece of fish pussy wanted. The cat seemed undecided on the matter. It poured rather condescendingly at the piece of fish the man was holding out, and then got distracted by a piece of dust on the floor. Pussy not eat his fish. Pussy get thin and waste away, I think, said the man. Doubt crept into his voice. I imagine this is what will happen, he said. But how can I tell? He proffered the fish again. Pussy think, he said, eat fish or not eat fish. I think it is better if I don't get involved. He sighed. I think fish is nice, but then I think that rain is wet, so... Who am I to judge? He left the fish on the floor for the cat, and retired to his seat. Ah, I seem to see you eating it, he said at last, as the cat exhausted the entertainment possibilities of the speck of dust, and pounced onto the fish. I like it when I see you eat fish, said the man, because in my mind you will waste away if you don't. He picked up from the table a piece of paper and the stub of a pencil. He held one in one hand and the other in the other, and experimented with different ways of bringing them together. He tried holding the pencil under the paper, then over the paper, then next to the paper. He tried wrapping the paper round the pencil. He tried rubbing the stubby end of the pencil against the paper. Then he tried rubbing the sharp end of the pencil against the paper. It made a mark, and he was delighted with the discovery, as he was every day. He picked up another piece of paper from the table. This had a crossword on it. He studied it briefly and filled in a couple of clues before losing interest. He tried sitting on one of his hands and was intrigued by the feel of the bones of his hip. Fish come from far away, he said, or so I'm told, or so I imagine I'm told. When the men come, or when in my mind the men come in their six black shiny ships, do they come in your mind, too? What do you see, pussy? He looked at the cat, which was more concerned with getting the fish down as rapidly as possible than it was with these speculations. And when I hear their questions, do you hear questions? What do their voices mean to you? Perhaps you just think they're singing to you. He reflected on this and saw the flaw in the supposition. Perhaps they are singing songs to you, he said, and I just think they're asking me questions. He paused again. Sometimes he would pause for days just to see what it was like. 
Do you think they came today? He said. I do. There's mud on the floor, cigarettes and whiskey on the table, fish on a plate for you, and a memory of them in my mind. Hardly conclusive evidence, I know, but then all evidence is circumstantial. And look what else they've left me. He reached over to the table and pulled some things off it. Crosswords, dictionaries, and a calculator. He played with the calculator for an hour, whilst the cat went to sleep and the rain outside continued to pour. Eventually he put the calculator aside. I think I must be right in thinking they ask me questions, he said, to come all that way and leave all these things just for the privilege of singing songs to you would be very strange behaviour. Or so it seems to me. Who can tell? Who can tell? From the table he picked up a cigarette and lit it with a spill from the stove. He inhaled deeply and sat back. I think I saw another ship in the sky today, he said at last. A big white one. Never seen a big white one, just the six black ones. And the six green ones. And the others who say they come from so far away. Never a big white one. Perhaps six small black ones can look like one big white one at, at certain times. Perhaps I would like a glass of whisky. Yes, that seems more likely. He stood up and found a glass that was lying on the floor by his mattress. He poured in a measure from his whisky bottle. He sat again. Perhaps some other people are coming to see me, he said. A hundred yards away, pelted by the torrential rain, lay the heart of gold. Its hatchway opened, and three figures emerged, huddling into themselves to keep the rain off their faces. "'In there?' shouted Trillian above the noise of the rain. "'Yes,' said Zani Whoop. "'That shack?' "'Yes.' "'Weird,' said Zayfoot. "'But it's in the middle of nowhere,' said Trillian.' We must have come to the wrong place. You can't rule the universe from a shack. They hurried through the pouring rain and arrived wet through at the door. They knocked. They shivered. The door opened. Hello, said the man. Oh, excuse me, said Zani Whoop. I have reason to believe. Do you rule the universe, said Zaphod. The man smiled at him. I try not to, he said. Are you wet? Zaphod looked at him in astonishment. Wet, he cried. Does it look as if we're wet? That's how it looks to me, said the man, but how you feel about it might be an altogether different matter. If you find warmth makes you dry, you'd better come in. They went in. They looked around the tiny shack. Zani whooped with slight distaste, Trillian with interest, Zaphod with delight. Hey, uh, said Zaphod. "'What's your name?' "'The man looked at them doubtfully. "'I don't know. "'Why, do you think I should have one? "'It seems very odd to give a bundle of vague sensory perceptions a name.' "'He invited Trillian to sit in the chair. "'He sat on the edge of the chair. "'Zani Whoop leaned stiffly against the table, "'and Zaphod lay on the mattress. "'Wowee!' said Zaphod. "'The seat of power!' "'He tickled the cat.' Listen, said Zani Whoop, I must ask you some questions. All right, said the man kindly. You can sing to my cat if you like. Would he like that, said Zaphod. You'd better ask him, said the man. Does he talk, said Zaphod. I have no memory of him talking, said the man, but I am very unreliable. Zani Whoop pulled some notes out of her pocket. Now, he said, you do rule the universe, do you? How can I tell? said the man. Zani Whoop ticked off a note on the paper. How long have you been doing this? Ah, said the man, this is a question about the past, is it? Zani Whoop looked at him in puzzlement. This wasn't exactly what he'd been expecting. Uh, yes, he said. How can I tell, said the man, that the past isn't a fiction designed to account for the discrepancy between my immediate physical sensations and my state of mind. Zani Whoop stared at him. The steam began to rise from his sodden clothes. 
Do you answer all questions like this? he said. The man answered quickly, I say what it occurs to me to say when I think I hear people say things. More I cannot say. Seyford laughed happily. <laughs> I'll drink to that, he said, and pulled out a bottle of Jack's spirit. He leapt up and handed the bottle to the ruler of the universe, who took it with pleasure. Good on you, great ruler, he said. Tell it like it is. No, listen to me, said Zani Woop. People come to you, do they, in ships? I think so, said the man. He handed the bottle to Trillian. And they ask you, said Zani Woop, to take decisions for them about people's lives, about worlds, about economies, about wars, about everything going on out there in the universe. Out there? said the man. Out where? Out there, said Zani, pointing at the door. How can you tell there's anything out there? said the man, politely. The door's closed. The rain continued to pound the roof. Inside the shack, it was warm. But do you know there's a whole universe out there, cried Zani, you can't dodge your responsibilities by saying they don't exist. The ruler of the universe thought for a long while, whilst Zani Whoop quivered with anger. You're very sure of your facts, he said at last. I couldn't trust the thinking of a man who takes the universe, if there is one, for granted. Zani Whoop still quivered, but was silent. I only decide about my universe, continued the man quietly. My universe is my eyes and my ears. Anything else is hearsay. But don't you believe in anything? The man shrugged and picked up his cat. I don't understand what you mean, he said. You don't understand that what you decide in this shack of yours affects the lives and fates of millions of people? This is all monstrously wrong. I don't know. I've never met all these people you speak of, and neither, I suspect, of you. They only exist in words we hear. It is folly to say you know what is happening to other people. Only they know if they exist. They have their own universe of their eyes and ears. Trillian said, I think I'm just popping outside for a moment. She left and walked into the rain. Do you believe other people exist? insisted Zani Whoop. I have no opinion. How can I say? I'd better just see what's up with Trillian, said Zaphod and slipped out. Outside, he said to her, I think the universe is in pretty good hands, yeah? Very good, said Trillian. They walked off into the rain. Inside, Zani Whoop continued, But don't you understand that people live or die on your word? The ruler of the universe waited for as long as he could. When he heard the faint sound of the ship's engine starting, he spoke to cover it. It's nothing to do with me, he said. I am not involved with people. The Lord knows I am not a cruel man. Ah! barked Zani Whoop. You said the Lord. You believe in something. My cat, said the man benignly, picking it up and stroking it. I call him the Lord. I am kind to him. All right, said Zani Whoop, pressing home his point. How do you know he exists? How do you know he knows you to be kind, or enjoys what he thinks of as your kindness? I don't, said the man with a smile. I have no idea. It merely pleases me to behave in a certain way to what appears to be a cat. Do you behave any differently? Please. I think I am tired. Zani Whoop heaved a thoroughly dissatisfied sigh and looked about. Where are the other two? he said suddenly. What other two? said the ruler of the universe, settling back into his chair and refilling his whiskey glass. Beeblebrox and the girl, the two who are here. I remember no one. The past is a fiction to account for. Oh, stuff it! snapped Zani Whoop and ran out into the rain. There was no ship. The rain continued to churn the mud. There was no sign to show where the ship had been. He hollered into the rain. He turned and ran back to the shack and found it locked. The ruler of the universe dozed lightly in his chair. After a while he played with a pencil and the paper again, and was delighted when he discovered how to make a mark with the one on the other. Various noises continued outside, but he didn't know whether they were real or not. He then talked to his table for a week to see how it would react. Chapter 30 The stars came out that night, dazzling in their brilliance and clarity. 
Ford and Arthur had walked more miles than they had any means of judging, and finally stopped to rest. The night was cool and balmy, the air pure. The sub ether sensomatic, totally silent. A wonderful stillness hung over the world, a magical calm, which combined with the soft fragrance of the woods, the quiet chatter of insects, and the brilliant light of the stars, to soothe their jangled spirits. Even Ford Prefect, who had seen more worlds than he could count on a long afternoon, was moved to wonder if this was the most beautiful he had ever seen. All that day they had passed through rolling green hills and valleys. Richly covered with grasses, wild scented flowers, and tall, thickly leaved trees. The sun had warmed them, light breezes had kept them cool, and Ford Prefect had checked his sub ether sensomatic at less and less frequent intervals, and had exhibited less and less annoyance at its continued silence. He was beginning to think he liked it here. Cool though the night air was, they slept soundly and comfortably in the open, and awoke a few hours later. With the light dewfall, feeling refreshed but hungry. Ford had stuffed some small rolls into his satchel at Millyways, and they breakfasted off these before moving on. So far they had wandered purely at random, but now they struck out firmly eastwards, feeling that if they were going to explore this world, they should have some clear idea of where they had come from and where they were going. Shortly before noon, they had their first indication that the world they had landed on. Was not an uninhabited one. A half glimpsed face amongst the trees, watching them. It vanished at the moment they both saw it, but the image they were both left with was of a humanoid creature, curious to see them but not alarmed. Half an hour later, they glimpsed another such face, and ten minutes after that, another. A minute later, they stumbled into a wide clearing and stopped short. Before them, in the middle of the clearing, stood a group of about two dozen men and women. They stood still and quiet, facing Ford and Arthur. Around some of the women huddled some small children, and behind the group was a ramshackle array of small dwellings made of mud and branches. Ford and Arthur held their breath. The tallest of the men stood a little over five feet high. They all stooped forward slightly, had longish arms and lowish foreheads. And bright, clear eyes with which they stared intently at the strangers. Seeing that they carried no weapons and made no move towards them, Ford and Arthur relaxed slightly. For a while, the two groups simply stared at each other, neither side making any move. The natives seemed puzzled by the intruders, and whilst they showed no sign of aggression, they were quite clearly not issuing any invitations. Nothing happened. For a full two minutes, nothing continued to happen. After two minutes, Ford decided it was time something happened. "Hello," he said. The women drew their children slightly closer to them. The men made hardly any discernible move, and yet their whole disposition made it clear that the greeting was not welcome. It was not resented in any great degree. It was just not welcome. One of the men, who had been standing slightly forward of the rest of the group and who might therefore have been their leader, stepped forward. His face was quiet and calm, almost serene. <coughs> he said quietly. This caught Arthur by surprise. He had grown so used to receiving an instantaneous and unconscious translation of everything he heard via the babelfish lodged in his ear that he had ceased to be aware of it, and was only reminded of its presence now by the fact that it didn't seem to be working. Vague shadows of meaning had flickered at the back of his mind, but there was nothing he could get any firm grasp on. He guessed correctly, as it happens, that these people had as yet evolved no more than the barest rudiments of language. And that the babelfish was therefore powerless to help. He glanced at Ford, who was infinitely more experienced in these matters. I think," said Ford, out of the corner of his mouth, "he is asking us if we'd mind walking on round the edge of the village." A moment later, a gesture from the man creature seemed to confirm this. <laughs> Continued the man creature. The general gist," said Ford, "as far as I can make out, is that we are welcome to continue our journey in any way we like, but if we would walk round his village rather than through it, it would make them all very happy."
So what do we do? I think we make them happy, said Ford. Slowly and watchfully, they walked round the perimeter of the clearing. This seemed to go down very well with the natives, who bowed to them very slightly and then went about their business. Ford and Arthur continued their journey through the wood. A few hundred yards past the clearing, they suddenly came upon a small pile of fruit lying in their path. Berries that looked remarkably like raspberries and blackberries, and pulpy, green-skinned fruit that looked remarkably like pears. So far, they had steered clear of the fruit and berries they had seen, though the trees and bushes were laden with them. Look at it this way, Ford Prefect had said. Fruit and berries on strange planets either make you live or make you die. Therefore, the point at which you start toying with them is when you're going to die if you don't. That way you stay ahead. The secret of healthy hitchhiking is to eat junk food. They looked at the pile that lay in their path with suspicion. It looked so good it made them almost dizzy with hunger. Look at it this way, said Ford. Uh, yes, said Arthur. Um, I'm trying to think of a way of looking at it, which means we get to eat it, said Ford. The leaf-dappled sun gleamed on the plump skins of the things which looked like pears. The things which looked like raspberries and strawberries were fatter and riper than any Arthur had ever seen, even in ice cream commercials. Why don't we eat them and think about it afterwards, he said. Maybe that's what they want us to do. All right, look at it this way. Sounds good so far. It's there for us to eat. Either it's good or it's bad. Either they want to feed us or to poison us. If it's poisonous and we don't eat it, they'll just attack us some other way. If we don't eat, we lose out either way. I like the way you're thinking, said Ford. Now eat one. Hesitantly, Arthur picked up one of the things that looked like pears. I always thought that about the Garden of Eden story, said Ford. Eh? No, Garden of Eden, tree, apple, that bit, remember? Yes, of course I do. Well, your god person puts an apple tree in the middle of a garden and says, Do what you like, guys. Oh, but don't eat the apple. Surprise, surprise, they eat it, and he leaps out from behind a bush shouting, Gotcha! Wouldn't have made any difference if they hadn't eaten it. Why not? Because if you're dealing with somebody who has the sort of mentality which likes leaving hats on the pavement with bricks under them, you know perfectly well they won't give up. They'll get you in the end. What are you talking about? Never mind. Eat the fruit. You know, this place almost looks like the Garden of Eden. Eat the fruit. Huh, sounds quite like it, too. Arthur took a bite from the thing which looked like a pear. It's a pear, he said. A few minutes later, when they'd eaten a lot, Ford Prefect turned round and called out, "'Thank you! Thank you very much!' he called. "'You're very kind!' They went on their way. For the next fifty miles of their journey eastward, they kept on finding the occasional gift of fruit lying in their path, and though they once or twice had a quick glimpse of a native man-creature amongst the trees, they never again made direct contact." They decided they rather liked a race of people who made it clear that they were grateful simply to be left alone. The fruit and berries stopped after fifty miles, because that was where the sea started. Having no pressing calls on their time, they built a raft and crossed the sea. It was relatively calm, only about sixty miles wide, and they had a reasonably pleasant crossing, landing in a country that was at least as beautiful as the one they'd left. Life was, in short, ridiculously easy and for a while at least they were able to cope with the problems of aimlessness and isolation by deciding to ignore them. When the craving for company became too great, they would know where to find it, but for the moment they were happy to feel that the Golga Frenchians were hundreds of miles behind them. Nevertheless, Ford Prefect began to use his Sabitha Sensomatic more often again. Only once did he pick up a signal, but that was so faint and from such enormous distance that it depressed him more than the silence that had otherwise continued unbroken. On a whim they turned northwards. After weeks of travelling, they came to another sea, built another raft, and crossed it. This time it was harder going. The climate was getting colder. Arthur suspected a streak of masochism in Ford Prefect. The increasing difficulty of the journey seemed to give him a sense of purpose that it was otherwise lacking. He strode onwards relentlessly. Their journey northwards brought them into steep mountainous terrain of breathtaking sweep and beauty. The vast, jagged, snow-covered peaks ravished their senses. The cold began to bite into their bones. 
They wrapped themselves in animal skins and furs, which Ford Prefect acquired by a technique he had once learnt from a couple of ex-pralite monks running a mind-surfing resort in the hills of Hunian. The galaxy is littered with ex-pralite monks, all on the make, because the mental control techniques the Order have evolved as a form of devotional discipline are frankly sensational and extraordinary numbers of monks leave the order just after they've finished their devotional training and just before they take their final vows to stay locked in small metal boxes for the rest of their lives. Ford's technique seemed to consist mainly of standing still for a while and smiling. After a while, an animal, a deer perhaps, would appear from out of the trees and watch him cautiously. Ford would continue to smile at it. His eyes would soften and shine and he would seem to radiate a deep and universal love, a love which reached out to embrace all of creation. A wonderful quietness would descend on the surrounding countryside, peaceful and serene, emanating from this transfigured man. Slowly the deer would approach, step by step, until it was almost nuzzling him, whereupon Ford Prefect would reach out to it and break its neck. Pheromone control, he said it was. You just have to know how to generate the right smell. Chapter 31 A few days after landing in this mountainous land, they hit a coastline which swept diagonally before them from the southwest to the northeast, a coastline of monumental grandeur, deep majestic ravines, soaring pinnacles of ice, fjords. For two further days they scrambled and climbed over the rocks and glaciers, awestruck with beauty. Arthur! yelled Ford suddenly. It was the afternoon of the second day. Arthur was sitting on a high rock, watching the thundering sea smashing itself against the craggy promontories. Arthur! yelled Ford again. Arthur looked to where Ford's voice had come from, carried faintly in the wind. Ford had gone to examine a glacier and Arthur found him there, crouching by the solid wall of blue ice. He was tense with excitement. His eyes darted up to meet Arthur's. Look, he said. Look. Arthur looked. He saw the solid wall of blue ice. Yes, he said, it's a glacier. I've already seen it. No, said Ford. You've looked at it. You haven't seen it. Look. Ford was pointing deep into the heart of the ice. Arthur peered. He saw nothing but vague shadows. Move back from it, insisted Ford. Look again. Arthur moved back and looked again. No, he said and shrugged. What am I supposed to be looking for? And suddenly he saw it. You see it? He saw it. His mouth started to speak, but his brain decided... He hadn't got anything to say yet and shut it again. His brain then started to contend with the problem of what his eyes told it they were looking at, but in doing so relinquished control of the mouth, which promptly fell open again. Once more gathering up the jaw, his brain lost control of his left hand, which then wandered around in an aimless fashion. For a second or so, the brain tried to catch the left hand without letting go of the mouth, and simultaneously tried to think about what was buried in the ice which is probably why the legs went and Arthur dropped restfully to the ground. The thing that had been causing all this neural upset was a network of shadows in the ice, about 18 inches beneath the surface. Looked at from the right angle, they resolved into the solid shapes of letters from an alien alphabet, each about three feet high. And for those like Arthur who couldn't read Magrathean, there was above the letters the outline of a face, hanging in the ice. It was an old face, thin and distinguished, careworn but not unkind. It was the face of the man who had won an award for designing the coastline they now knew themselves to be standing on. Chapter 32 a thin whine filled the air. It whirled and howled through the trees, upsetting the squirrels. A few birds flew off in disgust. The noise danced and skittered around the clearing. It whooped, it rasped, it generally offended. The captain, however, regarded the lone bagpiper with an indulgent eye. 
little could disturb his equanimity. Indeed, once he'd got over the loss of his gorgeous bath during that unpleasantness in the swamp all those months ago, he had begun to find his new life remarkably congenial. A hollow had been scooped out of a large rock which stood in the middle of the clearing, and in this he would bask daily whilst attendants sloshed water over him. Not particularly warm water, it must be said, as they hadn't yet worked out a way of heating it. Never mind, that would come, and in the meantime search parties were scouring the countryside far and wide for a hot spring, preferably one in a nice leafy glade, and if it was near a soap mine, perfection. To those who said that they had a feeling soap wasn't found in mines, the captain had ventured to suggest that perhaps this was because no one had looked hard enough, and this possibility had been reluctantly acknowledged. No, life was very pleasant, and the great thing about it was that when the hot spring was found, complete with leafy glade en suite, and when in the fullness of time the cry came reverberating across the hills that the soap mine had been located and was producing five hundred cakes a day, it would be more pleasant still. It was very important to have things to look forward to. Whale, whale, screech, whale, howl, honk, squeak, went the bagpipes, increasing the captain's already considerable pleasure at the thought that any moment now they might stop. That was something he looked forward to as well. What else was pleasant? he asked himself. Well, so many things. The red and gold of the trees, now that autumn was approaching, the peaceful chatter of scissors a few feet from his bath, where a couple of hairdressers were exercising their skills on a dozing art director and his assistant. The sunlight gleaming off the six shiny telephones lined up along the edge of his rock hewn bath. The only thing nicer than a phone that didn't ring all the time, or indeed at all, was six phones that didn't ring all the time, or indeed at all. Nicest of all was the happy murmur of all the hundreds of people slowly assembling in the clearing around him to watch the afternoon committee meeting. The captain punched his rubber duck playfully on the beak. The afternoon committee meetings were his favourite. Other eyes watched the assembling crowds. High in a tree on the edge of the clearing squatted Ford Prefect, lately returned from foreign climes. After his six-month journey, he was lean and healthy. His eyes gleamed. He wore a reindeer-skin coat. His beard was as thick and his face as bronzed as a country rock singer's. He and Arthur Dent had been watching the Golga Frenchians for almost a week now, and Ford had decided it was time to stir things up a bit. The clearing was now full. Hundreds of men and women lounged around, chatting, eating fruit, playing cards, and generally having a fairly relaxed time of it. Their track suits were now all dirty and even torn, but they all had immaculately styled hair. Ford was puzzled to see that many of them had stuffed their track suits full of leaves, and wondered if this was meant to be some form of insulation against the coming winter. Ford's eyes narrowed. They couldn't be interested in botany all of a sudden, could they? In the middle of these speculations, the captain's voice rose above the hubbub. "'All right,' he said. "'I'd like to call this meeting some sort of order, if that's at all possible. "'Is that all right with everybody?' he smiled genially. "'In a minute, when you're all ready.' The talking gradually died away, and the clearing fell silent, except for the bagpiper, who seemed to be in some wild and uninhabitable musical world of his own. A few of those in his immediate vicinity threw some leaves at him. If there was any reason for this, then it escaped Fort Prefect for the moment. A small group of people had clustered round the captain, and one of them was clearly preparing to speak. He did this by standing up, clearing his throat, and then gazing off into the distance, as if to signify to the crowd that he would be with them in a minute. The crowd, of course, were riveted, and all turned their eyes on him. A moment of silence followed, which Ford judged to be the right dramatic moment to make his entry. The man turned to speak. Ford dropped down out of the tree. Hi there, he said. The crowd swivelled around. Ah, my dear fellow, called out the captain. Got any matches on you, or a lighter, anything like that? No, said Ford, sounding a little deflated. It wasn't what he'd prepared. He decided he'd be a little stronger on the subject. No, I haven't, he continued. No matches. Instead, I bring in news. Oh, pity, said the captain. We've all run out, you see. Haven't had a hot bath in weeks. Ford refused to be headed off. I bring you news, he said, of a discovery that might interest you. Is it on the agenda? snapped the man whom Ford had interrupted. Ford smiled a broad, country rock-singer smile. 
Now, come on, he said. Well, I'm sorry, said the man huffily, but speaking as a management consultant of many years standing, I must insist on the importance of observing the committee structure. Ford looked around the crowd. He's mad, you know. This is a prehistoric planet. Address the chair, snapped the management consultant. There isn't a chair, explained Ford. There's only a rock. The management consultant decided that testiness was what the situation now called for. Well, call it a chair, he said testily. Why not call it a rock? asked Ford. You obviously have no conception, said the management consultant, now abandoning testiness in favour of good old-fashioned hauteur, of modern business methods. And you have no conception of where you are, said Ford. A girl with a strident voice leapt to her feet and used it. Shut up, you two. I want to table a motion. You mean bolder a motion, tittered a hairdresser. Order, order, yapped the management consultant. All right, said Ford. Let's see how you're doing. He plonked himself down on the ground to see how long he could keep his temper. The captain made a sort of conciliatory, harumphing noise. I would like to call to order, he said pleasantly, the 573rd meeting of the Colonization Committee of Fintelwoodlewicks. Ten seconds, thought Ford, as he leapt to his feet again. This is futile, he exclaimed. Five hundred and seventy-three committee meetings, and you haven't even discovered fire yet. If you would care, said the girl with the strident voice, to examine the agenda sheet. Agenda rock, trilled the hairdresser happily. Thank you, I've made that point, muttered Ford. You will see, continued the girl firmly, that we are having a report from the hairdresser's fire development subcommittee today. Oh, ah, said the hairdresser with a sheepish look, which has recognised the whole galaxy over as meaning, uh, will next Tuesday do? All right, said Ford, rounding on him. What have you done? What are you going to do? What are your thoughts on fire development? Well, I don't know, said the hairdresser. All they gave me was a couple of sticks. So what have you done with them? Nervously, the hairdresser fished in his tracksuit top and handed over the fruits of his labour to Ford. Ford held them up for all to see. Curling tongs, he said. The crowd applauded. Never mind, said Ford. Rome wasn't burnt in a day. The crowd hadn't the faintest idea what he was talking about. They loved it, nevertheless. They applauded. Well, you're obviously being totally naive, of course, said the girl. When you've been in marketing as long as I have, you'll know that before any new product can be developed, it has to be properly researched. We've got to find out what people want from fire, how they relate to it, what sort of image it has for them. The crowd were tense. They were expecting something wonderful from Ford. Stick it up your nose, he said, which is precisely the sort of thing we need to know, insisted the girl. Do people want fire that can be fitted nasally? Do you? Ford asked the crowd. Yes, shouted some. No, shouted others happily. They didn't know. They just thought it was great. And the wheel, said the captain. What about this wheel thing? It sounds a terribly interesting project. Ah, said the marketing girl. Well, we're having a little difficulty there. Difficulty? exclaimed Ford. Difficulty? What do you mean, difficulty? It's the single simplest machine in the entire universe. The marketing girl soured him with a look. All right, Mr. Wise Guy, she said. You're so clever, you tell us what colour it should be. The crowd went wild. One up to the home team, they thought. Ford shrugged his shoulders and sat down again. Almighty Zarquan, he said. Had none of you done anything? As if in answer to his question, there was a sudden clamour of noise from the entrance to the clearing. The crowd couldn't believe the amount of entertainment they were getting this afternoon. In marched a squad of about a dozen men, dressed in the remnants of their Golgofrinch and 3rd Regiment dress uniforms. About half of them still carried kilozap guns. The rest now carried spears, which they struck together as they marched. They looked bronzed, healthy, and utterly exhausted and bedraggled. They clattered to a halt and banged to attention. One of them fell over and never moved again. Captain, sir! cried number two, for he was their leader. Permission to report, sir! Yes, all right, number two. Welcome back and all that. Find any hot springs? said the captain despondently. No, sir! Thought you wouldn't. Number two strode through the crowd and presented arms before the bath. We have discovered another continent! Oh, when was this? It lies across the sea! said number two, narrowing his eyes significantly. To the east. Ah. Number two turned to face the crowd. He raised his gun above his head. This is going to be great, thought the crowd. We have declared war on it! 
Wild abandoned cheering broke out in all corners of the clearing. This was beyond all expectation. Wait a minute, shouted Ford Prefect. Wait a minute! He leapt to his feet and demanded silence. After a while he got it, or at least the best silence he could hope for under the circumstances. The circumstances were that the bagpiper was spontaneously composing a national anthem. Do we have to have the piper? demanded Ford. Oh, yes, said the captain. We've given him a grant. Ford considered opening this idea up for debate, but quickly decided that that way madness lay. Instead, he slung a well-judged rock at the piper and turned to face number two. War? he said. Yes. Number two gazed contemptuously at Ford Prefect. On the next continent? Yes, total warfare, the war to end all wars. But there's no one even living there yet. Ah, interesting, thought the crowd. Nice point. Number two's gaze hovered undisturbed. In this respect, his eyes were like a couple of mosquitoes that hover purposefully three inches from your nose and refuse to be deflected by arm thrashes, fly swats, or rolled newspapers. I know that, he said, but there will be one day, so we have left an open-ended ultimatum. What? And blown up a few military installations. The captain leaned forward out of his bath. Military installations, number two, he said. For a moment the eyes wavered. Yes, sir. Well, potential military installations. All right, trees. The moment of uncertainty passed. His eyes flicked like whips over his audience. And, he roared, we interrogated a gazelle! He flipped his killer zap smartly under his arm and marched off through the pandemonium that had now erupted through the ecstatic crowd. A few steps was all he managed before he was caught up and carried shoulder high for a lap of honour around the clearing. Ford sat and idly tapped a couple of stones together. So what else have you done? He inquired after the celebrations had died down. We have started a culture, said the marketing girl. Oh, yes, said Ford. Yes, one of our film producers is already making a fascinating documentary about the indigenous cavemen of the area. They're not cavemen. They look like cavemen. Do they live in caves? Well, they live in huts. Perhaps they're having their caves redecorated, called out a wag from the crowd. Ford rounded on him angrily. Very funny, he said. But have you noticed that they're dying out? On their journey back, Ford and Arthur had come across two derelict villages and the bodies of many natives in the woods, where they had crept away to die. Those that still lived seemed stricken and listless, as if they were suffering from some disease of the spirit rather than the body. They moved sluggishly and with an infinite sadness. Their future had been taken away from them. Dying out! repeated Ford. Do you know what that means? Uh, we shouldn't sell them any life insurance? called out the wag again. Ford ignored him and appealed to the whole crowd. Can you try and understand, he said, that it's just since we've arrived here that they've started dying out? In fact, that comes over very well in this film, said the marketing girl, and it gives it that poignant twist which is the hallmark of the really great documentary. The producer's very committed. He should be. Muttered Ford. I gather, said the girl, turning to address the captain, who was beginning to nod off, that he wants to make one about you next, Captain. Oh, oh, really? he said, coming to with a start. That's awfully nice. He's got a very strong angle on it, you know, the burden of responsibility, the loneliness of command. The captain hummed and hard about this for a moment. Well, I wouldn't overstress that angle, you know, he said finally. One is never alone with the rubber duck. He held the duck aloft, and he got an appreciative round from the crowd. All this while, the management consultant had been sitting in stony silence, his fingertips pressed to his temples to indicate that he was waiting and would wait all day if necessary. At this point, he decided that he would not wait all day after all. He would merely pretend that the last half hour hadn't happened. He rose to his feet. If he said tersely, we could for a moment move on to the subject of fiscal policy. Fiscal policy, whooped Ford Prefect. Fiscal policy. The management consultant gave him a look that only a lungfish could have copied. Fiscal policy, he repeated. That is what I said. How can you have money, demanded Ford, if none of you actually produces anything? It doesn't grow on trees, you know. 
if you will allow me to continue. Ford nodded dejectedly. Thank you. Since we decided a few weeks ago to adopt the leaf as legal tender, we have, of course, all become immensely rich. Ford stared in disbelief at the crowd who were murmuring appreciatively at this and greedily fingering the wads of leaves with which their tracksuits were stuffed. But we have also, continued the management consultant, run into a small inflation problem on account of the high level of leaf availability, which means that I gather the current going rate is something like three deciduous forests buying one ship's peanut. Murmurs of alarm came from the crowd. The management consultant waved them down. So in order to obviate this problem, he continued, and effectively revalue the leaf, we are about to embark on a massive defoliation program and uh, burn down all the forests. I think you'll agree that's a sensible move under the circumstances. The crowd seemed a little uncertain about this for a second or two until someone pointed out, how much this would increase the value of the leaves in their pockets, whereupon they let out whoops of delight and gave the management consultant a standing ovation. The accountants amongst them looked forward to a profitable autumn. "'You're all mad,' explained Ford Prefect. "'You're absolutely balmy,' he suggested. "'You're a bunch of raving nutters,' he opined. The tide of opinion was beginning to turn against him, what had started out as an excellent entertainment had now, in the crowd's view, deteriorated into mere abuse, and since this abuse was in the main directed at them, they wearied of it. Sensing the shift in the wind, the marketing girl turned on him. "'Is it perhaps in order,' she demanded, "'to inquire what you have been doing all these months, then? You and that other interloper have been missing since the day we arrived.' "'We've been on a journey.' said Ford. We went to try and find out something about this planet. Oh, said the girl archly, doesn't sound very productive to me. No? Well, have I got news for you, my love. We have discovered this planet's future. Ford waited for the statement to have its effect. It didn't have any. They didn't know what he was talking about. He continued. It doesn't matter a pair of fetid dingo's kidneys what you all choose to do from now on. Burn down the forests, anything. It won't make a scrap of difference. Your future history has already happened. Two million years you've got, and that's it. At the end of that time, your race will be dead, gone, and good riddance to you. Remember that, two million years. The crowd muttered to itself in annoyance. People as rich as they had suddenly become shouldn't be obliged to listen to this sort of gibberish. Perhaps they could tip the fellow a leaf or two and he would go away. They didn't need to bother. Ford was already stalking out of the clearing, pausing only to shake his head at number two, who was already firing his killer zap into some neighbouring trees. He turned back once. Two million years, he said, and laughed. Well, said the captain with a soothing smile, still time for a few more baths. Could someone pass me the sponge? I've just dropped it over the side. Chapter 33 A mile or so away through the wood, Arthur Dent was too busily engrossed with what he was doing to hear Ford Prefect approach. What he was doing was rather curious, and this is what it was. On a wide, flat piece of rock, he had scratched out the shape of a large square, subdivided into 169 smaller squares, 13 to a side. Furthermore, he had collected together a pile of smallish, flattish stones and scratched the shape of a letter onto each. Sitting morosely round the rock were a couple of the surviving local native men, to whom Arthur Dent was trying to introduce the curious concept embodied in these stones. So far, they had not done well. They had attempted to eat some of them, bury others, and throw the rest of them away. Arthur had finally encouraged one of them to lay a couple of stones on the board he had scratched out, which was not even as far as he'd managed to get the day before. Along with the rapid deterioration in the morale of these creatures, there seemed to be a corresponding deterioration in their actual intelligence. In an attempt to egg them along, Arthur set out a number of letters on the board himself, and then tried to encourage the natives to add some more themselves. 
It was not going well. Ford watched quietly from beside a nearby tree. No, said Arthur to one of the natives, who had just shuffled some of the letters around in a fit of abysmal dejection. Q scores ten, you see, and it's on a triple word score, so look, uh, look, I've explained the rules to you. No, 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 please put down that jawbone. All right, we'll start again, and try to concentrate this time. Ford leaned his elbow against the tree and his hand against his head. What are you doing, Arthur? he asked quietly. Arthur looked up with a start. He suddenly had a feeling that all this might look slightly foolish. All he knew was that it had worked like a dream on him when he was a child, but things were different then, or rather would be. I'm trying to teach the cavemen to play Scrabble, he said. They're not cavemen, said Ford. Well, they look like cavemen. Ford let it pass. I see, he said. It's uphill work, said Arthur wearily. The only word they know is grunt, and they can't spell it. He sighed and sat back. What's that supposed to achieve? said Ford. We've got to encourage them to evolve, to develop, Arthur burst out angrily. He hoped that the weary sigh and then the anger might do something to counteract the overriding feeling of foolishness from which he was currently suffering. It didn't. He jumped to his feet. Can you imagine what a world would be like descended from those cretins we arrived with? he said. Imagine? said Ford, raising his eyebrows. We don't have to imagine. We've seen it. But... <sighs> Arthur waved his arms about hopelessly. We've seen it, said Ford. There's no escape. Arthur kicked at a stone. Did you tell them what we discovered? he asked. Hm? said Ford, not really concentrating. Norway, said Arthur. Slarty Bartfast's signature in the glacier. Did you tell them? What's the point? said Ford. What would it mean to them? Mean? said Arthur. Mean? You know perfectly well what it means. It means that this planet is the Earth. It's my home. It's where I was born. Was? said Ford. All right, will be. Yes, in two million years' time. Why don't you tell them that? Go and say to them, excuse me, I'd just like to point out that in two million years' time I will be born just a few miles from here. See what they say. They'll chase you up a tree and set fire to it. Arthur absorbed this unhappily. Face it, said Ford. Those zebes over there are your ancestors, not these poor creatures here. He went over to where the ape-man creatures were rummaging listlessly with the stone letters. He shook his head. Put the scrabble away, Arthur, he said. It won't save the human race, because this lot aren't going to be the human race. The human race is currently sitting round a rock on the other side of this hill, making documentaries about themselves. Arthur winced. There must be something we can do, he said terrible sense of desolation thrilled through his body, that he should be here on the earth, the earth which had lost its future in a horrifying arbitrary catastrophe, and which now seemed set to lose its past as well. No, said Ford, there's nothing we can do. This doesn't change the history of the earth, you see, this is the history of the earth. Like it or leave it, the Golga Frenchians are the people you are descended from. In two million years, they will get destroyed by the Vogons. History is never altered, you see. It just fits together like a jigsaw. Funny old thing, life, isn't it? He picked up the letter Q and hurled it into a distant privet bush, where it hit a young rabbit. The rabbit hurtled off in terror and didn't stop till it was set upon and eaten by a fox, which choked on one of its bones and died on the bank of a stream, which subsequently washed it away. During the following weeks, Ford Prefect swallowed his pride and struck up a relationship with a girl who had been a personnel officer on Golga Frencham. And he was terribly upset when she suddenly passed away as a result of drinking water from a pool that had been polluted by the body of a dead fox. The only moral that's possible to draw from the story is that one should never throw the letter Q into a privet bush. But unfortunately, there are times when it is unavoidable. Like most of the really crucial things in life, this chain of events was completely invisible to Ford Prefect and Arthur Dent. They were looking sadly at one of the natives, morosely pushing the other letters around. Poor bloody cavemen, said Arthur. They're not. What? Oh, never mind, said Ford. 
The wretched creature gave out a pathetic howling noise and banged on the rock. "'It's been a bit of a waste of time for them, hasn't it?' said Arthur. Uh, 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 "'Muttered the native and banged on the rock again. "'They've been out-evolved by telephone sanitizers. Uh, 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 "'Insisted the native, continuing to bang on the rock. "'Why does he keep on banging on the rock?' said Arthur. "'I think he probably wants you to play Scrabble with them again,' said Ford. "'He's pointing at the letters.' Uh, probably spelt Crisgrid Woolwich again, poor bastard. I keep on telling him there's only one G in Crisgrid Woolwich. The native banged on the rock again. They looked over his shoulder. Their eyes popped. There, amongst the jumble of letters, were eight that had been laid out in a clear, straight line. They spelt two words. The words were these. Forty-two. Grrr. <coughs> "'explained the native. "'He swept the letters angrily away "'and went and mooched under a nearby tree with his colleague. "'Ford and Arthur stared at him. "'Then they stared at each other. "'Did that say what I thought it said?' "'They both said to each other. "'Yes,' they both said. Forty-two, said Arthur. Forty-two, said Ford. "'Arthur ran over to the two natives. "'What are you trying to tell us?' he shouted. "'What's it supposed to mean?' One of them rolled over on the ground, kicked his legs up in the air, rolled over again, and went to sleep. The other bounded up the tree and threw horse chestnuts at Ford Prefect. Whatever it was they had to say, they had already said it. "'You know what this means?' said Ford. "'Not entirely. Forty-two is the number Deep Thought gave as being the ultimate answer.' "'Yes.' "'And the Earth is the computer Deep Thought designed and built to calculate the question to the ultimate answer.' So we're led to believe. And organic life was part of the computer matrix. If you say so. I do say so. That means that these natives, these ape men, are an integral part of the computer program, and that we and the Golgofrinchians are not. But the cavemen are dying out, and the Golgofrinchians are obviously set to replace them. Exactly. So you do see what this means. What? Cock up, said Ford Prefect. Arthur looked around him. This planet is having a pretty bloody time of it, he said. Ford puzzled for a moment. Still, something must have come out of it, he said at last, because Marvin said he could see the question printed in your brainwave patterns. But probably the wrong one or a distortion of the right one. It might give us a clue, though, if we could find it. I don't see how he can, though. They moped about for a bit. Arthur sat on the ground and started pulling up bits of grass, but found that it wasn't an occupation he could get deeply engrossed in. It wasn't grass he could believe in. The trees seemed pointless. The rolling hills seemed to be rolling to nowhere, and the future seemed just a tunnel to be crawled through. Ford fiddled with his sub sensomatic. It was silent. He sighed and put it away. Arthur picked up one of the letter stones from his homemade Scrabble set. It was a T. He sighed and put it down again. The letter he put it down next to was an I that spelt it. He tossed another couple of letters next to them. They were an S and an H, as it happened. By a curious coincidence, the resulting word perfectly expressed the way Arthur was feeling about things just then. He stared at it for a moment. He hadn't done it deliberately. It was just a random chance. His brain got slowly into first gear. Ford, he said suddenly, look, if that question is printed in my brainwave patterns, but I'm not consciously aware of it, it must be somewhere in my subconscious. Yes, I suppose so. There might be a way of bringing that unconscious pattern forward. Oh, yes? Yes, by introducing some random element that can be shaped by that pattern. Like how? Like by pulling Scrabble letters out of a bag blindfold. Ford leapt to his feet. Brilliant, he said. He tugged his towel out of his satchel and with a few deft knots transformed it into a bag. Totally mad, he said. Utter nonsense. But we'll do it because it's brilliant nonsense. Come on, come on. 
the sun passed respectfully behind a cloud. A few small, sad raindrops fell. They piled together all the remaining letters and dropped them into the bag. They shook them up. Right, said Ford. Close your eyes. Pull them out. Come on, come on, come on. Arthur closed his eyes and plunged his hand into the towel full of stones. He jiggled them about, pulled out four, and handed them to Ford. Ford laid them out along the ground in the order he got them. W, said Ford. H, A, T. What? He blinked. I think it's working, he said. Arthur pushed three more at him. D, O, Y, doy. Oh, perhaps it isn't working, said Ford. Here's the next three. O, U, G, doyug. Hmm, it's not making sense, I'm afraid. Arthur pulled out another two from the bag. Ford put them in place. E, T, doyug. Do you get? Shouted Ford. It's working. This is amazing. It's really working. More here. Arthur was throwing them out feverishly as fast as he could go. I F said Ford. Y O U M U L T I P L Y. What do you get if you multiply S I X six B Y by six by what do you get if you multiply six by n i n e six six by nine? He paused. Come on, where's the next one? Uh, that's the lot," said Arthur. "That's all there were." He sat back, nonplussed. He rooted around again and he knotted up towel, but there were no more letters. "You mean that's it?" said Ford. That's it. Six by nine? Forty-two? That's it. That's all there is. Chapter 34 The sun came out and beamed cheerfully at them. A bird sang. A warm breeze wafted through the trees and lifted the heads of the flowers, carrying their scent away through the woods. An insect droned past on its way to whatever it is that insects do in the late afternoon. The sound of voices lilted through the trees, followed a moment later by two girls who stopped in surprise at the sight of Ford Prefect and Arthur Dent, apparently lying on the ground in agony, but in fact rocking with noiseless laughter. No, 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 no don't go, called Ford Prefect between gasps. We'll be with you in just a moment. "'What's the matter?' asked one of the girls. "'She was the taller and slimmer of the two. "'On Golga Frinsham she had been a junior personnel officer, "'but hadn't liked it much.' "'Ford pulled himself together. "'Excuse me,' he said. "'Hello. "'My friend and I were just contemplating the meaning of life. "'Frivolous exercise.' "'Oh, it's you,' said the girl. "'You made a bit of a spectacle of yourself this afternoon.' You were quite funny to begin with, but you did bang on a bit. Did I? Oh, yes. Well, what was all that for? asked the other girl, a shorter, round-faced girl, who had been an art director for a small advertising company on Golga Frinsham. Whatever the privations of this world were, she went to sleep every night profoundly grateful for the fact that whatever she had to face in the morning, it wouldn't be a hundred almost identical photographs of moodily lit tubes of toothpaste. For? "'For nothing. Nothing's for anything,' said Ford Prefect happily. "'Come and join us. I'm Ford. This is Arthur. We were just about to do nothing at all for a while, but it can wait.' The girls looked at them doubtfully. "'I'm Agda,' said the tall one. "'This is Mella. "'Hello, Agda. Hello, Mella,' said Ford. "'Do you talk at all?' said Mella to Arthur. "'Oh, eventually,' said Arthur with a smile, but not as much as Ford. "'Good.' There was a slight pause. "'What did you mean?' asked Agda. "'About only having two million years. "'I couldn't make sense of what you were saying.' "'Oh, that,' said Ford. "'It doesn't matter. "'It's just that the world gets demolished "'to make way for a hyperspace bypass,' said Arthur with a shrug. "'But that's two million years away, and anyway, "'it's just Vogons doing what Vogons do.' "'Vogons?' said Mella. "'Ah, yes, you wouldn't know them. "'Where do you get this idea from?' 
It really doesn't matter. It's just like a dream from the past or the future. Arthur smiled and looked away. Does it worry you that you don't talk any kind of sense? asked Agda. Listen, forget it, said Ford. Forget all of it. Nothing matters. Look, it's a beautiful day. Enjoy it. The sun, the green of the hills, the river down in the valley, the burning trees. Even if it's only a dream, it's a pretty horrible idea, said Mella. Destroying a world just to make a bypass? Oh, I've heard of worse, said Ford. I read of one planet, often the seventh dimension, that got used as a ball in a game of intergalactic bar billiards. Got potted straight into a black hole. Killed ten billion people. That's mad, said Mella. Yes, and he scored thirty points, too. Agda and Mella exchanged glances. Look, said Agda, there's a party after the committee meeting tonight. You can come along if you like. Yeah, OK, said Ford. I'd like to, said Arthur. Many hours later, Arthur and Mella sat and watched the moon rise over the dull red glow of the trees. That story about the world being destroyed, began Mella. In two million years, yes. You say it as if you really think it's true. Yes, I think it is. I think I was there. She shook her head in puzzlement. You're very strange, she said. No, I'm very ordinary, said Arthur. But some very strange things have happened to me. You could say I'm more differed from than differing. And that other world your friend talked about, the one that got pushed into a black hole. Ah, that I don't know about. It sounds like something from the book. What book? Arthur paused. <sighs> the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, he said at last. What's that? Oh, just something I threw into the river this evening. I don't think I'll be wanting it any more, said Arthur Dent.